عليه وسلم وعلى آله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله جان السلام عليكم everyone welcome um, uh, to this wonderful class I'm really excited for this class الحمد لله I wanted to actually begin first uh, by uh, sharing um, a dua for studying uh, something that I'm endeavoring. It's one of my goals this Ramadan that I memorized this dua, so I figured, inshallah, I can share it here with all of you as well. So I'm going to quickly screen share. And I just have this um, image here uh, for us to read from. Um, and I encourage all of you to, if you can, you can actually purchase this if you want from the Zaytuna College bookstore. Um, but it's a really beautiful dua that. I think all of us, we're all students of knowledge. Hopefully we all see ourselves as lifelong learners and students of knowledge that we uh, are mindful to really call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even when we're in spaces like this, learning from each other, inshallah. So, <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin al-Fatiha lima uqliq wal-khatimi lima sabaqa nasir al-haqqi bil-haqqi ala hadi ila suratik al-mustaqim وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم اللهم افتح علينا فتوه العارفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا اللهم بالقرآن وذكر الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يقربنا منك برحمتك, برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا سحر إلا ما جعلته سحرا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سحرا سحلا اللهم عذنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. So alhamdulillah you can see here the meaning of uh, this dua. Mashallah it's beautiful and it really I think puts us all it puts me and shall all of us in a state of humility where we are really asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this path of studying his deen easy and give us tawfiq and to make us sincere, inshallah. So um, again, you can get this. It's a really beautiful poster. You can get it from Zaytuna College, um, but I do encourage you to memorize it. And if you want to take a quick screenshot of it for now, you can do that. You can also do a Google search for it. Uh, just do supplication for studying uh, Zaytuna College and you'll see this image, inshallah. So with that said, I'm going to now share um, the document that I really am excited to uh, read with all of you. It's something that has absolutely impacted my life. Um, and I think uh, that's precisely why our teachers, mashallah, um, translated it and it taught us to uh, to study it because they wanted us to benefit from uh, the, the saints of our, uh, of our tradition who just had so much insight and really helped uh, to help us to navigate our path even now, centuries later. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, so actually, I'm so sorry. Uh, if you give me a moment, I have a, I apologize one second. I have some noise coming from the back. Hold on. Sorry, my husband and sons are assembling something and I think they forgot I had class. So <laughs> I had to just let them know. Thank you. All right, so alhamdulillah, um, where's my, I'm sorry, I'm looking for my notes here. Oh yeah, I just wanted to do a quick biography. Um, some may wonder what, you know, If I hope you got the PDF. Um, I know it was sent, uh, the PDF of the document, but if you're not familiar with who Sidi Ahmed Zarruq is, his biography is really um, powerful too, just knowing who he is. He's a 15th century uh, scholar from Morocco, Fez, Morocco, to be specific. His he has different titles, uh, Ahmed Zarruq, Imam Az Zarruq, Shihab Ad Din Abu Al Abbas, Ahmed bin Ahmed bin Muhammad bin Isa Al Barnusi Al Fasi. That's the long uh, name, mashallah, that he was given. Um, but he was born in Morocco and he has, again, many beautiful titles. One of his titles is Muhtasib Al Ulama Wal Awliya, which is the regulator of the scholars and saints. And he really just is a spiritual master and gave us so many. Um, you know, gems from, from the different texts that he's also produced. Uh, but his life story is actually also fascinating um, because he was orphaned when he was young. Um, and he was actually raised by his maternal grandmother, who was also a scholarly woman in her own right. Her, her name was Omal Banin. And if you read some of the uh, stories that he shares about her and how she she would teach him really beautiful ways of teaching Islam to children, 
um, you know, he, he mentions in one of his, in his autobiography, he mentions one of his texts uh, or one of the stories. He says that she told me that one night when I was two years old, I looked at a star and asked her who put it in the sky. And then she explained to me the duty of belief in that matter. She used to tell me anecdotes about the righteous and the reliant ones. And when she told me stories, she never told me anything except about the prophet's miracles and the wonderful miracles of the devout. She also used to order me to pray even without performing the ablution. And when my maternal aunt once blamed her for this, she said, let him do so until he prays performing it. And I thought, you know, just that's one of many examples. You know, she would teach him about reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by, uh, they, would, they were, you know, a very simple family. They didn't have much, but she would hide food throughout the house and then um, tell him to supplicate with her and that maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would put food somewhere, would, would give them, you know, sustenance. And then they would go on a little, you know, hunt looking for food and then they would find it and she would remind him to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he has all of these beautiful memories from his grandmother teaching him deen, putting him on the path of scholarship. He taught, she taught him how to pray. She put him in uh, programs for him to, or, you know, madrasas for him to learn Quran and, and his deen. So he really um, gives a lot of credit to her for, um, for his path. And I think that's just really beautiful for us to also remember that many of our scholars, um, they had, you know, mothers, grandmothers, motherly women figures who were very much a part of their journey of Islam. And I think that should incentivize all of us to really take um, the path of studying knowledge seriously and to be passionate about it and not to act as though it's the domain of, of exclusively men, because certainly that's just not, not, not the case at all. But I, I really love that he tri- attributes so much of his success to his grandmother. So Mashallah, there's a lot more to share about him, and there are biographies available. Um, but just in the interest of time, uh, because this is a one-hour class, I wanted to go ahead and share with you now the PDF. And uh, you also, hopefully, all of you have that PDF, but let me go ahead and uh, screen share here so that we can read it together. Now, <clears throat> Ismana, again, why I love this uh, text is because it is a roadmap, and it's it's just so beautifully organized, which also really impresses me because I'm looking at, you know, 15th century, the fact that, you know, him and many, even Imam al-Ghazali and other scholars, I noticed that they had the foresight to, you know, to to put the, their, their teachings or to structure their teachings in a way that was really digestible to the reader um, in this, you know, like bulleted point uh, way of, of structuring, you know, everything they taught. And I've always f- thought that was so fascinating because, you know, it's you would think, you know, I, I, you know, I think for in 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 the way that we're um, educated now, that's common. But I just wouldn't know or I, I didn't, I guess, think that, you know, people back then thought to do things like that, to actually organize like their 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 their, their um, teachings in this way. You know, I thought they would just be writing because they that's how it was always taught to us that they were just they produced so much. They were so prolific. So I thought they were more interested in just actually documenting and putting it all together, but to actually structure it in this way, I thought, I think is really amazing too. But um, so he starts off basically, and we can just read this together and then provide commentary inshallah. But, um, you know, he starts off and he says, if anyone is asked about the foundation of his, his or her spiritual path, he should reply. And then he gives us, the, the five foundations and each one of them we could spend an entire session on really talking about, but we're going to, again, try to go through this, navigate this text together. But he, he lays out the foundation that if you are on this spiritual path, this path of Islam, and you're sincere, you're, you really want to be a practicing Muslim, and you've finally come to that point in life where you really want to embrace your faith, inshallah, we're all there. Um, then you need to, these are the goals, these are the objectives, and these are the the foundations. And so then, so let's let's read through them. So he starts off and he tells us first that uh, taqwa, right, that the most essential prerequisite of being on a spiritual path is that you, that we are mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you'll notice this as we read, continue to read, that he puts these, these caveats or disclaimers that, because you know that's pretty understood. It's kind of like okay, I, I understand taqwa. Um, we're all taught that. But what I love 
is that he, you know, he met, he mentions here, uh, and I'm sorry, let me just quickly zoom into this text to make sure you guys can all read along with me. Um, it's clear for me, but I realize now that it might not be for you. Okay, this for that. So he says here, um, he he puts the condition here. This is a conditional statement, right? So it's mindfulness of Allah, but how privately and publicly. And I think that's really important for us to reflect on because, you know, it's easy if you think about it because social pressure. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, whether you want to be a part of a group or you're afraid of being excluded from a group, you conform. And so it's easy when we're in social settings to play the part, right? We may behave actually even more religiously or more mindful of our uh, behavior, of our words, of our language, of the way that the topics that we talk about, because we're in public settings and we don't want obviously the consequences of maybe unveiling certain parts of ourselves. And so we put on the persona or, you know, that, and we all do it to a certain degree, but we have that nature, right, of doing that. So I love that he is reminding us that while that is, you know, easy to do, even the munafiqeen, as we know, uh, were very convincing, you know, and they still are. Obviously, there's hypocrites that still exist amongst us. They're very convincing in that they show up, they come to the same spaces, and they perform or they appear to perform the same, you know, uh, rituals that we do. But it's really about the hearts and the the true uh, essence of a person's faith is known when they are alone. And I think that was really, again, it's it's when we say it now, as I'm saying it, I feel like it's it's it seems so obvious, some of these things, these insights. But I think um, to point it out and to make mention of it leaves really no room for for doubt or question that this is exactly what we want. We want to have uh, this degree of taqwa, where when we are alone uh, by ourselves, that's when we are truly mindful of Allah subhanahu wa So it's not just that we play a part, but that we're actually sincere. And so that's many of our scholars say that that in fact is, uh, you know, an indication or, or if you want to know your state with God, and you want to know where you are, then you have to pay attention to what you're doing by yourself. Uh, so when you're alone, no one else is around. There's no way for people to see you, do you know, observe you. How are you using your time? What are you engaged with? And that is really an indication of your state. And then in terms of you know the the broader meaning of taqwa, there's so many definitions and. You know, uh, there are technical definitions actually in this book um, where the foundations of the spiritual path was first printed, from my understanding in English, was in the book Agenda to Change Our Condition. So if you don't have this text, this is actually a wonderful text as well, because it is really about doing what, you know, this text also discusses, which is changing and, and you know, uh, coming to a point where you really want to start to practice your faith with sincerity. So they have the first entire chapter is on the definition of taqwa and the benefits. And so, um, you know, there's different scholars who gave their own interpretations of what taqwa means, but I'll just read briefly here. So Sidi Abdul uh, Wahid ibn Ashab defines taqwa as follows. The summation of taqwa is avoiding prohibitions and fulfilling injunctions both inwardly and outwardly. And then in his book def uh, of definitions, Imam al Jurjani defines it accordingly. Linguistically, it means to ward off. In other words, it is to take precaution. According to the scholars of truth, it is to protect oneself from the punishment of Allah by obedience to him. And it is to guard the self from Allah's punishment due to an omission of a right action or commission of a wrong action. What is intended in one's obedience is sincerity. And Ibn Ashad says that there's four aspects to taqwa. And he says that first, it's fulfilling obligations outwardly, fulfilling obligations inwardly, avoiding prohibitions outwardly, and avoiding prohibitions inwardly. So it's interesting again here is that even within the way that taqwa is defined, this condition is necessary, right? That we we are mindful inwardly, outwardly, publicly, privately. All these conditions are embedded even in the concept of taqwa itself. So that's just, again, speaks to 
um, you know, what your, your, your level of sincerity really is, because we can all say on our tongues that we fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we really are mindful of him and that we, um, you know, are, want to uh, obey him, but the proof, as they say, is in the pudding or in the actions, right? And so that um, is determined both privately and publicly. So that's the very first foundation. So we have to commit to that. And that's where I think, obviously, alhamdulillah, the month of Ramadan is a great time of spiritual reset for many of us, all of us, hopefully, for us to really come to terms with whether or not we're truly sincere. And so there's a lot of time where we're uh, alone and maybe we're not in our normal routines because I know you know, people take time off work um, and usually, you know, there's adjustments made in our schedules for this blessed month, but we might find a lot that we have a lot more time on our hands now that we're not eating and drinking and socializing and going out and meeting friends and meeting family. And so, so what are we doing? You know, what are we doing? And so this is being the very first point is something that we should all really take inventory of ourselves and our actions and where we have been over the course of our lives and whether or not we can objectively and truthfully say that when we are alone, we are displaying taqwa. And I think that's a question we all have to ask for ourselves. Like when we are by ourselves, are we mindful of our Lord or are we distracted? And then the next question obviously would be, if we're distracted, what are we distracted by? And that's when we get to, you know, the practical steps of changing course, right? Because if we're not here yet, then, then inshallah, that's where we should be. Um, and so we'll get to that later. Uh, but the next um, you know, point of, of the, the five, right? The next one he mentions is adherence to the sunnah in word and deed. Again, you'll see it's a conditional statement. So, you know, it's very easy for some of us. I mean, I don't, you know, I, I was looking at, um, I have, I recently moved. And so I have a lot of books um, in boxes still. And I was looking through some of my boxes and uh, looking through some of my books. And I realized, Ya Allah, may Allah be gentle with us and not take us to account for all of the uh, things that we're not acting upon, right? Because I'm just overwhelmed with how many books I have. And I love books. I just yesterday went to a bookstore because I have a little bit of time. And I, I could spend a lot of time in bookstores because I love books. And I think a lot of us, you know, we may see ourselves like that. But then it's the acting upon the knowledge that we read or learn that is really important. So, you know, this concept of knowing about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi knowing his sunnah, right? Many people know his stories. Many people, many of us have sat in classes. We've read his sirah. We've listened to lectures on his sirah. Um, you know, we've, we've even taught our children or or, or other children maybe, but we have definitely engaged with the sunnah uh, on an intellectual level, right? And I think people, mashallah, I'm always impressed. Sometimes I meet people and they know like, you know, the names of the sahaba, like just, they, they know them they, they, intimately. They know so many, so many details. But again, the true uh, mark of taqwa or of whether or not you're doing this right is are you acting upon the sunnah? Because it makes very little difference if you have all of that knowledge, but then in your actions, you're nowhere near trying to at least embody the, the Prophet I mean, obviously he, he's perfect. He's, he's complete. He's, he's, he's our exemplar. And we may never achieve that level, but it's the effort that we're looking for. So if we're not even striving towards uh, really changing our, our um, customs, our ways, and to adopt his ways. And that's a deficiency that we need to contend with and ask why. And, and this is where, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of self-reflection and knowledge. You know, you have to have knowledge of yourself in order to know what you're working with, right? So that's baseline. You have to know your temperament, your personality type, and then realize that in order to be more like, be more prophetic, like you're going to have to make some adjustments, right? And so that is going to require a lot of internal spiritual work and self-development. It's going to look, you're going to have to face your blemishes. We all have them. We're all completely riddled with uh, spiritual diseases and, and shortcomings and character flaws and vices, bad habits. We all have them. But again, being, when we say adherence to the sunnah and word and deed, 
it's being so aware of those things that you want to transform in your, and then you have obviously the uh, example to model yourself after. So you're learning the, the son of the problems I sent him and it should uh, fill your heart with, um, with pride and love and joy for him, because that's also part of our faith that we love him more than we love ourselves. We should do that. But the, actual t- um, true example or, or uh, manifestation of that love comes from adopting his sunnah and really uh, ridding ourselves of anything that um, goes against his sunnah, certainly that. And then the other things that we have to modify and change and refine over time, we do it with the niyyah to try to be as much like him as we possibly can. So Again, that's foundational. These are all the, you know, as, as you know, the example goes of a, of a structure of any structure, you lay the foundation first before you build upon. So that's what we're talking about here. This is what, these are the prerequisites that we need in order to then beautify our faith, right? The, the, the process that Imam al-Ghazali refers to as the, the three steps, right? Of tahalli, tahalli, and tajalli. This is where we empty the, the, the nafs of, of disease and all these bad habits. And then we you know, start to grow in our uh, understanding and knowledge and, and beautify. And then we really aspire to be our, um, the highest forms that we can be. So it's, it's a process, but this is what's required to even get there. And that's why I think it's so um, needed right now. We need to really uh, understand this, this roadmap that he's laid out for us. So, Adherence to the Sunan word, indeed, making sure that we know the Prophet's way, and then we're also modeling that. So the way, again, we walk, the way we talk, the way we eat, the way we dress, the way we um, deal with other people, the way our transactions with human beings. What? How is it? Am I just defaulting to my personality um, or the way that my family raised me, uh, even if it's against um, you know the, the Sunnah, um, and I'm comfortable in that? And I don't really want to change. Those are the types of questions that um, we have to, again, contend with when we look at this point of, of making sure that our outward match matches our inward understanding, our outward behavior. So then the third uh, foundation, right? Indifference to whether others accept or reject one. And I love this point, again, because it's so relevant, especially in today's day and age when people... I think most of us, if not all of us, are so affected by, again, the social pressure, right? The social pressure can um, take over in many cases. And a lot of our motivations sometimes, al billah, are not for the sake of Allah. Our intentions are not for the sake of Allah. Um, they are for trying to, uh, you know, either ingratiate or, or, you know, enter certain circles, be accepted by certain people. Or that we have a fear of being rejected. And so when we let social pressure dictate our behavior and we're not really dealing, we're not on, on you know, we're not uh, facing our intentions or purifying our intentions, then that can compromise our good actions. And this is why, you know, further study of the spiritual diseases of the heart is so essential because when you realize so many of the spiritual diseases actually have to do with intention, it has to do with the starting point of your actions, then it, and this makes a lot of sense. So being indifferent to whether others accept or reject one is, 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 it's a, again, it takes a lot of internal work because we have to overcome insecurities. Um, and when you're dealing with real life, you know, situations, um, people have trauma from their family backgrounds in, you know, things growing up, maybe they're in relationships where they're not supported, they're not really encouraged, they don't have a lot of positive um, influencers. And and I use that word very carefully because I'm not talking about that word in in the context of social media, but like people in your life that are really positive people. And it's sad, but a lot of people don't have positive people in their life. They have people who are detractors or as they say, haters, a lot of the negative energy people who tend to be more critical than positive. So what that can do for anyone, and especially if you, you know, really go back into a person's history and their, and their, and their upbringing and their childhood, 
this is how we, uh, it's, a, it's a breeding ground, right, for becoming uh, more consumed with people pleasing, uh, because we're looking for love, we're looking for validation. So you have, you know, people and a lot of people, this is what's what's happened to them, maybe they didn't get the love um, and validation from their, uh, the, the par- their parents, or their other, um, you know, caretakers, or maybe, as I said, they had too much negativity. And so there was just this need for uh, for praise or acceptance that began at such an early age, and then it was never really resolved, and that continues into the adulthood. But you can see how that can spiritually compromise you if you're not dealing with those things. So really working internally to face your insecurities is really important, and then to um, to kind of step back and and start to really address how people. Um, no matter how much they, uh, you know, goodwill they may have toward you, they don't benefit you. And that I think was for me personally, anyway, a very big realization, you know, that there are a lot of things that people do for us and a lot of good that comes from human beings. But at the end of the day, of, of the day they are the seba, the means, right? The, 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 the one who is providing those blessings and gifts even the words that people share, compliments, kind words, du'a, it it all goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because every good goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every good. And so, and that doesn't mean that we don't acknowledge the good of people. That's certainly not what I'm saying because we are taught to acknowledge the good that people do for us, the kind words, the support. But it's more about the metaphysical lens, right? Because you can see the world from a very worldly perspective, like, you know, just like, as they say, horizontally what's happening. So you talk to people, you're engaging with people. And so you can just leave it at that level. But once you start to kind of zoom out a little bit and you see that Allah subhanahu is the one who sent, um, you know, that person to you at that time or in, you know, that, at that time of your life or in that moment, and um, and he's the one who's directing, you know, it all. And so if, because for example, I'll give you an example. I've had, you know, I've, you know, I've given talks, alhamdulillah, for a long time now, and or I've written posts. Um, sometimes my Facebook posts or my Instagram posts. I can't tell you. I've I have no way of even quantifying it. How many times I've had people come up to me and say. I read your post or I heard this and I feel like you were speaking exactly to my problem, like exactly everything I needed to hear. I needed to hear this today. I, I get that sometimes almost, you know, on all my posts, I've seen some comment like that, or someone will give a feedback like that. And to me, that's just subhanAllah. You know, that's what we say, you know, divine will, divine providence. That's Allah subhanAllah just working through his creation. I don't, I, I believe truly in that. And I really believe that that person, Allah SWT is communicating, you know, to them directly. And so, you know, it's just an important lens to have. And it really does help you to rid yourself when you can start to think in that way of the need for human validation. Like you don't look for it anymore because you're just like, no matter what, it's it's not them. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whether he... Um, you know, sends those positive messages through people's words or actions, or it's manifest in the blessings that I cannot enumerate, you know, enumerate. We cannot, we can never, I mean, I really think about this sometimes and I'm like, subhanAllah, it's overwhelming. If, if you've ever, if you've ever done a gratification exercise where you sit, I'm sorry, not gratification, uh, gratitude exercise where you sit and you are trying to think about all the things that you're grateful for. Um, it's happened to me several times before where I feel, I don't even know how to, like what, what is happening? Is it a physiological visceral reaction to the process? Um, is it a mental spiritual? I don't know. I, I don't know, but I feel this, um, like I'm, I'm like, it's this overwhelming feeling and all these things are emotions are coming to the surface. Um, and I actually have to, in a way, slow down because I can, I can see myself if I were to continue, I don't know, maybe it would turn into something that I don't know how to, I wouldn't know how to control because, you know, sometimes these emotional states can arise out of these exercises. 
So I felt that before because I'm like, y'all love, it's just never ending. And what I appreciate about, you know, our teachers, uh, alhamdulillah, I remember years ago, like something that I never, it never occurred to me in my entire life um, to think of was something that, you know, Sheikh Hamza had mentioned many, many years ago in one of his classes, I don't know what, but he was talking about this concept of gratitude to Allah and how much we should be doing this. And he said, you know, think about like your eyelashes. Um, and, you know, that kind of just, you know, started like this domino effect of thoughts that where I was like, yeah, because he was talking about like the blessing of eyelashes. And I was like, yeah, I've never once prior to that moment in time ever said, thank you, Allah, for giving me eyelashes. But then when he, you know, went on to describe the immense benefit of how eyelashes protect us and how, you know, there are so many people, and especially if you know people who have like alopecia or who are going undergoing cancer treatment, they lose their hair. And so that also affects their ability to be out in public because can you imagine, may Allah protect all of us, but if you don't have certain means to protect your, um, you know, your most important faculties, it would be very uncomfortable, right? And so people are suffering with these things all the time. So that was just a really interesting observation. But you see, if we're not thinking of these things, then we may never even get to that point of reflection, right? If we're not thinking that there's just too many things to be grateful for. So that once you start living in that way where you are seeing the munim, right? The, the one who is the, the, the one who blesses us all, or the source of all blessings. When all of your thoughts start to go back to him, um, that's when you break free from the shackles of needing constant human validation. And so this third point of being indifferent. So when people come and they compliment you, um, that it doesn't affect your heart where you are excited for that. You know, you may be like, Alhamdulillah. And that should really be the response that you have internally, outwardly, Alhamdulillah. And you mean it like it's all from Allah. So, you know, deflecting um, compliments, sometimes people get into like, you know, and I think culturally also and socially, um, you know, it, there's a lot of insecurity around how do we receive compliments? Because, you know, there, it's, it's something that you, you, you want to know how to do properly, right? So how do you do it properly? Well, you, def, you give credit where it's due. And so uh, we always, we should always accept compliments because they're, recognition of blessings that Allah subhanahu has given you. So you don't have to, you know, negate a compliment. So someone says something nice about you, you don't need to, um, you know, go to that extreme of wanting to show so much humility that you actually start to negate the, 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 uh, the attribute itself or the blessing itself. We don't want to do that. Um, no, 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 don't say that. That's not true. We shouldn't do that. If people make observations, just say, Alhamdulillah, because that is haq. That's that's haq. There's we didn't do anything to warrant uh, the the compliment toward to ourselves to to take uh, to attribute that to ourselves. No, nobody's done anything. Like all of it comes from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Even your most think of the thing you work the hardest to achieve, whether it's academic pursuits or you know other things that you may have accomplished in your life. Not no part of that can you truthfully and honestly say was from you alone. It's entirely by Allah's permission and his uh, gifts and for you that you were able to do those things. So that's what this is about, getting to that point of, I just don't really feel moved either way by whether or not in, people accept me or reject me because my only concern is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it, it takes a lot of, again, real deliberation to get to that point, but inshallah, we all get there because we're living in a time where I think, especially with social media and now the pressure of the political environment that we're in, where there's just a lot of um, suppression of, of our true values and beliefs because of fear, right? There's a fear that I'm going to be judged or canceled or somehow, you know, I, I, I'll get this thing taken away from you, for, from me. And that's, you know, where I think, um, unfortunately, a lot of things um, have, 
it's it's fostered a lot of harm in our world when people just silently um, acquiesce and we don't really speak up or speak speak the truth and not you know not our truth as they say nowadays where everybody has their own truth we're talking about truth haq, like speaking the truth and of course there's um, there's a way to do that we have we have guidance on how to give for example nasiha or how to speak truth, as they say, to power. There's always guidance on these things. But the point is, is not allowing the fear or the desire to be accepted by people or the fear of rejection dictate. And that is, again, foundational. So it's like, subhanAllah, you can see, um, and I don't you know, mean to overwhelm anybody, but if this is the foundation of our faith, then you can imagine how, how beautiful, you know, and, and um, you know, how much more is involved when we start to build upon that foundation. But if these are this is what our, our scholars are calling us to, the best versions of ourselves. So they're really helping us to, you know, to, to cleanse these, uh, these impurities from our soul, inshallah. So that's the third point. And on the fourth point we have is contentment with Allah in times of both hardship and ease. And again, so beautiful because this is in, you know, um, in, in, in today's world, it's very easy to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, when things are difficult because it's a coping mechanism sometimes, which is good. I mean, there's nothing uh, necessarily wrong with turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but I think a lot of us may naturally do that, right? If, and, and you can see that when a tragedy hits, um, people usually turn to their uh, to their spiritual you know, practice or faith or, or whatever. Um, it is, you know, I'm speaking generally as a human beings, right? If they have that, if they have faith. But um, the fact that he's put, again, this condition here, contentment, having rida with Allah, when things are difficult too, not just, uh, I'm sorry, when, when things are difficult, but also when they're e with ease. Because, you know, um, to be, uh, and I'm sorry, I think I'm, I'm actually, I'm switching the two here. So I apologize. Let me, let me backtrack. So the first, this point is about contentment. So it's having uh, pleasure with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being uh, content with Allah during hardship and ease, right? And that's difficult because it's easy to be happy with Allah when things are going well, right? If he's, if, if everything's, you know, um, smooth sailing, you know, your, your personal life is great, your health is alhamdulillah, your children, your family, everything's in order, finances, I mean, you would expect nothing less than for you to be grateful and to be in a good state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's kind of obvious. But what about when he withholds something? What about when um, you are put through a difficulty? Uh, are you just as content? And that's really the question here. And it's very much tied with the last point here, which is uh, they kind of are, you know, you can um, you can go between them two. They're interchangeable. But the idea is consistency, right? That you're not like you don't treat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as though, oh, and I hate using this analogy, but it's the first thing that comes to my mind as though, you know, that he is there to just whip up like your, your dreams and wishes for you, you know, like, like, you know, that, that that's all you think of when you think of Allah. And as long as he's doing that, like your prayers are being answered, your dreams are being fulfilled, your desires are being fulfilled, that you're happy with him. But once, you know, things get a little harder and more difficult that you suddenly start to turn away from him, you're now doubting, you're distrusting of his decree. Those are the types of um, things that I think, again, we have to be really addressed within ourselves. Do I do that? Do I feel constriction um, toward Allah where I, I'm just not, I don't, I don't feel as open and as full of love because now I'm going through something hard? Um, or is it consistent? Because I realize that all of it is good, as the Prophet taught us, right? Alhamdulillah, ala Like that level of awareness, again, these are things that we're all hopefully aspiring to. But to, to see it all from him, that whether it's a, a tribulation in my personal life or um, khair, there's openings, it's all from Allah. And there's lessons that I'm supposed to glean from these events instead of just wallowing or falling into a state of, again, um, distrust or disease. And, and I start to 
you know, question things. And that's, you know, these are, this is where paying attention to our thoughts, uh, making sure that we have really good people around us who can help us because Iblis, obviously, that's the other part of this. He will see us in those vulnerable states and, um, you know, he will magnify the the hardships and minimize the blessings so that we start to fall into these really negative states. And so catching ourselves and saying, wait a second, where was I? You know, um, I mean, when, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was, was blessing me for years and years and years, and this is why learning, for example, the story of Prophet Ayub alayhi salam and other prophets is so important because they give us that perspective. Like they lived years of abundance and, and joy and, and khair. And so when the hardships came, they weren't suddenly, you know, having a crisis of faith. They were totally accepting that this is from the same source. And so that's how we can contend with, uh, with whether or not we have rida with Allah consistently. And then the last point, again, is very much tied, but it's really about action, right? Like, what is what is our protocol? So when you're in a state of prosperity that Allah has given you all these blessings, right? Are you continuously turning to him? Are you getting up every night uh, for your, you know, the hajjud and, and your prayers, uh, making sure you're doing them all on time as early as possible, are you engaging with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are you doing your da- daily adhkar? Are you doing that um, in times of prosperity? Or, as I was saying earlier, is it something that you do naturally or reflexively when things are, you know, when you're scared? There's a fear element, right? We go into panic mode. And we saw a lot of this, for example, during COVID. You know, you can just think back on the fear that took over so many people. Many people found faith, right, that they didn't have before, which is alhamdulillah good. Guidance in any which way is good, right? But it's about, you know, consistency. That if we're not, if we if we only, and I remember like, um, it was like an ongoing kind of joke when I was in school or college, but finals week was the time where everybody was suddenly super religious, you know, because we're... We're all worried that, uh oh, you know, we want to get the best grades. So people start to pray and some would even fast. And they were very serious because they were scared that, you know, I need I need to do well. And so I have to turn to God right now. But then as soon as they got, you know, the results, um, then then they weren't doing the same. So that's the problem with, you know, the, the mind that doesn't understand that really. And if you look at all five of these points, the message that I hope should be very clear to all of us is it's really about consistency. And every single point, he's emphasizing that you can't have this, you know, difference, this cognitive dissonance or this, uh, you know, outward and, and inward duplicity where you're just a different person, you know, in, in private and public and you're not consistent. Consistency is, again, I mean, it's it's one of the one of the many beautiful virtues of the Prophet's life that I'm that we also need to uh, to be aware of that he didn't have these these dual sides. He was a very consistent person, and that that's not to say that he didn't have his private life with his you know family more intimately than he when he was in social in social settings. Of course, that's just natural. But we're talking about character. We're talking about you know one's lived experience being aligned with their faith, regardless of people. Right, regardless of of who's watching, who's around, and I think it it takes um, a great deal of practice, inshallah, to get there. And may Allah subhanahu give us all the faith to get there. But again, what I love about this, you know, roadmap that Sidi Ahmed Zeruk has put out is he's laying it for us. He's he's given us the tools. He's given it to us the criteria for what we need to really build upon. And so. There's so much to explore with this, um, and there's a lot more to be said and shared. But let's read from this paragraph, um, and then we can maybe stop if there's some time for Q and A. Um, here's the, this paragraph that follows right uh, at the bottom. It says, "The realization of mindfulness of Allah is through scrupulousness and uprightness." So now He's giving us the practicum, right? Like, how do we actually do this? So if you want. Uh, to have true taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to be mindful of him. You have to be thinking of him. 
Um, and every moment you really can, if you, if you try hard enough, you look at um, what you're doing, you know, in the moment, and we can maybe go through some exercises where we do this, but just how you can train your mind to, to, to like create a little trail that goes back to a lot. It's not difficult. It's actually easy to do. And I've, I've, you know, kind of in my own life forced that process because I wanted to, to try to do that. So at every moment I'll try to find something, you know, I mean, obviously I'm not perfect and I definitely fall short, but it's something that if we're deliberate about, inshallah, we can do more uh, than, than not doing it at all. So being mindful of Allah um, is through scrupulousness and uprightness. So again, just being uh, aware of oneself, being upright, having, um, you know, the, 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 the understanding of what good character is and all of the uh, virtuous uh, behaviors that we should be embodying as Muslims, just following the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is the second point here. The realization of adherence to the sunnah is through caution and excellent character. The realization of indifference to others, acceptance or rejection is through patience and trust in Allah. And that's really, again, beautiful that we, because people will disappoint us, people will hurt us. So I think the the more we te- we learn to lower our expectations of the creation of Allah, then the more we will increase our expectation of the creator. And that's really comes through patience and just taqwa and and tawakkal, you know, just trust, putting our our, uh, confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Uh, That in shakartum la zidannakum, if you're grateful, I'll increase you. So knowing that the gifts are coming, and then anandi thani abdi bi, all of these beautiful, um, you know, teachings and principles of our faith that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is incentivizing us with, right? That if you, uh, I am in the opinion of my servant, so just be mindful, uh, but have the best opinion of Allah, and He will show you in due time. And then the realization of contentment is through acceptance to what one is given, and turning over the management of one's affairs to Allah. So, you know, Rida, again, it's a station to get to this point of really being content with Allah. And people are going to, we're all going to go through different struggles in our lives where this lesson may be really the, the, the point to, 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 to make sure that we're getting this lesson that maybe, for example, again, something may be withheld from us for some period of time. Um, we may be in that limbo of uncertainty, which is very difficult if you've ever been there before. If you don't know if something is going to unfold a certain way, uh, whether it's with your health or your personal, you know, your personal relationships, it's very difficult to be patient. But um, to surrender or to, you know, to turn over one's affairs to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is so beautiful, right? It's just such a beautiful concept that Allah, I, I, I'm incapable. I, I have no way of seeing this through. I can't see the future. I don't know what's in my good. And that's why I saw is such a gift for us because we are literally asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take over our affairs when we beseech him in that way. But it's such a gift because it's true and we are surrendering to our creator. And that's what he loves to see. The more we surrender and show our confidence and faith in our creator the more content he is with us and then it's that's where you know you know that the ease will come after the difficulty but he's he sometimes puts us through certain trials to get to that level where we really have surrendered so it's inshallah may allah um give us all of that uh, i mean give us all that uh, ability to get there inshallah And then the realization of turning back to Allah is through praise and gratitude in times of prosperity and taking refuge in him in times of affliction. Again, beautiful, because the more mindful we are of him and just constantly, alhamdulillah, you know, really being in that state of just abundant gratitude. And, you know, uh, and I I actually um, like to call it even actionable gratitude because Gratitude isn't just saying alhamdulillah. I mean, it's part of it. It's shukr al-lisan. So it's the, the gratitude of the tongue. But it has to be deeply rooted in the heart, right? So shukr al-qalb is, is really more important. That you truly feel grateful to Allah. You know, that it's not just something you're saying. Um, but, you know, and, and a good exercise would be the next time someone does something for you, 
catch yourself because sometimes we'll say, thank you so much. Right. And we say it because it's that social etiquette. You know, someone does something nice to you, you should say thank you. But how many of us take a moment and think about that? Like, I'll tell you just on Friday, I mean, I'll, I just thought of it right now. Um, on Friday, I was teaching, I teach Alhamdulillah at a, a wonderful school, uh, North Star, uh, which is here in the Bay Area, Alhamdulillah. And many of our Rahman uh, founders and teachers are part of that school as well. Um, make dua please for the success of the school and all the students and families. But I was teaching there, alhamdulillah, and just at the, at the end of the class, right when we're all about to leave, one of my lovely students comes and she hands me, let me see if I can get it for you. I think I have it. She hands me this beautiful bag. And first of all, <laughs> this bag, it, oh, I don't know if you can see it. Not probably because I have a filter. Oh, wait, no, it's hiding my face. There you can see it. <laughs> she gives me this beautiful bag. And I, if you... If you know me, I love this Zilij print. I have a lot of things in my house with this print. Um, so, I, And her mother, actually, mashallah, is the one who uh, put this gift together. So she knows my love for her. But I think, she, anyway, she gave, mashallah, gifts to uh, the teachers. And I was very fortunate to be counted among them, um, although I don't work full time. But anyhow, so she gives me this gift. And I just was, like, so taken aback, not because I was surprised at her giving me a gift. She's they're a very beautiful family. But, you know, I had been having one of those days uh, just feeling heavy. This is a heavy time for my family and I, um, as it's, there's just a lot of things that happened in my, in our family. My father's uh, eight year passing uh, anniversary will be in just a few days. My mother was, Allah Yerhamha, and I, Allah Yerhamhu, uh, she was ill last uh, year at this time. So I, I've just been feeling very heavy uh, thinking about them. And, you know, she didn't know that. And I was, you know, just teaching mode, but she gave me this gift and it just like hit me, you know, with like real, um, because it's a law, right? He, he's the one who, who's, who, put, who puts, you know, these, these thoughts, uh, you could say, in, in the minds of his creation. Like, you know, we meet people all the time. Someone thought of you, you know, and they put together a beautiful gift. And then they came without knowing at all that you were having a heavy day. And they gave you this beautiful gift. And it's got so many wonderful things in it. And they had no idea that they were going to make such an impact on your heart. But when you step back and you say, Alhamdulillah. And that's Allah, right? He's working through his creation. That's the shukr al-qal. That's what we should be aiming for. Like that degree of thank you, Allah. You see us. And you, you remove pain in this way. You know, so that, that's where the gratitude moves from the tongue to the, it's, it's, it's in the heart. And then, it's the actions that you do that follow, right? The dua that you make for that family, you know, the 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 well wishes that you wish for them. And then inshallah, maybe you'll have the opportunity to gift them as well, right? The had of the habu. We should be giving gifts because this will increase love for, for one another. The Prophet taught us. So this is real gratitude right that we we have that awareness that Allah subhanahu wa is always the one where every good that we have is from him there's nowhere else that you know that that you can attribute the good of your life nobody else your parents yes they're again the means but it's Allah who blessed you with those parents so alhamdulillah being uh, mindful in times of prosperity and then when things happen, right? When, when calamities hit, which they will, that we immediately turn to Allah. That our first thought is, Ya Allah. And I'll give you again an example. Um, you know, when, when my mother, Allah Rahma, was in the hospital last year, there was a, a period where, and I'll just share this because it's relevant and I'm already an emotional mess, so why not? <laughs> but um, subhanAllah, when there was a point where she was in the hospital and this was before we knew the gravity of her state, we didn't know how, how diff 
what was going to come. So there was a lot of momentum and, you know, we were looking forward for treatments and all of this. And so I had spent some time in the hospital uh, with her. And at one point I needed to go home because I had a, I slept basically at the hospital in the car. I was just there for a few days, Abdullah. And I decided I need to come home for a break uh, to just to, to basically freshen up. And, and then I was going to go back. So I sought her permission. She was still alhamdulillah, awake at that time. And I said, I'll be back. I just need to go, you know, and it was a bit of a drive. I said, I'll be back. And so I came home and this is where, again, Allah, he's going to test you. I had just seen her. I just spoke to my mother um, and my sister was with her. She was not alone. Everything seemed fine. I came home. I saw my children and husband after a few days. I went to freshen up and shower and I came out and it was about a 15 minute window. And this is what I mean when calamity strikes. A 15 minute window of me feeling somewhat like, you know, normal, as you can say, because I felt like I was in an alternate universe. Um, when I came out, my phone was just buzzing, like it was blowing up with message after message after message. And I was like freshly out of the shower. I'm just trying, and I see these messages and I, immediately was like yeah a lot because it was uh my my sister was with my mother and she had an unfortunate uh um issue come up and it was it was very very serious basically she had cardiac arrest um while my sister was in a room with her and so i'm seeing these text messages completely anything. I just was calling on a lot and I immediately ran out of the house. I don't know, it was record time. I got in my car and the entire car, I just, I cried more in that maybe than I ever have in my life. And I just begged him to please not take her from us. I, it was, I couldn't even bear the thought of that. Like it was, I just saw her, how? And I just said, please, don't take her suddenly from us. I just, I can't, we're not ready. I, I don't know what to do. And I begged and I begged. But my point in sharing is the doctors were with her. She's in a hospital. The nurses were there. My sister, family members were there for her. Nobody could help her. Nobody helped her in that moment. Allah does with his dominion what he wills. And he in the moment that I left, just, you know, put her and all of us through that test. But it's, again, he can do that. Our response to that is where we show our belief in him. And I just, for me at that point, it was like, Ya Allah, you're the only one. I can't call on anybody at this point. And alhamdulillah, you know, we got to the hospital. And although she suffered, uh, uh, you know, um, an incident was very serious, code blue, all of it, the whole thing. Alhamdulillah, they had stabilized her and she was again awake. And it was just like, oh my God, thank you, Allah. Thank you for hearing on it, hearing us. Thank you for accepting our dua that this, please don't take her from, from us. Um, but, you know, it wasn't long after that he took his crea creation back. He called her back and that was his will. And we had to, as a family, deal with that. It was, it was, that was our test, but this is life. This is dunya. So in times of affliction, the only refuge is Allah. And I'm telling you from my experience, that was the hardest test of my life, weeks at the hospital, but you can ask the people closest to me in my life. I really couldn't even talk to people. I just, you get to a point where you realize I just need Allah and that's it. And the Quran was my best friend. Um, and the prayer mat was my best friends. And that's 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 what we need to really realize. If we want to get through the trials of this dunya, refuge is Allah. He's the only refuge we need. Alhamdulillah. So I think I did, um, I went over, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. But Asada Fadwa, if we have time to go over some questions or comments, I, I, I'm happy to stay a little longer, maybe 10, 15 minutes. 
Thank you, Sada Hosai, for that uh, beautiful introduction to the text, as well as just kind of laying the foundation for us. And um, it wouldn't be a class with you, Sada Hosai, if you didn't share something to really move our hearts. Um, let's take a few moments to answer some of these questions that we have. Um, we have questions in both the Q&A as well as, uh, as the chat. Just going forward, it's um, easier for us to follow the questions in the Q&A because the chat is moving. Um, so if you put your questions in the Q&A, &A, it's easier for us to follow. Um, would you like me to read the questions or do you want to? Sure. If, if you want to point me to the questions that you vetted, uh, that's helpful too. Or you can read them, however. Okay. Um, I'm just going to start with the Q&A just as a, as a sort of disciplining. That way we know that students next week, inshallah, will use the Q&A. <laughs> so I'll start there. It says, Assalamu alaikum, Stada Hosai. Can you please address the idea of spiritual bypassing in the context of detaching from dunya? How can we strike a balance in being emotionally present and available in this life while working towards our akhirah and not becoming flooded by dunya? MashaAllah, great question. Jazakallah khairan. You know, it's it's um, something that I think maybe the easiest way that I can answer it is, you know, there are um, others who've written on this topic of just becoming more self-reliant and the detachment process. But I did write an article that for me, it was kind of my own way of uh, coming to this point of realization that I really want to not have these attachments. Um, and so I wrote an article for a Medina Institute. Let me see if I can find it, but I feel like it really does help on this topic of how we can move away from our attachments of dunya and become more self-reliant, all based on the sunnah. This is actually a prophetic practice. And he encouraged us to not have attachments to even uh, people and to not ask for people of things. Uh, you know, these are things that I think more of us need to speak on. Um, and I know it's a delicate balance because obviously we're, we're in the world, we have relationships, we have to, you know, we, we, we're constantly, um, I mean, there are rights that we have over people and, and obligations. So there is this, uh, you know, balance that we have to find. But I think if you, for me, I, I feel like so much of this gets resolved when we adopt a mindset and then we're fixed in that mindset. So our mindset has to be that metaphysical akhira mindset. And once you have that mindset, then the other things kind of just start to make sense. So I'll try to find the article, um, inshallah. Let me see if I can do that. And, and, you can also so, share it next week, but if you find it in the meantime, we can always share uh, via email. Okay. Or it should be week. a quick. Okay. Quick in the meantime, I'm going to um, read you the next question, inshallah. It says, Mashallah, Stada Husay, everything you have said is on point and relatable. You mentioned the lack of love as a younger child that manifests as we become adults in society. How can we stay strong when we still seek the love from our parents, knowing we can't force anyone to love us in an affectionate way? But I guess my question is more pertinent to the patience needed to accept this. Being a daughter of immigrants posed the effect of receiving love in the means of meeting our basic needs and meeting our educational needs. But there was always a lack of love in a relationship. Yeah, mashallah. I think, you know, I can also, um, in a way, speak about this because, you know, when you have multi, uh, like sibling families, you can, some, some children, it's all like mentioned, Shagam's actually mentioned this recently about like hierarchies that even within family systems, birth order, there are hierarchies. So some children get more love and others just don't. And I think some of us may have even had that experience where we get lost in the shuffle because there's too many and, and parents can only do so much, especially immigrant parents who are dealing with all the challenges of coming to a new country and starting over. So being forgiving that it's not personal because sometimes we personalize things um, because it, you know, speaks to those the insecurities we may have, uh, and maybe we have m poor memories that are really hard to erase. So we start to build like a narrative. But at the end of it, when you have a, a more broader, holistic view of things, you start to see that I'm personalizing. In my case, for example, my mother. I mean, we, she, you know, we're Afghani, and so she came from the Pashtun culture that was not very demonstrative. It was not a very affectionate, uh, it's not a very, I mean, for women anyway, you know, some of our women are very tough women. And so my mother um, growing up, she was, you know, tough, but she was also tough because she was put in a very difficult situation to raise five kids, leave her home country, leave everything behind, not speak the language, have to barely you know survive on whatever means that my father could produce she was a homemaker so she had all of that context that as a child you don't you're not aware of you're not cognizant of 
but as an adult, you are. So for myself, I started to really, once I had children, start to see my mother in a very different light growing up than I did when I was younger, which I did feel I was, you know, the fourth in line. And, you know, my mother and I, we kind of had our uh, differences growing up in my teenage years. So, and I was a bit of a black sheep, you know, I wore, uh, I mean, I came to Islam and I did a lot of things that didn't, um, I mean, I kind of broke the, 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 the pat or the expect ex expectations, I guess I, I challenged some of those expectations. So anyway, my point is, is it was, it wasn't until later on when I started to really see how much my mother went through and that empathy that I had for her made me realize I personalized so much that was not personal. My poor mom, like she was just trying to survive. And that actually completely changed my relationship with her. And we became very close, uh, alhamdulillah, up until, uh, you know, her passing. Um, you know, alhamdulillah, my, I'm, I'm very grateful to Allah. I was able to take her to Umrah, alhamdulillah. We had a lot of great times together, just talking. She would call me uh, for therapy <laughs> because after, uh, my father passed away a lot of humble. She really had a lot of emotions. And so I, I just, we had a different connection, but you have to find the empathy within yourself to see your parents as they're, they're not always deliberate. Inshallah, nothing is ever deliberate. I mean, that's not to say there aren't, and I'm not speaking about your parents, but there are parents who, um, you know, may have, may, may have harmed their children. May Allah forgive them. But I think a lot of our parents may have inadvertently caused harm but the Nia wasn't to harm. And once you come to that point, you can forgive them. But then also the other part of it, which is Allah, you know, like I, you know, I'll, to, to start to prioritize, you know, the love that you have for Allah and wanting his rida for you just starts to make your human relationships, yes, important, but not as important. Because when Allah becomes your, you know, your um, focus, then he will start to fill you with uh, a level of, again, rada within yourself that will heal a lot of these wounds. And I'm speaking from personal experience. You know, I've, I've lived through a, a few different things in my life where I feel like it's only the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that healed those wounds for me, nothing else. Only the love of Allah. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. There's sort of a, a flip side question to this idea of, um, you know, it says, how do you navigate family environments where there is an unset expectation to make appearances when you are someone that has the mindset of, I have no need to please others or look for praise in those environments. So sort of like that's a little switch. If you're only looking to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then in that, in that way, you have no need to please others or look for praise in the environments. How, how does that, I can see that sort of as like uh, going too far to, the, to one side on, you know, the flip side. How, how would you uh, address that? Yeah, that's that. I'm sorry. Is this in the? I want to read this. Question. It's in the. Yeah, it's in the Q and A. Is it already answered or is it open? Uh, no, it's in the open. Open. Yeah. yeah family members where there's an unsaid. Okay. So if you if and I I'm assuming I don't know sister if this is the case but I'm assuming maybe you are a trophy child, right? Because sometimes our parents like to showcase uh, us for different reasons. So if you find that you're being used in that way, you know, and it's putting you, it's kind of making you maybe, um, you know, like it's, it's difficult to reconcile your Nia because of it. Then I would just say, you know, make your intention bit. If it's your parents that are asking you to do things, but you're not in it for the praise, you, you don't really want to do things for uh, others to, to know or acknowledge you, but you're doing it for your parents, then just make it your Nia that, I'm doing this for the sake of Allah to please them so that they are pleased with me because that is also a huge part of our faith that we seek out every opportunity to praise our parents. And if it means, you know, kind of putting ourselves in, in awkward situations for their sake, as long as internally there's no conflict, there's no ulterior intention, then there shouldn't be an issue. And inshallah, Allah accepts your niya. Um, because you're you're doing it for that beautiful intention. I hope that was in line with the question. Yeah, I think I think you brought it back to Bidil Wadi Dane, which is a really good reason to do things. <laughs> Sometimes we feel like uh, you know 
we don't want to because it may put us out there or we're showing off or something. But if you can just bring it back to just putting joy in the heart of your parents, it goes Absolutely. a long way in terms of um, our relationship with Las Fontana. Absolutely. Um, there's one last one. When struggling with low self-esteem more often than not, you find the confidence in people's words and acceptance to what you've done. And when they don't, you start to question where you went wrong. How do you shift that reliance back to Las Fontana and not what people say to you or about you? Yeah, that's a great question. And again, I'm I'm giving you like real lived experience here because, you know, as you know, being in, in, in a public figure, you end up getting a lot of attention from people. And so then there is a time I remember before I even understood the diseases of the heart where I absolutely, I know I did. I had, you know, Ria for sure, uh, Suma, probably all the diseases of the heart that deal with wanting to be known and recognized and people saying things to you and complimenting you. I had all of it. And like you said, you be, you kind of grow a dependency on it. And then when they don't do it, you start to doubt yourself. But over time, as I said, when you start to peel back the layers um, and see that sometimes, you know, people are... They just, you know, they say things that maybe they're genuine. Maybe they're just saying that because that's an expectation uh, that they think that you need to hear something, you know, um, but it's not always necessarily um, true. You know, some people do flatter. People do give empty compliments. It's just a fact. So I have just over the years realized like I, inshallah, and may I'll always keep it so, but I don't put a lot of weight in, in the compliments that I receive. I'm very self-critical. So for me, it's whether or not, um, you know, I feel like I, I put my best effort into something. If I did something with, inshallah, Ihsan, with Itqan, um, and I, I feel that I put my best effort, then I feel the the taysir will come, you know, the facilitation comes, the tawfiq comes, but I don't necessarily look for, you know, the compliments. I'm looking at it more like, you know, in terms of the effectiveness, the impact. So I think looking at the impact of your actions is more important than looking at how people perceive you as a result of what you do or say. Like, you know, and I, again, I'm, you know, I'm speaking from a very personal experience, but I think generally just no longer seeking people's praise because you realize like there's very little value in what someone says to you if it's not true. And the true way, the true measure of yourself is with a lot, like how, you know, because people could think all sorts of things about you. They could think you're the nicest, wonder, most pious person ever. But if that's not true, then why did that compliment impact you, right? It's just, it's just a perception. Whereas the truth, it's like a mirror. The truth is your, you know, relationship with Allah. And if you're striving, you're working hard, you're getting up, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you're self-critical, you're doing your muhasibah, then that is a greater indication of your truth and your true essence and value than anything that anybody has to say about you, no matter who that person is, because they don't know you. The only one who truly knows you is your Lord. Jazakallah khairan, if you could just end with the closing du'a for the... Sure. Yes, Jazakallah khairan again. And I'm sorry that I didn't get to all the questions, but if there's a way to maybe log these questions... Uh, we did, we, we hit all of them. Okay, and even in the chats, because if yeah. there's anything in yeah, the chat I went that through. I didn't yeah, get, yeah. yeah, please. No, I did. Okay. okay. All right, Jazakallah khairan. All right, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa la asr inna l-insana la bi khusr illa ladina amanu wa amiru salihati wa tawasu bil haqqi wa tawasu bil sabr. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله جزاكم الله خيرا everyone inshallah we will see you next week at the same time on monday and if there are any other questions you have please send them our way thank you so much Thank you, Ustada Fadwa. Thank you. And inshallah, we'll send out a, a one-day reminder and a one-hour reminder for class, as well as uh, the link for the text in um, via email. So it should come from Zoom, and it will have this, it'll be the same link. Um, and please encourage others to log on and join this wonderful class, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair. Ah.
Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. Inshallah, we will begin shortly. Um, uh, Ustad Fadwa is not able to be here today, so I'm kind of doing this on my own solo. So just bear with me as I bring up all my slides and get everything ready, inshallah. All right, alhamdulillah. So uh, first of all, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Mawlana wa Habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, taslima al kathira. If you're here for the first time, welcome. Alhamdulillah, we are, this is our second session, uh, Foundations of the Spiritual Path. Um, the recording did go out, so if you didn't, if you weren't here for last week, inshallah, you can watch the recording uh, when you're, uh, when, when it's convenient for you. Uh, but we'll continue the text, inshallah, where we left off. Um, before that, though, if you remember, I um, made mention last week that I was uh, trying to memorize the dua for studying, and I shared it with all of you. So I'll be reciting that for a brief moment, and then we'll begin the, the actual uh, text, inshallah. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatiha lima ughliqa wal-khatimi lima sabaqa nausul al-haqqi bil-haqqi al-hadi ila siratika al-mustaqim wa ala alihi haqqa qadrihi wa miqdarihi al-azim Allahumma aftah alayna futuh al-arifin wa wafiqna tawfiqa al-salihin wa anfa'na Allahumma bil-Qur'an wa dhikr al-Hakim Allahumma alimna ma yinfa'na wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna ilman yuqarribuna minka bi rahmatika ya arhamu al-rahimin اللهم لا سحل إلى ما جعلته سحلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم وتجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سهلا اللهم عذنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستقبلك ونتبو إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله آمين آمين وأجمعين الله أكسبت عن بهاف الأبرمون هير الحمد لله um, so the text that we are reading from is Foundations. I'm going to also pull that up. Uh, hopefully you have your uh, PDF as well, inshallah. We can all read together. Um, just again, bear with me as I bring up. There it is. Okay. So now, where did my Zoom screen go? <laughs> Too many screens. Wow. Um, okay. I lost my Zoom screen. It's hilarious. There you are. There I am. <laughs> All right, one moment, the screen share. So here we go. So just a quick review for those who are joining us maybe today for the first time. We mentioned last week uh, just some uh, biographical information about Sidi Ahmed Zaruk, who authored this text. Sheikh Hamza translated it. Um, and then we introduced it, uh, starting with just this section here. So... Uh, we read only a small part of it. This is actually a pretty lengthy text, uh, so I don't know how much we'll be able to get done in Ramadan. Um, we may possibly have to go beyond Ramadan, but inshallah, we'll do our best. So just a summary. Basically, the text is a roadmap for the seeker, for the person on the spiritual path, for the student of knowledge, for all of us to really be able to um, you know, clearly build upon a foundation. And so it's called Foundations of the Spiritual Path. And what he does is he introduces first the foundation, like what is required, what is the prerequisite of someone who actually is on this path. And he lists those at, very, at the very beginning. And then he works backwards um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, mentioning what would be required to get to, the, to these foundations. So we started off by um, explaining and just giving commentary on what these foundations are. So for example, uh, and again, I'll just quickly summarize them. We have the first one being taqwa, mindfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, privately and publicly, uh, and then adherence to the sunnah in both word and deed, indifference to whether others accept or reject one, uh, contentment with Allah in times of both hardship and ease, and then turning to Allah in prosperity and adversity. And so again, we point, I pointed this out last week, but there's there are conditionals here. You know, these are taqwa, of course, is a given as Muslims, we all understand taqwa, but the conditionals that he provides are that it has to be consistent. You have to be a consistent person, right? You can't just have a persona um, and show up, 
you know, part time uh, as being a person who has taqwa because other people might be around you. Um, so he puts those uh, conditionals uh, actually on each each point here. There are conditionals, but the first one is that you are uh, you have that taqwa and you can maintain it even when you're by yourself. Um, and that's obviously a station to get to that level of awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It requires work, which is what we're going to uh, start to now explain um, the, the prerequisites to getting to even to these five. So there's that consistency factor. And then the same with the sunnah, right? Um, many of us, as, as I mentioned last week, we may be very well aware of you know, uh, aspects of the Prophet's life, certain teachings, because we've heard them, you know, we've heard them our whole lives, maybe our parents or relatives or from our teachers at, at the masjid or Islamic school, Sunday school. So we may know them, but knowing them is only part of it. It's the action that has to follow. So there has to also be, um, you know, it has to show that you uh, understand, you know, who the, the Prophet was, that he is uh, our exemplar and you are doing your best to emulate him, and that would show obviously in your actions. Uh, so you're you're constantly trying to better yourself according to his way. Um, so the, you know, and everything. This is where adapting, for example, the sunnas would obviously be the first point. Like, what were the sunnas of the Prophet? How did he begin his day? How did he? What are what are the different um, you know actions that he did throughout the day? Where did he spend his most of his time? And then what are the accompanying duas for those actions? Right, because obviously he was a human like us, and so he he did many of the th same things that we do, but he also taught us how to do it best. Right, so when he uh, got dressed, for example, you know, starting his day, he 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 did so in the best manner. And so he's showing us uh, those steps, you know, how he started with his right and then his left, and then the dua of actually wearing clothes um, when he would enter or use the restroom, leave the restroom. There's all these beautiful duas that we should know, and we should certainly be able to almost imagine him um, as we're doing them, because that's what a guide is. It's someone that you try to uh, to emulate and follow. So. To that degree, we should be familiar with his sunnah and then obviously put that into action in our own practice. So the duas that we say should follow his uh, duas. And just to even teach our children that this is how we protect them, right? We're at a time of immense fitna, of immense fitna. And if we're not giving our children the best course, then all of these other deviation, deviated uh, paths will start to um, to take hold of them because you know we're 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 denying them, which is one of the rights of children, uh, the this this knowledge. So we have to be very mindful. But first, obviously, we need it for ourselves. So the sunnah is um, again we have to be consistent. And then the third point is also very important that once you uh, embark on this path to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, you don't concern yourself with the opinions of other people. And we have to also qualify that a little bit because we do have social responsibility. We have responsibilities to our family, our community. So this is not, you know, what we find today, which is, you know, I'm going to do me and I don't care how it affects other people. That's not what this is. This is a matter of your heart. This is a matter of not being compelled to action because you're trying to impress people or you're trying to avoid being ostracized. Because what that does is it it's 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 a it's an issue because the intention has to be for the sake of Allah. But when we start to, you know, factor in other people, then it's no longer purely for His sake. So learning how to do things truly because we want His pleasure, we want His rida with us, right? We want Him to uh, we want to to be pure and sincere in our devotion to Him. But if we're also bringing in, you know, this group or that group or this teacher or that teacher uh, into our heart, then this would be a compromise of that pure intention. So that's why the indifference is, is again, we, you have to work on yourself because you have to really um, have those conversations with yourself. Like, why would I seek the approval of other people? You know, and that type of line of questioning, you'll, it's a, it's, it's a self-discovery process because maybe there's, you know, factors like, you know, if you, for example, um, are familiar with, you know, children who come from multi-sibling households, we know from research that some children, depending on where they fall in the order, 
may be susceptible to excessive people pleasing, right? Uh, so if you're a middle child, uh, you know, you may um, have what they call the middle child syndrome, which is you felt pretty neglected growing up because your parents' attention was uh, given so many, so much to the siblings before you and the siblings after you, but maybe so, you somehow got lost in the shuffle, which is a very lived and real experience, you know. And um, you know, I've, I, as someone who comes from a household of five or five of us, I certainly felt that growing up. You know, I felt uh, I was, I'm fourth in line, but I do I do feel like I kind of had the uh, the um, the middle child uh, effect because I I felt it growing up. But recently, uh, Sheikh Hamza actually was speaking about hierarchies, you know, that hierarchies are real. And he brought that point to, to this, um, you know, to, to, to uh, or he brought that perspective that this is from Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually puts us in these systems, in these family systems, in order for us to uh, to learn, right, that that some he gives to some and he doesn't give to others. So it's it's very intentional that we experience these things. Right. Um, so if you're aware of yourself and you know that that might be uh, something that you grapple with, then when you have this this introspection, this, you know, where you're asking yourself, like, why do I always seek people's validation? Then maybe you can arrive at, you know, at the same conclusion, which is I didn't maybe get that from my parents. Right. The Navara. And we've talked about this uh, or I've talked about this in previous talks. But, you know, um, Imam Ghazali and others reference uh, the potent eye of the mother and the father, but specifically the mother, that we as mothers have an immense power given to us, which is our attention, right? So children, we know they seek undivided attention, but mostly from their mother figure. So, or the, you know, that the main caretaker who's taking care of them. So when we are deprived of that, then we go looking for, as they say, love in all the wrong places, right? And so a lot of children who did not get the attention from their mothers may start to seek it elsewhere. And this is certainly relevant in today's uh, you know, uh, uh, state. I mean, look around and you see a lot of children who were not raised uh, by their, their parents. Um, in many cases, they're being raised by other people because of the way our societies are structured. You know, a lot of people are working out uh, or both now we have double income homes. And so the child get either has a nanny or maybe a daycare or a school drop off. So they get, um, you know, get lost. And now you're competing with not two, three, four, five, which would be maybe normal in a family, but you're competing with 30 students, right, uh, for attention from an adult. And, uh, and that can really affect uh, the child's self, you know, image and view. So a lot of these things are very real human experiences, but once you start to pay attention to your own self and what drives your behavior, it can he help to heal some of those even past wounds. And you know, there are many people who have unfortunately been deprived of that love that they uh, that was their right. Uh, but Subhanallah, you know, the love of Allah can absolutely heal all of that. So that's what this process is. It's getting to that point of. I don't really need to worry about being accepted or rejected by the people because if I have Allah, I have enough, right? I have more than enough. I don't need human beings when I have uh, the creator. And so that that's really uh, what, what the point is here. And then contentment with Allah in times of both hardship and ease and turning to Allah in prosperity and adversity are, are similar in the sense that, again, you're consistent and you have the right understanding that that you have to um, not change your opinion of Allah based on your circumstances, right? That your fidelity, your loyalty, your love is true, pure, unconditional to your creator because you realize that all of your blessings um, are from him. And even if things aren't going well at certain points of your life, that doesn't mean that you turn from him, but that you know that there's wisdom. Because when you have trust uh, in, in you know, someone, or, or in this case, obviously, Allah, when you have trust in Allah, you don't doubt um, the, the reasons certain things have to ha happen the way they do. You, you know automatically that there is hikmah, but maybe that's something that you, are, you have to wait in order to learn or, or for it to be unveiled to you. But you don't doubt that it's actually there. You, you know that it must be uh, khair because it's from Allah. 
So that's what, what is required for this path, that level of absolute, unconditional, unwavering trust in Allah, knowing that he always has your best interests and whatever his decree is for you is always better than anything you could have decreed for yourself with certainty, right? With yaqeen that you have um, that level of, of understanding. So alhamdulillah, I'm just going to, I think my my screen um, share got bumped off, but we'll wait for, uh, alhamdulillah, I'm happy to see you. I think it's Ustada Fadwa. If you can please uh, re uh, give me back. Oh, there we go. You did it. Thank you. So I'll just go ahead and go back to the screen here. We're happy to have you here. Alhamdulillah. So we're just doing a quick summary and then we're going to jump into the lesson for today. So, um, you know, having that understanding, again, turning to Allah in both times of hardship and ease and um, uh, I'm sorry, contentment with Allah in both uh, hardship and ease and turning to Allah in prosperity and adversity. So now the first is like your your understanding of who Allah is. It's your aqidah, right? The second point is your your protocol. Like, what do you do? What is your protocol for when you have hardship are you the person that uh, falls apart and goes you know completely into panic mode because you really um don't have you know you're just worried and, and this fear overcomes you or is it uh that you have that trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make things easy for you and you just patience you know, you kind of, you've read the stories, you know about uh, these lessons that we've been given. So this is what's required. And alhamdulillah, that was, you know, last week's discussion mainly. So inshallah, we can, um, if again, you're welcome if you're new, but you can go back and watch the recording to get more commentary on those five. For today, we're going to start with the building blocks, I guess you could say, of the foundations, right? Like what uh, what are the, pre, the, the first pre, uh, prerequisites for these five? So again, I love the, the way he structured uh, this, this whole uh, um, text, mashallah, it's beautiful. But the first one he says, mentions, is exalted aspirations. So basically, if you want to get to that level that we just described, this, this amazing the foundation, right, then you would need to have uh, high aspirations. You have to have high himma, right? You cannot be a person who's willing to uh, settle with medio- mediocrity in yourself. Uh, especially, right? Because, you know, sometimes, again, we get lost uh, in, in our own, you know, whatever we're, we're busy with, with our work, with our families. But when it comes to your work for the sake of Allah, you have to be a person who understands ihsan, itqan, right? Th- that you perform with the best, that you, ch- you strive for it. So it's not good enough for you if you, um, you know, and I'll give you an example. For example, <clears throat> There's times where, you know, I, I'm out and about and I come home and I'm rushing to come home because I have to pray, right? I wasn't able to do it outside, so I have to pray. Um, but, you know, it's kind of one of those situations. I don't know if you guys are like this, but I'm like this where uh, as soon as I get home, you know, because I'm, I've been out all day, I, uh, I end up, you know, wanting or it's, it's kind of like a biological thing. I don't know, but because I'm in my comfort zone, I also need to use, you know, the restroom. So now I'm like, Oh boy, you know, what do I do? Am I in, I'm in a, I'm in a situation, should I pray? Because, you know, I, I need to pray. Obviously I don't want the time to go out, but um, you know, I also don't like that feeling, that anxiety of, I need to just rush to do the prayer because I need to rush to the, to the restroom. So there's been many times where I have prayed because I'm afraid of uh, delaying it or getting distracted and doing something else and then forgetting. But my conscience then comes back and reminds me like you weren't really fully present in that prayer. You know, you were, you were very distracted. You were kind of rushing to get through because you needed to use the restroom. Is that, is that befitting for someone who is trying to better themselves? And so, you know, what, what happens next? Next I'll, I, I come out and I make will do, and I'll go right back to the prayer rug. It's happened many times before, but this is from this teaching, because if you accept mediocrity in yourself, then that's what the nafs will um, acclimate to because the nafs is, is lazy. The nafs does not want to put in effort. So when we take the, you know, the fast route, the, the easy path, it will always push us in that direction. But the challenge, mujahid al-nafs, is actually going against the nafs. And 
So I kind of, um, I don't know if I read this somewhere, if I heard a teacher mention this, but it clicked. It was whenever you have resolved to do something and because um, we know ourselves, even in the Quran, I don't know the specific ayah, but Allah says, you, basically, you know your own self, right? Um, so you have to know yourself. But if you ever get to a point of resolve on an action um, and you're not, you know, you, you have to kind of question it. You have to question the source of that resolve. And this is where knowing the khatir, right? The four uh, sources of our thoughts is very helpful because if you understand that all of our thoughts are going to emanate from four sources, then you can start to suspect what is um, a thought that you should follow and what's a thought that you shouldn't, right? So what are the four sources? We have khatir rabbani, Khatar Madakani, Khatar Nafsani, and Khatar Shaitani. And so obviously there's a split here. Two of them are good, always positive thoughts. Um, sometimes you might uh, want to do something, but all of a sudden you get this burst of inspiration and you're off, um, you know, instead of getting online and checking email, you're like, no, 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 I want to read Quran. Uh, that may be your, your angel, your angelic, uh, the angelic um, thoughts that come to you because we have angels that are with us, right? And they sometimes, you know, nudge us in, in good virtuous behavior. So it could be that. Um, istikhara or dreams uh, are attributed to, uh, you know, revelation that it's a source of revelation. So these could be considered uh, khatir uh, rabbani, right? Um, or just a, a really strong, uh, you know, conviction in something could be from Allah. Um, so those two are pretty obvious that they're good. But the, the, the latter two, which are those thoughts that we should be, sus you know, suspicious of, emanate from the nafs and shaitan. And in order to differentiate or discern what's what, you want to pay attention to habit because your nafs will, again, push you into things that are comfortable for you, that you've done probably before, whereas shaitan is, you know, he wants you to, he wants to ruin you. So he's going to compel you to do things worse than what you've done before. He'll push you in a further, like a, a worse direction. So in the sense of, in, in the case of, you know, uh, resolution, like when you, for example, um, decide to do something like, let's say you decide to, um, uh, you know, wake up for uh, the hajjid. Okay. So you have this resolve, you, you make the niyyah the night before I'm going to wake up for uh, the hajjid. Now, when you wake up and the alarm goes off and there's a thought and it's very, you know, the nafs is very crafty. Um, the nafs is very crafty. So it'll come up with all sorts of justifications. You know what? You're sick. You haven't slept for three, four days. You have a work meeting, you've got so much to do, it's okay, just go back to sleep and wake up in an hour when Fajr comes in or two hours, whatever the time is, right? It'll give you all of these excuses. And so that is a thought that you want to be sus uh, suspicious of because it's such a strong resolution, right? It's so like, um, it's it's you're kind of flooded with all of these uh, excuses all of a sudden, like where'd that come from? When before you had this beautiful intention, it's your nafs. And shaitan may even, um, you know, inspire you uh, with something worse, you know, I don't know, uh, maybe you'll come and instead of praying to hajjid, you find yourself, oh, check your email real quickly. And then all of a sudden your email, you go down that rabbit's hole. And now you're on TikTok and you've been watching TikTok the entire time until Fajr comes in, right? So Iblis knows how to get us, our nafs knows how to get us. So the point is, when you have such strong conviction on an action where you already had a prior resolve, suspect it immediately. Be like, nope, that's nafs or shaitan. I have to force myself to do it. Don't even stick around for this back and forth, but immediately know that these two uh, evil forces that work against us 24 hours a day are at play, one or the other. And you have to be so aware of what's happening that you are you force yourself into action. The, the, going back to that initial intention you had, right? That's how we overcome the nafs. That's how we elevate our uh, our our worship from mediocrity because mediocrity is just doing the bare minimum. Uh, you know, I'm just going to do how I always have done it. But if you want to push beyond that, you have to learn to struggle against yourself, and that's what that looks like. It's suspecting the thoughts that we have, sourcing them, and then realizing that Allah inspired you when you had the beautiful intention. You know, that was inspiration or it was maybe your angelic 
uh, you know, um, you know, the, the presence uh, that, that was inspiring you, who are you going to listen to? It's a choice now because you had the ania the night before you set your alarm. What happened now? What happened now is you, you forgot that you have these two uh, forces, demonic and, and the nafs that are, um, that are going to do everything to thwart your initial nia. So you have to fight them. And the way to fight them is action. Be true to your initial nia. Don't uh, engage in, and as I said, um, you know, don't have a, back, a mental uh, back and forth. Just get up and do what you were going to do. So exalted aspirations, I mean, that's just uh, you know, one um, way of doing it, but it really is wanting uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wanting proximity to Allah, wanting um, wanting to uh, to be, you know, the highest, your greatest potential, wanting to really see who that person is. And that's why Ramadan is so special. You now I had a, a halaqa last night with, with some teen girls. And so I made a reference, it was very outdated, but I just thought, let me throw it out there. Because sometimes, you know, these teens get into, um, you know, uh, what do they call it when, when it's, um, when uh, they go back and like watch, uh, watch things that are, that are from previous generations. I forgot that there's a, a term for it, but anyway, sometimes they'll watch things right from like the seventies or sixties or eighties. Uh, and that's how ancient we appear to them. <laughs> but I referenced a movie that I watched maybe around, I think it was in the nineties. I saw it. I don't even remember the details of it, but the concept I remember, which was, um, uh, sliding doors, you know, sliding doors for, with Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, I don't remember the movie, but just the idea of the movie was so cool, which was, you know, here's this woman and she, um, it's basically sh showing like a split screen almost of two different paths that her life took based on one decision. Um, so that's, it was a very cool concept at that time, right? So you get to see her she made this decision. This is the course her life took. And then she made this decision. And this is how her life went into a total different direction. So I always thought that was so neat. And what I've realized is that Ramadan in a way is kind of like that because we get to see ourselves in, in a light that we don't normally see ourselves, right? We get to actually pause the normal us, the, the 11th month of the year us, and have a new identity emerge, you know, uh, hopefully a better one. Um, and then the idea, I think, inshallah, is by the end of it, you have now a choice to make. You know, am I going to be um, this new improved version of me? Because Allah has given me ample time to really form good habits and just to become better and be more mindful. Am I going to be this person or am I going to go back, regress to the version of me that I had before this month? Because that's usually what happens, right? For many of us, we've definitely done that. Uh, may Allah forgive us. But that's where Ramadan is so amazing is that it gives us a, an opportunity to really um, have exalted aspirations. Why not? Why not uh, have high goals? And that doesn't mean you feel like a failure because you didn't um, maybe hit all of those you know points on your checklist, to do list, or or goal list. Don't feel like a failure, but be happy that you had the himma to even want to do those things. So if you wanted to go to the masjid every night of Ramadan for taraweeh, mashallah. If you wanted to to do multiple khatams, mashallah. If you were like, oh, I'm going to memorize this many surahs this month, mashallah, or do this many salawat every day. That's amazing. Alhamdulillah. But we can't, you know, lower the bar as, as you know, um, we find, unfortunately, in this culture, that's what they're they're incentivizing or, 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 you know, that's kind of how they're conditioning people to so just keep lowering the bar. So everything's kind of become lower. Our language is lower. You know, you do the bare minimum, you get uh, participation trophies for everything. Everybody gets rewarded regardless of their effort and merit. It's just, that's not our way. You work hard and you, you reap the rewards of your, your hard work and you're, you know, grateful to Allah for the opportunity and for the gift of being able to do those things but you have to have the aspirations to start with so um, this is required right so having again um high hema and then the next is maintaining uh, allah's reverence uh, again so important in this day and age i mean always important but certainly in a day where religion is is attacked and even you know god's name as they say is taken in vain all the time and uh, in many cases even erased uh, entirely, right? People don't want to talk about Allah, even uh, within our community, but also outside of our community. We see, unfortunately, people sometimes becoming a little bit, you know, uh, constricted as soon as people start talking about 
religion and getting too, you know, um, too, too extreme or fundamentalist. Too. These are the kinds of words I've certainly heard uh, be used against me, you know, uh, describing me when I get into my, um, you know, desire to want to talk about Allah or praise Allah or reference Allah because it's, it's necessary. We should be, we should be thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time, um, directly or indirectly, but he should certainly not be erased, uh, and, and forgotten how, how, you know, uh, what kind of, I mean, how, how is that a reflection of gratitude when your every experience on you know in life is due to the existence that he get, gave you but then you can just uh forget him and of course you know we're human we get distracted and distractions are external they pull our attention away um that's not uh, the same as someone who is willfully uh denying uh the the remembrance of god or just not um revering him as they should and reverence to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks like uh, you know, saying Bismillah before you eat, um, saying MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah, SubhanAllah, when things happen to us, you know, there are a lot of things that Allah shows us, um, amazing signs, uh, and we should have awe of him. And that's why, um, you know, one of my, uh, why I love to teach children is because they just have it naturally and you'll see it whether it's your own children or other children there's always this awe that they um, when they're young right for everything but they're they're they, they're teaching us of something that we once had that we've lost so we have to now bring that back and the way you do that is through the uh you know the the, the reflections you have right the thoughts that you carry and the words that you say so if you're you know for example um you know, I, I heard this story, uh, I think it was, yeah, it was Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad just shared this beautiful story on his social media. Um, and it's so amazing. It was just such a powerful story, but I'll share it with you. He said that he met uh, a woman who came to the masjid. He'd never met her before. And she said to him that she had only a hundred pounds to her in her account. Like that was all she had. But when the earthquakes in Turkey hit, she was so moved by the plight of the victims that she gave half of her wealth, of her savings. A hundred pounds, as you can imagine, is not very much at all to live by. But she gave half of it away. And she said that just a few hours later, just a few hours later, what happened? 8,000 pounds was put into her account. Um, and it was from some loan, I think student loan that she had forgotten about years before. But a few hours later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deposited $8,000, just 80 times, right? Or actually, no, Fadwa, you have the math. You can do the math better. Uh, uh, between, uh, yeah, you can do the math for us, but let us know how many times more that he uh, rewarded her with, subhanAllah. So I just thought that was so profound. And the reaction to these types of stories, you know, some people, I've, I've actually shared stories like this with people and some people are like, oh, wow, that's that's neat. <laughs> that's amazing. Or, the, oh, that's cool. That's cool. And they kind of like, that's that's it. And, and, you know, that's they're they're not really impressed by these types of stories that we would see as obvious, obvious signs, you know, um, uh, from Allah that he's showing his, uh, you know, uh, he's his signs to us. So the believer doesn't just make it like, you know, respond that way. They actually um, respond with awe, subhanAllah. And then, you know, just allow yourself to feel the power of that, you know, that the story, like, what, wow, what, what did we just witness? What did we just hear? And, uh, you know, and then you can hopefully uh, sit with yourself and maybe think of experiences you've had similarly, but it, it allows for this process of just like, Allahu Akbar, Allah, Allah is so amazing. Um, and many times, you know, if you're paying attention anyway, you'll see these things if you're paying attention. But the reverence for Allah is all of these things. It's adab with Allah. It's knowing how to call on him by his most beautiful names. It's knowing how to um, speak of him, you know, as I said, and bring his remembrance into the conversations. Uh, we should never have... Um, meetings with people, you know, obviously professional meetings aside, but like when we meet with our friends, our family, our community, um, there should be the intention, whether it's uh, the host of, of the gathering or someone there, someone at least should have the intention 
to uh, make the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you find yourself in a, in, a, in a gathering where there is no remembrance of Allah being made because everybody's talking about politics or uh, dunya and material wealth and uh, school and kids and all of that stuff, then it's on you if you have that awareness to somehow share something. Oh, let me share this wonderful story I heard or guess what happened or something. Or I read this ayah or did you guys listen to the recent talk that so-and-so gave or whatever. Make mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that people um, don't fall into the habit of ever coming together and omitting him. That's that's tragic if you think about it, that we come together and we don't even mention the name of our creator. So uh, that's, you know, reverence for Allah. Um, also for his book, you know, knowing, for example, not to um, speak over the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a very important um, adab that we should have when we hear the Quran being recited, that we know to quiet our, just immediately, uh, you know, go quiet. Or if you have to speak, whisper at least, lower your voice and teach your children. If the Quran is playing, the Quran is playing. Um, how do we carry the Quran, right? Um, how do we hold the Quran? All of that reflects your reverence. When I was, you know, I, I teach Quran, alhamdulillah, I used to teach young children, but we would spend a great deal of time on just uh, practicing carrying the mushaf uh, because, you know, it's not an average book. This is the greatest book. So they have to treat it like the greatest book and they should revere it. They should know to hold it with two hands. They should know to hold it above their waist. They should know to hold it in a state of wudu. All of these things should be taught. I've seen, unfortunately, many people, adults as well as children, running through the masjid or from you know Sunday school or whatever, and they completely lost this. They carry the Quran like it's you know another library book under their arm, or uh, sometimes all the bala hanging by their side, all the bala. So we have to have proper reverence for Allah and also teach this to our children and our and our families and obviously embody it ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always also said in a hadith um Sahih in Al Bukhari, the Prophet said that Man Ahaba Lika Allah Ahaba Allah Lika Ahu Waman Kariha Lika Lika Allah Kariha Allah Lika Ahu, which is that the Prophet said, Whoever loves to meet Allah, Allah loves to meet him. And whoever hates to meet Allah, Allah hates to meet him. So the reverence and love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the, uh, you know, the, the, how it plays out. If you don't have it in you to want to uh, meet your Lord, to make mention of him, to, to just be in awe of him, then it will be reciprocated to you, al And we obviously do not want that. So uh, that's a very important uh, point, again, uh, to, keep, to be mindful of. And then expending oneself in excellent service of others. So remember, what we're doing is we're, we've laid the foundation, right, of the path. Now we're helping um, to build upon uh, or, or to uh, put together what is required to get there. So these are the qualities that we have to have in order to get to those five. So uh, the third being um, service of others, khidma. Khidma is a beautiful, um, a beautiful um, you know, part of our deen that has also been lost. You know, um, wanting for your brother or sister what you want for yourself. Uh, it really comes down to our values. And, and if you value um, the, the rida of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than yourself, then it will be easy for you to give up your comforts for other people. Because you realize that the, the nafs, as, as I already mentioned, right, is not your friend. So to cater to it constantly is actually your own undoing. But to go against it, uh, will will elevate you. It's it's better for you, right? To go against your nafs. We we kind we we get so comfortable with comfort that we are opposed to discomfort. But sometimes discomfort is actually better for you because it pushes you outside of constantly being in that nafsi state. So doing something for someone else, right? Um, you know, there are many examples I can give you, but you know, just think about. Uh, let's say your home, you're, it's cozy. You just, uh, you know, the, the house is clean. Everything's kind of, you know, we've all, alhamdulillah, inshallah, we've all had those days where we've just had a really nice day and things are going in in the order that we want them to. And we just sit down, right? <laughs> we just sit down to, to, and we have our nice cup of chai and we're going to have our little piece of, you know, cake or cookies or whatever with treats we've uh, brought for ourselves. Maybe we're going to read a book. Maybe we're going to turn on uh, the TV and and turn on something uh, inshallah beneficial. But we're just we're now it's all about us, right? Self care, as they call it. 
And in that moment of, of just um, immense comfort, immense joy and ease, maybe you get a text message, right? And that text message is from a friend who's going through, she's distraught. She's going through something really difficult. Um, and you hear from this friend a lot, you're, you're in contact with her. She, she Obviously you care about her, but uh, this is the worst timing, right? So you have choice to make. I could leave the messages unread. She wouldn't know that I saw them because we have all the preview screen and I know I use it all the time. I have to, right? So you, uh, you, know, you, you may uh, go back and, and use that feature on your phone to preview the message, but you're not gonna look at it because you don't want to let her know that you've seen the messages because you're just enjoying yourself too much. You can't give up your comfort, right? Now that's a choice you made. You're not certainly, you know, um, uh, compelled you to it. It certainly made sure that you did that because it wants you to not benefit from the rewards that Allah just pretty much dangled in front of you. Uh, because what's greater than removing the distress of a fellow believer, right? For in, in, in between those two choices, I mean, I hope it's obvious. Yes, you, you, we're deserving of ease, right? We're deserving of that sometimes, especially if we're not doing anything haram, and it's it's fine. But in that situation, when an opportunity comes to you to do something against your own nafs, this is when you're really understanding the way the world works. Because that temporary comfort you got from drinking your chai and watching your uh, rom-com or whatever other thing you may have indulged in um, uh, or read your book is nothing compared to the massive rewards you just got because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw, he's witnessing your mujahid against yourself. He saw that you said, no, I want to put aside my own comfort because my friend needs me and I know this would please Allah. So that, that it's, you know, we can't even fathom how many, how many rewards you would get. And Allah is so generous with us. So that, you know, expending oneself in excellent service. And so then the excellent service is also important to clarify here, because if you're going to do something with pure intention for Allah, you can't do it begrudgingly. You can't do it huffing and puffing and annoyed and, oh, uh, what, you know, what does she need now? And you're like griping as you're doing it. <laughs> And you know, these, we all have grown, inshallah, we've grown and we don't do those things anymore, but just think about Allah's witnessing you. So when you do it, you do it with excellence and with excellence, it is controlling any negative thought that comes. You certainly don't, you know, vocalize those things. Um, and you, you really make peace with whatever's being asked of you. And this is boundaries, you know, boundaries saying there's a lot of uh, ways this, uh, we can, uh, this conversation can go in, in terms of how to do things with Ihsan. But I would say create really healthy um, uh, boundaries around these things, especially if you're someone that's called on a lot. Like if you have family and friends and there's a lot of people that you end up having to do for then you need to take care of yourself. And by creating healthy boundaries, you'll get to a point where you don't do things, um, as I said, begrudgingly or uh, really with frustration uh, and there's resentment in your heart. We don't want that. We, we don't want to ever do things for others with resentment in our heart. And so that's where purifying the intention that it's for Allah, it's for the sake of Allah. And when we do things for the sake of Allah, it should always be done with uh, with immense um, with with you know happiness with joy with gratitude because Allah is giving you an opportunity to draw closer to Him. But this is you know where intentionality and it's a lot of hard work to get to that point. Um, but it's very important to be to desire to serve other people. Um, when you're in the uh, at the masjid, for example, you come in for an event. Maybe it's a premier speaker. Everybody's rushing to get to their seat, um, and you see someone you know, struggling or, or, you know, instead of worrying, oh, I'm going to miss out, I'm not going to get a front row seat. And you stopped to help someone because their bag was too heavy, or they were elderly, or they had maybe a physical, you know, disability. Allah is watching you. He sees that you had the need to do something, but you redirected yourself for the sake of someone else, for his sake. The rewards of that, again, we don't know, but you should be certain that it would be far better for you to do that than to just walk back past your brother or sister in need to serve your own nafs. So these are the kinds of ways that we 
pay attention to our intentions and we become better. Fulfilling one's resolves. This is very important as well because when we say something, we have to you know, act upon it. We can't be the type of person that, um, that just throws words out, right? Because and I'm, I'm pulling out uh, from the content of character because right on the very first page, right? We are taught, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, um, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ آيَةُ الْمُنَافِقِ ثَلَاثَةُ إِذَا حَدَّثَ كَذَبَ وَإِذَا وَعَدَ أَخْلَفَ وَإِذَا تُؤْمِنَ خَانِ So this is in um, Al-Bukhari and Muslim. And the Prophet ﷺ said the characteristics of a hypocrite are three. When he speaks, he lies. When he gives his word, he breaks it. And when he is given a trust, he is unfaithful. These are warnings for us that if you get in the habit of throwing out a lot of words, a lot of lip service, a lot of false promises, um, but you don't, you know, fulfill them, this is dangerous for you. It's a sign of of weakness, of spiritual weakness, because the believer, um, when you have an intention, you follow it through. When you promise something to your children or someone else, you follow it through, even if it's against yourself. And if you need a break, maybe you overshot. Maybe sometimes we we want to do a lot out of our love, but you um, you can't. Then you at least have the humility to admit th- that you know you you overplanned. You maybe um, didn't factor this or that, but you explain yourself, and then you uh, you fulfill your your promise. And maybe another time, but you absolutely. Don't just ignore it or trivialize it. Like, yeah, 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 so what? I said it, I couldn't do it too bad. That's not the way that we should uh, behave as believers because it's, you know, to break um, someone's heart, to not fulfill a promise uh, would inconvenience others um, in ways, you know, again, depending on the situation that would really harm them potentially. And that now, you know, all because of our own weakness, because of maybe laziness or just mismanagement of our schedule or time, we've now, uh, you know, affected another person negatively. So we have to take those things seriously. But just generally speaking, if you plan to do something or say you're going to do something, hold yourself accountable. That's what it is. Hold yourself accountable. Don't be a person whose word means nothing. And there are a lot of people, unfortunately, who um, who've just been broken because of people in their lives who give them false hope, false promises, but they never uh, come through. And it can be very, very um, you know hurtful in the long run, especially. I mean, just think of children who's um, you know who are. I know children, for example, who are in different. Um, Homes, you know, their parents have divorced, and many of the the suffering of children of divorce are because of this specific situation. One parent uh, will be neglectful; they will promise, "Oh, I'm going to come to your basketball game. I'm going to come take you here. I'm going to take you shopping. I'm going to give you this," and then they end up not doing it. And then, of course, who has to pick up the pieces of that child? The parent that the child is with. Um, It's very sad how common that is, but this is what happens when you're not working on yourself spiritually. You you fall into these very nefsy states where you are your biggest priority and you don't really care how your decisions or indecisions affect other people. So may Allah protect us from that, but just be a consistent person, be a person who uh, follows through. And then the last one is so important. I mean, all of these are important, but in terms of daily... um, daily exercises, I would say this is so important, like on a daily basis, no matter what you're going through, this should be your state where you're always looking to magnify the blessings. You're always looking to, um, to, to count the blessings, right? Um, like recently I came from an event and I came home the whole drive. I was just in a constricted state because I had heard from so many people, just a lot of suffering, you know, uh, loss of, of children, multiple uh, different losses that have happened recently. Um, I saw people in these states weeping uncontrollably because of the loss of a child. You can imagine. Right. And then, um, you know, divorce, um, being uh, dealing with infidelity, uh, dealing with uh, suicidal ideation, you know, parent who's, who's, who's taken their own life, 
and, and now the, ch the children who are also suffering with their own suicidal ideation. These are things that I heard all in one day. And I heard them in one day. And I came home. And as soon as I came home, I just, my Hamda family was there. And I just said, we all have to say Alhamdulillah, like all day. And I told my children, I said, please promise me when you make your sajda, uh, that you really, really are in a state of gratitude to Allah. Because I don't think you realize Alhamdulillah, how much suffering a lot of people are going through that we're not going through. May Allah protect us. But that kind of hyper awareness of your blessings usually comes from this very intentional practice of you know magnifying your blessings, but also um, you know communing with other people, talking to other people, observing other people, um, and seeing that suffer there are people. Everybody's suffering in different ways. And like Ibn Abbas, you know, radiallahu anh, taught us that um, there's immense, you know, benefits in tribulations. Um, and this is how we, we get perspective, right? He's, uh, he's, he says first that it could always be worse, right? Whatever you're going through could always be worse. And that's a, that's a factual statement. Um, any, you, you take anybody's suffering and whatever it is, as awful as it is, it could be worse, right? right? So that's a perspective we have to have. The second thing he says is that it's in your dunya and not your deen, right? Because a tribulation that affects like a material thing, a part of your life um, is different than something like a faith crisis. A faith crisis is real. That's, that's a very scary uh, tribulation. So that's something to be grateful for, that it's just dunya, right? And then the third point is that the tribulation is in this life and not the next. These are things that give us perspective, right? that will hopefully then uh, put us in that state of gratitude to Allah. Like, Alhamdulillah, thank you, Allah, for everything. Thank you for life, for existence. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for uh, my health. Thank you for my mental acuity. Thank you for my ability to communicate. Uh, thank you for my uh, ability to be mobile, right? I mean, just think of how many people are dealing with neurodegenerative uh, diseases or, or other uh, types of diseases where they cannot move and they have full, um, you know, they're awake mentally, but they can't move. May Allah protect us from those states. Um, financially, alhamdulillah, if you have a fridge full and a pantry full, you're, we're living like kings and, and queens compared to people who don't even have potable, drinkable, drinkable water. They don't have these things. It's not a reality for them. Um, or or food that's you know not uh, uh, that that um, can be preserved, right? They have to eat whatever they can because that's all they don't have ways of preserving their food. So these are things that unless you're doing it, it will um, you won't you won't notice them. And then shaitan is right there to do the opposite of this, magnify your problems. So instead of magnifying your blessings, all you're doing is wallowing in self-pity over why did this have to happen and why this and why that? And I, you know, I deserve this. And we just get in these really awful states. So these are, you know, regular practices we should be doing, all of these, right? Make sure our goals and our intentions are high. Don't shortchange yourself. Seek the akhirah, not dunya. Dunya is low. It's, it's temporal. It doesn't last. Akhirah is forever. Be always mindful of Allah and have the best adab with your Lord, right? We have to have the best adab with Allah. We only speak about him in the best way possible. We have husna dhan with Allah. And uh, there's actually, let me, I pulled out a hadith on this particular topic. Um, where is it? SubhanAllah. Um, so there's a beautiful... Oh, here. This is actually one hadith, but there's something else I'll mention. So Abdullah ibn Masood, may Allah be pleased with him, said that by the one beside whom there is no God, a believing servant is not given anything better than good thoughts about Allah Almighty. By the one who besides whom there is no God, a servant does not improve his opinion of Allah Almighty, except that Allah will give him what he assumes. That is because all good is in his hands. So this is, of course, you know, uh, right? When we are grateful to Allah, we're revering Him, we're exalting Him. He increases us. When we have the best op opinion, right? Uh, I will. He basically confirms what you think of Him. Um, so this is what uh, Ibn Abbas, or I'm sorry, uh, Abdul Ibn Masud is calling us to. Um, and so I'm sorry, I'm looking at the time. So I, I, let's read this last paragraph. 
here um, before we pause for Q&A. So he whose aspirations are exalted is raised in rank. Um, Allah mentions, or I'm sorry, Allah maintains the respect of he who preserves his reverence. Um, he whose service is for others is ennobled by it. Beautiful the perspective, right? We are the beneficiaries of the service we give. It's not the opposite because you think of service as like, oh, I'm serving people, but we benefit. We're ennobled by the, by the khidmah that we do. He who does that which he resolves to do is assured continual guidance. So if you're a person of your word, you will be continuously guided by Allah. He who deems blessings to be great by his own eye has shown gratitude. And he who is grateful ensures an increase in blessings from the giver of gifts according to the promise of the truthful one. SubhanAllah, it's just so succinct, so beautiful, so powerful. But on this point of um, he who's, uh, I'm sorry, Allah maintains the respect of he who preserves his reverence. This is also, I just wanted to quickly mention, because there are a lot of people who seek status, who seek, as we said in the beginning, acceptance by people who want to be respected, who want people, whether it's in their family, in their professional life, in their community, to look upon them with reverence, right, with respect. But they forget that that is something that Allah rewards to his believers or to his servants, right? And so it's not, you can't just get it. Because how many professional people, how many people of, um, you know, who, who you think it, it, they would, uh, it would, it, they're warranted, it's warranted that they would have that respect, don't get respect. Um, because Allah, you know, doesn't will that for them. So it's not something you can get from a worldly uh, place, uh, that type of reverence that people seek um, is through Allah. So if you're not going to revere the one who gives you that place and status amongst his uh, creation, then you you clearly don't understand how things work. Uh, so just wanted to mention that. But alhamdulillah, we can pause. And I'm happy to stay for an additional uh, however many minutes to go over the questions. So Bismillah. Ustaz al are you here? Uh, uh, yes. Jazakallah khair. Thank you for another wonderful class, mashallah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go to the Q&A where I've asked everyone to please um, direct your questions to the Q&A box so that we can keep track of questions asked during the session. The first question um, is asking for um, the dua that you started the class with. And um, I think that you had said that that was available on the Zaytuna website. Is that true? Yeah, so I'm sorry, because I had mentioned that I do, um, I have a, P, uh, not a PDF, it's an image of the of the du'a. Um, and so the way that I found it, let me see, I'll just quickly do it while you're talking and you, you're reading the other questions. So we, we save time. So let me go ahead and find it for you. Because it's Perfect. a link. All right, thank you. The mm -hmm. second says, I often find that what people say to me really affects my mood. If it's something good about me or my work, I find myself extremely motivated and cheerful. But when I don't receive this kind of recognition, I start to feel low and think negatively of myself. My question is, how can the how can the one that suffers from low self-esteem and low self-confidence find ways to build it up instead of being dependent on what people tell them about themselves? MashaAllah. So the, I'm really glad uh, this uh, sister uh, asked this question because I think a lot of people would probably uh, fall in, in the same category, right? We, we are very affected. We do source uh, external validation because of all the things I mentioned, maybe other things, you know, there's, uh, you know, temperaments um, and, and different uh, personality types. They seek, you know, these things out more. So being, I think, more self-aware of yourself, and I'm glad that you have this awareness that this is what's going on, um, well, is the starting point to changing. Uh, but also, I think I'm just going to throw it out there because I feel like this is also a factor. If you don't have good sohbah, right, if you don't have good people who reflect goodness to you, um, right, al-mu'min al-mir'atul mu'min, the believer is a mirror for the believer. So when you have really good people around you, they will know how to uplift you, but do it in the right way. Because throwing like flattery is, is looked down upon because it's empty. There's no substance to it. But when you have God fearing good company who really wants your good, right? People who are good people who genuinely want to um, for you to be successful, then they will uplift you in a way where it doesn't um, feed into maybe what has been going on, right? Which is there's this um, 
maybe insecurity that you're dealing with that 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 those other compliments are kind of feeding into but really um righteous people will always remind you that your blessings are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and help you to redirect um even your own need for validation back to Allah because it's it's kind of just habit right if you start to um take some of the um the attribution of your your blessings this would be uh, something to work on because nothing nothing no good that we do is self made nothing so all of it should be redirected to allah that's why when someone gives you a compliment your mind you should be like you know they're being nice it's social it's it's a proto, it's like an etiquette you know you just want to say something nice to someone but the reality the haqiqa the what's really happening is they are witnessing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who's blessed me with skills with gifts with abilities um and the uh, you know the the life force to actually do these things so they're what they're witnessing is allah working through me so alhamdulillah wa shukrulillah right it's all back to allah and if you can start to do that regularly then the words are not going to impact you anymore because guess what whether they say it or not it's true whether people give you the compliment or not it is true and if if uh, you're witnessing it because you know if you produce something amazing you don't need other people to come and tell you it's amazing you know it inshallah you should and that's where confidence building is also important recognizing the nama recognizing that you are you you're skilled at something is a good thing to do because you're recognizing that it's allah who made, who made that happen but my point is is whether people give you compliments or not no longer is is important because it doesn't take away from the reality of what's happening which is indeed allahu akbar indeed al- alhamdulillah allah is deserving of all praise um so i hope that's clear thank you um our last question says can you please give some advice for improving one say do ratio at work i work in a corporate environment and it can be extremely draining sometimes i fall short in delivering and unfortunately it's starting to impact my performance i work to support my family how can i take the spiritual route for improving my state of affairs mashallah um again that's a it's a very good and relevant question cuz you know a lot of people are struggling with the life home life balance and yes we become overly ambitious with our careers and so we want to do a lot but i think you know having um in, in every business or every um you know environment is different i don't know what the company that you work at but if you have uh people who are there to kind of help shape like your your goals you know your trajectory at the company like what your long term objectives or goals are what your short term goals are then maybe instead of leaving it to yourself because sometimes if it's like there's um sort of either insecurity or a feeling of uh what do they call it um imposter syndrome there's a lot of these things that can affect our sense of self those things drive us to take on more than we can chew right because it's like oh i got to show up i got to impress people and so there's a lot of insecurity driving that but when you become more intentional and actually organized and plan like have like a, a plan for your year like okay so in my current capacity this is where i'm at but this is my target for the year or target for 6 months or target for 3 months and then you're working with maybe a coach or like hr or whoever would be in your in your company helping you to your supervisor maybe shape how that's going to materialize then you're working at, you know in in a very um like it, it, that is a much more structured way of goal setting as opposed to letting the fear of maybe not doing enough and being you know uh, i know there's people who are now very insecure in their in their positions because there's so many layoffs happening so a lot of people are just in panic mode trying to do more but i think planning is always going to yield better results and planning with someone who's a little ahead of you in your role um to be realistic because they may offer great advice to you that says hey don't do that because i made that same mistake and this is what happened to me so asking for help you know and this is actually part of leadership um if you look at the different qualities of like leaders is knowing when to ask for guidance and help from people it doesn't mean that you don't you know that that it's it's somehow a negative quality it's actually very intelligent to do that to seek out your supervisors or people ahead of you and just say 
you know, can you help me kind of put together some real practical, realistic, long-term and short-term girl, goals for my uh, work so that I can uh, be balanced and not take on more. And inshallah, bismillah. And always, of course, start with bismillah. May Allah give you tawfiq, inshallah. Thank you, Stella Hasai. Um, you mentioned earlier in the class about the recording. Uh, is, uh, are we ready to share just a... Uh, yeah, YouTube? absolutely. Uh, inshallah, yeah. You can always share the recordings unless something really wild happens on these sessions. I don't have a problem with the recordings uh, being shared. Yeah. All right. I'll put it in the chat. I just created a shortcut for this week. Um, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> and, uh, and then inshallah, um, I'll post this one soon. Be patient. <laughs> we have a lot going on these days. Alhamdulillah. 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 Jazakallah khair. And thank you. So if there are uh, no other questions, we're only doing Q&A box, right? So uh, Yeah, I, I checked the, check the chat as well. Uh, alhamdulillah, there are no other questions. And uh, inshallah, you can end with the closing dua. Sure. Just one last thing. Did you check the math on Sister Luna's um, math here? Is that correct? Because remember, 80, 50... 80, time, 80 times 100 is 8,000. Right. But I said the, that. I initially yeah, said. <laughs> the percent increase is a 7,900% increase. So, <laughs> mashallah, we'll just think grander of Allah. Mashallah. Sada Fadwa is a math whiz. So that's why I refer, defer to her for all your math questions. But Jazakum al khair. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you all for being here. And I look forward to our next session next week. And feel free to read ahead. And if you have any questions based on your reading, please uh, provide them, you know, come, come, uh, or uh, send them to Sada Fadwa. And maybe we can look over those before we start. So with that said, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا عصر إن الإنسان لا في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شهدوا لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزة يا ما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين Alhamdulillah. Jazakum Allah khair. And thank you again, everyone. I wish you a beautiful uh, morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. And please remember us uh, if you haven't made iftar um, at, at iftar time. Inshallah. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته everyone. Welcome again. Alhamdulillah. It's an honor to be with all of you. Uh, we will jump right into it because I want to maximize our time. Uh, first, we'll start with the dua. Uh, the dua uh, that a student of, of knowledge should recite uh, before um, their studies. So inshallah, we'll, we'll recite that together. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق الهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا اللهم بالقرآن وذكر الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يقربنا منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم سهل اللهم لا سهل إلا ما اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سهلا اللهم عذنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستقبلك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا آمين بسم الله so with that said um, let's go ahead and screen share inshallah so that we're all uh, reading the document together alhamdulillah so we are reading from the foundations of the spiritual path and again, as Sada Fadwa mentioned, the recordings for previous sessions are available, so you can go back and, and watch um, those to uh, kind of bring yourself up to speed. But we have only barely scratched the surface. It's such a rich document, mashallah. So we've only covered the first section here and the second section. And today we're going to continue. So again, just to remind everyone, the way the document is built is it gives us the foundations of the path first and then the prerequisite 
uh, you know, things or qualities or actions that we would need in order to even get to the, uh, the foundation. So it's kind of working us backwards in a way. So we talked last week about how, you know, one, how, if we wanted to, again, establish um, a strong foundation, we would need to have exalted aspirations, maintain Allah's reverence, expend ourselves in service, khidma, uh, fulfill our resolve. So once we, you know, have uh, have a, an intention that we actually see it through, and then to be in the practice of uh, gratitude, magnifying one's blessings, always mentioning them, uh, of course, feeling the gratitude in the heart, mentioning it on one's tongue, and um, and then working towards good deeds as a reflection of one's gratitude. So those are the three levels of gratitude. Now, uh, today we're going to talk about how we can get to those uh, levels, right? Because those are that, those are all conduct related. So the foundations of the of right conduct, in order to get to to what we just shared, to to the place where we have exalted aspirations, where we can maintain Allah's reverence and we can do khidma freely from a pure intention, and we see through our our intentions, uh, making sure that we finish and complete them to the best of our ability, and that we're always in a state of gratitude. In order to get there. We have to then look at what uh, the foundations of the of right conduct or correct conduct are. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So again, he has these bulleted points here, um, organized, structured, so that we can really follow this through. The first point he makes is seeking sacred knowledge in order to fulfill Allah's commands. And this, of course, you know, follows logic, right? That in order to have correct conduct, you need to know what correct conduct is. So knowledge and being in pursuit of knowledge is really important. And we've, you know, I've mentioned this in, in previous sessions as well, that we as Muslims always have to see ourselves as students of knowledge. And it's really important that we don't, um, you know, that, that we uh, hold on to that part of our identity until we take our last breath, because Islam is so rich and it's, it's, it's so deep that we'll never be able to fully uh, arrive at, at any level of true, true understanding, but at least we can, uh, you know, we can be on that path, inshallah. So seeking sacred knowledge is first. And then, you know, um, just to share it, because it's a really good document, um, you know, uh, during the, uh, these, I, I've been giving uh, these sessions on the foundations for a couple of years now. And, um, Afterwards, uh, this is on a, an app called Clubhouse. You may not be familiar with it, or you may be familiar with it. But um, I asked Sheikh Hamza specifically, like, what would be a good text to follow up with this uh, text, um, as well as, you know, content of character and other texts? And he uh, pointed me to another text, which is really amazing. And that's what I'm working on now with some of the uh, students who attend the sessions on Clubhouse. And I'm going to share that with you right now. Let me find the link for it. Uh, but he pointed me to this document called the Six Points of Tabligh. And this was uh, this is actually a document put together by the, the group, as we may know it, uh, called Tabligh Jama. Um, one of the main, I think the founder of it, I, I, uh, his name is actually here in the in the document. I can't, I can't remember his name, but he, um, he put this together. Um, let me see if I can find it. So... Let me see here. Is it? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm looking for his name. Maulana Ilyas, Rahim, uh, Rahmatullah Alayhi. So he, he's the one who uh, put this document together. And then another brother by the name of Bilal Malik uh, translated it in English. So let me go ahead and share this in our chat here because it's a really great um, document for all of us to uh, to benefit from as well as it kind of gives you um, many of the topics that we're going to talk about here, it gives you more broader um, explanations and there's a lot of hadith and Quran, but that's the link for it. Um, oh, I think I sent it only to, to the Salaf Adra. Let me send it to the whole chat. So you guys should be able to see this now. So this is a document that we're reading together, but there's a whole section there on just the, the, the benefits, the merits, the objectives of of acquiring knowledge and and uh, being in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's actually the third point of tabligh. And it's really beautiful. There's verses shared, but also, you know, they, they mention here that the objective, the purpose of ilm is twofold. The first is that one is able to differentiate between the halal and the haram, and then as well as purity and impurity, 
what's legitimate, what's illegitimate, and this would pertain to all aspects of life. So that's the first purpose of why we should acquire knowledge. The second is to know that at any given moment in one's 24-hour existence, uh, what Allah wants of him or her. And this is, uh, they have an Urdu reference here, uh, but it's uh, basically recognizing the command relating to the present. So, you know, this is really profound because as we know, part of the challenge of the modern world is mindfulness, of is being present in, in the moment. Um, it's very easy to get caught up with the distractions um, that are all around us. And even in our own minds, even within our thoughts, we can be pulled away from the moment. So what knowledge does, as uh, beautifully elucidated here, is it first gives us all that clarity about right and wrong, basically, and good, pure, and impure, all of those things. But it also helps us to reorient ourselves in any given moment, because if you're uh, hyper aware of uh, the gift of life, of the gift of the present. And also you have that taqwa that uh, reminds you that Allah subhanahu is watching, that your deeds are being recorded, that choices are going to be presented to you at every given moment and you have, you will be held accountable. Then it brings you into that, uh, that ideal state, right? That inshallah we all wish to be, which is again present with Allah. So these are the objectives of, uh, and, and then they go on to, uh, in the in this document, as if you've opened it up, you'll, you, you can read, it's on page 11, you'll see the merits of it. And there's so many ahadith, mashallah, that you can just read through and skim through that really give us um, a lot of insight into the value of knowledge. This is again, not just, something that we should think of as the activity of a student um, per se, you know, like a, a registered student, someone who is, um, you know, pursuing that path of, of uh, scholarship um, as a student that would maybe go on to do more. That, if you, if you think of knowledge that way, then most of us would not feel inclined. But if you think of it, that knowledge is um, a pathway for us to gain closeness ma'rifah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it becomes something for all of us to partake in. So here, that's the first foundation. If you want right conduct, you have to seek sacred knowledge. And inshallah, we're all hopefully doing that in our lives. We're all here and we're all students of knowledge. So alhamdulillah. Uh, the second point um, is uh, that we you know, keep company with spir spiritual guides um, and the fraternity of, as sorry, Keeping company with spiritual guides and the fraternity of aspirants to gain insight into one's fault. False. So this is also another really important point, because if we try to go at this alone, right, this path of spirituality by ourselves, very dangerous. And as they say, the one who doesn't have a spiritual guide, a sheikh or someone to help them, then Iblis will be their sheikh, you know, or their guide, because he will delude you. He will, um, you know, make you focus on unimportant things and lose sight of really valuable things. So that's why it's very important to tether yourself to someone who is um, either, again, uh, ahead of you, you know, in terms of, of, of um, if, if you can have access, you know, not everybody does. If you have access to a teacher who's um, in part of the path, uh, you know, part of the uh, the 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 chain of uh, of traditional sound knowledge he he or she has those credentials then that would be the ideal choice that you are in a solid path of of knowledge but if not then at least someone who is a little bit ahead of you right that maybe is older has been down the path knows what to stay away from because well as we get to in a moment there are pitfalls to each of these points which he's going to point out that if you don't have first of all, knowledge, or at least access to knowledge by way of a spiritual guide, then you are susceptible to falling and slipping and causing and having real spiritual struggles that may, um, may be very difficult to overcome. So keeping company with guides, but also a fraternity or sorority for the sisters, right? Um, but a group, a group that keeps you accountable, that also you can check in with. You know, it's so important. We're a dean of of Jama'a, we're a deen of Suhba, right? We're a deen of uh, the Prophet had companions uh, all around him, and they would, you know, uh, always be in his orbit because 
obviously they were they wanted to be around the best of creation but i think that was a great um you know model for all of us as well that have people around you be in circles you know be with people who you can remember allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with and as the hadith says right al-mu'min al-mir'at al-mu'min that the believer is a mirror for for the believer so if you don't have good company to help check in right to to help if you stray if you maybe you're you stop for example um, let's say you're in a halaqa or you have a, a routine with a group every single week and all of you come together regularly but then one stops coming right one of the one of the uh, here, uh, attendees stops coming um maybe they they've been they've fallen into a bad group you know this happens all the time uh people are consistent until something comes and distracts them the dunya shaitan whatever it is they're somehow now pulled away um then your group that you've created or, or that you've been blessed with hopefully uh, realizes your absence and we'll check in on you you know we'll check in on you they'll find out what's going on and maybe inshallah there is you know a path uh for you to come back um earlier today i was watching a video of uh this young girl you know she's mashallah very beautiful and she was doing her makeup while she's talking you know these now these are the trends where people um have to be doing something while they're telling you a story but she was going on about her experience with hijab and why she left hijab and um that she's not religious anymore she's all the blushes not even fasting um and i just my heart say just sunk you know because i'm watching her listening to her very proudly talk about her experience in islam as this forgotten past historical moment in her life that you know she's she's not really lamenting about she's not sad about she's just kind of sharing certain things that happened to her and i just thought oh all the bala like i wish she had um and maybe she did maybe she had very good friends around her um uh, but they but she just you know allah is the one who guides and misguides but the point being is you know it's it's sad to see that that it can happen to someone that they completely leave the practice of faith but the beauty of having a good group around you is that they hold you accountable and that they follow up with you they check in on you and they hopefully remind you of what's more important so that when you're distracted by something that distances you from Allah that you have this this group that can hopefully bring you back in gently with love of course so that um you know it's really important that we have uh those that the, the, the those groups or those teachers those guides to help us and then the third uh point that he mentioned so it's knowledge and then it's people to hold you accountable so knowledge is obviously the guidance that we need and we need to work on you know getting those from the proper sources so it is very much intertwined but also keeping in um the company of really good people who will hold us accountable so those are the first two points of right conduct and then this is also really important for going dispensations and interpretations concerning injunctions for one's own protection so i know it's very it's a, it's a word salad as they say it's quite wordy this this one but it's um it's basically talking about not looking for the easy route right because part of spiritual mastery and discipline is welcoming some of the discomfort right i mean we're in it right now fasting is absolutely to help us build willpower and um it is uncomfortable you know we're we're not sleeping as much we're obviously not drinking and eating during the day but the discomfort that we experience has exponential benefits to it and so getting out of this very modern uh mindset that everything good is always easy right or everything good is always comfortable and um easily accessible that's actually not true as anybody who's ever worked hard at anything will tell you that uh, the more hard work you put into something the more value it actually has so sometimes what happens is you know we um come into the practice of faith but then we're looking for all those little loopholes or ways out of doing things and we're kind of allowing that nafs to have um you know some still some influence over us um and you know this takes again for practice to to become aware of even those little suggestions those little nudges that maybe um are always looking for ease right and so being disciplined enough to say i need to you know take on this practice diligently seriously and not uh, give way for my nafs to 
uh, to basically, you know, um, to try to in any way um, give me that ease so that I fall into those habits. And then those, that becomes very difficult, again, to overcome. So that's also the third uh, point here on how to to correct our conduct, our behavior, so that we can get to the prerequisites of what are then the prerequisites for the foundational path. So it's amazing, subhanAllah, that there's so much more to what uh, what uh, we would maybe assume to actually be on this path, um, it, doing it, you know, with ihsan, with, with the correct way. Um, and of course, Islam is easy. So I want to mention that it's not a difficult thing, but it's a matter of working smart, not hard. And working smart is having this understanding and this structure and this roadmap. And of course, looking at the sunnah of the Prophet as he's our exemplar. That, that's how we work smart. When we work hard, we're trying to do it all on our own, which is the experience of many Muslims nowadays. You know, they just pick up books. They they, they flood their, their libraries with a lot of books. They'll take classes here and there. Um, they may open up the Quran or just hear kind of cherry pick different aspects of uh, Islam, which, it, which in and of itself is not a problem. But if it's not guided, if it's not done um, correctly, then it can pose problems. And I'll just mention this because it's relevant, but you know, recently during Ramadan, there's been a lot of online feuding, unfortunately. Um, and some of the most prominent da'is uh, teachers, maybe in, you know, in, in the West, um, have been unfortunately caught up in a wave of, of argumentation, caused a lot of fitna because, um, you know, there's this new Scottish prime minister named Hamza Youssef. Um, this obviously is not Sheikh Hamza Youssef, although many people got it wrong. But um, this prime minister apparently took some positions on LGBTQ that are, you know, contradict Islam. And so some people, without really understanding the context with which he may have said things, we don't know. The thing is, we it's always better to be neutral on these matters because you don't want to be held accountable before Allah to make the fear on someone, right? Just because someone says something um, without a context, uh, you want to be careful. So anyway, this whole debate started and a lot of them began to argue. And um, for now a couple of weeks, ever since this was announced, I think there's just been these back and forth um, videos on YouTube and a lot of fitna, unfortunately, and it's, it's sad because this is the month of Ramadan, obviously. And so to see that so many people are getting caught up in all of this as a result of, of teachers, right? And may Allah forgive them and, and guide us all. But that's really heartbreaking because our teachers are supposed to be excellent examples for us. Um, and, you know, we're all human. And, you know, there was, uh, alhamdulillah, apologies given. And, and inshallah, things are, are fine between the hearts. But the damage that I think um, these types of things cause, we just don't know because many people, as soon as they see these kinds of behaviors, they just turn away, they turn away from the deen. So this is the value of having, you know, really not trying to just do things on your own because then you may be blindsided by your own nafs and your own nafs is dictating to you and you don't know it. And next thing you know, you're embroiled in some fitna. Whereas a teacher or a group or someone that, really um, is close to you. And I think even in the way that the apologies have been given, it seems as though, alhamdulillah, that is the case, you know, that, that somehow maybe teachers or, or a good company got to the individuals and they helped them to, uh, to redress their, their mistakes. But this is, again, just the point of, of the importance and value of having really good uh, people in your life. Um, so, uh, so we're on point number three. So now the fourth uh, point here, um, is organizing one's time with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to maintain the presence of heart. So this is also, you know, I think anybody who's, uh, you know, pursuing, um, uh, whether it's a, a personal, you know, goal or, or in this case studies or work or, you know, they have some objective, they know that time is of the essence because Time either works for you or against you. And the best way to make your time useful is to be structured, to be organized, and to actually have, you know, um, have your, your calendar or whatever, you know, you use. You can use all these mo uh, modern gadgets. I know people who still use daily planners, <laughs> which seem like relics of the past in today's day and age, because they're not about like, you know, online stuff. It's all written and they actually use the, the planners 
very effectively because they can see it and you know they can t- they take it with them wherever they go. So everybody is going to have to choose for themselves the best way. But I think organizing your time to make sure that you know um, you know what you're doing. As we talked about, one of the again objectives um, of knowledge is that at any given moment you know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you in that moment. And that's just such a beautiful concept, you know, that that's uh, why, I mean, that's how we should, that's how we should exist, right? That we're always aware of the present so that we can know what, what does Allah expect of me in this moment? Um, So scheduling yourself would obviously help you to do that because if you, um, you know, naturally, I mean, inshallah, you know, depending on our work and our schedules and our routines, um, we may have already figured out uh, a good portion of our ibadah in terms of our prayers, right? So those are usually kind of locked in because uh, the prayer times are known to us and inshallah we're doing all of our prayers, we're prioritizing them. But then there's also other matters that we should think about. For example, our relationship with the Book of Allah, which is why Ramadan is such a gift because you know, it gives us the opportunity to really prioritize the Quran and more so I think than any other time of the year, we become very consistent, right? In our relationship with the Quran and we will uh, pencil it in as they say, um, as a priority in this month. So we, we're showing ourselves that it's very possible, right? Whether that's going to be after Fajr, which is, you know, um, according to the ayah in the Quran, right? That the recitation of the Quran at Fajr is witnessed right, that this is the most recommended time to read Qur'an would be um, at Fajr time, uh, inshallah. So that could be part of your routine. And hopefully you're doing it, you know, you're doing it already right now that you can see that it is very uh, possible because Allah is showing you you're doing it. So, you know, that you have that routine. And then, um, you know, I I, I had a, uh, someone on Facebook the other day um, write a beautiful post about the merits and benefits of uh, doing 1,000 salawat every single day. And I believe um, our Mashaikh said that we should be doing at least 300 to 500. Um, and that if a person doesn't have a spiritual guide, going back to the second point, that just doing salawat on a daily basis would compensate and that's just beautiful, right? Because the Prophet Sallallahu is obviously all of our, uh, you know, our teacher, our murabbi. He, he is the ultimate uh, sheikh teacher that any one of us could want. So even by by just doing our salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu we are protecting our hearts. Um, but obviously, ideally, it would be nice to have a direct relationship with the teacher. That's just in the event that a person is so remotely uh, distant or not able to find one that they would at least have a recourse. So the, the salawat, though, as this post was saying, was the benefits of a thousand. And mashallah, the brother went on to give a structure that if you were to do, you know, um, however, 200, I think he was saying, after every prayer, right, this is 200 times five, that you would gain a thousand salawat. And he's, you know, he just beautifully uh, gave the structure and the explanation that there's just, you know, the, the way you'll feel, the way your day will go, the way that you uh, will experience um, the openings that come from such a beautiful devotion are, uh, you know, are, are amazing. So that's how when we talk about organizing one's time, that's what it's about. It's about looking at what practices moving, I mean, for now, for example, we're talking about this in Ramadan, but what practices moving forward can we maintain and how are we going to plug them into our schedule? Because obviously we were only created to worship Allah. So that actually is the most important thing that we do, but is that reflected in our day? And where is it reflected? Because just the prayers alone, which are uh, you know un- undisputable or undisputed, they're thought we have to do them. If we're distracted even during those prayers, um, because that's who you know our creation, we're we're constantly distracted, then now it's it's a matter of quality, right? Not just quantity. So and then where, where are we compensating, right? Where are we compensating? And to me, you know, when I think of the Prophet Sallallahu and his routine, the du'as that he left us, right? At every single point of the day, what I gained from that is that the prayers are spread out and they're 
you know, really, uh, they're like massive kind of billboard signposts that tell us and remind us, right, that we we have one purpose only, and that's alhamdulillah. But again, because we're so distractible, we need other little signs throughout the day as well. So it's not enough to just have these five big neon signs that remind you, you you're going to go back to God. You will be standing in front of him and he will you know, take you to task for all that you did. That is, is good, but because our nature is so distractible, uh, the Prophet has left us all of these, you know, uh, daily du'as woven within the day between the prayers, right? So you wake up in the morning, you haven't even, you know, prayed Fajr yet, but your tongue, you, you say the du'a for, for waking up. And then you move to the bathroom and you say the du'a for entering the bathroom. And then you come out and you say the du'a for leaving the bathroom. And you say the du'a for completing your wudu. And then you move forward and maybe you go and get dressed and, and you say that du'a. And then, you know, you go to pray. And so subhanAllah, it's so beautiful because it's like every movement almost that we do or every action that we do, even just, I mean, bismillah, that's that's uh, uh, what we should initiate all of our actions. But that being, our tongue being moist with this type of remembrance throughout the day is constantly uh, reorienting us, right? So it's kind of like the nafs within is this force that it, that causes you to look away from your path. And shaitan obviously is calling you from the other side, you know, so you've got these forces that are taking your focus away from your path. And then you have uh, these other more, more better forces that are actually reorienting you when you look away. And that's how, alhamdulillah, you know, you, we can understand the du'as that we say and the prayers that we say. Um, and this is just human nature, right? So organizing one's time, really important. And to also be mindful. That's also the other part of it. So it's not just that we're reflexively or, or moving quickly mechanically through our acts of ibadah, but we're actually sitting paused, uh, you know, with real um, uh, presence, right? Doing that tadabur, tafakkur, um, just thinking about everything that we're experiencing, uh, whether it's you know, the breath that we're exchanging, you know, the, the, the carbon dioxide, the oxygen, just thinking about what a ni'mah it is to be able to breathe. Like, you know, I've seen, um, I've seen uh, people close to me who've been ill, have really labored breathing. And until you watch how stressful it is to see someone who can't breathe, you might not take it. I mean, you might take it for granted. Um, but it's really something that if you're present with Allah, like even these things, these, um, you know, these systems, these bodily functions that we're doing at all times without any effort, right? They're, they're just happening because it's by Allah's will that you start to be like aware of it. And like, subhanAllah, you know, when it was cold uh, the past couple of weeks, for example, I would look at my nail beds and, you know, if, if it gets really cold and you're your extremities aren't blood supply isn't getting it. You'll see, you'll start to see this bluish purple hue on your nail bed, you know, that's indicating to you that your, your blood is somehow, you know, not getting to, to, to your limbs. Right. And, you know, there's science for that because when it's really cold, your blood uh, preserves your vital organs. So uh, that's why your limbs tend to be cold, right. As well until you warm up. So your hands and your feet, but it's amazing that we have all of these signs that Allah has created to help us to just be mindful of these things. Like, you know, you're, you've got blood surging through your veins and, uh, you know, there's all these, I don't remember exactly what it is, but it's, it's insane. The length, when you add up all of the, you know, the, um, the, the network of our circulatory system, right. But with the blood vessels and the capillaries and the arteries, when you, when you stretch it all out, it's like thousands and thousands of miles. <laughs> it's hard to even fathom how that is contained within our bodies. But this is the type of thought process that brings one into the presence of, uh, of Allahu Akbar, right. Where, where you're just like in awe. And um, I would recommend this because I think he's doing an incredible job. There's a brother named Paul Williams, and he um, he's a convert to Islam from, from the UK. He has a YouTube page called Blogging Theology, which is very popular, mashallah, and he invites a lot of great guests 
Um, but he also has, I don't know if he does it on any other platform. I just follow him on Twitter. He has a very strong Twitter uh, presence, but he has this amazing hashtag that he started, um, which is just so great. And a lot of the stuff he shares, I think would be great to even show your children because he finds these incredible examples of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's, you know, mulk, this is, you know, the universe, whether it's, you know, celestial or, or animal or just the, you know, the, the uh, plants and vegetation. But what he does is he shows us, he reminds us. And the hashtag he's created is called no design. And he kind of does this thing where, you know, he writes no design and then there's like a little eye roll emoji. And he's speaking to the atheists, right? Because the atheists are so quick to look at human um, accomplishments uh, and and fawn over them because oh we're so intelligent intelligent design but then they um, they they don't have that same reaction to the natural world where there's phenomenon everywhere so anyway these are really wonderful ways that you can just get those kind of doses of wonder that we all are so in need of to bring us back into that state of this is incredible like the fact that we are in existence this is incredible, like that we have consciousness, right? It is something to behold. Um, so those are the ways that we can do that. But if, again, we have to organize our time. And then and then the last point he makes here is suspecting the selfish soul, the nafs, right? In everything in order to free oneself from its whimsical desires and to be safe from destructive circumstances. It's very hard to, um, you know, like when, when we think of harm or or evil or darkness, we usually think of external things, right? But sometimes we forget that the greatest harm to ourselves, to our souls, is actually within us. It is the nafs. It is the greatest impediment, the greatest evil, the greatest obstacle to our closeness to Allah. So to suspect the self is very important to constantly question oneself that when you uh, do something, you say something, um, you, you know, you, ha you take a position, right? Sometimes we take hard line positions on something and we feel very right to always be a little suspicious of oneself. What is my motivation? Why do I feel so strongly about this? Is this a, a thought that my nafs is compelling me to, or is it truly something of virtue? This is how we we do this process of suspecting the nafs. So um, alhamdulillah, these are the five, again, foundations of right conduct. And now if you just scroll down um, as we're doing, you will see that he's going to go over the pitfall of each. And this is also really relevant information because he's reminding us that as we pursue these uh, ways of uh, conducting ourselves to be mindful of what could happen along the way. So the first is saying, the pitfall of seeking knowledge is the company of sophomoric people, whether due to their age and intellect or deficient religious practice. In other words, those who do not refer to sound principles of guidance in their actions. So a person, for example, could take on the path of knowledge, but then they fall into the wrong group that doesn't have good, um, you know, first of all, they don't have, uh, you know, a, 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 a tradition that, uh, or or a chain, excuse me, they're not part of, of a sound uh, chain of transmission. This should be the first red flag because anybody who claims to be a teacher, right, who claims to have knowledge should be able to provide their background. Like, who did you study with? What what are your credentials? And I think we understand that, interestingly enough, in, uh, in a material sense, right? Um, if you go to, if you wanted to, you know, take a, a class on mathematics or science or something else, you would want to know the credentials of the teacher and make sure they go to a reliable, or they went to a reliable institution and that they actually, you know, are credible people. So the same applies, if not more, to our faith. And that um, that requires transparency. It requires someone being very um, open about their teachers and what they studied and what credentials they have. And people who don't do that, but yet speak um, as though they are authorities are very dangerous, very dangerous. And there are many of them. There's so many of them now online with uh, TikTok because these spaces have exploded during the pandemic. Um, you know, TikTok, YouTube, there are a lot of da'is. They, they call, they self, you know, describe themselves as da'is. But uh, just by their takes, by the way that they speak, they don't lack, they lack adab, which is 
a hallmark quality of a believer, let alone a scholar or a teacher or a student of knowledge. So a person who espouses, you know, righteousness and deen and and tries to direct people to the book of Allah and the sunnah, but does so with a foul tongue, does so while simultaneously cursing other people, that is not someone you ever want to take deen from. Um, And so be careful, basically, that when you're seeking knowledge, that you seek it from people who are actually credible and check their sources so that you don't fall into um, the dangerous groups that are uh, that abound right now. The pitfall of keeping company with the spiritual guides and the fraternity is elitism, deception and self-righteous meddling in the affairs of others. This is an amazing point because this absolutely happens, right? Group think is real. When you start to follow a certain, um, you know, kind of belong to a group and you um, you carry yourself a certain way, maybe the, you, where you live, there's a certain group that is recognized by the community and it has, you know, some rank and status. And now you've, you're in that group. That can be very dangerous spiritually because now is it the uh, the the you know the glory of being a part of a group like that that you're seeking or is it the glory of God right What are you seeking What what are you Why are you there So the danger is that you might start to really again um, uh, like the enjoy the perks right Enjoy um, all of the uh, doors that are opened for you as you are now part of this elite group of students or, you know, uh, spiritual uh, seekers. So these are the things you want to be very careful of. And also that sometimes when people get very enmeshed with each other, they create unhealthy uh, co, uh, you know, dependencies where, where they lose the respectful boundaries that we should always maintain, you know, just because someone is in your home and you're interacting um, with them day in and day out and learning from them doesn't mean that now you should uh, pry or meddle into their uh, business or affairs. But these are where, you know, just having more uh, clear, de- clearly defined boundaries would help, which can be a problem if people get fall into this group thinks uh, type of um, uh, issue. So there's just something to be mindful of, not to fall into group think. Um, and, uh, and, you know, keeping company with, with people who may, uh, you may feel that, that sense of pride and just belonging to, it, you have to be very careful with, with these things. So the third pitfall uh, that he mentions is a foregoing dispensations and interpretations concerning injunctions is self-pity due to hardship. So if there are ruchsas, for example, um, that you, uh, you know, would want to seek out that because you're disciplining yourself, you might start to shaitan, you know, your nafs might start to make you feel like you are, um, you're a victim of some type, you know, like, oh, this is becoming so hard for you. And I'll just give you a very brief example. As we know, uh, uh, you know, for, for women who are pregnant or nursing, the option to fast is there. And every woman has to make a decision for herself, right? Every woman has to make a decision for herself. So, um, and, you know, many people would say it's up to, you know, the medical, um, like if she has, you know, a doctor or someone advising her, but also herself, like if she notices she's feeling weak, that she, you know, uh, can can take that ruhsa. There are more, you know, conservative opinions that would say it's better for her to fast and, you know, unless there is a direct threat to her or the baby. So there's difference of opinion on this matter, but someone may find themselves in this predicament where they want to be strong. You know, they want to be strong. They want to maybe push through a fast while pregnant or nursing, but then that, um, you know, because they're doing it for the sake of Allah and they're doing it to, um, you know, to maybe limit the amount of makeup fast they have, they'll have to do later. There, there's a lot of reasons why people would want to push through the fast. Right. But then this idea might come where it's like, oh, you, you poor thing, you know, you're suffering. And all of a sudden there's this guilt and this shame. And, and that's where you have to be very clear that when you make a decision, right, as we uh, mentioned before, that you see it through and you don't just um, start to self-pity because that is enough dictating to you. Um, and also don't rush into decisions, right? Make decisions thoughtfully, carefully, because you want to commit to them. And similarly with people who wear hijab, you know, there are a lot of 
uh, sisters who wear hijab because they have resolve, right? They feel it, they feel the himma, they start to do it. But then somewhere down the line, all of a sudden, you know, they... Um, they uh, they forget that there's you know if they if they take the more conservative route of wearing hijab, um, they'll start to feel like they're missing out because oh so and so is wearing like a wrap and she can kind of be more creative with her style and she wears makeup and so there's all this wasmus stuff that enters the mind and maybe that sister now starts to feel like somehow because she didn't take certain easy uh, you know paths. That she was, she's being, you know, um, she's she's on the short end of it. These are all short, you know, again, pitfalls that you want to be mindful of because enough lies, enough deceives, enough tricks. So um, that's an important point. And then the pitfall of constantly suspecting the selfish soul is inclining towards its upright states and goodliness. But Allah Subhanahu that reminds us, were he to offer every kind of compensation, it would not be accepted from him. So when we, um, you know, uh, start to suspect the nafs, that's also part of the trick of the nafs is we can start to feel proud of how well we are mindful of our nafs. And so, you know, these are all just very subtle spiritual things that can creep in and compromise the purity of what we're doing. And so he's pointing all these things out so that we can be very uh, you know, aware and awake and vigilant, right? And he goes on to say, moreover, the noble son of the noble one, Yusuf, the son of Yaqub, peace be upon him, um, uh, peace be upon them both, says in the Quran, I do not say the selfish soul is free from blame. The selfish soul indeed commands to evil acts, except for those on whom my Lord has mercy. So that's just an example. And some people attribute this verse to being Zulekha who was speaking. So there is a difference of opinion, but here we're just citing this opinion. So, you know, to, to be careful that if you get so far to the extreme of thinking like you've got your soul figured out, that that might make you feel, um, uh, you know, puffed up a little bit. And that in and of itself is a sign of, of, of the delusions of the nafs. So there's all these things to be mindful of, uh, alhamdulillah. And I think we can stop um, so that we can allow for some Q&A before we stop. And then we'll continue next week, inshallah, with the foundations of what will cure the sicknesses of the soul. So this is going to be really uh, interesting as well, because we have to remember that we all are diseased. We have spiritual disease of, of different varying degrees, um, but we also have cures and remedies. So inshallah, we'll talk more about that. Uh, next week, but let's go ahead and um, I'll stop the screen share and Ustada uh, Fadu if there are any questions that I'm happy to, to take. Thank you, Ustada Hasai, for that beautiful class today. Mashallah. I just want to um, ask that everybody put their questions in the Q&A versus using the chat to make it easier for us to follow, inshallah. So I'm, there's two questions in the Q&A right now. The first says, Salam, how can we become more intentional with seeking good virtual sahaba if it is evident that seeking it in person is difficult where one resides? MashaAllah, excellent. I mean, a beautiful question. I think you're at the right place. I mean, here we have Rahma Foundation, one of my favorite organizations, because the whole purpose of it is to bring sisters together, to learn from one another, to be in these companies. And if you've haven't yet been blessed to attend a, a, a non-site um, uh, qiyam or halaqa, then alhamdulillah, they do have a lot of online, uh, you know, programs. And they're they're going to have one, I believe, Tuesday evening and then continue through the odd nights, uh, qiyam, a major one on Friday evening. So I think, you know, looking to contact um, people or, or organizations like Rahma and asking, maybe you could even say, I'm in this particular region or locality. Is there, do you, is there a way, is there a bulletin? Is there a way for us as Rahma students to engage with each other so that I could put out like a bulletin maybe to say, hey, I'm in this area. I would love to meet up with any sisters who are also in a similar area. Or is there anyone from the online virtual space that would like to have an offline um, group. And, you know, I, I'm, um, I follow, for example, this, someone had this great idea. So Shehamza through the Zaytuna College, he has the book club, right? The first command book club. And it's a, it's a great, uh, mashallah, space. If you're, if you're not familiar with it, look into it. But one of the attendees decided to go on Telegram and create a group for all of the book club members. So now everybody is talking to each other and then they have this amazing, I don't know how they did it because I'm not really familiar with Telegram, 
But within that group, they have a bunch of subgroups all based on top. It's topical. So they have topical subgroups like parenting. And I'm like, what a great idea. You've brought people from an international audience together on a platform. And now each person kind of has their own niche or, you know, group to, to be able to, to, you know, uh, to uh, dialogue with. So there's these options, but I would definitely say contact, you know, the info at Rahman and see if there's a way for you maybe during one of the PMs to put it, put that out there and, and we can put you in contact with some sisters inshallah. May Allah bless you. Thank you. I actually didn't know that the book club had uh, a group. I need to get on that. <laughs> oh, you're going to love it. It's incredible. The subgroups I'm just shocked at. I'm like, how do they do this? We all should do it. Yeah, maybe, we, maybe you need an Ahmed Foundation telegram page. Yeah, maybe that that might work. We, uh, if somebody knows how, maybe I should join that one to see how it's organized. And then yes. kind of go from I, there. Halas. Yeah, I think we should. And I'll help you with that Sadafado, because uh, I think it's a phenomenal idea. So may the sister who asked, may, may you receive the reward of that, inshallah, if it happens. Hopefully it will happen. Thank people, inshallah. And again, another question similarly related. What uh, what are the best means for cultivating good sahba in one's local community if there are no third spaces to gather and meet people? How can one initiate in this area if there is a clear gap? Alhamdulillah. Great, great um, question. Jazakallah khairan. I had a sister a few years ago attend one of my halaqas and she had just come back from like an Alamiya program, but she was in the same boat. Like, what do I do? So I told her, I said, you know, we, this is how we started off. Salafado knows, you know, 25 years ago or so I, I've aged myself, but yes, that long ago, we were doing halaqas out of home, rotating from home to home for the sisters who had space and just meeting weekly. It was called Friday night halaqa, um, but we were meeting weekly. So I just told her, you know, just start at the home level with a few sisters, sincere sisters, make it once a week, twice a week, whatever works for your schedules, but do it at someone's home. Don't worry about the space. I saw her maybe a month and a half ago at an event um, where she invited me as a speaker to her organization that she now works with. And she shared this with me. I forgot about that in her exchange, but she said, SubhanAllah, you told me to start home alaqas. We started with four or five people and now look. And I was shocked because I'm speaking at this incredible event with hundreds of sisters and it all came from that seed. So start with just a small group in your home halaqa and let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of the rest. You'll see it expand. Maybe at some point someone will say, hey, we have a venue. Why don't you use it? And you'll it'll just turn into something amazing. But always have um, you know high him and shalom. I'll give you tawfiq. That's great. I mean, even the Rahma Foundation, it was just a group of us that came together that wanted to have programs. Yeah. You know, some fifteen years ago, and you know, you just slowly build. Inshallah, they get, that we can have more of these types of uh, organizations across the country. Absolutely, absolutely, mashallah. Oh, I'm sorry. And I just wanted to make mention because sometimes when people think of starting a halaqa, they fear that they have to have like a lot of knowledge. But the best thing to do if, if you feel like you're with a group of people that are kind of all starting off is to look to the teachers. So there's a lot of resources already. So I know people who come together, they'll watch a YouTube uh, talk and then they'll talk. They'll read a book together and then they'll talk. This is how we grow in knowledge and also how we respect, you know, we kind of stay in our lane so that nobody starts to get ahead of themselves and you know presumes to uh, to be um, more you know on the uh, uh, more more um, qualified than maybe where they're at because it keeps you in line when you have uh, teachers to hold you accountable to. So that's just something I want to mention. But I'm sorry, go ahead, Osada. I think there are a couple more questions. Sorry, I had to mute myself. One of my children was like calling, and I'm like, shh. <laughs> oh well, it worked out. I didn't know. <laughs> just, we're actually, it worked out perfectly. You literally started and ended as I was dealing with that. So alhamdulillah. <laughs> All right. The next question says, my question is, how can I strengthen my soul to not care about what others say about me? For example, I recently hosted an iftar for in-laws and someone commented on the dryness of a certain food. I felt I, I was very sad and felt defeated and had anxiety. I worked so hard to host and cook and felt disrespected. SubhanAllah. May Allah bless you, sister. The fact that you cooked in the month of Ramadan for guests supersedes any critique they could make of you. And the thing is, the best thing to do is when you see people lacking uh, 
you know, the most basic of, of that, like the proposal I sent him, when he didn't like something, he would never criticize it. He just would avoid it, but he wouldn't go out of his way to tell the person this isn't good. So if you see people lacking this very basic etiquette of how to receive your hosts and, and feel gra- grateful that they cared to invite you, that they cared to cook for you, even if it wasn't the most perfect meal, then you should just, you know, look at it like as a deficiency in them, make the offer them, but certainly not take their critique to heart because your reward is with Allah, whether it was dry, that's a very subjective thing. Some people could eat, two people could eat the same thing. One person comes out and it's raving and the other person's like, no, it's not. So subjective criticism like that are not something you should ever, you know, let affect your heart because the Nia that you had in, in, in cooking for them and the beautiful, you know, uh, reward, the rewards that, that are awaiting you, as I said, far supersede one person's criticism. So don't uh, attribute uh, that as some flaw that you now have to worry about and, and, you know, fear that, oh no, I'm a bad cook. No, astaghfirullah. They just lacked basic adab and make dua for them and make, uh, and just be content that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with you. We don't need to be pleasing people because you'll never please people. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the bare minimum we do, the bare minimum we do, he is pleased with us because we still are, are, are showing up and we're fighting ourselves. It's not easy to fight uh, oneself, right? So alhamdulillah, sister, your reward is with Allah. This last question is my favorite. It says, Salams, my mom is wondering when you're going to release a CD and al- uh, anthology of your lessons. I suggest maybe <laughs> a commentary on the CD set of Purification of the Heart, along with your clubhouse sessions. <laughs> and some book writing on top of that, too. <laughs> Jazakallah khairan. That's very, very kind and generous of you, mashallah. Um, you know, I... As a Sada Fadwa knows, uh, this is I'm kind of in this perpetual um, struggle because I love to write, um, and then there's so much need in our community. There's a lot of you know needs that come my way, so I have a very difficult time managing what's what my heart tells me or what my mind tells me. Because if it, I had it like my way, uh, I would you know be more um, I would be more structured, be more be more consistent with producing and doing things. Cause you know, we all want to be able to um, have goals that are met, but I think my heart gets pulled in so many different directions. So it's really difficult. And I, I feel like a broken record, just make it offer me please. Because I think at a certain point, <laughs> like we all do, um, you know, we're going to run out of gas and uh, you know, we're just going to have to slow down. And maybe that's, that's when you might see more, um, more writing and more, more content being produced, um, hopefully, inshallah. <laughs> but, but thank you for the good opinion. May Allah bless you. I think we'll just have to make you solar so you don't run out of gas, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah. Uh, and then and I think that's it for questions tonight. And then, um, inshallah, if you can just close with a dua, that'd be great. Absolutely. Oh, again, first of all, Jazakum al-Khair to the Rahma Foundation, to Asada Fadwa and the whole team for helping put these wonderful programs together. I love this text and I'm so happy to be sharing it anytime I can. So thank you for the platform. And thank you to all of you for attending week after week. As we mentioned, we will likely have to go beyond Ramadan. So I hope you'll stick it out for as long as you can. Um, and inshallah, the recordings are available to you as well. So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يسكفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله جزاكم الله خيرا everyone إن شاء الله we will see you next Monday Wow, this is, I think, the most punctual we've ever been. One minute past the hour. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. But we'll see you next Monday. Jazakallah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mubarak night. And today is, of course, the day of the 27th. So alhamdulillah, may Allah accept from all of us uh, our ibadah, whatever we gave, inshallah, for his sake, may he accept it. Um, with that said, I uh, wanted to just also welcome, there are, I, I, today I did a, something a little different. I have some friends hopefully joining me here on Instagram Live as well. I thought, why not um, try this out? I'm not a multitasker when it comes to these kinds of things, but today seemed a little easier to do. Just hit the live button on 
Instagram. Um, but I'm for those of you who are watching on Instagram, I'm with the Rahma Foundation. We are doing a class called the Foundations of the Spiritual Path. If you go to my link tree on Instagram, I want to thank uh, Brother Omar for pointing it out to me that I had posted it there. You will see the link for to register. It's free. Anyone can tune in if you want to join the actual broadcast happening. You can register for that because we're going to continue even inshallah after Ramadan. So this class is basically on this document. It's an incredible document translated by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, but it's by written by Sidi Ahmed Zarruq. Um, and so we have been going through this for several weeks now. I think this is our fourth session or third. I can't remember, but alhamdulillah, um, I'm very excited to continue this text. So we begin, inshallah, first with our dua. So we're going to do our dua together, and then I'll jump into the text. But again, for those who are on uh, Instagram, you might want to come on the Zoom call because there's a lot of visual um, stuff here to look at. So hopefully it'll help you to follow along. Um, so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatiha lima ughriqa wal-Khatima lima sabaqa nasud al-Haqi bil-Haqi al-Hadi ila suratika al-Mustaqim wa ala alihi al-Haqa qadrihi wa miqdarihi al-Azim. اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا اللهم بالقرآن وذكر الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وسدنا علما يقربنا منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا سهلا لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم وتجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سهلا اللهم عيدنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستقبلك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله Again, uh, rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. We're going to now begin the text or reading the text. So I just wanted to actually share with you something that I worked on just a little while ago. I thought for those of us who are visual learners, this may further help to kind of see what we're doing here. So I'm going to screen share um, Actually, I should just put this in the same tab so I don't have to keep going back and forth. Hang on one second. Let me add this to the same tab and then that makes my sharing um, a lot easier to do, inshallah. Okay, so what I have done here is, because as I've mentioned, and I say it all the time, but it's true, I am a visual learner. I like to just see things. So this is um, how, when I imagine reading this text, this is how I'm reading it, right? That we started off, defining what the foundations of the spiritual path are, according to Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, who uh, gave us, mashallah, so much content and rich insight into how to really be on a path, right? If you, if we want to take our path seriously, which inshallah we all do, I mean, we're here, alhamdulillah, we're in the month, blessed month of Ramadan, inshallah, we're fasting, we're praying, we're doing uh, our Quran recitation, our dhikr, our charity, we're doing all the things that we should be doing every day of the year, because that is the purpose with which we were existed, uh, which we were brought into existence, excuse me, which is to worship Allah. So all of these things we're doing and it's being facilitated for us. And if we want to sustain this path, right, because that's what we're, these are the conversations we need to start having. How can we keep this momentum going? Then we need to really see it as clearly explained to us what the ask is. And the ask, which of course is, you know, benefiting us and only us is that we uh, take seriously our, our path, uh, our spiritual path, and we start to build upon it. But in order to do that, we have to first lay the foundation. So that's what Sidi Ahmed Zaruk has done. He's given us here the uh, the five uh, foundations, which are taqwa, right? Being mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he, you know, I'm just giving those summary points for us all to kind of, again, um, you know, bring full circle what we're doing here. But to be mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, in private and in public, right? So that's the uh, condition. There's, these are all conditional that we have to have taqwa consistently. We also have to practice the sunnah consistently in both word and action. We can't just, you know, teach uh, or 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 share uh, the, the the beauty of the Prophet character and his sirah without acting upon it, right? That would be a huge fail, um, and, and it would be actually a sign of ingratitude, right? To acknowledge on one hand. Uh, that he is the perfect role model and the exemplar, but then to not even embody it, it doesn't make you very convincing, right? It doesn't make you convincing at all. So we have to put it into practice. And then indifference to whether or not people accept you or reject you. This is really important, given the context that many of us may find ourselves today, where social pressure actually uh, really does inform a lot of our decisions, right? Many people are afraid 
to uh, disappoint people, whether it's their, you know, family or, you know, people in their immediate circle or outside of, you know, in professional circles, wherever they go, there's a lot of uh, these things that people are factoring into their choices and decisions. But in order to be sincere on the path, you have to completely um, abandon that idea of letting the people dictate to you uh, and really thinking more about what is in your best interest in terms of your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the creation becomes irrelevant, right? It's about the creator. Um, and then contentment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in whatever difficulty you find yourself, whatever you know situation you find yourself, whether it's in times of prosperity or in times of hardship, that you have a consistent uh, rida with Allah, that you do not allow life circumstances to turn your heart this way or that way from Allah, but that you understand it's all from Him. The blessings are for him, from Him, the tests are from Him, right? So your loyalty, your fidelity, your love, your devotion, your reverence to Allah remains the same, undisturbed uh, regardless of what's happening to you. And then the fifth point is reliance, right? That your default setting is to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you are in times of ad adversity or difficulty and in times of prosperity. And this last point is really important because I think it's easy for us to turn to Allah when we feel helpless and, and, and sometimes even hopeless. That may uh, just be natural, right? We're inclined to do that because what other means do we have? But when Allah is telling us that in times of prosperity and abundance, we should actually be turning to him, this is, I think, sometimes lost on us because we're easily distracted by dunya and ease and comfort and luxury and all the things that we enjoy, that we forget that it is those acts of uh, devotion, those, you know, the, the things that we do consistently that are um, really giving us the reserves that we need when things get bad, right? So we're kind of, we're stockpiling, we're adding, we're building the reserves because spiritual reserves are necessary. We should constantly be looking to try to fortify ourselves. Uh, life hits people very hard. I just spoke to someone earlier on a clubhouse call who uh, lost her father, um, Allah Arhamhu, to an, a car accident just 10 days ago. Sudden, sudden death. I mean, subhanAllah, um, taken in, the, in this blessed month of Ramadan, uh, of course, and inshallah, we pray that he is accepted as a shaheed. But regardless, it is still very difficult for the, the bereaved to process a, a death like that. But if you've been doing your work, right, spiritually, consistently, every day, day in and day out, doing your prayers, reading your Quran, doing your dhikr, reading the stories from the Quran, turning to the book of Allah, then those, when those events, if those events are decreed for you, when they happen, inshallah, you'll be able to stand, you'll be able to have that, that, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that necessary strength to endure. So this, these are the five foundations. And then if you remember, we've, we've talked about these again, for those of you who've been consistently coming every week, just like Mawakhirin, but we talked about how to, uh, what are the prerequisites of getting there? How can we even achieve this? It seems uh, maybe too, too uh, difficult, but it's not, subhanAllah, because again, our amazing scholars have given us the details or the or the prerequisites. They've, they've outlined it for us. So exalted aspirations, right? Allah's reverence, service, khidmah, completing our resolves. If you have a goal, you actually see it through. And then being in a constant state of gratitude, magnifying your blessings. So these are the ways with which we can at least uh, aspire to those five foundations. And then all of that, right, requires proper conduct. So I just love the way that this is structured and it really helps us to understand so that we can see and visualize where are we missing? Where are the gaps? What do, what do I need to work on, right? So the proper conduct is in and of itself its own foundation, right? And that's why you, when you, as you read the text, this is how you want to understand it. It's like levels, right? The highest level are, are the foundations, right? And we, because of our state and the, and the time that we're in, we're, we have to work on the, on the lower levels. We're, we're, we need to go all the way back to the, to the original steps, you know, before we can even begin to get to the foundations and then build and beautify and build upon that. So this is how we're working. So the proper conduct, he's also helped to, um, to, uh, to elucidate, like, what does that mean? Well, how do you get to proper conduct? You have to seek knowledge. You have to know what proper conduct is. You can't 
have proper conduct without knowing it, you have to also seek out spiritual guides. You have to look at people who are ahead of you on the path so that you can follow their example. Because trying to do this on your own is very difficult. It's very difficult to, to, to try to do this on your own. And then you also don't want to look for those shortcuts, right? If you are intending to go on a path and you, you want to really experience the journey, then you can't just be looking for loopholes, right? And there are, of course, that paths of ease that are within our Sharia and fiqh that are meant to facilitate certain circumstances. But if you at the very onset of your journey are already looking to try to seek out the paths of ease, then you're not really up for the, for the arduous path ahead. And you should be, because this is what is going to fortify you. So foregoing those dispensations and then organizing one's time, this is how we get to proper conduct. And then the last point that we talked about, um, which uh, was to suspect the nafs, right? And so these are the ways that we um, get to proper conduct. Um, and then, sorry, let me just check here. Okay, I think I, I didn't, I apologize. I'm looking at this here. I didn't get a chance to edit the bottom levels here. So hold on to that. Don't, don't, um, don't, uh, don't look at that yet because this is really what the next level should be. So just ignore that bottom level because this is what we're gonna talk about today. Okay, so today we're going to look at how to cure the soul sickness because if you want to get to proper conduct if you want to do all the things we just talked about right which is seek knowledge keeping spiritual guides foregoing dispensations organizing time and then suspecting the nafs you have to be mindful of your own delusions of your own spiritual diseases and afflictions so he's giving us these all of these insights uh, so that we really are doing this right right we're really addressing um our, our needs in, in a correct organized structured manner so i just wanted to share this and you feel free for those of you who are here to just quickly snapshot any of these and, and i'll share them again but i'm going to now flip over to the document because i just wanted to you know kind of bring us all back to where we left off last time so that we can now read together about the uh, spiritual sicknesses. So at the bottom of page 10 here, so we have the PDF open. Let me zoom in here so that you can see. Uh, we start this section, right? The foundations of what will cure the sickness of the soul are five. So now this is a new level, right? This is the level of, of pur purifying the heart or the soul. So the first thing he mentions is quite relevant because we're still in the month of Ramadan, is moderation achieved by lightening the stomach's intake of food and drink. So subhanAllah, you see now that this is all, you know, and I'm, for those, of course, who are familiar with, with other um, teachings like those of Imam al-Ghazali and others, this connection of spiritual strength and the appetites is very well known. And it, this isn't exclusive to Islam either. Many other religious traditions have, you know, um, have uh, acts that involve uh, abstaining that uh, have acts uh, that involve restraint, right? Uh, the uh, the Catholics, of course, we know they have certain periods where they fast. We have um, other traditions as well, the Buddhists, the Hindus, they have a tradition of fasting and just being able to really uh, not give in to every appetite. And there's a great reason because when we are um, diminishing, right, the power of the nafs, then that allows for what to emerge, Right, think of it that way. It's kind of like we have these two oppositional forces within us, which are our nafs, the appetite of soul, right? Which which calls us to all of our base desires, and then you have the aql and the 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 ruh that was that's created to worship Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, the higher form of of our being that's constantly looking to draw closer to Allah, and they are really working uh, oppositionally. And so when we suppress the lower nafs, when we're not giving into our food and our drink and our sexual appetites and our sleep, although sleep is necessary, of course, because we need it to function, but we're not indulging. And there's a difference there, right? When you're indulging and you just don't want to get out of bed because you want to be on TikTok all day or just you're pretending to sleep, right? Sometimes people delude themselves uh, to these things uh, because they just want to basically veg, as they say. These, uh, this can uh, this can really um, prevent us from achieving a lot, spiritually speaking, right? So when we're suppressing all those things, when we give into those things, that's what I mean. But when we suppress those things, when we don't give into the lower nafs, then what happens is we find ourselves suddenly having much more energy, much more um, himma, as they say, right? Which is ambition or aspiration. 
we feel that, that this, this desire to, to do more. And then from the efforts that we give, and of course, in this month, uh, the month of Ramadan, Allah, out of his uh, generosity, will um, expand time, right? The dilation of time. So you suddenly find yourself just being able to produce more and have also other benefits like the clarity of mind, right? How many of us experience that? So the, the to, to really achieve moderation, which is, um, you know, temperance, ifa, the ability to know when is enough, right? It's This is a virtue. It's a, one of the cardinal virtues. But it's the ability to just really not indulge beyond your needs is something that requires practice because by by nature we want more right we're very nafsi beings and nafsi being that we want to constantly indulge these appetites that is the default setting of the human being so we have to work to moderation and that's where where fasting becomes incredibly useful to actually get to that level right and we we're given this month where it's required of us but subhanallah, like with everything, and this is the, the sad state of the human being, is that we cannot see the immense benefits of what, even what, what Allah requires of us to do. All of it benefits us. You know, it's not, you, and human beings are different, right? When you have certain tasks or work that you have to do that feels forced, you know, or is you have to do it, like for, for your employer or for school, um, those things can really feel weighty because they're arbitrarily sometimes given based on the, you know, the, the individual who's dictating, right? So individuals, we can sometimes, um, you know, not always uh, um, delegate or, or, or give, um, you know, instructions on certain you know, whether it's to children, students, or other people that are necessarily always going to be beneficial to them. We we can sometimes, because we're humans, we make mistakes, right? So our ability to uh, necessarily be able to, you know, um, to 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 um, require of others uh, things that are, are always going to be beneficial isn't, that's not guaranteed. Whereas with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every single thing, every single thing that he expects of us to do is always beneficial, consistently beneficial. Our prayers, our fasts, our Quran recitation, everything we do, it's not a chore that would in any way bring harm, right? It's all because it's all been determined by our creator who obviously knows what we need. So he knows best what is in our best interest. That, that's why we have to really show immense gratitude that that our Lord is, is you know, he's giving us this opportunity in this month of Ramadan where he has made it, you know, a fard, it's a pillar of Islam to fast, right? It's not optional because he wants us to go against ourselves, right? Uh, if it wasn't fard, how many of us would fast? We, we wouldn't. If we had the option to fast or not, most of us would not fast. I, I can guarantee it. I'll, I'll speak first about my own self. I'd probably find ways to get out of it because it's optional. But the fact that it's fard, you know, we got to do it. We And we're believers, we're committed. We do it, but then subhanAllah, we reap the benefits. So this is our generous Lord. He makes it required for that reason, right? Or what? that's one of the reasons so that we can see for ourselves. And then of course, the rewards that he has waiting for us. I mean, there's just so much abundance there, but the point is that moderation in, in, in will, will help us to, to cure our diseases. But in order to become moderate, we have to do certain things. So that's where fasting becomes an incredible tool. The next point of getting you know, uh, mastery over the nafs and purifying the nafs of these diseases is to be vigilant about places where one fears that they are going to make mistakes. So this requires some brutal honesty with yourself. Like you, we all know that there are certain people that may pull us into haram, we all know that there are certain places and environments that when we go to, we suddenly get a little too loose, you know, um, sometimes because of familiarity of just closeness of comfort level, we lose comportment, we lose other, we lose the vigilance over ourselves, and we may start to do certain things that we wouldn't normally do uh, or by ourselves or in other settings, right? And so that's why we have to be very careful. Like if you know, if you had, for example, like let's say when you were in your high school, college days, you had a period of, you know, jahiliya, like we call it, right? Like a period of ignorance, 
Um, uh, you know, you did certain things that maybe you're not proud of, but you had your a partner in crime to do it with, right? You had someone who was um, there with you and you guys did things together. That person now, unless they've reformed and, and you've reformed and you've really truly made Toba, can become dangerous to you, right? If you have kind of started to go in a different direction and that person is not at the same level, right? Maybe they're not there yet and Allah guides whomever he wills, but you leave the door open to maintain um, a friendship with this individual, knowing that you kind of have this history with them and there could be a relapse you're risking your own soul, right? So you have to have the presence of mind to know that as much as that person, maybe you care for them and you should, we shouldn't cut people off. We should certainly not think ourselves as better than those when we, um, if we've kind of achieved a certain, you know, spiritual, um, like we're, we're, we're being drawn spiritually, we should never let ourselves think uh, of ourselves as being better than others, but we should just be honest and say, I'm weak still, right? I'm vulnerable. I could easily relapse if I'm with this person or go to this environment. You know, maybe if you're on a college campus this is a perfect scenario I've had, because I work with college students, I've had this, you know, issue come up of, you know, non-Muslim uh, uh, friends, classmates who are really nice people and you get along with them, but they always want to invite you to like party kind of environments, you know? And I, I recently actually had this question from a brother who was like, how do you deal with that? You know, like you want to maintain a friendship with these classmates that you've forged bonds with, but they always want to invite you to scenes that you know are not right for you as a Muslim. How do you find balance? And this is where boundary setting is really important. If you allow yourself to let your emotions dictate to you, then what you're going to do is say, oh, I don't want to be perceived as a bad friend and I don't want to be ungrateful or, or make this person feel bad. I'll just go, right? But when you're trying to fortify yourself without you know, any um, real concrete, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, established practice that would, that is so far removed from, from that kind of behavior, then you risk relapsing or falling into sinfulness, right? Like if you're, if, if a person, for example, is practicing their deen inshallah for 10, 15, 20 years, and they're pretty, you know, they have um, that strength and that fortitude, uh, likely those environments would never even tempt them. They would never even go. There's just no question about it. But a, a very young you know, um, person on the path, young, not by age, but like a seeker who's relatively, you know, new on the path has to be very careful not to allow that door to remain open and then to walk through it because it just takes, um, the nafs is so weak that in that case, when you haven't built that fortification, you could easily be called, right? Like the siren call, as they say, of sinfulness or, or sinful behavior. It kind of puts people under a spell. Like you go to an environment with all your um, peers and there's a lot of peer pressure, as we say, but also you're, you're an, a young adult, uh, you know, hormonal uh, teenager, let's just say, if that's the, the context. And you go to an environment where like your nuffs is literally being catered to everywhere you go, your eyes uh, are, are able to look at things that you sh normally would not see, your appetites are being um, you know, enticed, it's too much. It, it's sensory overload. And next thing you know, um, you may fall into sinfulness. And once you cross a line with like doing a, a severe haram act that you know is haram, it's a very slippery slope because shaitan is now he is relentless. Once he has a person in his grip, when he's got them to do something they've never done before. So the, the, the first experience, right, um, of, of drinking alcohol, the first experience of smoking weed, the first experience of touching um, a, a man or a woman that's not lawful to you and actually doing things with that person becomes a source with which he will continue to work the individual down, right? He will continue to entice you and also spiritually shame you to the point where you may think, what's the point of, you know, I'm too, uh, you feel so guilty and you feel so terrible and have so much self-loathing that you start to distance yourself from the path and even from, you know, the spiritual friends or, or, or company that you may have that were on the opposite side completely because you feel so disgusted with yourself. And sometimes we 
we wear that shame externally so we feel like everybody can see it then we avoid those groups and this is exactly the path that the you know how shaitan works he gets people to uh, slowly uh, transform and slowly turn from one direction to the other. So avoiding places is really important um, if you want to <clears throat> to uh, remove uh, th- these sicknesses. And I would say um, this is not just also restricted to physical places, because in the context of social media, there are far more places we traverse that are haram from the social media perspective than we um, than physical spaces, I would say, the far more, because at the access, the access is so easy. You know, with the with the touch of a finger, you can go down the most demonic uh, pathways possible. Um, now it's very simple, and that's why people are ruined. Uh, many people become ruined, uh, spiritually speaking, because it took a button, it took a, um, a you know a click, and then all of a sudden they're they're down a very 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 dark path. So when we say avoiding vigilantly places where one fears misdeeds occur, understand that there's multiple iterations of that. It's physical, it's uh, virtual, it's it's individuals, it's not just places, but also people that could also call us to sinfulness. So that's the second point. The third is to see yourself in a state of perpetual humility, right? Perpetual humility, because that then forces you to always, you know, ask Allah subhanahu for forgiveness, right? Continuously asking Allah for forgiveness, coupled with devotional prayers upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in both solitude and gatherings of people. And I love that he puts those conditions, because, you know, making the toba or um, doing salawat, right, when it's in front of people can lead to, um, what we would call riya, right? Which are, uh, which is which is performing spiritual acts for the the sake of just being seen, right? Ostentation. You want people to see you. And sometimes when we're in certain gatherings, right? If you're sitting in a thick of a circle, you're in a masjid, like you know, last night. Last night was a qiyam. All, we all, inshallah, some of us were on virtual qiyam, some of us are in physical qiyams. Whatever the case is, if you're participating in something and people can see you. And you're just kind of going with the motions. Um, it's easy to do because it serves, you know, the nafs. In some cases, people are oblivious to these things, but it, you like the um, the feeling, right, of being part of the jama, part of the group. And so the intentions can be sometimes compromised. Whereas when we're doing these things separate from people's eyes and view and just completely independent, this is where we really are showing our sincerity. So Toba. Um, and uh, I mean, a perfect example is Toba in a gathering where everybody's, you know, saying together in unison, like, right? These are all things that we could be doing in unison in a group. Do we really think that's the same at the same level? And of course, every individual heart is different, but I'm just kind of drawing a parallel. Would you say that that would be the same as a person who is in their own private quarters, not a single soul in sight? And they are shedding tears for remorse before their creator. They're, this isn't about anybody else. This is about true remorse to their creator. True remorse. Or is it the same if we're all in a gathering and there's a you know kind of nice um, uplifting setting where everybody's doing salawat and the Prophet and we're all kind of just sharing that moment together? Is that the same as a person who is in every waking moment, whether they're dri- driving or they're, <coughs> excuse me, they're walking, they're cleaning, they're doing something um, of benefit, but they're, there's nobody else that, around. And then they remember, you know what? I want to do salawat on my Prophet Sallallahu because he, his entire life, right, was for me, for me to benefit from. And I, I, I owe it to, to him to at least, to, to at, le- at the very least, offer my words of gratitude by sending the, the salam upon him. Right. So you just do that from your own heart. It's not about just being a participant in a group activity. It's about you demonstrating your true love and devotion to the Prophet. So that they're very different. And I think we can all agree to that. So that's why these conditionals that Sidi Ahmed Zero puts are so important because he's reminding us to purify our devotion, not just to do it in the context of it being done with others. And and yes, there's still benefit and merit to that. We don't want to disconnect from our community, but to actually do it independent of that as well. 
be consistent, be real, right? So being in a state of toba consistently will help you to not want to continuously what transgress the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the wisdom, right? That you are continuously mindful of your sinfulness in the past so that you prevent yourself from falling into further sin. And then doing salawat and the Prophet is in the same vein by witnessing his blessings upon you and not wanting to disappoint him, right? Because inshallah, we're all, we should all seek that when the on the day of judgment, inshallah, when we're all gathered and we're all running around, you know, it's gonna be pandemonium, it's chaos, the, the fear that strikes the, the, the human being in that day. But what we find is our ummah, we're blessed in that we all are are, are sought seeking um, our Prophet, but he's also seeking us. He's looking out for us. And how does he know us, right? How does he know us? He knows us by the marks of our wudu, by the limbs that are literally uh, uh, illuminescent, right? They're they're lit up um, uh, because of our wudu. So he will be seeking us and we will be seeking him. But we should seek to not be those who disappoint him, right? So this is where the wisdom of doing the tawbah coupled with the salawat, where? in both solitude and gatherings of people is so, so profound, mashallah. And then, uh, so the fourth um, or the fifth, excuse me, point here is keeping company with one who guides to Allah. And then this is, you know, Sidi Ahmed Zaruk, he's, he's, he's making a comment here. He says, unfortunately, such a, no one, such a one no longer exists. And he's talking about, you know, the, the 15th century um, where, in his time, he's witnessing this idea of a single spiritual master or guide was uh, was fading. It was it was just not they they were they they weren't in existence then. So what about now? And I think this is an important point because there are charlatans, there are people who uh, who uh, pose as being spiritual guides, but they actually have ulterior motives. So I think, you know, he's, he's making a recommendation, but also warning that not to fall for just anybody. And then there's more as we read, um, uh, we'll continue to read. You'll see where he's going with this, right? So now he pivots a little bit and he speaks specifically about Abu Hassan Shadri, uh, rahimahullah, who said what? And this is the counsel that he gave. So it's in the same context. And he says, my beloved counseled me not to put my feet anywhere except where I hoped for Allah's reward. So we just talked about avoiding places where one fears misdeeds. And now this is a beautiful pairing to that, right? Don't go anywhere if you don't feel that there will be reward for you. Why even go? What's the point? What's the point of going if there's no reward? So this is the counsel, right? And then not to sit anywhere except where I was safe from disobedience to Allah. So watching the gatherings, watching the company that you keep, not to accompany anyone except someone in whom I could find support in obedience to Allah. So if you're going to hang out with people, you're going to go travel with people, you're going to work with people, but they do not call you to obedience of Allah. You know, um, even marriage, like I'm just, um, subhanAllah, it's sad because you hear so often these cases of divorce just popping up every single day. I was, you know, watching um, a qiyam last night where du'as were coming in. There was like a, just people were asking for du'as and several of them were, please make du'a for the sister, the divorced two kids, you know, brother divorced, 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 divorced. And you're just like, yeah, Allah, what's happening? What's happening? You know, Allah knows, but I've worked enough to the, in the community to see that many people will completely get caught up in the superficial you know they'll get caught up in the looks and the attraction and the emotions the tension that they feel with a with a potential mate you know uh they get caught up in the attention that they're getting so if you're lonely you're feeling insecure and someone suddenly comes along and fills you with all the compliments in the world you love it you love the way they make you feel right that's all nafs your nafs is completely taken hold of you because if your rational mind was activated, you would realize that human beings use people, you know, people will say whatever to get whatever they want. They'll say a lot of things. They'll tell, they'll lie to your face. 
And, you know, it's just the way that the nature of the, the human being is in order to get something out of you. And many people do that in order to get something. They'll, they'll flood people, right? Love bombing is a very real thing that predatory people do. So it's not um, something to necessarily uh, be impressed by, but rather to be suspicious of, especially when it's done quickly, you know, someone you barely know, and all of a sudden they're making all these promises to you and they're, you know, giving you all these, just, you have to have the, the reasoning to know, wait a second, something doesn't seem right here. And this is where our Dean is constantly warning us. How do you do that? You look at character. You don't look at the superficial. You don't look at a person, how attractive they are, how, um, you know, the words that they use, how, how uh, charming they are. Those are not the criteria for, uh, for marriage, right. Or for, for drawing close to people. Uh, how wealthy they are. But this is what we've come to now where these things matter much more. A person gets completely infatuated with someone just because of the clothing they wear. Like I know people that that's what it was. It was like, I love the way they dress. I love the swag they had. Swag? So your criteria to give your soul and heart and body and mind to someone because it was because they dressed in brand name clothing and you don't see there's an issue with that? And the reason why I mention this is because look at the advice here, right? Not to accompany anyone except someone in whom I could find support and obedience to Allah. If the person who you are going to give your entire being to is not calling you to be in obedience to Allah, what are you doing, right? How do you possibly expect to have khair? How do you possibly expect to see good come out of a relationship like that when the person doesn't obey their Lord? And for women, I'll say this because I really feel like we need to warn our sisters. If he doesn't fear his Lord, what on what basis do you have any assurance that he will give you your rights? It's, it's a very big risk to marry someone who doesn't display taqwa. And if you get caught up with the physical attraction and all the other superficial things and forget that taqwa is the most important quality in a companion, let alone a partner in life, uh, then you will learn a very difficult lesson. And I think we're, that's what we're seeing with the rise of divorce is that people let their emotions dictate to them, but then they realize in order to sustain a relationship, I need to have someone with a conscience, right? I need to have someone who understands what fairness is what justice is, what rights are, what balance is, what compassion is. And that can't be in the heart. That's not, um, it can't, it doesn't exist. Those things can't exist in a heart that's completely heedless of, of, of their Lord. So you just can't have your cake and eat it too, as they say, you need to prioritize. But I find it important that he mentions this. And then he says, and not select Anyone for myself other than those who increase my certainty and how rare are they to find? There you go. Don't shortchange yourself in any regards, you know, um, whether it's friendship. And I, again, this is just something to mention. So many people I know are, um, they have quote unquote friends that are really harmful to them, but they don't, they still continue to maintain those relationships. If people are not benefiting you and they're causing you harm, they're stressing you out, they give you anxiety, you panic when you see their phone come in, you feel restricted and constricted every time you're around them, what are you doing? Have ghayda for yourself. Have ghayda for your heart. Your heart is special. It was you know, created to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And instead of knowing Allah, it's being consumed with all this, you know, with all this toxicity of dunya. And, and it's not because the dunya has just got in, it's because we let it in, right? So we have to protect our heart. We have to stand vigilant. So that's, you know, the counsel is just to be very mindful of where you go, who you spend your time with, and, and really protect your own interests, protect your heart. He also said, may Allah be pleased with them, whoever directs you, now the opposite of this, right? Whoever directs you to this world, right, has cheated you. So when people are telling you to, you know, give into your nafs and, and just forget your spiritual religious obligations, what's the big deal? Your heart is pure. I've heard people say that to me, literally, I'll take your sin for you. Just let's, 
Let's go. Don't worry about it. Uh, you know, God is the most merciful. Our hearts are clean, but I'll take it for you. <laughs> I mean, that's like the height of, of real, not only arrogance, but also ignorance because we, we should never have, feel so safe, right? Nobody should ever feel safe. And then he goes on to say, so whoever directs you to this world has cheated you. Whoever directs you to deeds has exhausted you. Right. And then, but whoever directs you to Allah has truly counseled you. So we have sometimes people who push us towards actions, right? Whether they're worldly or otherworldly, um, without really directing us to Allah. And that's important because sometimes, you know, people get again too preoccupied with the external or the outward, but the heart matters and whether the sincerity matter, matters. So the true companion in this life, the true person that you want to um, spend time with, whether it's a teacher, um, a spouse, a partner, a friend, whoever it is, is the one who's constantly directing you to Allah, right? Who's constantly uh, trying to remind you of your relationship with your Lord. It's not about them, right? And I'll say this, for example, like parents, when I do parenting sessions, I'm always, I try to remind parents that our role as parents is to, you know, give our children the necessary tools and all of the, the, you know, the, the tarbiya that they need in order to navigate this world. But at a certain point, we have to get out of the way, right? We are in there because, you know, it's kind of like when you, you have a toddler and you're, you're teaching them to walk, Right what do we do? We usually hold their hands and we walk backwards while they walk forwards with us because we want to hold their hand and guide them in the direction, the correct direction. And we are in the path. We're right in front of them, right? This is how all of us taught our children how to walk or we stand and we, we, we uh, incentivize them to come to us, right? But we're in their way and they love us so much. They want to draw close to us. So they come and they start to walk. Subhanallah. That's kind of like metaphor for life, right? For the instruction of a parent. We do that, but at a certain point, we have to get out of the way. And this is really the difficult part for a lot of parents because we get so comfortable with the dutifulness of our children. Um, we get so comfortable with their devotion and love to us. And we want them to constantly acknowledge us and you know, be mindful of all the things we do for them that we sometimes realize we are an obstacle for them spiritually because if we could redirect or, or kind of slowly phase out and just leave and, and turn everything back to Allah, uh, we, we're going to help them a lot more. So it's, you know, it's really about trying to do that in the most, in every situation is just constantly direct uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for ourselves and, and our children and whoever else, but the, the company that we keep, that's what the best company is those who are like, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, it's all from Allah, it's all from Allah, it's not me, it's not you. We're in blessing, we're in nitma because of Allah. That's it. That's the, the, the person or the people that you want to keep company with. And then um, he says here, and I'll we'll close out with this. He also said, May Allah be pleased with him, make piety, taqwa, your abode. So beautiful, so simple, so succinct. Make your home, your your place that you reside in right? Uh, taqwa. And the delight of your selfish soul will do you no harm. So long as it is discontent with its faults and does not persist in acts of disobedience, nor abandons the awareness of Allah in solitude. This is the formula, right? Your nafs will not uh, continue to wreak havoc on you uh, if you can maintain taqwa and make sure that what? That it's aware of its faults, right? So when we talked before about being suspicious of the soul, that's uh, very important to have that mind, uh, to, to be aware of that always, to be vigilant, that your nafs that which resides within you should be con- always um, suspect. You know, they have that word now, uh, when, they, when you want to say something is suspicious, it's sus. <laughs> the nafs is very sus. It's always going to be sus. It will always push us uh, to to just indulge and to do things um, that that are going to take us backwards, right? So be be always mindful of that and don't let it ever become too content with itself, which we're going to get to soon, right? About this idea of being content with oneself. Uh, It is a sign of spiritual disease. And also, obviously, I mean, it's obvious 
do not uh, continue in acts of disobedience. So whatever, whatever haram you're doing, at a certain point, you've got to wake up and say, what am I doing? It's like you're, you're self-harming. You know, we, we, we gasp when we hear of people self-harming, right? <gasps> the teenagers are self-harming. They're cutting themselves. Everybody's like, <gasps> but in reality, all of us are, you know, ruh harming or nafs harming, whatever you want to call it. We are harming our soul. And we're harming our body too. I mean, it's all harm, but we are harming the most, our, the, the most essential part of who we are, which is our spiritual heart, our, our self, and, and that way, our, our soul. We're all doing it in this way. So disobedience has to be, you have to come make a break. Like I'm not going to be actively disobeying a lot. It's one thing when you do something accidentally or you're not aware of something, but to actively be doing haram, aware of it, and then not even uh, feeling guilt over it. You've kind of just resigned yourself that it's just who I am. It's just part of who I am. It's just what I do. This is this has to stop, and we all have to make toba from that. And then the last point he makes to also be aware of Allah in solitude. And this is full circle, right? Because we started off with that, the foundation. The first one is taqwa with Allah in private and in public. And solitude, the dhikr of Allah in solitude, far, far outstrips and outweighs the performative dhikr that we may do in the company of other people. Um, just being mindful of Allah when we're completely by ourselves. And that's an indication, actually, of who we truly are. What are we doing when we're alone? Right. If you're alone, no one else is there, no one else is watching you. What are you doing? It, it tells you a lot of what you need to know where you are. And the final thing he says, I say that being content, here it is, with the self, persisting in disobedient acts, and abandoning awareness of Allah are the foundations of all illnesses, tribulations, and pitfalls. Subhanallah. So it's like a, these are, by the way, the words of Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, because those were counsels from Imam Shadri, but now these are his words again. And you can just see by the font. So this is the cliffhanger that I'm going to leave you all on for next week. We're going to continue, inshallah, these sessions until we finish this text. I'm grateful to the Rahma Foundation because initially this was supposed to be for Ramadan, but I realized that this is such a rich document. It's not going to be able to, um, I'm not going to do it justice doing it in three or four sessions. So inshallah, we're going to continue. But that cliffhanger, we're going to leave you all with and just think about it deeply, right? He's, these are, he's not equivocating his words here. He's very clear here that all illnesses, tribulations, and pitfalls come from these things, right? The self being too content with it, per perpetual or persistent disobedience, and completely abandoning awareness of Allah. Those three things. And we all have to answer, you know, eventually, but let's examine ourselves now. So let me stop here and I'll take some questions if there are any, inshallah, before we close out. I'm doing that. Assalamualaikum. Thank you again for another wonderful class. So you mean uh, telling you all about how little sleep I got last night and how good I'm feeling today is not the path, not the spiritual <laughs> path. <laughs> no, we can do that. It's just... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a uh, it's like the the Facebook morning um, statuses. Exactly, all oh, those days. It's so funny when you look back on what what were we all thinking? Yeah. <laughs> Moment of our day was a status. Subhanallah. Mashallah. All right. So this first question says, "Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh." When you mention sincerity and difference to social and family pressures and pleasing the Creator and not the creation, what about wishing someone a happy birthday? No cake. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, these are like, you know, out of questions um, from my understanding, you know, it really comes down to like these types of cultural customs, like in some cultures, birthdays are a really big deal. So if you're marrying into a family or you maybe you come from a family where this was just a custom, um, I don't think there's anything harmful about it as far as I've from my teachers that we've learned. Um, so these are, you know, not things that we should preoccupy or, or get too caught up in because it's just, it's out of its culture. Whereas, um, you know, there are other opinions that are very strict about these things, but I feel like that causes sometimes more harm. Like I've seen people have, you know, disputes, family disputes. And if you really think about it, just wishing someone a simple happy birthday should not cause problems, right? But if people become sticklers on certain things, and then they politicize or make things, you know, everything about haram and halal and bid'ah, and, and it turns into this big debate issue. It just causes 
these problems in the hearts. And that I think would be far worse. So uh, it's not a, I, I don't think, you know, it's a big deal. Again, I'm, this isn't my opinion. This is what our teachers have taught that those types of things don't make issues out of it, inshallah. And just have the best of intentions that you're doing certain things to bring the hearts together. All right, thank you. Uh, so how do we best identify our attachment to food? When should we realize how culture and environment inform our desires? Any best practices? Huh, that's a good question. So I think, you know, you know, I had a friend who who used to say, you know, it might be actually a popular quote, but I just remember she would say it often that we fuel is a or food is a fuel, right? And we should live uh, live to eat. No, eat to live. I'm sorry, eat to live, not live to eat, right? Because of the culture we're in today lives to eat. They're obsessed with food, preoccupied with food, and you know there is there are there's the hadith that talks about you know the lack of baraka when food doesn't have baraka then you have an insatiable appetite, right? And so this is where it's all connected. Um, but I think if you're just consumed, uh, which is ironic that we use that word, buy food because we consume food. But if you're consumed by it, you're waking up, you're thinking about it, you're dreaming about it, you're like constantly obsessed. Like I was uh, teasing um, someone I know recently that on Facebook, we have one of the most probably active Facebook groups I've ever seen uh, here in the Bay Area is called Bay Area Food Halal Ease, I think, or something. I'm, I'm, I think I'm on it, but I'm not really on it. But I just, I see posts and people send me stuff and I'm like, wow, this, this is such an active group. And man, mashallah, I wish we had this level of um, interaction on other, you know, uh, groups that are maybe more intellectual. And I get it, people, you know, especially during the month of Ramadan, they're hungry. So it's, it's kind of, it's natural to do that. But I feel like if that becomes like your life where you're just like browsing through menus and, and looking at different restaurants all the time and you just want to eat, 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 there's some, there's definitely a problem there. You have to work on breaking the um, that hold that food has over you. Now, food is enjoyable. It's it's a great nama that we've been given, but I think this is where practicing restraint and creating a um, an independence from food, you know, uh, is really important. Like seeing your, your, um, your patterns, right. Is it certain types of food or is it just the entire, you know, topic of food that excites you? Uh, cause there are uh, certain, you know, we, we, uh, we can certainly get addicted to certain foods. Right. And if you look at the, um, quality of our food and the properties of our food, they're designed to be addictive. So sometimes it's not even a person's actively seeking these things. They're just consuming things that are affecting their brain chemistry or their physiology. And they don't even know that they've created these, um, these addictions or these food dependencies. So there's so much there, but I think if, if the bottom line is if your mind is constantly thinking about food, there may be something to explore there because and I want to be um, sensitive to also people who have had really difficult lives and food became a source of comfort. I remember a friend of mine who had severe you know, trauma as a child. Um, I mean, really severe, all the things that I, they're, they're made of nightmares that she, you know, she had gained a lot of weight and she said it was completely intentional. She hated her body so much that she, actively ate a lot. And I, there, are, that's a reality. There are people who consume themselves because of real severe trauma. So I don't think it's fair to just speak of these things as being, you know, somehow a person's weak. It's more just paying attention to your mind, whether or not the preoccupation is coming from something that may be more, you know, you would need to explore more from a mental health perspective, or if it's just, um, a, an enjoyable pleasure that you like indulging in that is distracting you a little bit too much. You know, I knew someone who was stick thin. I mean, this is, it's, it's weird because, you know, we can't predict it, these things. Someone who is really much less so thin, like maybe less than a hundred pounds, but loved food to the point that their refrigerator was, I, I would say it was like pregnant with food. Like you couldn't open it without something falling out. And they said themselves, like their eye was bigger than they could consume. They didn't eat a lot. They ate like birds. They like, like the portions were so small, but they loved the idea of food. 
And, you know, this again, could, there could be other implications, all of those, but I think each of us are going to have to examine our relationship with food from that perspective, because um, I've been, you know, much less the Fadwa, we've all, you know, maybe some of you have been on this call, have been around like really spiritually people who've mastered these things. I, I'm in awe. They eat like nothing, but subhanAllah, they look fully nourished. It's not like they look emaciated. They just, food is not interesting to them and they eat to, uh, to live. It's a, it's a fuel. Um, and that's very possible. I, I mean, I'll just share this with you because I actually, from our teachers being around them, I was so amazed by their ability to restrain themselves. We would have these lavish, you know, meals sometimes because people would host and everybody's just pouring it on. And then there's dessert and chai and you would look at their plate and it was like a date, a small little morsel and water and everybody's drinking soda. And it's just, it's just, it was a scene, but I would just look at them and go, subhanAllah, what kind of strength do they have? You know? And I actually, this is a true story. It happened to me when I went to Hajj back in December of 2004, long, long time ago, this was my dua on Arafah. I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I said, please, Ya Allah, give me the ability to completely uh, restrict my food intake and have complete mastery over like my, my nafs so that food is not interesting to me. Like I can, I can, basically I wanted to have what they had. And I, so I put that dua out there and subhanAllah, it was amazing because Allah completely answered that dua. And, you know, those of who know me personally know, I went through a period before I had children where I lost a lot of weight. And part of the weight loss was me literally forgetting to eat. I just cut off my shahwa completely. It was cut off. I, I went entire days. Allah is my witness. Wallahi, I would have maybe one cucumber. There was a couple of days I didn't eat, but I wasn't even interested. I was drinking water, but I had no desire for food. And, you know, I would go to girls' parties, halaqas. There was dessert plates, everything, brownies, everything that you could want. You know, women usually go for the desserts, men go for the meat. We know that. <laughs> but I was completely unfazed. I had no desire. So it is very possible. These are spiritual things. Allah can turn your heart off from these things. Alhamdulillah. Um, so I've lived it. I know it's real. May Allah give us that fortitude and strength to not be enslaved by our desires. Inshallah. Ameen. Alhamdulillah. Sorry, there's uh I, I give these long answers. I apologize, Sada Fadu. I hope we're no, not we're fine. It, it's like cows, you know, they just eat grass and they become these massive beasts. And it's not like they go around looking for something else. Right. You no, know, but it's part of us that we have these shahwas and so there's so much variety in the food that we can eat. And it's right. it is, it's a path. It's just one of the paths that you can take to really train yourself um but yeah it's it's interesting there is one more question if you have time for sure, it i do absolutely so this one this person asks we're new parents and my husband always blames me for everything that happens to the baby example the baby has eczema and it's my fault how do i stay positive without having bad thoughts about my husband yeah Allah, that's really difficult i'm sorry to hear that it's not your fault you know stuff but a lot um sometimes men really want control or, or um i mean i shouldn't say that they want control but i, I want, what i mean to say is a man especially a husband a young father the way that Allah Subhanahu wa has created our men folk is that they have so much uh, responsibility they're constantly bearing this weight of being responsible right for um their family and a new child a new baby an infant so vulnerable right as soon as something doesn't go the way that would be ideal the father may feel that he has somehow failed but it's you know a lot easier sometimes to scapegoat uh because to deal with to confront or to accept that maybe you know you uh, somehow miss something is painful for some people so that's where a lot of this blame and shift goes between spouses especially and young children bring a lot of tension and stress for that reason but i think open communication is really important and what i would encourage is to 
always kind of, especially as you're learning, right? I mean, you have a new baby. This is a learning uh, phase for both of you. Not You don't get a, like a handbook on how to do this. But I do think the more you show and demonstrate that you are ahead of these things, like making sure doctor's appointments are scheduled in advance, giving um, reports, you know, of daily things so that he feels like he knows what's going on, it will actually protect you from these types of um, injurious, you know, accusations. Cause it's, it hurts so hurtful, right? You're the young mom, you're with this baby all day, taking care of it, tending to it. And to have someone throw an accusation like that is very, very painful. But I think um, if you think of it, like from his perspective, if he at least knows what's going on and sometimes men, because they're working, I'm assuming you're home with the child and he's out, he doesn't know, right. What's going on. And we, as women, sometimes we're so spent, we don't think of the importance of actually sharing all of the daily stuff. Cause sometimes it gets so you know repetitive, like, Oh, okay. Every time I change a diaper, I have to tell them no, but it's more like anything that you notice or observe, or just even checking in. Like when I was married uh, with my, I mean, when my kids were younger and um, uh, you know, we were in Southern California uh, with my, with my husband, I would just update him, send pictures, constantly keeping him in the loop is what I'm trying to say, because if you keep him in the loop and he knows what's going on, it's kind of like you're submitting these reports periodically, then he'll feel some sense of like control. Right. But if he's absent in the day, it doesn't really have much to do with the, the, the day in day out stuff, a parent of, of, you know, taking care of the, the child, then it will be very easy for him as soon as something goes wrong to be like, it's your fault, right? So I think being a, a kind of getting into the team mindset as a mom is really important that yes, I'm doing the bulk work uh, of this, you know, of, of the child, you know, taking care of the child, but I can at least bring him into the loop so that he feels we are a team in this. I'm doing this part. He's, uh, you know, going out and, um, you know, getting, um, you know, I mean, working and, and bringing uh, the sustenance for the family to be sustained. We're, we are a team. We just aren't communicating. And I think in the absence of that communication, these things happen. And then fear sets in, panic sets in, blame shifts, and it's just all this ugliness. So try that. Try being more open and more communicative, giving him those little reports, inshallah. And don't um, don't let your heart turn from him. It's out of love and concern, uh, but obviously he's not emotionally managing himself well because he he's blaming you. But I think you can, inshallah, help to turn that around by just having a little bit more clear communication with him. And also, as I said, being on top of those appointments and kind of reading and sharing articles on certain things that involve the baby, it shows your proactivity and he can't then uh, blame you for, for being, you know, for missing something because you've been actively doing that. I hope that makes sense. Inshallah. Uh, thank you. Sometimes I think too, the, you know, when, um, when maybe men are working in a professional sphere and they're used to that sort of having to assign blame mm -hmm. to somebody on the team, because things didn't go right. Yep. Um, and then they try to bring that home. You know, it doesn't necessarily work. <laughs> I mean, obviously it doesn't work. And so that may be, and they're both new. That, that That's the thing they have to remember. She has to remember you're both new at this parenting. And it's really important that you allow each other to have time. So just like she would like time to sort of learn about the best care for her baby. She should also give her husband that time to learn to be a father in the way that um, he can and with his other responsibilities and with her other responsibilities. So it's interesting to, to see these new parents for those of us who have been around a while. We know it's, these are just the easy days of <laughs> dealing with the babies, but um, you know, it's important at the beginning, I think too, to just have that relationship and use, you, you know, use your words, of course. Absolutely. And not let shaitan come between you two. Cause he's, that's what he will continuously do. He'll find these ways. Oh, he's blaming me. No, just be like, you know what? He's a dad. He's worried about his baby. He's not handling it right. This is stressful. We're both lacking sleep. We've never done this before. It's hard for both of us, but I can, you know, show that, um, you know, like I said, be proactive and really for the sake of the family and try to make these little adjustments. Inshallah, Allah will give you tawfiq. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Please, uh, Close us up with a dua, and then inshallah, we'll be back to Monday schedule next week. Is that correct? 
Yes, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. And thank you so much again, everyone. Thank you. Please support the Rahma Foundation, by the way, for those who are, uh, you know, joining and, and benefiting from these classes. Inshallah, they try to make so much programming available for women and young girls all over the world. And I really, they didn't ask me to say this, but I really wish and pray in these last Mubarak days and nights of, of uh, Ramadan that we all do whatever we can to support this wonderful organization. It is on my top uh, list of organizations and they know, Sada Fado knows, um, she basically owns me. <laughs> she can, whatever she needs, I'm at her disposal in the service. But alhamdulillah, I just, because I love the mission so much and this is really uh, if we want to protect our uh, future, and I say I don't say this lightly, I really mean this. If we want to protect our future as an ummah and as a community, then we have to support our women because the women, the woman, the mother is the first house, the first madrasa, the first school, the first uh, source of so much of of the uh, the the dean that is transmitted to the child. So we need to fortify our women folk. And our young girls, of course, to be able to handle this insane world that they're in. And then we will see the benefits of that in our household, which will reach our boys and our sons and our men, inshallah. But let us uh, invest in, in organizations like the Rahma Foundation that center women. Um, alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khairan. With that, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal asr inna l-insana la fi khusr illa ladina amanu wa amiru salihati wa tawasab al-haqi wa tawasab al-sabr. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa anta nasaqbiraka wa natsubu ilayk. Allahumma sada wa salam wa barik ala sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa salam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam tasliman kathira. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yusifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khairan, everyone. Thank you again, inshallah. We will see you on Monday next week for the continuation of the foundations of the spiritual path. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Inshallah, we'll begin in just a moment. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Mawlana wa Habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, tasliman kathira. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Uh, first of all, Eid Mubarak, inshallah. I pray that all of you had a beautiful end of the sacred month, the blessed month of Ramadan, and a beautiful um, Eid. Uh, alhamdulillah, it's a... It's been quite bittersweet for many reasons. Obviously, the month coming to an end was in and of itself bittersweet. And then many of us, I think, are also still in shock and grieving the loss of our brother, Sidi Mu'adh and Nas, inshallah. So I wanted to just take a moment and recite Fatiha for him, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Um, الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين آمين يا الله May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him the highest station in Jannah al-Firdaus al-Ala and may he be united with the beloved صلى الله عليه وسلم um, he was a very dear brother, mashallah, and uh, earlier today was his janazah. So we, for those of us who may have tuned, tuned in, um, it was very beautiful, mashallah, um, janazah. There's so many people were there, so many uh, beautiful people were there to, to make the offer him. Um, and we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give his family sabr and jameel. Uh, it's very difficult. I can't imagine a harder test than to lose a child. But subhanAllah, his parents are beautiful, righteous, God-fearing people. And from everything that has been circulating in the past few days, they've done nothing but demonstrate amazing faith and are, are really strong, mashallah. But of course, we know that grief is a very difficult, unpredictable process. And when you're surrounded by loved ones and community, alhamdulillah, it does help to carry you through. 
But um, we ask that Allah subhanahu wa continues to give them that beautiful sabr and jameel when all of you know the the um, the news and the this just everybody being there when when people start to leave them and they're with, by themselves again it's it's difficult so our hearts are heavy for them but alhamdulillah you know this is dunya we have to I think just be prepared and um, as you know I think every year this seems to happen almost um, where some news will just will just come and completely take everyone by surprise. And it's difficult, but it is part of our dunya. And we're in many ways um, protected more so, I think, than previous like pre-modern people because uh, sickness and illness, death were just so much more common. Uh, and a lot of parents actually, it was very common to bury children, not just a child, but children. So for us, I think, because of modern medicine and a lot of the advances of our modern world, we were hit so much harder by these things because they are not as common. Of course, they still happen, but may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all um, strength and yaqeen and conviction and to remember that this is the temporal world um, and we're all going to leave. At uh, one point or another, we will leave, and there is no way to determine when that is. But we have, um, alhamdulillah, beautiful faith that gives us uh, so much clarity. Um, and really, if you just if we just stick to our faith, alhamdulillah, we can get through any difficulty and challenge. So may Allah make it easy for us. But alhamdulillah. Um, so as we all know, we've been working on this text, the foundations of the spiritual path throughout the month of Ramadan, and alhamdulillah, we are uh, going to continue our reading of it. I begin, I'll begin with the dua for studying that I really encourage everyone to memorize, inshallah. Um, so I'll go ahead and recite that, and then we'll begin and look at the text. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatiha lima ughliqa al-Khatima lima sabaqa nasir al-Haqqi الحق الهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم اللهم اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووافقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا اللهم بالقرآن وذكر الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يقربنا منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن إذا شد سهلا سهلا اللهم عيدنا من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا واصلح لنا شاننا كله لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا امين امين يا رب العالمين الحمد لله so بسم الله i'm going to go ahead and screen share because i um i had a couple of things i wanted to show all of you first of all this text that we've been reading i actually didn't i forgot that i had done a infographic on Instagram on this very text. Um, it's called The Five Foundations of Faith. That's what I titled it on Instagram, but I wanted to just share it with you in case you um, wanted to maybe grab um, a screenshot of this to help you. Uh, I've mentioned it many, many times, but uh, as a visual learner, I think just seeing things laid out can make retaining knowledge easier. So for me, it works, but here is the uh, the infographic, I'll quickly go through this. It summarizes basically the very first five uh, foundations um, and also gives us the necessary uh, questions to really self-examine, right? So first, what is a foundation? It's the lowest load-bearing part of a building, typically below ground level, and it's or it's an underlying basis or principle. So it's a beautiful word because it actually applies. We are building on this structure of faith um, that we, that's, you know, the, the objective anyway, that our, it's a lifelong process of knowledge acquisition and obviously application. So you're constantly building, you're constantly moving toward a goal of becoming a better version of yourself every day. So there's this idea of building upon something, but it's also a matter of um, establishing your principles of belief. Like, what do you believe? And what are um, the ways in which you uh, manifest or represent that belief. 
So the five foundations, again, this is just summary for those of you who have been here uh, from the first week, but good visual to kind of see it all out, laid out. Mindfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, privately and publicly. Very important foundation for strong faith. If you don't do this, there's a problem, right? If you're mindful of Allah because everybody's watching you, but then as soon as you're by yourself, that's clearly an indication of spiritual disease, right? There's a problem there because if you are alone and you do nothing to remember Allah and you actually um, do, you know, other things that you shouldn't be doing and you completely forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this is, again, indicating that there is um, spiritual affliction that you have to rid yourself of. Uh, the next is the adherence to the sunnah in word and deed. And we're going to, we, we already kind of, you know, went through each of these, but I'm just uh, reviewing it. And also I have um, people on Instagram live who are tuning in, who I'm hoping will also look at this document and really understand it. It's called the F uh, Foundations of the Spiritual Path by Sidi Ahmed Zarouk. So uh, the third point here is the um, indifference to the acceptance or rejection of others. So not being moved by whether or not people like you or not like you, because that's not, um, I mean, you know, our, the reason why we do what we do is not for the pleasure of people, it's for the pleasure of God. So that becomes your criteria, not seeking to be part of the in-group or fearing being excluded, you know, and being ostracized. Those are not motivations. Um, so really getting to that point. And then satisfaction with Allah in hardship and in ease and turning to Allah in prosperity and adversity. So those are the five foundations. And here they are written out a little bit more, you know, um, as, as, you know, in text form. And then the questions that I uh, think are also really important for us all to ask to determine where we are with, uh, in this, you know, spectrum of belief are important. Like, how are you when you're completely alone? Um, how close are you to the sunnah? Um, in, in your speech and actions? Do you talk the talk, but uh, but not walk the walk? How much do you care about people pleasing or being excluded? You know, does your preoccupation with people prevent you from practicing your faith authentically? And how much do you complain and whine about your life and events outside of your control? Do you resist the decree of Allah by questioning and saying things like, why me? Right? And, and then how often do you remember Allah when things are going well? and remind yourself to be grateful? Or do you only turn to Allah when things are going bad? Okay. So, um, and then we, last week, if you recall, I shared with you these uh, other visual aids to also just kind of lay out the foundations for us, inshallah. So everything we just mentioned, right? Um, what they are, the taqwa, the sunnah, the indifference, the contentment and the reliance, and then how do we get there, right? Through exalted aspirations, through Allah's reverence, through the service of others, khidmah is really important part of spiritual, um, you know, uh, purification of spiritual preparation. Right? We 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 better ourselves through the service of other people, completing our resolves. So having goals and meeting those goals and objectives, and then magnifying our blessings, being people of gratitude. It's very important that we live. Um, uh, you know, with gratitude every single day, no matter what happens. And you'll see this, you'll see people of um, faith, even when they're tested in the most difficult circumstances, you will never uh, not hear their, th them expressing their gratitude because in their grief, in their sorrow, in their sadness, they can still uh, be filled with total gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they can, they're witnessing that they still have so many other blessings, right? So this is a very important um, quality the believer must have. And then we talked about you know, proper conduct and how uh, one gets to proper conduct. So you know, seeking knowledge is obviously the first point. You can't get to certain levels if you don't know what the levels are or how to even, you know, how, what they are or how to get there, right? So you need to seek the knowledge. Keeping spiritual guides is part of that, right? Where are you gonna get the knowledge from? hopefully from people who are on the path and are, are ahead of you. Uh, in some cases, you might find, you know, really uh, qualified teachers to help you. In other cases, you might uh, find other seekers on the path that are similar to you. They're students, they're just trying to gain more knowledge and you can come together and have circles and study from with one another 
but whatever the case is to seek those out. Um, I actually had a sister message me earlier today on Instagram, just saying that it's been very disheartening because she doesn't have access to female teachers. And she was just saying, expressing that she feels very weighted down by that, you know, that she doesn't have the access. And I know that there are a lot of people who are in similar situations, maybe in their region, like where they are regionally, they don't have teachers that they can access. But this is why we also have to magnify our blessings because um, alhamdulillah, the internet affords us opportunities that many of us would otherwise not have, right? We can connect with a lot of amazing people online and there are spaces for that. Right now, what we are doing is a proof of that. Right, um, the Rahma Foundation has opened up an opportunity for us to come together on their platform, using you know their platform to learn from one another. And we're reading this incredible text that was translated to us by um, our, our you know modern scholars who have uh, who had access to the original Arabic. Um, and so we're we're doing this together. We're all students of knowledge. But this is the way that the believer, you know, they operate is that they're always. Um, as they say, where there's a will, there's a way. So you seek knowledge, you seek out company, and you look for those resources. And you don't let shaitan um, get in your head and you know pers- uh, dissuade you, you know, dissuade you from your path. Um, and you also other uh, you know things that we need to be mindful of is not also seeking out um, those dispensations and shortcuts in order to prevent what's necessary. Um, to be on the path, which is discipline, right? Disciplining uh, the nafs, getting mastery of the nafs requires hardship. And if you're always looking for the easy way out of everything, then you're really not going to um, not going to excel. It's kind of like a student, right? If a student um, is, you know, seeking, uh, for example, they're they're, they're looking to classmates for. Um, notes, uh, you know, cheat sheets and things that will prevent them from actually studying the text, right? Sometimes teachers will give very long um, assignments that are required of the student in order to prepare them, right, for for the test or the exam. But a student who's not disciplined will forego, right, looking um, at the reading the actual text, even getting the book in some cases. I remember when I was in college, there were students who never paid for textbooks because they didn't want to spend their money and they would much rather just attend maybe um, any groups, study groups, or just borrow and ask other people who are taking notes to, to take their notes from them. And some people are so nice that they would share those things, but that student is not going to learn discipline. They're not going to learn. Um, they may get by because they're taking those shortcuts, but if the purpose is to gain mastery and gain real knowledge then how are those shortcuts serving you? So in the same way, if you're on the path and you're immediately trying to make everything easy and cushion yourself, you know, from difficulty, then that means you're you're setting yourself up to uh, to not do very well because there is um, that that especially in the beginning, you know, you you need to sh- to show up, you need to put your best effort forward. Um, and then, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, will, will bless you and things will naturally become easier. But if you're just going to start off with this attitude of wanting everything handed to you, um, it's not going to, you're not going to do very well. So that's the third um, requirement for proper conduct. And then organizing one's time. So making sure that we are really mindful of where we spend our time, what we're doing, who we spend our time with, and being unapologetic about boundaries. It's very important that we get to a point where we are comfortable um, saying no, thank you. You know, I know that there's you know, social um, considerations because sometimes we may be invited by certain people to participate, you know, in, in certain events or activities. But if it's a matter of obstructing something that you set out to do, like if you're on a pl- path to really, for example, let's say you want to memorize something or you you want to complete a text or you want to take a class and it's very rigorous. Um, and then in the midst of your beautiful intention, you are being invited to, um, to participate in certain activities with friends and maybe they're fun and they're exciting, but you know that it would really pull you away from 
your studies, right? Then you you have to be willing to you know respectfully decline those types of invitations and just make a, a priority that right now you're in a, a phase of your life where you're really doing something serious. And as much as you would love to, you know, clone yourself and make it uh, make it make it possible for you to be everywhere all at once, you simply can't do that. And so drawing those boundaries is really important. And sometimes I think uh, we let the fear, which goes back to that first foundation, right? The fear of being ostracized or not liked precede our own goals. And you see many people giving up, you know, their their own goals because of these types of factors. So you have to take this really seriously. Now, when it comes to your dean and your path, you should be very, very um, selective. And it's okay to do that. It's not. Uh, it's it's not something you should guilt yourself over. So organizing one's time. And then the last uh, part that he mentions here about um, proper conduct is suspecting the nafs, which is really important because, you know, what he's saying is that pay attention to that inner voice because the inner voice is usually dictating to us. But if we're not suspicious of the motivations of that inner voice, the source of the inner voice, then we're susceptible to falling for its tricks, right? Because it can definitely trick us. And so suspecting the nafs is, you know, it's a, it's a daily process, but it's really about the choices you make and uh, the resolves that you have and what where is it coming from, right? If you, for example, I mean, I know because I'm seeing um, already questions uh, online from various different people who are posting these things, that post Ramadan, right? We're now in the post Ramadan phase. We feel the dip, right? Some of us may be feeling that sudden because we, we reached a high. We all got really excited, especially in the last 10 nights. But then you you kind of free fall uh, immediately after because Eid comes. And, you know, I was just speaking to someone yesterday just about food, food intake. Uh, she was saying like, my God, what happened? Like, we're all doing so well in Ramadan. And all of a sudden Eid comes and it's like, suddenly all the food that you've been avoiding it's like permissive you know you're permitted to once again indulge and it just it doesn't feel good you feel you start to feel sick and you know she was just saying that it's too much too soon and i think a lot of us who've had maybe some eid celebrations can acknowledge that that's true right we we really likely did see too much uh, uh, all of a sudden all at once and so similarly you know, spiritually speaking, all those um, goals that we achieved during Ramadan, maybe we were doing so much more than we have been in the past few days. And so you start to feel like, you know, what's going on. Now, the nafs right now is vulnerable. It's very vulnerable to spiritual attack because you could, you know, want to go back. You want to jump back. You know, you're, you, you fell off the wagon, as they say, and you want to jump back on. But then the nafs may start to tell you certain things like, oh, you know, it was Ramadan and uh, Allah made it so easy and you had the support of the masjid and the jama'ah and now, you know, um, things are different. And then it's it, then then there's all these justifications that come from that, right? Like, oh, your work schedule is more intense now. Um, if you have children, you know, they're, they're, it's the end of the school year, summer vacation. So all of a sudden you're getting like all these ideas that are basically justifying you um, slowing down, right? Not really going back to that Ramadan spirit that you had. This is all from the nafs because the nafs is, and it's going to sound legitimate. And if you're really being honest, maybe some of those things are quite reasonable and fair um, and true, right? It's true that in Ramadan, we have facilitation. It's true that in Ramadan, you, have, you feel more supported because everybody's kind of doing things together and there's more events and there's just that vibe, right? That's all true. But when we say to suspect the nafs, that's part of examining like, you know, is it true that I, um, that, that the person that I was in Ramadan, I have to completely hit pause and then move, you know, in, in a completely different direction or can I maintain certain things in Ramadan that maybe, maybe I can't maintain it all, but is it kind of like this all or none narrative that I have to accept, right? That, that it was possible in Ramadan, but now that it's not Ramadan anymore, I just have to kind of 
you know, move on and um, maybe revisit that next Ramadan if Allah gives us the gift of doing that. So the nafs, like I said, will really encourage us to, to, to not hit those goals and those objectives by, by flooding us with a lot of justifications. But we have to be like, no, this is, this is not right. I had so much hemma, I had so much hope. I had so many aspirations in Ramadan because I was feeling it. Allah was showing it to me. I need to reclaim that somehow, even if it's a part of it, even if it's a fraction of it, but not certainly not allow all these just, justifications and excuses to make me feel like I um, I don't need to, you know, I just need to kind of move on because it was just the Ramadan high. And now that it's not Ramadan, it's all good. That's just, that's a hundred percent nafs shaitan working to sabotage. And they do that quite frequently. They do it on a daily basis, but they also do it when we um, have just had this incredible month, right? Of really seeing our own potential. And so right now we're vulnerable, but every day actually we're, we're vulnerable. So this is, you know, something to, to keep in mind. Now, last week, if you remember, we um, also touched upon the sicknesses of the soul and what the cures are, right? Because according to the document, right? So let me hear, for those of you who are on the Zoom call, you may recall, we went through, sorry, let me let me just expand this a little bit so you can see it better. But we went through, right, the five foundations of right conduct and then um, then he he brought us to this point, the foundations of what will cure the sicknesses of the soul. So this is a new now chapter in a way, right? Where he's now articulating or elucidating for us, what are the ways to cure our, ourselves of, sick, of spiritual sickness in order to, again, avoid falling into these pitfalls? So the first thing he mentions, and I'll go back to this here, is the moderation of food intake, which brings us back to, you know, Ramadan and the significance of Ramadan, because it is a very big part of why we have so much tawfiq. Um, the nafs is, you know, it's it's like, it's a beast that resides within us, and it is emboldened and empowered by food. Food is a very big part of why the nafs can bog us down, because um, it's, you know, there's, it's connected, right? The, the, the mind body connection is very real and it's true. Like if you really think about, um, what happens after we consume food, right? What happens is our, the, the, the digestive process is such an intense process that it takes so much energy from us that you start to feel very sluggish, especially if you've had a heavy meal, you know, if you're eating good, healthy foods, it's different, but if you're eating the typical foods uh, that most people eat, which are convenient, quick, you know, and a lot of our foods from our different respective cultures usually are quite heavy, right? So what happens is when we eat those, all that energy is focused on breaking, you know, those that food down. And then there's also the hormonal impact, right? Because we know that there's also um, a huge connection between our mental well-being and the gut flora, the microbiome, as, as they say. And I know there's many experts who speak on those issues and you can look more into that, but there is a connection of mood, of uh, just general feeling of even other mental health issues being affected directly by the stomach. So this is incredible that our scholars, you know, Imam al-Ghazali in particular and others made these connections for us you know, over a millennia ago, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, that the food that you eat will actually really impact your output. Um, and so when you look at your spiritual output and how much you're doing, you have to link it to the food you're eating. I mean, number one criteria is, are you eating halal food? If your food is not halal, this is a problem, right? If you're eating uh, food that's sourced from uh, haram income, or if in in and of itself it's haram, then you likely will have spiritual affliction or other problems because you know we are commanded by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to eat from the pure. So there's definitely a connection there. So um, that's one thing, and then the moderation aspect of it. If you're overeating, right, eating things that you shouldn't be eating, consuming to the point of just disgust. You know, and 
you know, it's a joke, it's a running joke, but for example, the, you know, what, what happens to people after Thanksgiving, right? The food coma that everybody falls into. And it's not just the, the tryptophan that's in the turkey. It's usually because you're eating a lot of heavy foods all at once and then there's desserts. So what happens to a lot of people is they just feel sick and then they just, you know, lay around because you can't even move. So moderation in our dean, everything is, you know, the middle way. It's, it's we are the, 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 the dean of balance and the middle path requires that you know, and the Prophet, you know, in the hadith, reminds us that the stomach should be divided into three, right? Three parts, which are a third for air, right? So that you can breathe comfortably. And if you've ever eaten to your fill, that's one of the things that you have a difficulty with. You can't breathe properly because your stomach is expanded and you're actually pushing on your lungs. Like what, you know, that subhanAllah, we can, we can do that. And if you've, I mean, for those of us who've been um, pregnant before, right, you know how that feels. It's very difficult to sleep, to be comfortable in certain positions because you feel like you're suffocating, right? You have this, mashallah, uh, the baby is pressing on you. So you have to eat very, very small, especially towards the last trimester of your pregnancy, most women, right? Um, so that's a third for, for air and then a third for food and a third for drink. And you know, it's so not also to uh, to delay the the drink part until after you've eaten. So there's all these considerations that are so beautiful because they're teaching us the importance of not giving in to the nafs because ultimately that's what we're doing. We're not only potentially harming our physical bodies with too much food intake, but also we are indulging the very lowest part of us that will make it difficult for us to spiritually act right it it will be um it will obstruct our um our spiritual aspirations because we just simply don't have the energy i uh, you're just too exhausted or tired from all of that food so moderation is really important the second is the see- seeking refuge in allah at the onset of difficulties and challenges right um this is how we gain that mastery over the nafs, but also purify ourselves from a spiritual weakness and sickness, right? If we look to the material world, we look to people whenever things um, you know, go wrong, but we don't even think that the only one, and this is just the simple truth, who can change our circumstances is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't think to turn to him. Um, then that means that there's a misunderstanding. There's there's a misalignment. There's something off about one's understanding of the way the world works, right? Because Allah is the source of all blessings, 100%, without a doubt. He's also the source of our tests. So you have to know, and this is why going back to the original five foundations, it is very explicitly stated that we turn to him, right, in both situations, Um, in hardship and in ease. Like we have to have that reliance on Allah. So seeking refuge, this is training yourself. This is getting into a habit where immediately when something, uh, you hear difficult news, um, you immediately just turn to Allah. You know, all of these are taught to us to know how to process um, difficult news, whether it's directly impacting us or other news that we may hear of loved ones and people that we care about, but it's just immediately seeking that strength, that support in Allah and not falling apart, you know, because uh, some some people who don't think to turn to Allah uh, can let, you know, their emotions get the best of them. And then, you know, there's a lot of uh, further problems that come from that. So this is just training yourself that no, I immediately need to know what to say, how to say it. Some people, mashallah, immediately will fall in, you know, in sajda, um, asking Allah whether, you know, it's it's just seeking strength from him or um, protection is seeking refuge in him for, from whatever it is. But they know to do that because they've been taught that that's how you respond to, to difficulties and challenges. So this will help one to, to cure those, those illnesses of the soul. And then avoiding haram places. So we talked a lot about this last week as well, that in order to 
um, you know, really prevent yourself from relapsing or falling into sinfulness, you have to cut yourself from the source. And so cutting from the source is examining who and where is it that I start to fall short? Is it certain people that are too overpowering? Um, and if your temperament is you are, you know, a more uh, mild mannered, quiet person, you're you're kind of, you know, um, a little bit, you know, you're you're, le you're you're less likely to maybe speak up because you don't, you know, want to um, disrupt things. And some people, this is just temperamental, um, very agreeable person. Then you might need to examine your circle of influence and friends because maybe they are so overpowering in terms of the way they are. There's a lot of pushovers, you know, people who are easily pushed over. Um, and it's not, uh, and you know, that's, that's a beautiful, in, in some cases, it's a beautiful quality because, you know, the, op, the, the alternative in some cases is the, you know, to be overbearing and, and, and difficult. Right. And so if you're mild mannered, it's, it's a beautiful quality, but you also have to know the, the, the limit, right. Because part of, um, the spiritual diseases is something that we call blameworthy modesty, right? That when you're you're shy to speak up, even when something is really clearly wrong for yourself or other people, this would be considered a spiritual disease. So you have to know that if someone is pulling you into different directions, or maybe their company, you just find that every single time you're around them, um, the energy is really negative. Maybe they gossip a lot. They talk about people. They're just, they don't really have a lot of good to say. They curse a lot. They use foul language. They speak about things that are just not very beneficial. Um, then you have to have the emotional intelligence to be able to slowly remove yourself from their influence in a, in a very considerate way, because we are not, um, uh, encouraged to, you know, we don't need to be dramatic about things like this. You know, if you, if you need to create a boundary with someone, there's no need to be dramatic and cause a scene and hurt people and then make it this huge, um, very, um, it is cause it's quite nefsy to do that, right. To, to kind of center yourself as though, um, you're, you're so above other people and that you can't, I can't be around you anymore. You're not a good influence. This is, this is not wise. We shouldn't do that, but you can certainly um, explain very, you know, carefully to people that you're on a different trajectory. You know, like I'm just working on myself. I need some time away. I appreciate the invitation. Thank you so much. But for right now, I'm, I'm really busy. I have some other projects in, in the pipeline or something that indicates to your, these people that right now, and maybe, you know, it's open-ended. Um, you're just not able to participate in whatever it is that they're inviting you to. And that slow withdrawal really will help you to avoid, again, the people and the places that are causing or potentially causing you to continue to sin, be in, be in a state of sinfulness. So that that's a very like you know, direct way of dealing with external negative influences. But you also have to be mindful of your own habits, right? Your own um, tendencies, because we can't blame everything on everybody else. So if you yourself have weaknesses to being in certain environments, um, you know, FOMO is a very real thing. And there are people who are afflicted with this feeling of, I have to go because I don't want to be the only one that's not going. And then I won't, you know, have, it's, that's what it is if you're missing out. So if you, um, if that's coming from you, right, maybe you're invited to something and all your friends are going, and this is, you know, during a time where you had intended to, to do something else. Like, let's say, for example, I mean, I'm just going to try to give you a practical example. Let's say, for example, there is a weekend retreat coming up and it's going to be a really great spiritual weekend. There's some teachers coming to your area. They're going to put a program together. You buy your tickets, you register, you're ready to go. But then on one of those nights, some of your friends um, decide that they want to go to the city, whatever major city is in your area, and they want to have dinner and maybe, you know, have have some other social, um, there could be some other social thing they want to do, but they're inviting you to that. And all of your other friends and maybe even really close people are going to go. And now you're getting phone calls and text messages. Let's go together. Let's hang out. Let's all carpool. 
And you now are in a bind because you, it's coming from you. There's no real pressure necessarily, but you yourself are now like, oh, I'm torn. I really wanted to go to this. I bought my tickets. But then at the same time, everybody's going to this big shindig or whatever it is. You know, everybody's going to be there. And then I'm going to be the only one left out. Um, and you have to make a decision. And it is. It's kind of one of those dunya versus deen decisions that you might find yourself in. But if you are really thinking with your rational mind, not your emotions, not your appetites, with your rational mind, you're weighing between the two. And this is why it's so important to, like, again, suspect the nafs, because the nafs is going to give you all the justifications for why you should go. You know, all your friends will be there, your siblings, your cousins, whoever. You're going to have an awesome time. You can't be the only one left out. It doesn't look good. It doesn't reflect well. Blah, blah, blah. All right. It's going to fill you with all these justifications. But you have to activate the rational mind and say, I had a really beautiful intention. Allah inspired me to go and do this spiritual weekend retreat with amazing scholars who I don't know if they're ever going to, you know, like when, when, when it would be possible for me to have this opportunity again. And um, there's going to be obviously more, more baraka there because if I'm in this environment, I'm going to be remembering Allah. I'm going to be doing my prayers. I'm going to be listening to Quran. I'm going to be listening to dhikr. I'm going to be around people who are beneficial to me, inshallah. And as much as I would love to be in this social place where I can get dressed up and kind of have fun and do whatever I do with my friends, if I'm being honest, that environment, I'm going to be forgetful of Allah. I'm probably not going to do all my prayers because you know how it goes once you're out and about and um, you're not in an environment where those things are easy to do, then it just becomes qada or, oh, oh well, I guess um, I just won't pray this time. And th these are the kinds of options that eventually what happens, right? That's the real way of examining your choices, which is what are which one is better for me? Rational mind has to be operating here. The mind, not the heart, not the emotions, and not the appetites. And that level of, dis I mean, that level of awareness of your, of your, um, your, your, you know, these choices that are you're being presented with and your own mind and suspecting the mind will help you hopefully make the right decision. So you have to do that though. So when we say avoiding haram places, it's, it's very much, um, the onus is on the individual to do that. And then continuous toba and keeping company of the rightly guided. So those are all part, those are all regular actions that we should be constantly doing in order to prevent the illnesses uh, of the soul from increasing, exacerbating, because we need to constantly be working on cleansing the heart and soul. But if we're doing, uh, you know, these things and not mindful of them, then it's when it, will we ever get to the a place of like some level of peace, right? Uh, how, how will we arrive at that place of, of soul uh, tranquility if we're constantly, um, you know, uh, in, in this position of, of disease taking over and we're not really working on cleansing. So all of this is to help. And this is what we talked about last week. Now, um, the next, if you look at underneath here, right, you'll see, cause he, he mentions this actually, you know what, let me, let me go to the next slide because at the end of last week, if you remember right before we ended here, he says, I say, um, it's this last paragraph on page 10. I say that being content with the self, persisting in disobedient acts, and abandoning awareness of Allah are the foundations of all illnesses, tribulations, and pitfalls. So this is, you know, Sidi Ahmed Zaruk, he's basically giving us the answers in this small little chapter, I mean, a uh, paragraph, where he's telling us that everything that we want to rid ourselves, all these spiritual illnesses, and then also the hardships that we want to prevent, right? The tribulations that we want to prevent. Nobody wants to be tested and tried in dunya. Um, and the pitfalls that we keep falling into can be sourced back to these three things. The first is being content with the self, which is why he mentions right before this, you have to be suspicious of the self. You can't be content with the self. 
If you let that inner voice dictate to you all the time without challenging it with the rational mind, without um, you know questioning its presumptions or its intentions or whatever it is, and you just allow yourself to always do whatever your your you know whatever you're compelled to do without first examining the uh, motivation behind it, it's 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 going to cause you problems because many people fall into um, a lot of problems in their life because they didn't take the time to first suspect the intentions of their their own inner voice, right? Um, and they just they're too confident basically in their own judgment. They're too confident in their own assessments of things, right? Many many of us will make um, uh, assessments and judgments of people of situations without even all the evidence. Like it's snap judgments. How many of us fall into snap judgments all the time? And then we act upon those snap judgments, right? Uh, we let the emotions dictate. So this is where it's so important that you are not content with the self, that you actually look at yourself as being a source of a lot of your problems. And I mean, our scholars, they didn't mince words. They were very clear that the greatest of the four evils of this dunya is the nafs. So if you're not suspicious of your own nafs, you know, because it's very easy for us to look outwardly and be suspicious of other people. And we're all like mind readers, amazingly, you know, when we, when we presume to know a person's intentions, you know, I bet you, I know why she did that or why he said that we all seem like we got everybody figured out, but we are clueless about the machinations of our own nafs. Right. Which is why, um, a really great book that um, alhamdulillah, our teachers uh, you know, Sheikh Hamza and others have recommended for decades. Like I remember decades ago, he he encouraged people to read it. And I love this book. Um, he recently did a reading of it on the First Command Book Club, which is the Screw Tape Letters. So if you have never read the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis, I really recommend reading that. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's not my recommendation, but it's the recommendation of uh, many teachers, but I have also read it and I find that it is a really great in, insight uh, or provides a lot of insight into these um, internal dialogues that we have that are actually sourced from, uh, you know, these, the external evil of Iblis's waswasa with our own nafs working, you know, together because they are, they're like, Co co conspirators against us. Uh, so it's it's a dialogue between Iblis and one of his uh, minions, and how they basically um, trick us as human beings. So, but but it's just it's very insightful. Um, and then there's also um, I think it's Ibn Al Josie's book, The Devil's Dupery, which is um, forgetting the name in the Arabic. Uh, it's it's a text as well on the, the way that shaitan tricks the human being. And it's amazing, amazing text. Um, so the, there are books within our own tradition that I think once you read it, you're just going to be like, subhanAllah, I have been fooled for so long thinking that, you know, I was applying logic or I was, you know, being fair when I really wasn't, when it was really very self-serving, right? Because a lot of our, our thoughts are actually very self-serving thoughts. Um, and we will convince ourselves because um, there's a lot, there's, well, well, it seems like logic, but it's not really, it's just nafsi uh, justifications. So, um, and this is actually why it's also important. I mean, this is a total different topic, but I actually did want to share this with you because just to make this point. So let me, um, let me add this image. I hope I can add it. You know what, I think I need to, um, yeah, I won't go into a tab, but let me uh, quickly stop this screen share and share this image with you, because I think this is one of the best images I've seen on cognitive distortions. Um, so look at this image. This is, this is just enough. I think if you, if you took time to study this, and this is, you know, um, from, from modern psychology, but a lot of these things what, what it does is it helps you understand how your own mind can mess with you, which from a metaphysical lens, from our perspective, this is a very material scientific approach to understanding 
the distortions of the mind. But from our lens, the distortions of the mind can be con- attributed to the nafs and shaitan, right? Um, so for those who are on Instagram, let me see, how can I get you to see the same image? Because I wish I could, I don't know how to do these things like while I'm on the call with you. If there's a, uh, see, they don't have an image share, which which is unfortunate. But the Zoom call is through Rahma Foundation if you want to jump on. But otherwise, you can go to, um, you know what, do this. Go to Google and do a search for cognitive distortions examples. Um, and the website is called Mind My Peelings. It's, it's uh, I don't know what, anyway, it's, it's not feelings, it's peelings with a P. P-E-E-L-I-N-G-S. But it should come up. It's an image that I I just found on Google. Um, But I think it's a great image because everybody should know these things. What's polarized thinking? What's mental filtering? uh, Overgeneralization, jumping to conclusions, right? Mind reading, fortune telling, which I mentioned. Catastrophizing, um, magnification, minimization, personalization, blaming. I mean, if you just took some time and you're honest with yourself, right? And you really ask yourself, how often do I do these things? You're going to hopefully have a total different understanding of the mind and how um, how you how you should not trust your mind so quickly. Which is why it's so important to have good sahaba. Because if you have teachers, you have good people, then when you get like a solid, firm, you know, um, idea about something, it's really good to to check that with someone who can be honest with you, who'll tell you objectively, mm, I don't know if that's, if I would do that, or I don't know if I agree with that. You know, I think, I think you're, you might be getting ahead of yourself. Um, you know, you might be overgeneralizing or you might be doing this or that, but being suspicious of the nafs, that's what it looks like. It's not believing everything that your mind tells you. And, you know, there's a fine line. We also don't want to uh, become paranoid of every single thought and idea we have. That's not the point of this. The point of this is to just be really clear about the, the way that our stream of consciousness is influenced, right? Because there are multiple things that influence our thoughts. Um, so we have the, the four khawatir in our tradition that explain, you know, the sources of inspiration for the human being. Like what, what inspires the human being? Um, it's your nafs, your own self, your own ideas, your own desires, your whims, your um, iblis, because he is, that's one of the characteristics and qualities, major ones that he has, is he can't directly force us to do anything. We are responsible for our own actions. However, he can suggest, right? He can suggest. Um Alhamdulillah. So I'm sorry, someone's asking on the Instagram. Yes, mind my peelings with an S.com. And then do a search for cognitive distortions examples. Sorry, it's very wordy, but cognitive distortions. I'm going to just quickly try to type this cognitive distortions um examples that's the name of the image it's got yellow little um pictures on it that and then there's seven qualities that they um, teach you really great and i think you should look, look this over and examine it really well um so yeah that you know that it, once you once you uh do this then you'll just be more suspicious of of what's going on why why am i thinking this way and um, then you check, you know, you you contrast those ideas that you have with your conscience, which should hopefully be rooted in your taqwa, right? That I have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even if I'm thinking this way or I want to do this, what would be more pleasing to Allah? That is the, the, the constant state of the believer. That, you know, you have an impulse, you have a desire, you have a thought, but then you you weigh it with that scale of, is this going to be, um, is this going to yield the rida of Allah or his displeasure? And that's, then you act, right? So the other two sources are the Khatar Malikani, which is from, you know, the angelic presence um, that we have angels all around us that are assigned to us to protect us. I think um, there's 10 of them, if I'm not mistaken. 
um, that, that are assigned to us. And they're on either side, in front of us, behind us, above us. There's a two on our shoulders. So we have angels that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And they will sometimes inspire us to act, inshallah, always in, in khair. Um, and then we have the Khatar Rabbani, which is the, you know, in, the direct um, communication or inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which, which uh, Allahu alam exactly how uh, or in what context that can come. But I think I've heard some, for example, uh, explain that our answers to our istikhara which are directly, we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, you know, for guidance on a certain matter, um, then he will guide us. It could also be dreams because dreams are part of revelation, right? So there's certain ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can, will communicate things to us as well. But these are the four sources. So what this does is it helps you to just suspect is which source is a certain thought or idea coming from. And, and that's why it's so helpful. So this is a really great, and I hope you, those of you who are on the Zoom call, I hope you got the um, screenshot or at least, you know, saw it. So I'm, I'm going to stop sharing this and then we can go back to, and I'll stop soon so we can take some Q&A, inshallah. So this is what he ended on, um, or what we ended on last week, which was the sources of all illnesses. So being content with the self, persistent disobedience. So if you are persistently being disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yeah, you're going to have spiritual illness. You're going to have tribulations. You're going to continue to fall. I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? Because why would you expect facilitation and ease and guidance and benefit and blessings? Although Allah is so generous because he's, by the fact that we breathe, by the fact that we eat, by the fact that we have a roof over our heads, we have sustenance coming to us, we're still in blessing. We're, so it's not like, we're completely cut off when we turn from him. I mean, even those who deny him and reject him are still being sustained by him. And that's out of his generosity. But if you want ease and you want to be protected against these types of things, then you have to have, again, the mindset or the just the, the conscience to know and the logical mind to know that um, sinfulness is going to, uh, it, it has to stop. You have to stop your sinfulness. Uh, in order to be protected. So that's the second thing. And then the la the third thing that he mentions is abandoning awareness of Allah. Um, so when we are in ghafla, which all of these things lead to, if you're content with yourself, you're persistently uh, disobedient and doing sinfulness knowingly, like you know what you're doing is haram, but you continue to do it anyway, then it will lead you to a state of ghafla, which is abandoning awareness of Allah, where you're not thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're not remembering Allah. So you will, again, have a lot of problems. It's just, that's the recipe for disaster. So he says, all of our illnesses, our tribulations and pitfalls can be rooted to one of these three or all of these three. So really important, uh, mashallah, um, wisdom here. And then for just in the few couple of minutes, actually, wow, subhanAllah, today's session went so quickly, I apologize. But um, this is what was the next section, which are the other afflictions and pitfalls of the soul. So he's giving you the three that are, he believes, the root of a lot of the evil and the hardships that we experience. But now he's also mentioning that there are other pitfalls that usually people who are spiritually ill will fall into. First is that they prefer ignorance over knowledge. So there is this idea and tendency for some people, right? Ignorance is bliss, where they don't want to know. They are willfully ignorant. They don't want you to teach them about right and wrong. They don't want you to correct them when they make mistakes. These are the type of people that shun, um, you know, nasiha. So, and you might know people like this, like they, they'll be doing something wrong and you want to advise them. But when you advise them, they're just like, oh, no, I don't want to hear that right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know, I know, I know. And they kind of play it off because they're, they'd are they rather not know. Um, and if you think about the day and age that we live in, Allah alam, but I don't think many of us are going to be able to get away with the whole I was ignorant card. You know, just think about the level of uh, access to information that we have. It's unprecedented. If you just rewind 50, 60 years ago, you a person in order to really learn their deen, they would have to travel. They would have to go out of their home, make a trek sometimes to find qualified teachers. It was a much more involved process. Whereas now knowledge 
within a split second, you could access major databases and sources of information. And so it really comes back to the individual volition and desire of all of us. If you are, you know, a student and you're, or you're working and you're constantly, um, you know, reading for your work or your studies because of your, you know, you're, you're still in school and you're, or you're just online and you're watching videos and looking at news articles and following blogs and whatever you're doing, that's all you actively pursuing knowledge but it's just not the knowledge that will lead you to the knowledge of God, right? In most cases, because it's material knowledge. So how then can a person who has the access, who has the means, who has the ability, because you are, you know, you, you, you're obviously, um, you're, you're able to read, you know, you're, you're educated enough to do that. So you have all of these things. How then can you act as though you didn't know other than, The only explanation being you chose not to know. You chose, instead of um, learning your dean to go and memorize song lyrics. And, you know, there there are people who do this. They they will not know Quran. They will not prioritize their knowledge of dean. But they can memorize many other things. And they will be very proud, whether it's a person who's like a sports um, buff and they know all the stats of their favorite athletes, or they will, I mean, I know people who love movies to the point that they will memorize dialogue of like a, the whole movie. They'll know it back and forth. So, okay. So you can clearly, uh, you know, you have the time and you have the, the ability, but your what is dictating? Because if it was your rational mind, we go back to that equation, right? If your rational mind is dictating to you, then you see your brain cells, your memory, your uh, your your mind basically like real estate, right? Because once you're you know you choose to, to make those uh, connections, right, in your brain, and you choose to uh, to distribute your 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 uh, brain cells to certain skills or whatever it is, um, it's it's like real estate that you've you've built upon. So if you're really mindful of that, then you would say, I can either spend a lot of my brain energy and you know time and money maybe doing this which will make me maybe feel good or feel some you know nafsi kind of impulse in me or i can think about the long term benefit and investment of learning something for the sake of allah and this doesn't mean that we can't also learn other things outside of deen that's not the point here the point is having the discernment to know what is in your best interest in your in your soul's best interests versus what indulges your nafs and if you can do that then you will be able to make the right choices when you're presented with options but if you're not even thinking on that higher level right you're not pushing yourself to higher goals and standards then what will happen is your emotions and your appetites will dictate for you which is why we have to be what suspicious of the nafs of the thoughts of the nafs so this first point, preference over uh, of ignorance over knowledge is really important. A lot of people will present with this. Being deluded by spiritual imposters. This is also another sign of spiritual um, uh, you know, sickness and also susceptibility to pitfalls is that you, because you don't have discernment, you're not aware of what, what is true and what isn't, and you're kind of in that you know, you're just letting your emotions get the best of you, then you may very easily fall for people who come, you know, with all the right things to say, right? The same way, for example, you know, a a hopeless romantic can be easily swept off their feet because they're not thinking with their logical, rational mind. They're thinking, they're allowing their emotions to get the best of them. So if you have um, the ability, or if you've studied your dean and you see, or, or you're around really God fearing people, then you can look past the performativity that usually comes with spiritual imposters. Cause a lot of them are just performance artists. I mean, I wouldn't even call them artists. They're just performers. They come, they, they look the part, but they're not, um, you know, they're not sincere because there's, there's a, there's a lot of odious behavior that they present, you know, being overly, um, almost to a point of, you know, just uh, repulsion, um, being too, um, what's the word, like 
you know, there, there's too much uh, uh, performance, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm this very, very um, humble uh, person. And I, I lower myself to everyone. And I, I speak in a way that's just, you, I think we've all been around people like that, right? Where it's just, it doesn't feel right. And if you look at the Prophet, I said, I mean, he's our exemplar. You you show one hadith where he or any of the great Sahaba or any of the great scholars of our time ever um, humiliated themselves or or made themselves look to um, in a way that was just not befitting. You know, there's a there's a very fine line between humility and and looking um, and and humiliating yourself. We don't, we don't, as Muslims don't do that. You're supposed to hold yourself up with dignity and with honor, not because you think of yourself as anything, but it's rather the, the way that, you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed us to be, right? That's why we're upright, right? We're not like animals on the floor. Um, so when you see that kind of, there's a specific term for it, and I can't remember it right now, but anyway, it's to describe people who are just very, very, um, uh, affected, I think, is is one of the ways to describe them. But it looks like basically they're just acting, and it's not real. So you, you would be able to see that. But if you're, you know, um, easily deluded because you're, and there are there are these gurus, for example. Like I remember, I went to um, a, an Oprah Winfrey event here. Like I don't know, it was 2014. So it was a while ago, almost 10 years ago, and. Oh my gosh, this is what I, I'm, I mean, I've seen it. I've seen these people, they come on stage and they just act like they're these highly, um, you know, spiritual, like they've reached nirvana, the way that they act and the way that they carry themselves. Uh, and you should just see past it. A lot of them are just, they're grifters. They make money off of making claims. Um, a lot of them are just not real uh, you know, they, they, a lot of them steal, like it's known, um, you know, some of the people that she's platformed have been proven later to be just people who take from the tradition, the great, the great traditions, they'll actually say it like they, they basically borrow from all of the great world religions, and then they write their little books, and it's next thing you know, it's on the book club, or it's all over the bookstores, and they're, um, they're, you know, lauded as being these spiritually enlightened, mystical individuals, but it's like, please. So you can see people like that as for what they are. Whereas, mashallah, some of the greatest scholars of our time were so humble that, you know, people didn't even know uh, that they were talking to them sometimes. Like Imam al-Ghazali has, you know, many uh, great stories about when he was sweeping, you know, uh, I don't know if it was Baghdad or Syria, but he was sweeping the mosques of, of, you know, the great mosques. And because he had reached the height of scholarship, there were circles of, of scholars and students of knowledge talking about him. But, you know, this was before pictures were available, so they didn't even know what he looked like. But he's just so humble. He didn't say a word. He just was, because he had his own journey with Allah. So, our tradition is full of stories like of people like that, saint, saintly people who are not interested in trying to impress people. They didn't do the whole sycophant kind of weird, like I said, performativity that you'll see from a lot of these people. And they didn't center themselves. It was never about that. It's always about the deen, about Allah, about the Prophet. So that's how you can pr protect yourself from being deluded by those types of impostors. And then the inability to prioritize important matters. Again, if you're... Um, not spiritually right and following the tradition and following the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then your whole life will be kind of all over the place. You won't make good decisions. You don't have that wisdom and discernment. So you may just prioritize the wrong things and you end up foregoing really important things like your prayers for other things that are of no benefit to you. Something as, as so obvious as what could be more important than praying because that is the reason why you were created. There's nothing more important in your life that you do as a human being, as a Muslim, nothing more important than your prayer. Um, but if you have to be told that and you have to be convinced of that, then there's something you need to examine within yourself because your priorities are off. Like if you think your work is more important than your prayers, that's a huge problem because who is the one who's sustaining you? Who's the one who got you that job? Who's the one that is allowing that income to come to you. It's your Lord. So you think that by bypassing the worship of your Lord to get to your job on time or to, to, you know, to do your work, 
that that is a wise thing to do? I don't know. I just think, again, activate the rational mind. You'll see that that just doesn't logically follow. And then using using spiritual path to inflate the nafs. This is also another problem that for a person who's afflicted with diseases, they would uh, start to see, uh, you know, getting into, you know, these types of spiritual, um, uh, you know, endeavors as being a means to uh, to benefit themselves. Like I said, grifting or just, you know, benefiting, profiting off of off of spirituality is a is horrible, and it's it's the lowest thing to do. And then wanting to expedite spiritual openings without the prerequisite effort. So this is also another pitfall that a person who is not on the right path, who is afflicted, would want to experience things really quickly. And I've heard from many people, some people, for example, who have a difficult time sustaining their worship because they're waiting for, I don't know, like the sky to open up and the angels to descend, but they're waiting for like these signs. And it's almost like in their mind, until they feel like, you know, these openings um, that they just don't really feel like it's working. Like I've actually had people say that, like, I don't know, I don't really feel very motivated in my prayers. I'm, I don't feel anything. I'm like, okay. So in order for you to continue to pray, you have to feel something first. How about seeing it as the opposite, that maybe if you continue to put that effort in uh, to whatever act of worship you're supposed to be doing, that eventually, because of your sincerity and your effort, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reward you with um with with things you know like if you if you're not seeing dreams like some people for example they may want to do dhikr or salawat on the prophet sallam because they want to see him in their dreams so is that um is that now the only motivation that you have to do salawat on the prophet sallam is that oh i want to see him in a dream that you have to you know really again suspect your intentions and be like wait a second you know, I should be doing salawat on the Prophet just because Allah commanded us to do it. He does it, the angels do it, we do it, right? Um, why am I making these conditionals, right? If I'm making conditionals, then that's clearly an issue. But this is how the nafs can really um, trick us and delude us, is by putting all these ideas in our minds. And unless we're suspicious of it, then we're susceptible to it. So, mashallah, I know that I'm really over and I apologize. For that, let me go ahead and stop screen share, see if there's any comments um, or questions. I see one qu question in the Q&A box, but I don't think there's anything in the chat going on. And um, Osada Fadua had a prior commitment, so she's not here to, uh, to moderate, but let me go ahead and read this. Could you recommend some books that you think reading would improve our deen or enlighten us toward our deen? Looking at things to head while I'm working, cleaning, driving. Mashallah, Jazakallah khairan for this question. I mean, I think, um, you know, some of the books that, uh, you know what I would really recommend, actually, because uh, to to you know populate a list right now offhand uh, is difficult. But I do think that, mashallah, if you're not familiar with um, the first command book club that Sheikh Hamza is doing with Zaytuna College, I would really recommend people to look at that uh, program because he has hand selected very specific texts to really open our minds up and to um, enhance our understanding. And they're, they're all over the place. I mean, I, I mean, in terms of genre, so it's not like uh, one specific genre. He, he has a lot of non-Muslim authors, um, a lot of novels, nonfiction, but everything that he's curated is actually, and if you follow the recordings that he's put together, um, they are really quite spiritually insightful. I mean, there's not a single book that he's picked that hasn't left the you know the the group anyway because you can you know we have q a and there's a lot of discussion in the chat everybody's like wow 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 because it's it's done with a lot of depth and insight into what we the modern muslim need to do in order to really elevate our understanding increase our understanding and hopefully inshallah um you know just spiritually uh grow and benefit from. So I would say definitely look at that. Um, it's called the First Command Book Club. Just go to zaytunacollege.edu. You'll see the, the link for it. And you can, they actually have a list of the, the titles uh, for, for last year and this year. Just look at it. Um, there's a lot of great selections. And I mentioned, you know, the screw tape letters, but I would say purification of the heart for sure, because Tuskia is a lifelong process. It's something we should all be doing. And if you're not even aware of your own spiritual illnesses, it's kind of like um, 
getting a blood work analysis, right? Before you get on a path of like a total new lifestyle change. Most people, that's what they do. If you want to have a total, um, you know, like you want to renew your your health or, or revitalize your health, this is, is what may be encouraged of you, right? Go to your doctor, get some blood work, see what's going on. And then you start to plan ahead, right? Once you look at your numbers. Um, so in a way, when you look at your um, the purification of the heart, when you're examining your spiritual diseases, it's the same thing. I need to know what I'm working with, like which diseases, um, you know, do I need to uh, to work on more than others? And that's why there it's it, it covers the signs, the symptoms, and then the cures. And so I would definitely do that. Um, I think also connecting with, uh, I mean, there's there's things that we do like prayer, reading the Quran, um, Sira and Dikir that are kind of like just givens every single day. I have a portion of it the same way you would like taking really potent spiritual, uh, vitamins or like, you know, to, to basically inoculate yourself or, you know, from diseases and from problems outside prayer is part of that. Uh, reading the book of Allah, doing our daily awrad or du'as, that's all to protect the heart and our, shield ourselves from the external you know, world and the problems here. So that we do those no matter what. And then there's additional things where it's like you're really trying to grow your understanding. And that's where looking at your aqidah, looking at, you know, tazkiyat and nafs, um, uh, you know, looking at... Um, you know, I mean, obviously we should be, we should know our, our fardain. So if you're, if you haven't studied like the fiqh of, you know, the or the fiqh of prayer, just the basic fiqh that you would need your, you know, your daily um, life fiqh, those are important, but I think that's a good place to start in terms of, you know, what to read. Uh, so sorry, long answer to the question, but alhamdulillah, I hope that's helpful to you. And then um, let me see, I don't, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So unless there are any questions, I think we can go ahead and end for today, inshallah. I will look quickly over at Instagram because I see, mashallah, a lot of people are coming in and out and I don't know if there are any questions. So let me just check. Um, uh, yes, Sister uh, Fatima, I was speaking about the book club that um, is on uh, Zaytuna College's website, in Mubarak. Oh, thank you, mashallah. Thank you. Jazakumullah khairan for some of the, the comments here. I don't see any questions yet. So I think we can go ahead and end today's session. Inshallah, next week we will, um, Bismillah, we will continue the text. So for those who are on the Instagram live, I'm actually doing a class with the Rahma Foundation. We started it in the month of Ramadan, but we're continuing it until we finish this text. It's called Foundations of the Spiritual Path. It's open, it's free. There's no commitment other than just a registration. But it is an incredible text that is um, uh, written by Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, translated by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. And it's really a roadmap for the believer on how to build your, your spiritual path in a very smart way, mindful of all of the pitfalls and the dangers within and externally. So it's a beautiful document. And we've been going over it for four or five weeks now. We'll continue, inshallah, next week. I want to thank everyone for being part of the session today. Oh, wait, is there another question? Alhamdulillah. Yes, Jazakallah uh, khair and sister. The recordings will be available. Um, I believe the Rahma Foundation it will send a link to the recordings um, after the class is over. So just check your email. They usually upload it to the cloud and then um, send the recording. So inshallah, you can check it out there. Um, and then we'll continue next week, same time, Monday, 5 to 6 p.m. Well, 5 to 6, 20 p.m. today, but hopefully we'll, I'll try to keep it under an hour next week. And uh, I invite you to read the document ahead of time and prepare any questions in advance. Uh, I want to thank all of you. Jazakumullah khairan. Inshallah, I'll go ahead and end in dua. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa al-asr inna al-insana lafi khusr illa ladhina amanu wa amilu al-salihati wa tawasu bil-haqi wa tawasu bil-sabr. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfirk wa natubu ilayk. Allahumma sallu wa sallam wa barak ala sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad. صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزه اما يصفون وسلامنا على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله
Jazakum al khairan, everyone. Inshallah, we'll see you next Monday. Please keep, again, Sidi uh, Mu'adh and Nas and his entire family in your du'as, inshallah, and uh, the community worldwide. These things um, are really hard sometimes for, for, for many people. But inshallah, Allah will give us strength that we just had a blessed month of Ramadan. And even though it's very difficult to bear such losses, we have to keep in mind that, alhamdulillah, this is dunya. Inshallah, we'll all come out on the other side in a much better state, reunited with our loved ones, inshallah. Ameen. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah. Again, Jazakum Allah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before I begin, before I formally begin, I just wanted to remind everyone that I have been asked by uh, some people how much longer these sessions are going to go. And I'm not quite sure because, mashallah, as you've seen, this text is so dynamic and we end up sometimes uh, on certain topics for longer than maybe I even intend when I start these. So there is time to still register. And I do encourage everyone to uh, share it, inshallah, because as I've mentioned before, this is such an important text and I really want to expose as many people as possible to it. So please do let others know that they can still register. And then there's the recordings, of course, available. Uh, I also have people joining on Instagram Live. Salam alaikum and welcome everyone. I am with the Rahma Foundation. I will put the link to the Zoom class right now. But if you go to the Rahma Foundation, you will see a link for the Foundations of the Spiritual Path, which is a course that I've been doing throughout Ramadan. And we're going to continue until we finish this document. So please feel free to join the, the Zoom currently happening live if you want to see the video and uh, some of the slides that I'm sharing. But you're also welcome to watch here on Instagram. So we will begin with the dua of um, of seeking knowledge first. So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Excuse me. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatiha lima ughriq wal-Khatimi lima sabaq. Nasir al-Haqi bil-Haq al-Hadi ila suratih al الحادي إلى سراتق المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووافقنا توفيق الصالحين اللهم excuse me اللهم بالقرآن وذكر الحكيم I apologize one second let me just grab some water I feel like a, a tickle in my throat one second We'll begin again. I'll do that section. Allahumma aftah alayna fatuh al-arifiyin wa fiqna tawfiq al-salihin wa anfa'ana Allahumma bil-Qur'an wa dhikr al-Hakim. Allahumma alimna ma yinfa'ana wa anfa'ana bima alamtina wa zidna ilman yuqarribuna minka bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin. Allahumma la sahla ila ma ja'atuhu sahlan wa anta ya hayu ya qayyum wa taj'alu al-hazna ida shatta sahlan sahla. Allahumma aidna min shulur yanfusina wa min sayyati a'malina wa aslihnana shatna kullah Alhamdulillah. I mentioned that I've been trying to memorize this thought and it, I, I'm uh, clearly not doing that well <laughs> memorizing it. So Alhamdulillah, may Allah give us tawfiq. But again, uh, welcome everyone. So the text that we are reading, I'll go ahead and screen share for those again who are joining for the first time. Um, it's called The Foundations of the Spiritual Path. And we've gone through several uh, sections of it, but recordings are available. We can kind of pick up because it's really um, organized in a, in a way that even if you're joining for the first time, you can follow along, hopefully. But let me go ahead and screen share so that you can see what I'm seeing, inshallah. <clears throat> Bismillah. So last week, we left off on this section... Bismillah here, which is right in the middle of page 11. Um, let me zoom in so you can see it more clear, hopefully. But we, this is basically describing spiritual illnesses and what results when we become too comfortable with ourselves, right? And if you remember, I also um, have some slides that I've created just to visually give you um, a picture of, of the structure of, the, uh, of how he's organized this document. So if you recall, last week, we were here on this section. So these are afflictions and pitfalls of the soul. And he identified that you know, when you let yourself go, you stop remembering Allah, you habitually sin, you become very comfortable with yourself, you're opening yourself up to even more spiritual problems, all of which are connected to those 
three uh, things that he mentioned, right? Um, again, this was from uh, previous sessions, but I think it's important to bring it up here. He, he says that he believes the sources of all of our illnesses, spiritual illnesses, our tribulations, the difficulties that we have in life, and the pitfalls that we perpetually fall into, spiritually speaking, can be deduced to these three. Like there, these are this is the cause, which is being content with the self, persistent disobedience. So we continuously are sinning, and then we're just not thinking of Allah. And again, it seems so simple, but if you think about people who are in uh, states of sinfulness, they're likely doing all three of these things, right? Because once you habituate to sin, you're not, you don't really feel guilt. You don't feel that there's anything that you need to correct because the nafs will delude you to think that you're okay. And a lot of times, I mean, I know I've heard in my lifetime, many people will say things like, you know, God is the most merciful. My heart is clean. You know, I, um, I, I know I'm a sinner, but one day I'll correct myself. So they kind of, you know, these are all rationalizations and justifications that the nafs will make in order to justify sinfulness. But the, so, so when you think of people who have problems in their life, um, again, according to, uh, uh, you know, Zaruk, these are the reasons is that they are falling into all of these or or some of these or, or mostly uh, I think um, he would say all three so and then from that you get these different types uh, of um, of uh, you know things that present right that the individual will present with for example he mentions uh, we talked about this last week that the, they will prefer ignorance over knowledge and there are many people who would rather not know because it absolves them of accountability and responsibility, right? If you if if you know that something is flat out haram and there's clear repercussions um, for it, um, it maybe you're you know you you would think twice. But if you remain ignorant of certain rules or try to kind of skirt around um, you know uh, your your obligations, then you can use that experience excuse, well, I didn't know, right? So this is also part of the tricks of the nafs is that it will encourage people to remain ignorant because it's a lot more easier to um, absolve oneself again of the guilt that would come and the internal shame that would come when you are clearly aware of your sinfulness. So that's uh, one. And then being deluded by spiritual imposters. This is another important thing because, you know, in our day and age, what I found, and I'm sure many of us will agree which is a problem, is that you will find many um, Muslims who are not impressed by scholarship. They're not impressed by religious or pious people, right? They won't even give them much importance. And they'll be, in some cases, they will um, be very dismissive of these types of people. You know, they'll even have labels for them, right? So instead of someone being uh, a sheikh or, or a scholar, they'll use these uh, terms or labels that are usually, you know, just veiled epithets, right? Like like uh, Molana or Molvi or, uh, uh, you know, they'll use, again, these terms that are supposed to have religious significance in a way that is intended to be more demeaning. So we have to be very careful um, of, of uh, obviously anything like that. But I think the point here is that they will not give credibility to religious people, but then they're, they will be impressed by other people who um, maybe sound like they know what they're talking about. They they seem to have some spiritual, uh, you know, enlightenment. Um, and, you know, and, and this is, again, I'm, I'm talking about like new age kind of gurus or self-appointed uh, authorities on matters of spirituality. Just maybe they, they even have, uh, for example, a scientific background, right? So it may not be that they're, they have any religious credibility, but they have other things that that make them seem to be popular or like they know what they're talking about um, and they'll give them more importance. So this is very dangerous because if you're going to dismiss actual grounded real scholars who know what they're talking about because they've gone through the proper channels of knowledge, you know, learning knowledge and, and uh, getting that credibility, but then you, you don't give them you know, their due, but then you are quick to speak very highly of other people who may have more secular views, uh, less you know strict uh, religious views, but they espouse spirituality and humanism and a lot of very um, they seem to be very uh, good things you know and this is where we have to differentiate between what is an actual real 
good or benefit and what apparently seems right apparent good versus real goods um, because there's a lot of things that apparently seem good but they end up being major sources of misguidance um, you know when I was younger I remember um, a lot of people would go to people who would uh, for example read their their tea leaves or somehow you know dabble into the occult and they would really believe that these people knew what they were talking about because, oh, no, 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 um, they knew things about me. And, you know, you see mediums, for example, there's a lot of documentaries on people that have like these abilities to speak to, you know, the dead and, and whatever. And a lot of people will believe in that stuff, but they will totally be dismissive of religious, actual, uh, credible people. So this is another sign of spiritual sickness because what it indicates is that the individual is not really thinking about, you know, what is uh, the correct course, but they're actually, it's their desires that are dictating because it's very, um, you know, it's, it, it feeds the nafs to go to, to people who tell you what you want to hear. And so you'd rather go to someone who, again, um, presents themselves as being some spiritual authority and who tells you, oh, you don't have to pray. You don't have to do these things. You know, God is good, God will forgive you, and they'll say all these things to fluff you up, but you don't really have to do anything to earn those things, right? And that's where we in Islam draw the line, because yes, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absolutely, uh, you know, the most merciful of the merciful, that goes without saying, and those are his attributes that he describes himself as, but that does not mean that we do not have to earn, right, our place in his uh, grace, and, and to try to strive. So. We have to work for it, basically. But this is a sign of spiritual illness, is that when you're too impressed by the imposters out there. Uh, the inability to prioritize important matters. Again, I'm just summarizing last week so that we're all on the same page. But this is another important thing. If you are putting certain things um, before things that are more essential or more important, especially when it comes to your spiritual life, right? If you're bodily, worldly, physical needs are coming before your spiritual needs, this would be an indication that you, you don't have your priorities straight. Um, a very simple example of this is your schedule, right? If you are factoring in, you know, things uh, that relate to your, um, you know, your interests or maybe your responsibilities in terms of work or school and your schedule, you're always prioritizing those things first. And then you're not making time for your spiritual uh, ritual obligations. You know, you don't you don't really think much about your prayers or um, the, the book of Allah or anything else that you should be doing on a regular basis, because those are kind of optional when you have time. Uh, but they're or, you know, they're not essential. They're not they're not major priorities because you will see many people. Uh, you know, and I know even people that are that, that I love and care for, um, unfortunately, they will make a lot of time for, you know, their work. They will wake up very early. Uh, they will be always ahead when it comes to their worldly pursuits. And there's nothing that could stand in their way because they have high ambition, right? So they're very ambitious. But then when it comes to their spiritual matters, those are not really on their radar at all. And they tend to follow, um, unfortunately, these ideas or these notions that, you know, there's a there there will there will come a time and a place when I will get more spiritual, you know, um, and that'll come later. And that's why it's so important to study diseases of the heart because once you read the diseases of the heart, you'll see that one of the diseases is actually the false belief that you have more time than you have because nobody knows how much time. We have the only thing we have is the present, right? So that's why you're supposed to live in the present. If you're living so far ahead and you're procrastinating really important things that you should be doing, um, thinking that you will somehow have time that nobody's promised you, this is also an indication of spiritual illness and disease and delusion. So prioritizing what's important is an, is really, uh, you know, again, important uh, when you're uh, trying to remove spiritual diseases to say most the most important thing that I can do every single day is worship my Lord. And that's why I was created. And I need to assure that those things can be done every day without excuse 
Um, and then I can, you know, do the other things that serve my other needs or interests or what have you. So that's very important. And then he mentions using the spiritual path to inflate the nafs. So this would be, and I love, you know, we can see, with, I mean, I can appreciate, right, that the range of, of the different levels of illness, because sometimes when we think of spiritual illness, we may think that it only afflicts those people who are weak or uh, very, you know, um, far behind on their spiritual path. But in fact, every single human being, every single one of us, even those who've reached the height of their spiritual aspirations has to guard themselves against spiritual disease. Because in this case, right, using the spiritual path to inflate the nafs would be something that a person who is already on the path and maybe even, you know, um, it's become a very big part of their identity that they would really need to watch out for, right? So public figures, people who are, um, you know, in positions of authority, teachers, spiritual guides, uh, if you're in a position to use whatever knowledge you have um, as leverage or as a means to, again, uh, get maybe prominence or status or power or certain things, you have to be very careful because your path is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And anytime you are put in a position of authority, it should weigh very heavily on you. And that's why, you know, a very important Islamic principle is that anybody who wants leadership, they discredit themselves by virtue of wanting leadership. And so in the same vein, when you are put in a position of spiritual authority um, and you want it, let's say, like you're seeking it, you know, you, and this is now unfortunately common now where people who are um, not qualified, who haven't put in much effort in terms of, you know, knowledge and, and rigor or, or really working with teachers, they um, get a taste of, you know, what, what is now becoming very unfortunately common, which is popularity because of some association with the dean, right? So being a charismatic speaker, being um, a person who has a, a following, um, and you see this all over social media, on TikTok, it's very prevalent that you have a lot of young people who are very, uh, very fresh uh, on the path, who are giving, you know, uh, in some cases, uh, making their own judgments on very important matters, giving uh, very poor advice, uh, because, you know, there, we're in an era now of, unfortunately, like I said, using the... Um, the dean as a way of of marketing oneself. So this is a very serious, grave, uh, you know, sign of, of spiritual illness. And the fact that Sidi Ahmed Zuruk is mentioning this centuries ago is also really powerful for us to. is a It's a good reminder, right, that uh, the human condition um, is the same, and we these diseases have been there from from the beginning, but it, they just come in different forms based on the time. So this is really important, and I would caution myself as someone who's, you know, in a position of, of teaching publicly, and anyone else who's also on this path of, of you know, being kind of uh, public in terms of their spiritual work, to be very careful that they do not use their um, position in terms of, you know, for ulterior motives. Uh, and, and, and that's why purification of the nafs is so important. I'm sorry, purification of the intention is so important that you are really careful before you do something to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify your niyyah, right? Like, why am I doing this? What is it for? What am I seeking? Um, you know, and, and then, you know, it brings you back, if you remember, uh, all the way to the very first foundation, right? What's the, what's the third foundation? Uh, maybe I can test some of you here in the chat if you want to participate. I'd like to know who's been paying attention. Without looking at your notes or the document, who remembers what the third foundation is of the spiritual path from the first five that he teaches? So I'm going to see if um, maybe if there's someone who is uh, in the chat here on Instagram or on uh, Zoom, if you guys want to participate, I'd like to see if anybody remembers. So don't look at your notes. <laughs> Let's see if you remember what the original five foundations are and specifically what the third one is, because it relates to what I'm talking about here. I'll give you a couple of, or 30 seconds. Let's see. There we go. Mashallah. Excellent. 
Very good. Indifference to being accepted or rejected, right? And this is so important because if you are uh, working on your niya, right, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will realize how futile it is to expect um, or want or desire validation from human beings. You'll realize how empty it is because people will flatter you. People will ingratiate themselves to you. People will say a lot of things that are not true or sincere when they're seeking something from you. And so it becomes this exchange where, you know, if, if you become dependent on that kind of uh, attention, where you're both using each other for a different reason. Uh, and what I mean by that is when you're in a position of authority or, you know, in a public position, people may gravitate toward you because you have something to offer. And, you know, there's a, a, a sort of, um, uh, there's this pull, right, that people who are in those types of uh, positions have. So they may be just leaning toward you, but then you're also gravitating toward them because they give you a sense of uh, validation or purpose, but it's just a very unhealthy um, and codependency or whatever, you know, relationship that, that can come out of that. So what you do is when you really think deeply about how those words don't mean anything, because if your Nia isn't, isn't for the sake of Allah, then you could have every human being on the planet praising you and singing your, you know, uh, giving you all the accolades in the world and, and applauding and all of that. But it's empty because if Allah doesn't approve of it or he doesn't accept it, then what it actually can even harm you further, right? It can, it can um, be your undoing. So you don't put much weight into that, but this is a very deep, you know, uh, introspective process that one has to undertake when you are trying to really uh, pur purify your intention. And it is necessary. That's why we, we start everything with Bismillah, right? The whole point of that is for us to remember that we, we're doing it for the sake of Allah not for, for other people. So he mentions that. And then wanting to expedite spiritual openings without the prerequisite effort. This is also another major sign of spiritual disease, which seems kind of um, counterintuitive or, or maybe that doesn't, you know, because you would think that if a person wants, you know, spiritual openings that they are, you know, manifesting uh, pure intention, desire, they want to be close to God, um, they want to, you know, they want to get close so that that's why they have this yearning. But the point here is that if you're trying to over uh, or bypass the 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 mujahada right of the nafs or the jihad of the nafs, and then expect all of those, um, you know, fruits that you may have heard other people have, right? Like you, you hear stories of saints and obviously prophets and other exceptional human beings all the time that inspire us, um, even as recently as, you know, um, I mean, just, I mean, in, in modern times, we may even hear people having these amazing uh, dreams or other experiences where it's like, subhanAllah, clearly these people um, are special. And so it, it can excite the nafs, right? But if you're not even doing your bare minimum, you're not um, putting any effort in, but then you're yearning for those things, that is also part of the delusions of the nafs because we don't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gain those experiences. That shouldn't be the, the purpose, right? We worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's most deserving of worship. So when you're immediately thinking of, as I said, the rewards, not even willing to do the work for it, but you want it anyway, then maybe you need to step back and say, wait a second, what effort am I even putting in to be deserving of those things? Because those people clearly inshallah they're doing something right right to be having these incredible experiences but if i'm if i'm not even doing like i said the bare minimum then why would i expect that and what kind of entitlement is that and maybe i need to really go back and you know do some digging so those are you know the 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 first um five that he mentions after he talks about right some of the uh spiritual diseases that presents. And then we're going to just go back to the document here because I want to kind of go back and forth. But he says that after he goes through these five, then he says, this has resulted in five other afflictions. So once you have the five that we just mentioned, then again, you're opening yourself up for even more problems, spiritually speaking, because it's kind of like, you know, a slippery slope. You're now um, full, you're, you're, you know, you've the floodgates have, have kind of opened upon you. And unless you're 
really um, reversing course and making toba and really trying to work on yourself, this will just grow. It'll metastasize, right? As they say, like the diseases will just keep growing. So the next um, things he mentions here are preferring innovations instead of sunnah. Now, this is huge, right? Because there are established sunnah. We know, alhamdulillah, our deen is complete. We have, uh, you know, the, the sunnah of the Prophet is preserved. Uh, and so when you know that the Prophet did certain things in a certain order, um, but yet you're not inclined to follow his way, and rather you may be inclined to um, take either your own opinions on certain matters or the opinions of other people who are who speak to your uh, preferences, who speak to your nafs, um, clear indication that that's a problem because on, on the surface, it looks like you're just, you know, you're still trying to be uh, intentional. You're trying to um, implement certain things, but what you're implementing matters, right? You can't just justify implementing anything and everything. Is it, and that's why it's so important to study with the proper, uh, you know, teachers, because they will help you determine whether or not what you're doing or learning is sound, right? Um, and if it's just, uh, you know, uh, d- someone else's ideas um, that are completely uh, in contradiction to the sunnah, then obviously that would, that should hopefully raise some red flags, but you would be surprised because some people um, would rather take, again, opinions of other people who are, who, who speak to their own, you know, desires or their own personal nafsi um, inclinations, as opposed to established facts, you know, that are, that are, that have been there for, for uh, centuries. And, and, and so it's so important again, to, to look at who you're learning from and whether or not it is um, from the sunnah or not. And I'll just mention like an example, you know, for example, there are some people who they may take issues with certain, you know, messages within Islam just because of their own personal opinions. And so they'll find ways to discredit um, a hadith, for example, like, oh, you know, this particular narrator of a hadith was this, that, or the other. And I'm not going to listen to that person because, you know, it's, it doesn't gel with my view on this particular topic. And then they'll find a modern, uh, you know, quote unquote, academic or some speaker or someone who maybe has very, very progressive or different, you know, uh, ideas, reform Islam ideas. And they will um, say that this speaks more to my opinion on this particular issue. So this is clearly a problem because, again, alhamdulillah, our deen um, has been preserved and we have uh, our scholars are are spent uh, such a great deal of time in uh, codifying and preserving our tradition. And so for now, uh, Western or modern Muslims just suddenly want to do away with all of that and try to find answers elsewhere is clearly a problem, right? So that, that's just a simple example. Um, then the next thing he points here is following people of claims and conceit. So similar to being deluded by spiritual imposters, right? What happens is your criteria for who you uh follow or who you uh, presume to be a a religious authority may speak more about uh, the claims that they make, right? And the way that they carry themselves. Um, And this is very um, true in many ways. You see, I mean, I I think if we step back and look at the power and influence that, for example, many celebrities have, many very popular people have over humanity, It shouldn't surprise us that some people are very drawn to that, right? These are showboats in most cases. Many uh, people who are popular and famous are quite braggadocious, right? They they hold themselves a certain way, and um, that pompous, those pompous like you know airs about them uh, attract certain people. They 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 won't even look at their character. They won't look at their you know, credibility, whether or not they they have ethics, whether or not they speak from a place of, again, uh, true sincerity, but they just look at the show around them. They seem to be people of influence and power and wealth and all of these things. So that's it. We're going to listen to them, you know, and politicians similar and people of uh, who, who, uh, uh, you know, position themselves again as authorities of of certain, uh, you know, fields or areas just because of maybe their background or their the family they came from or the schooling that they had, uh, they can amass a lot of influence because human beings are drawn to them. So this is the issue is that you start to, again, your criteria for who you 
hold as being a person of importance is inverted because you know in our tradition we don't look at the superficial we don't look at the outward reality of a person or the way that they you know necessarily um carry themselves it really comes down to their character that is the um the the, the criteria for which we should you know treat one another but also establish uh authority is that are they sound good god fearing people are they people who truly want the best for others or are they just in it for themselves whereas when you don't have that filter or that you know um that that standard then you're going to be influenced by a lot of other people um so you'll be susceptible to following people again of claims and conceit and then um the third uh, affliction that you're you know you open yourself up to when you have all of these other diseases is that you will act on your own capricious desires, even when it comes to your spiritual matters. So basically, you know, your nafs, your, your hawa, which is, you know, there's four sources of evil that the world has, right? There's four sources. And so they are nafs, shaitan, hawa, and dunya. Three of them are external, right? The nafs is the internal voice, but your hawa, which are your desires that fluctuate, right? We, we go through different stages in life where maybe our desires um, change, right? Based on our circumstances. So those can fluctuate. But if you are a person who is driven by your desires or your impulses, your, your lower self, then even when it comes to spiritual matters, those things will dictate to you. And so, um, you know, it's, it's something that, again, can, can play out in many different ways. But the bottom line is, is that you're not uh, thinking of right and wrong and, and, you know, consequences and really trying to practice restraint and, and make sure that you, um, you know, you don't cross boundaries because you have your conscience uh, is, is uh, you know, is, um, is leading you. Uh, but rather that your desires are are so you're so weak to your desires that even when it comes to um, you know your spiritual matters you will it will be susceptible. So a good example is um, people, for example, who may um, pray when things are like easy, right? Like let's say you're home, uh, you don't have a lot of obligations, so now it's like I suddenly become very spiritually uh, motivated and driven, and I'm doing my prayers. But then the next day comes along and you have now maybe some commitments or some social things have opened up for you where you get to go, um, you know, out with your friends or, or, you know, in a social setting. And now it's like, oh, you know, all those things that you just did the day before, religiously speaking, suddenly don't seem to be of any importance anymore. What, what happened between one day and the other? What happened between Monday through Thursday and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? Because you have the weekend uh, experience where a lot of people kind of throw out their um, their their principles, right? It's like the play hard, work hard model of, of living. And there are people who do that. They'll be very responsible through the week, but then suddenly the weekend comes around and you're like, what happened, right? So if your if your uh, Hawaiian is dictating to you, then that's what it's going to be like. You're going to justify um, you know, kind of being all over the map in a way when it comes to your spiritual practice, because it's not your conscience. Because your con once you adopt um, a principled stance, for example, on your worship, like when you come to a point that you say, "I really want to be to live the the life of of a, of a practicing sincere Muslim. I want to live that life, and I'm not going to make excuses. I'm going to strive." And you take a principled stance then your life, there's an overhaul that should happen, right, of your life. You should start to look at what is, has impeded me, spiritually speaking. What do I need to uh, change about my the way I'm living? And you start to look, is it my friends? Is it, um, you know, the place I'm working at? Is it, yeah, my income? Because that's a very legitimate point. Like if, if your source of income is haram, um, it will absolutely affect your entire life because uh you know the 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 food the drink the clothes everything that you're wearing or i mean uh consuming from the source of uh, income that's haram will absolutely be an obstacle for you spiritually so that is a, a certain i mean that's definitely a place to start is to say i need to 
remove all sources of haram, which we already talked about, right? When we talked uh, earlier um, in previous sessions about avoiding places where haram will take place. So the overhaul process has to happen um, when you make that firm, you have conviction and you want to really change course. Now, if the overhaul process isn't happening and you're kind of doing this, you know, back and forth, right? Um, then you need to determine what is it. You know, is it that I'm trying to, I want my cake and eat it too, as they say, uh, or, or am I, there's some spiritual delusion happening because, you know, it's, this is where duplicity is, is a very real problem, right? If you're duplicitous in your nature, being two-faced, nobody uh, wants to be accused of being two-faced, right? Um, uh, and, you know, there's many, many warnings, all the bala of being two-faced. Um, uh, there's a particular hadith that says that the one who is two-faced in this world, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise them on the day of judgment with two, uh, you know, is it, sorry, is it, it's either two-faced or two-tongued, like, you know, if you have two tongues, but they, it's, the punishment will be on the day of judgment that you will actually have uh, physically two, um, two uh, tongues or two faces. So all the bala. But the point is, is that uh, is such a odious, you know, quality to have, to not be uh, a person that is consistent in character. Um, but what happens is uh, when we're not, again, mindful of our states and our nafs is dictating our hawa, our desires are dictating, then yeah, we end up being, even when it comes to our spiritual practice, we're, we're all over the place. So this is something really important to think about. And then preferring fantasies to realities I, um, you know, there isn't much commentary on what is meant by this, but from what I've heard and uh, what I kind of um, extrapolated from, from this particular point was that people who are um, not, you know, grounded in reality, they, they escape, right? And how do we escape? Oftentimes we get, we escape into these alternate realities or worlds, whether it's through film, through television, through literature, but we kind of find more comfort um, forgetting uh, poetry. Why, why are these things so uh, potentially spiritually dangerous? Music, right? Think of like all the distractions that human beings are susceptible to and how they can absolutely affect a person's spiritual growth. Because a lot of people, this is what it is. They're, they're, they're caught up in trying to escape their reality uh, and so how do they do that? They can do it in many different ways, right? Uh, like I said, uh, they can do it through all of those ways, right? Through entertainment, through trying to find ways to basically, you know, not confront their, their circumstances or even worse than that would be to um, fall into addictive behaviors, right? Drugs, alcohol, all of those ways are really pathways where, where the individuals are just not they don't want to deal with reality, so they would rather escape into another um, place, whether it's virtual, uh, whether it's through, again, mediums or through chemical altered states. So th this could, I think, present in many ways. But this is one of the dangers, again, um, of not being spiritually aware of oneself and how all of these things start to uh, you know, affect um, and, and they're all connected. They, it all ties in. And you see this, they're quite prevalent in, in, uh, in our world today, all of these things that we're talking about. And then um, the last point is manifesting claims without sincerity. This is also another really important point is that once you've habituated negatively in the, all of these ways, right, then, um, and you're not really uh, thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're not doing things with a clear conscience. Your, your conscience is not driving you, but you are, you know, you're, you're, you're one of those people who, again, is more about, um, you know, the, uh, the, the way that you present because image, image, very highly image focused people, right. Um, who are more worried about pleasing other people or impressing other people will start to behave in all of these ways. And then they also will start to make claims, right? So, um, you know, I, I know I've heard it in my, in my lifetime from people who are not religiously practicing, but they will definitely lean on certain things like lineage, right? So let's say you're not, um, you know, someone who is actively practicing yourself, but you will make a lot of claims or use your family history, uh, maybe there's other, you know, factors um, in your in your personal life that you will try to use in order to establish yourself 
as someone who is a pious person, who is, uh, you know, a spiritually, um, you know, like a spiritually aspiring person. Although the 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 evidence isn't there in terms of your character or your practice, it's just claims. It's just words said, right? Um, uh, or people, which is, you know, I remember learning this when I first began practicing, and it was interesting because. I was trying to understand why, but like of all of the ways of deception, among the greatest lies that the human being to, um, you know, will tell um, is lying about dreams. Um, and I thought that was so interesting because how can you uh, prove otherwise, right? If you lie about dreams, it's considered a kabad or a grave, grave sin because dreams are one. I think it's 46th of prophecy, right? So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can reveal certain messages in dreams. So the individual who who lies, if you're telling people that you are, you know, dreaming of the Prophet Sallallahu or you're having these incredible things, but they are not true, um, and you're just doing it because you want people to see you in a certain light, you know, that you want to impress certain people, this is what we're you know what what he's cautioning is that you are susceptible to doing those things because your priorities are all over the place you're not thinking of god you're not thinking of what's right or wrong you're more interested in again maybe the social um uh, benefits of of presenting yourself as someone who is spiritually inclined and so that becomes uh, your drive and if in order to to do that you you want to you know uh, as they say a uh, hobnob or rub elbows with people who are you know you think of importance and so you need to kind of keep up right because if you're going to be in certain circles you need to have um some reason to be there so you may suddenly uh you know puff yourself up over again like i said family background lineage or i've had this experience or i've had that experience or i've you know i've had dreams or you know blah 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 whatever people will create but all of the these go back to the core issue, which is they are signs of spiritual disease that we as human beings become more and more susceptible to when we're not doing what? And we go back to that initial slide, the first, uh, these three. If we're not uh, suspicious of our nafs and really what, like listening to the thoughts that we have, the vo the internal voice, all the things that um, the nafs will will tell us about ourselves, we're continuously doing haram and not um, stopping. You know, if you're going to justify haram and you don't make it a point to really uh, correct, you know, yourself or or at least show, uh, you know, some uh, level of of um, of uh, guilt and shame before Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and you just you know, keep because you know, and the thing is, we we I want to just qualify this for a moment. We're sinful, right? All of us, we all sin in different ways. Um, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is, of course, so merciful, and He reminds us over and over again that even if we keep slipping, to return to Him. But this is a different type of you know um, disobedience. This is when you are aware fully of you know whatever it is that you're doing, but you're not. Um, it's, the, the guilt has kind of been removed. And especially if we're talking about open sinfulness, right? Which is very different. A, a, someone who openly sins versus someone who is um, shamed, uh, shameful of their sinning and is really having a difficulty overcoming a weakness are not the same, right? So when you're persistent and you're very um, brazen, I think is the best word, when you're brazenly disobedient uh, and you're not really... Um, your conscience isn't there. You're not, you don't come back with a level of remorse and, um, and real, uh, you know, seeking contrition for what you're doing. That is a huge problem, right? So this is what, what I just wanted to make sure that that's clarified because, you know, none, none of us are, are perfect. We're all sinners, but it's really the way with which we um, feel in our sinfulness that we're talking about here. And then uh, completely abandoning awareness of Allah. You're not thinking of Allah or you're, you're off in your own world. And it's it's interesting that that is even like um, a reality because, you know, subhanAllah, once you adopt uh, a life of, of, you know, religious practice, the idea of not thinking of God is so like foreign and impossible. Like, how do you go 
um, without thinking of God. But when you look at today and this atheist, nihilistic, very toxic culture that um, we've produced here in the West and then forced upon the wor world through globalization and the internet and all of our exports, then you can realize, or you, you have to stop and think, oh, there are people who not only go days without thinking of God, but they go months and years. And I don't know, I, that's just unfathomable to be me. I was probably I'll never test any of us with that um, level of, of misguidance and heedlessness and hearts that are completely locked, right? Because that's what it is. It's like your heart is locked. It's locked. There's nothing there. Uh, blind, right? Uh, as Allah says, it's not the eyes that are blind, but the hearts. So may Allah never test us, but that is actually a reality that people can fall into states of such um, ghafla, heedlessness, that they don't even think of Allah. So these are the sources, and this is what happens, uh, or when we do this, that's what these, these uh, subsequent sections are about. We open ourselves to uh, these other diseases of the heart, right? And which we just covered. So alhamdulillah, there is more, but I think this is a good point to stop in case there are any questions. Cause I know last uh, week I went over and um, I don't want to uh, start the next section because that will likely happen again. Um, and I know mashallah people are busy and uh, we have people tuning in from different time zones. So I want to be respectful, but if there are any questions of Salah Fadwa, please let me know. Um, I don't see any Q&A uh, notifications, but maybe maybe people will like to come on the mic and I would be happy to hear you if you'd like to come on the mic, inshallah. And I'll also look at Instagram because I know, mashallah, there are people coming in and out. Uh, but if there are any questions here, I'll, I'll see what's going on here. There was a question in the Q&A and I just went ahead and shared the title of the book. Okay which was what somebody asked. But other than that, we haven't seen any questions today. You're being too clear, Sada Hosai. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Well, I'm trying to uh, um, make sure that I do not go over, you know, my time because I, I, I kept everybody here for 20 minutes, I think, last time. I do see a question here. If you continue to sin and justify by saying it's not easy to leave. Jazakallah uh, khairan um, to... Um, this uh, questioner, the question is, if you continue to sin and justify it by saying it's not easy to leave, actually, I'm not sure if that's a comment or a question, but I'm assuming it's a question, like what would be the response to that, um, I'm assuming. So yeah, if you're uh, someone who, oh, how to stay on track and control the nafs. Okay, I'm sorry, that's a separate question. I thought it was just a follow-up. So yeah, there are, the thing is, is the nafs is, is very good at tricking us. And so that's why part of the advice that Sayyidina Ahmed Zaruq gave in the very beginning is you have to be sus suspect of the nafs. You have to question ideas and thoughts that come to you. So even a question like that, like if you're going to, um, you know, justify sinning because you say, oh, it's too difficult. Is it really difficult? Right. And I'll give you like a good example that I thought, I mean, I, um, many, many years ago, this issue came up about, um, you know, getting uh, like beautification, right? Publicly, like if a person, and I, I speak mostly to women. So this idea that that a lot of um, people in, in, in our community, in and outside of our community, sometimes perpetuate in defense of uh, the permissibility of a woman overly beautifying herself, right? So there's this idea, well, you know, I, I do it because it's uh, it's for myself, you know. I don't have a pro. I, I I'm not trying to um, seek attention. I don't want people to look at me. I love to do my makeup. I love to dress a certain way. So it's all for myself, right? Now the nuts will convince you, and and people. I've been in you know, debates and discussions with people who hold these positions. That yeah, like you know, we we shouldn't be policed as women because we're not doing it for the male gaze right? We're not seeking male attention. We just love to get dressed up. We love to, um, you know, to beautify ourselves. And I mean, this could apply to both men and women because vanity is a disease of the heart, bottom line. If you're a person stricken with vanity, you like to look good. You just do. And you like to um, get yourself, you know, in a certain state because you appreciate maybe your own beauty. Allah gives beauty to some and he withholds it from others. So you like it and maybe you want that attention, but you will 
convince yourself in order to continue to do it without, you know, drawing uh, this type of condemnation that it's for your own self. But the challenge, and this is where you logically can challenge yourself, is has anybody, and I, I mean, I would just say anybody who takes that position, my challenge to them would be, if you have you ever gotten dressed up, like have you ever woken up in the morning, gotten dressed up, done your makeup, like you know, the way that some martial art people nowadays do makeup, it's a process. It is like two to three hours. And I'm not exaggerating because you've got so many steps now. And then you do your hair, you curl your hair, and then you go and you wear maybe the nicest outfit you have. Has anybody ever done that and not either invited? people over to, you know, to see them in that state um, or gone out or somehow um, made sure that their efforts were not completely lost. I don't know. I find it very hard to believe that that would be like an average Sunday, you know, how Sunday is kind of like the chill day at home, that a person who really holds to this argument would think that that would be um, like that, that that's just a normal Sunday for them, that they just wake up and they get themselves all beautified for nobody else, not a single soul, because they do it for themselves, right? Because wouldn't you, if you were truly doing it for yourself, you would think that, that that would be a likelihood at least. So I feel like this is a way that we can kind of, you know, talk to ourselves in real talk, like, come on, you know, that's just, you're just making excuses and you got to really at a certain point face yourself and say, okay, that's just an excuse. That's, that's ridiculous. You're, you're, you're just trying to save face. Um, you're trying to justify something, but that's not what's really happening. And this is, um, I forgot which verse it is in the Quran, but there is a verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, um, and I'm paraphrasing that, that we know our own selves. Like there's a lot of, um, you know, things that we try to mask for the sake of, you know, other people. But at the end of the day, you know your own self. And as someone who people, you know, will turn to for advice, I've said this before, but I think like 99% of the people who seek advice from someone like me, they know the answer. They just want to hear someone else, someone else's perspective. But it's not that they're lost and they're completely like, we don't know what to do. Everybody, I think, at a certain point, we just have to kind of keep things real. So that's what, you know, the process of really um, being in touch or in tune with your uh, nafs is, is being able to call your own self out. Like, I'm just, nope, that's not going to fly within me, right? You don't, you can protect your honor in front of other people because, you know, people can be cruel and, and these are very spiritual matters between you and God. But when it comes to you um, and your Lord, you have to be like, totally open to vulnerability and transparency, right? Look in the mirror that is the most uncomfortable, not the, the mirror that makes you look amazing. Uh, that what's point, what's the point of that? Because it's not your reality. So anyway, mashallah, more, any more questions? We have something in the um, Q and a box real quick. Will yes. you share the slides with us? So I, I'm assuming they're talking about not the text, but these slides that you're showing. Yeah, here. I can definitely share these with you. That's a, actually, thank you for asking. I, I'm kind of, they're like work in progress every session because I want to um, add on to them per our text, like what we're reading. But if you'd like, I can send the ones we've already covered um, to through uh, with, with Sada Fadwa. Or if you want to wait till the end, I can send them all together, whatever you like. I can do that. That's fine. And then another question, um, how do we deal with the notion of accept me for who I am when living in a hyper individualized individualistic society? How do we recognize within ourselves that this is a personal nefs issue instead of expecting people to accept us? Excellent I find question. this way of thinking a type of fantasy. <laughs> Excellent question, Jazakallah. I mean, you really are opening up... Um... Uh, a big discussion for me because a lot of this comes down to the era that we're living in this hyper uh, nafsi narcissistic and very individualized uh, time that we're in it, it's by design right these are all things that come out of um you know how we're conditioned to think about the world our place in the world uh, and everyone else and a lot of this is fueled by post-modernity right this idea that you know um, everybody can have their own subjective truth and subjective reality and i have my truth and you have your truth and you know um, like you said accept me for who i am because this is my individual you know and all of this is is very much of 
politically reinforced um, because of the time that we live in. But we as Muslims, we have a different, again, criteria. We don't, um, you know, these are not our, our terms. These are not our, this is not our framework. This is not our worldview. We first and foremost hold ourselves up to um, the standard with which, you know, our, our, I mean, this the we hold ourselves up to uh, the image that that God wants of us, right? And so we, that's, that's the, the most important thing. If we're not, if our behavior, our words, our actions are not pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it doesn't matter what any human being, even the most beloved people to us. Because like, there are times where your uh, parents, you know, you're going to have to go against your parents. You're going to have to go against maybe certain people when they obstruct you um, to, uh, you know, from your, from your path to God. So human beings, we don't give them that power over us to dictate, um, you know, to us. So if, if we strip, you know, you know, people outside of us, then what about people? I mean, what about our own selves? Of course, when we've already, you know, mentioned that the nafs is your biggest enemy, then you would not empower your nafs to say, well, this is, you know, I'm just going to do what I want to do. The the I is your biggest threat between you and God. So why would you, like like the Prophet said in his, you know, um, uh, famous uh, dua mentions, like, do not leave me even for a blink of an eye to myself. So this I, this concept of I being, you know, um, the, 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 the sort of, um, you know, the, the, like I'm the captain of my own ship uh, is very dangerous because we are, we're, we're the, we pose the biggest threat to ourselves. So we shouldn't trust ourselves to that point where we think that speaking in those terms are somehow empowering. It's actually not, it's the very opposite. It's very disempowering because it puts us in a very, as I said, nefsi state, and then we're susceptible to all the things that we just talked about. So the eye has, should not be a fed, you know, we have to actually, um, counter it with social responsibility right uh, making sure that we are for example like if you if you want to drive down the, the the street in your neighborhood at midnight and you're jamming to your favorite song and you're like well i love this and i just really want to hear it and you know i'm going to do it anyway you are a completely selfish narcissistic careless person who is trampling on the rights of your fellow neighbors or citizens you are not empowered because oh well i just wanted to do this and, and i'm not necessarily harming anybody because we have you know social contracts or social obligations to be considerate of other people especially when we're sharing uh you know spaces with with people so you can't just uh that's very entitled right to to operate from this place of well as long as i want it i can do it we don't do that so our you know first and foremost again our Standard is, is it pleasing to God? Yes or no. And then, you know, does it in any way infringe upon or impose upon the rights of other people? And you operate from this very considerate, respectful place. And inshallah, at that point, it's it's fine. But other than that, you can't just force yourself on other people and, uh, and you know, act as though you're somehow in a position of power or entitlement. So a lot more to say on that, but thank you for the questioner. And I'm sorry, I know I, I still went over by a couple of minutes, but alhamdulillah. Any last questions or, or comments or anything like that? Please let me know before we close out. And I'm also just checking Instagram for those who are here. I, I'm um, We posted it. I'm sorry if you're just joining and you're not sure or you don't know what's going on. Basically, um, the Rahma Foundation, which is an incredible organization, um, is hosting a class through from Ramadan through um, hopefully maybe uh, another few weeks of, of looking at this text called The Foundations of the Spiritual Path. You can um, find more information through their page or through my previous posts, but it's still open, free registration. You can tune in anytime. And uh, there are recordings available for previous sessions. So please feel free to inquire if you are interested, but we would love to have you join. Um, and as far as uh, the attendees who are already with us, Jazakumullah Khairan. I don't know if there are any other, um, oh, is this a question? Let's see. Bismillah. It's hard to separate your own desires and the expectations of society. The need for validation is also another struggle. Yeah, mashallah. That's a, it's a good point. Um, and it's interesting that you brought this uh, up because I was speaking to someone earlier today about detaching and l having less attachments. Um, 
So I shared it with her. Let me pull it up. But I wrote an article back in 2018 on this topic of being, um, you know, more self-reliant and finding contentment with that, without having expectations of people. And I really think, and it, and it's, by the way, this is Sunnah. Like these are all recommended things from the Sunnah as the article that I wrote, you'll see, I, I just shared it with people in the Zoom chat here. But in the article, I present, you know, hadith and, and anecdotes that indicate from the Prophet ﷺ that the less attachments we have here on in this earth, uh, earthly realm, the better overall spiritually. So learning how to disconnect um, from these dependencies, right? From, like I said, validation from other people um, is so important. Uh, and it is, it's, it's a lot of work, but I think when you start to, this is where that concept of apparent goods and real goods really comes into play, right? Um, that, um, and I think this is from Aristotle, right? That he taught us how to differentiate between the two. Like what is a real good? And what is what does that mean to you? Like, what is a real what is what is a real value? And what it what looks like it's a value? And having the discernment to know how to differentiate between the two, because there's a lot of blurring of the lines, or there's a lot of confusion and conflation. So what happens is people presume that certain things are to their benefit when it's actually to their harm. So for example, you know, as I said, amassing a large uh, you know, following or, or seeking, um, you know, the validation of people on a large scale, wanting to be popular, wanting to be socially, um, connected. That seems like it's a good, right? Oh, we're networking. I'm socializing. I'm hobnobbing. I'm a social butterfly. I'm invited everywhere. I'm this and that and this and that, right? I'm like, uh, and you think like that's beneficial because what could be the harm? But the harm is that you start to do all of these things that, you know, Sidi Ahmed Zaruk was talking about is that you're giving so much power to other people. Um, you're starting to let the desire to impress people or the fear of not being accepted by people dictate to you. And then your principles get thrown out. Your religion, uh, you know, your, your, your actual values and your, your creed starts to become diluted or you start to play with it. And this is where a lot of people we see it now, you know, the, the with, with um, a lack of of um, moral uh, stance on on things that are so outwardly obviously detrimental and harmful, but people are too worried about the implications of of you know speaking openly about these things, and so that's where these dependencies can be very dangerous. And that doesn't mean that we don't have again um, there are social rules when we're we're you know living in in communities and societies that we should be respectful of, but it's more about where is your priority? Do you really seek to uh, just, again, people please and, and be accepted? Or do you want to please God first and foremost? Because guess what? The formula is very easy. If you put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, always you will be successful. It's just a fact. If you put God first, you he will make you successful. But if you choose to try to please other people and not think of you know him first, then you risk not only having his displeasure, which is obviously what's worse than that, but also being, you know, somehow turned from or having people turn away from you too. It doesn't pan out. So that's that's a, a perfect example of of where um, how we can be so deluded, right, by things. So, alhamdulillah. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm gonna stop because I feel like I'm gonna keep going. And Salafado, I'm sure you you need to go. And I apologize uh, for everyone for staying on too long. Where can I find the link to the article you mentioned? Oh, you don't see the link? SubhanAllah. Oh, you know what? I'm so sorry. I posted it to the panelists only. There we go. Here is the article that I uh, mentioned. It's from El Medina Institute um, and it's called How Self-Reliance Fosters Spiritual Contentment. So you can look more into that. It's a short article, not too long. But alhamdulillah, anything else before I continue, or, um, keep going? Did Ustada Fadu leave? Perhaps she... I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> I do have another meeting in just a few minutes, but I'm still I'm here. Sorry. I haven't seen anything um, else besides what's in the chat. We're just commenting on the link. <laughs> okay, alhamdulillah. I'm going to let you go to your other meeting and everyone else as well. We'll go ahead and end in dua. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لا في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يسكون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله جزاك الله خيرا um, inshallah, we will see you next uh, week for the continuation. And please do read along. And um, I'll try if you if you do want those slides, let us know, inshallah, and I'll try to get them to you all soon. All right, take care, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khairan wa sallam khadwa. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome. We'll begin in just a moment. Thank you for your patience. I know we're a few minutes behind, but inshallah, we will begin. I also want to welcome everyone on Instagram Live. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, we are on the Rahma Foundation's Zoom uh, class. If you're not familiar with it, please check out Rahma Foundation. But we're doing a class um, called the Foundations of the Spiritual Path. So alhamdulillah, I'm on Zoom with the Rahma Foundation. I'm on Instagram Live with all of you. Thank you for being here. We'll go ahead and begin, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrib al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatiha lima ughliq wa al-Khatimi lima sabaq nasul al-Haqqi bil-Haqq al-Hadi ila siratik al-Mustaqim wa ala alihi haqqa qadrihi wa miqdarihi al-Azim. اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووافقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا اللهم بالقرآن وذكر الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يقربنا منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا سحل إلى ما جعلته سحلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن إلى شد سحلا سحلا اللهم عذنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأسلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستطرق ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Again, welcome everyone to Foundations of the Spiritual Path Alhamdulillah We are going on, I've lost complete track I think eight weeks now I know this was only supposed to be a four week of course, but Alhamdulillah, the Rahma Foundation has extended us uh, or given us more time to be able to really give this text its proper due. Um, and so we are still at it. And I am hoping, I really am, that we might be able to finish by next week or, or the following week if it if it takes too long next week. And I would actually love to have uh, a Q&A session. So maybe we'll, we'll aim for that. But with that said, I just wanted to bring everyone up to speed who may be new to the class about what we've been talking about. So this document is a wonderful, uh, we, I call it a roadmap that Sidi Ahmed Zarruq laid out for us in terms of what to look out for um, on the spiritual path. Once you decide, right, every one of us has to make a decision at some point in our life that we are going to start taking our faith practice seriously, but it can be very overwhelming, right? Like, where do you begin? What do you do first? And of course, we know the five pillars of Islam. We know the six articles of faith, and we learn those things at a very elementary level, but when it comes to being an adult practitioner of the faith, it may be overwhelming in terms of like knowledge, like who, what do you study first, what subject, and then from who, you know, who do we uh, seek uh, our tradition from, and how do we know if a teacher is sound or not? I have someone very close to me who came from the Shia tradition, you know, she uh, converted to the Sunni tradition, and so she didn't have really much foundation when it came to her family background. Um, and, you know, no, she didn't have guidance from her parents. She wasn't exposed to any of that until she made that conversion. And so then it became very overwhelming. And to this day, sometimes she will express, you know, how it's overwhelming for her, even though she's been practicing for a while now, that because she's not familiar, like who are the the sound scholars? Um, and, you know, uh, even even in terms of like hadith, right, there are a lot, there's a lot of confusion. Uh, in fact, I think it was earlier today I saw from the Miftah Institute, I believe, they put together a really nice Instagram post on what is a Sahih Hadith. And this is really important knowledge that every adult Muslim should have. Um, like, how do you determine what is, a, 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 you know, if a Hadith is Sahih or if it's given a different grade, what does that whole process look like, right? Because there's, it's a very rich uh, science and there's so much effort uh, for, for centuries put into uh, 
put into collecting hadith, you know, and then grading them and then putting it, you know, giving them um, their, you know, I mean, writing, uh, putting them in collections. So all of these things have to be understood. So um, this text, though, what it does is it gives you some really key points, first and foremost, for yourself, like to know what your objectives are as a Muslim. You know, yes, it's to get close to God, but there are other uh, objectives as well. So he starts off with those five foundational ones, which really are about quality of practice, right? It's not just doing your ritual worship, but it's about the way that you do it. And then from there, he gives you those the building blocks um, necessary to get to that point. So we've been, you know, at this uh, course or, or, or doing this for several weeks now. I would invite all of you to please check out the Rahm Foundation, sign up with them. They'll send you links to previous recordings if you want to watch them, just to kind of, again, familiarize yourself more with the text. But we're almost toward the end of it. And so today I'm going to pick up from where we left off and I'll go ahead and screen share for those on the Zoom call right now so that you can see what I'm seeing. Um, oh, I would like to please request that my sh screen sharing be activated, please. Mustafa Fadwa, if you can do that for me. Um, and then I will uh, share so that we can see what I'm seeing. And I did, if you recall, I have... Um, I have a visual, uh, you know, um, these these diagrams, I guess, uh, that I created to help us kind of visualize what these building blocks are. That's it. He uses bulleted points um, to identify certain qualities. So let's first look at the text and then, you know, I'm sorry, let me, um, can I, yeah, I think I can. I wanted to add these onto the same window so that way I don't have to keep going back and forth. So I apologize. One second, let me just put them, there we go. Alhamdulillah. All right, so now I can screen share. And thank you for yeah, activating that for me. And so bismillah, here we go. So let me also zoom in a little bit here because I know it's small, I apologize, let me zoom. So where we left off last week was where Sidi Ahmed Zarouk is now helping us to identify people who make claims, right? There's a lot of people who claim to have some uh, station with God or you know that they are um, that they have certain abilities, maybe, or, or you know, things that are uh, superior to maybe other people. And so he says, anyone who claims to have a station with Allah while any of the following five emanate from him is either a liar or deluded. So um, visually, uh, and I'll, I'll read them, and then we can go. Actually, you know, it might be it might be helpful, more helpful to just see them in this uh, order here. So what are they? What are these qualities that, or claims and actions that a false or a deluded teacher would make? First and foremost, he says, allowing any member or student of his or her, we can certainly add that, into sinful disobedience. So if someone is claiming to be a religious authority or having knowledge or having studied, or you know they have uh, ijazas and certain things and they've been given permission to teach other people, but yet, the people that they are teaching, they overlook outright sinful disobedience. This is clearly a sign that there's some problem here because a true guide, a true teacher is obviously very concerned with the well-being of their students. So if they wouldn't allow that, certainly they wouldn't overlook it. They would try to correct it. And of course, we don't compel people. We don't do anything by force, but to allow outright disobedience to take place or, or to manifest in a gathering, for example, you know, I mean, I think all of us would, would agree, right, that if someone is claiming to be uh, a spiritual teacher, but then they have, you know, very out of character and poor character, low character behavior around them, that would be very, very odd. And, you know, again, in, in recent times, these types of examples may not be as obvious, but throughout history and in many parts of the world, there are absolutely these types of charlatans that exist. Um, for example, I know, I forget his name now, but you know there was a character that came out of Turkey, I think in the 90s. He became very, very popular for some of his writings. But then we learned that he had these um, harem-like environments where he had these women who I think he called dolls or he re he referenced some really, he called them very, uh, I don't know, uh, bizarre terms, but he um, he made so much money off of whatever, you know, 
think whatever he was selling that he was he would just collect these women and then give them plastic surgery and the environment was just obviously for a practicing muslim if you see a man surrounded by hordes of women who are wearing very revealing clothing they've obviously had procedures done to it to modify the, their bodies that that should immediately be a huge red flag that whatever claims this person is making um, about his knowledge or his area of expertise or his spirituality would be something to question especially if you fall under these types of you know cultish kind of people so that would be um, a first sign to look out for that they allow disobedience to happen around them and then affectations in uh, his devotional practice so this is also when we are it, it, there's sort of like these theatrics that sometimes people bring to um, their devotional practice. So you see some, some people, and it's because they are trying to be noticed. You know, if you're looking at, let's just imagine um, areas where there are may, maybe, uh, you know, th there's a competition, I guess you could say, of, of uh, leadership, and you want to be seen or regarded as more spiritual than other people. And we're looking at, again, maybe in places where there isn't a lot of religious literacy and people are very downtrodden. And so they look to spiritual leaders for support and they want to, um, you know, feel that, that, uh, that they're, they've, you know, they're coming to people who can really help them in their own circumstances. So when someone who is in a religious in a position of authority is bringing on those the, those types of you know theatrics, they're performing their practice spiritual practice in a way that seems very uh, convincing, right? Um, and you certainly see this uh, in different again groups where people will um, chant very loudly or they'll they'll call on. Allah in, in ways that are just uh, jarring. You know, they can, I saw a video recently of someone who was, I think he was doing the adhan. I mean, this is not, I don't, I don't, we don't want to make assumptions about individuals, but it's just an example of how there are people who can sometimes forget, you know, that in social settings, we, we, we need to have the utmost adab and composure. And so sometimes people just enter these states, but in other times it is very affected it's very it seems like it's it's very performative or perfunctory so anyway but the video i saw was someone who was making and then and then you know people someone reacted to him and he he spooked him he got so scared but those types of you know overly dramatic um uh, you know ways of, of showing that you are in some state or hal uh is is definitely a red flag um because again if you've been in the company of of righteous scholars, of people who have their their acumen, their history, their um, their you know uh, reputation precedes them. People know who they are because they have toiled and sacrificed and given so much for the ummah, and they've produced a lot of amazing things. You will not find these people who um, doing things like that, even if they may may reach a certain spiritual. Um, states in in a, in a gathering they tend to be very subdued and inward it's an inward uh reality that may be manifesting within them but they don't really try to show that outwardly so that's always a concern when there's more concern with trying to display right so that's definitely something to look out for and again we want to be careful because we're giving you know qualities to look out for but we also have to have the humility to know that we don't know what's in people's hearts so use this information just generally, but not to start to presume that someone who may do something, you know, um, similar to this is suddenly false. That's not fair because these are collective qualities, right? So you want to kind of see all of these in a person together but to just kind of isolate them. Or maybe you interpret someone that you already have a bias against in, in a negative way would not be right. So we always have to um, second guess our own assumptions about people, but it's good to be at least, uh, you know, versed in certain qualities to look out for them. And then the third quality that he mentions are, are so this is what he's defined, what he's defining for us are qualities, claims and actions that people who are either false teachers or deluded teachers may make. And that's an important distinction because false is like you are you know, purposefully present, misrepresenting yourself. Deluded is something that I think would be 
um, you know, it's it's a it's a it's not as bad, right? Because if you're a false teacher, you're a liar. You're just flat out deceiving people. If you're deluded, it may be that you're just under the spell of your own nafs or shaitan. So you might have other problems, but they're, they're I wouldn't say that they're morally equivalent. So he makes that distinction here because sometimes they have these shared types of qualities, right? So the third one is the expectations from the creation. So what does this mean? It means that a person who is truly, um, you know, has really sound uh, and and um, strong conviction and faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relies on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in their actions, in their words, you don't see a type of desperation that is um, is is turned to the creation, right? They they If they're in that state, it's all to Allah. They completely surrender to Allah. So if they have any needs, personal needs, financial needs, health issues, whatever their personal circumstances are, they uh, seek for first and foremost uh, assistance with from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then that doesn't mean that they're obviously not allowed to seek other means, but you will notice that they don't have um, this reliance on the creation. Uh, they, they rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's very clear in their words, in their sabrun jameer, right? This is why we even have that concept of sabrun jameer is because we should be able to identify that when we see that in people and certainly in our teachers, right? Um, if they are going through personal uh, challenges, then they are modeling for us, or they should be anyway, uh, modeling for us how to persevere, how to receive those challenges in the proper way. But if they are falling apart and, you know, they, they show a weakness of faith and then they turn um, to the creation before they turn to God, then obviously that would be a red flag. So that's the third quality he mentions. Then the fourth one, backbiting against the people of Allah. And this is really important. And I would say in this day and age, when there are so many, um, you know, social media campaigns where self-proclaimed teachers uh, start to attack one another this is definitely an, a, a, a red flag. You know, it's called punching up. Uh, this is the the term for it when someone, for example, let's say they're, you know, uh, a student of knowledge, maybe not even, um, uh, maybe that's too gener generous of a term for them, but maybe they know a little bit of, about the faith. And then they create these online, you know, accounts where they suddenly amass all these followers. And now they're critical. Now they see themselves as being on the same level, right, as a proper scholar who has the, you know, the again credentials, they went through the, the path of knowledge, it's clear, everybody knows who their teachers are, they know where they studied, all of that is made clear and transparent, there's no hiding. That scholar is leagues ahead of someone who doesn't even barely know their faith, but they just have popularity, right? So this is often the case nowadays where you will see these people who unfortunately are perceived as religious guides and teachers and authorities, um, who they, because of their fame uh, and the fact that their videos get the most likes and they're quite popular, they will start to create these critical, you know, response videos. So, oh, someone said something and I'm going to now respond to this teacher. How dare he or she uh, say this and who do they think they are? And then you can see all the black. You know, we have what we call adab al-ikhtilaf, which is, you know, the the um, the etiquettes of disagreement. And in our tradition, scholars historically, plenty of them, many of them disagreed with each other, but they never departed from prophetic character. They 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 disagreed on ideas. So they would, you know, challenge the positions of other scholars. They would challenge their thoughts, but they didn't do it from a low place, which is to backbite against them, ad hominem attacks, slander them, bring back, you know, things that were irrelevant, it has nothing to do with the argument, but you just want to uh, take them down, right? So it's called punching up. And unfortunately, we definitely see a lot of this in the social media space. So if you follow someone, whether it's on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, wherever you're following them, Twitter, and you see post after post where they are actually attacking other scholars, especially if they're young and they're attacking senior scholars, I would say be very 
cautious of those types of people. They tend to be very charismatic. They use logical arguments. They sound so convincing and they'll weave together these very, um, you know, um, these very uh, complicated or, or, or um, uh, you know, these videos where they have all these, you know, references. And, and so they'll try to create a story, right, a narrative. And so it seems very convincing. But this is why it's so important that we heed the warnings that were given in our tradition, which is to verify information, not to fall for uh, a story that is woven for you, right? Because people, uh, they have, you know, their own biases and they will cherry pick in order to create the image that they want others to have of whoever they're attacking. And so you have to have the discernment to say, first of all, anybody who does that, that's that's definitely a red flag. When do you see real, you know, people real scholars or people of Allah uh, wasting their time on things like that? Now, if a person is um really misguiding people and they are causing a lot of fitna and harm. That's a different scenario. This is just a matter of difference of opinion, right? Like we, when we have due process too on how to deal with those types of characters, but we're talking about just someone who doesn't like another person or another like person's position. And instead of debating the idea or providing counter arguments and proofs against whatever is being said, they take it to the low level of backbiting and, you know, spreading false lies. So we really want to be careful about that. And that's the fourth quality. And then he mentions the last one, which is lacking the proper respect in accordance with the commands of Allah. So this is, you know, very important too. And I think actually lacking the proper respect, I think this should be towards Muslims. Let me check. I may have mistyped uh, here. I apologize. One second. Yeah. So lacking the proper respect for Muslims in accordance with the commands of Allah. So when, when a person, again, is in a position of leadership or uh, knowledge, and then they are speaking about other believers. It might not be a scholar, but maybe they're, you know, um, they're speaking of groups collectivizing and just disparagingly describing other Muslims. Um, this is also an absolute red flag because the people of Allah, people of Taqwa, do not. Uh, they're very cautious with their own state with Allah. They don't want to take chances. So how would you defend someone who? is, you know, they're a little too loose-lipped, you know, and they start to speak about groups or ethnicities. It could be racially charged. It could be charged from other, uh, you know, um, perspectives, but it's wrong because anytime you collectivize or, or stereotype or use these types of, um, you know, foul ways of speaking about groups or individuals, that's just showing your own diseases, right? It's It, it doesn't I say anything about the groups you're describing, you're you're at fault, you know. And so that that would be unbecoming, unfitting uh, of someone who's a, apparently or supposedly a scholar. So these are the five qualities that he's outlined for false and deluded teachers. Now he does something interesting because if you look at the document, which I'll go back to here on the Zoom call, you see that he jumps from these five qualities, right, to the qualifications of the spiritual guide. So now he, he's told you what to avoid. Like if you see people like this, they're either liars or delusional. Now he, he switches gears and gives you the qualifications of the spiritual guide with whom the seeker may safely entrust his uh, self. So now we're going to pivot to what qualities you should look for, right? So those are the ones you don't want. So it's interesting, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean. But here are the qualifications that he outlines for real teachers. He says, first, unadulterated spiritual experience. So it's the opposite, right? In the beginning, he was talking about these affectatious sort of, you know, performative displays during spiritual devotion. Now he's saying, no, none of that. You just see pure, you know, uh, ritual, you know, if it's their prayer, if it's their recitation of the Quran, their dhikr, whatever they're doing. It's there's no nothing that makes you feel like, you know, icky, I guess, you know, there's sometimes you're you're in a gathering or you might be with groups that there's something just doesn't feel right. Right. When you're with people of taqwa and real sound scholarship, everything is um, is is clear because it's from the 
uh, tradition. It's not innovated. It's not introduced from themselves. It's something that you could easily uh, read in the sira, or you know that there's textual proof and evidence for it. It's unadulterated. It's pure, right? And that experience uh, you have just being in their company um, is 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 very clear. And so you'll never feel odd being in their presence. And then sound outward knowledge. So again, a person um, who who makes a claim or claims to be, you know, a spiritual guide or a teacher would have the knowledge to back that up. They would be able to cite certain, uh, you know, proofs and evidences. They should certainly know portions of the Quran, the Hadith. They should be able to speak in a language that is clearly distinguishable from the average person because the way that they speak is informed, right? Knowledge uh, is something you acquire. So their knowledge is, is something you can test and prove just by asking certain questions. Um, and you don't have, they're not, it's not double speak. It's not um, a way of, of presenting that's just very, uh, you know, full of, of, of ornamentation and eloquence, because this is one of the, the qualities that we're also warned about, right? During the end of time, that there will be many people who are very well spoken, but they are devoid of knowledge. So, but they actually do reference and they cite. And I know our teachers always remind us to provide. Uh, sources, right? When you're teaching, when you're speaking, writing, whatever you're doing, cite your sources because you want to, first of all, you know, show that that you know what you're talking about. It helps your credibility in general, but also because it's an amana. The transmission of knowledge is very serious, right? To be in a position where you are teaching other people, you have to be so careful because your uh words, right, or everything is being recorded and a teacher is not uh, absolved of the responsibility that all of us will be are, are responsible for, which is what emanates from our tongue. In fact, they, they have to take themselves even more to task because of the reach that they have, right? If I'm my myself and I'm not really impacting other people, then the only harm that I could produce would be for myself, right? But if I'm in a position where I have Nowadays, it's not even just you know 10, 15, 20 students. Uh, we're looking at by the thousands, by the tens of thousands, by the hundreds of thousands. And some people, if you're looking at global reach, you know, some scholars have students that are in every corner of the world, whether they know about them or not. They're watching their material religiously, um, pun intended. They're looking at um, you know, all of their, their socials. They're following them everywhere they go. So these are devoted people. And therefore, all of these people could make claims you know, against these people in the day of judgment. Well, I heard this from so-and-so. So if you're not citing your sources, and just speaking from your own self, it's very dangerous. And that's why a real teacher cites sources. They show and demonstrate knowledge clearly. So that's the second quality. The third is celestial aspirations. And if you go back to the you know, beginning of the document, you'll remember that this is also one of the prerequisite, prerequisite qualities of the foundations, the original foundations, is that you actually have to aspire beyond this, this worldly realm, right? If you're dunya oriented, your goals in life are dunya oriented. You're just looking constantly at whatever you can get here and you're not thinking of the next world and not trying to push yourself to have the highest uh, you know, aspirations, um, then that's a problem just for the average Muslim. So what about then a teacher? So they should also be speaking about the Akhira and really directing themselves and their students to think of the next world, right? And how um, everything we do should have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure in mind before we give in to our own nufus, our own lower selves, because that's where the delusion of the self manifests from. It's the the desire to just give in to your own self. Whereas when you have celestial aspirations, you're willing to go against yourself, right? Mujahid and nafs, jihad of the nafs is to go against yourself because your goals are that great. You know, you want uh, Allah's pleasure. So you'll wake up in the middle of the night, you know, because your sleep, although you love to sleep and sleep is great and we all want more of it, you realize that um, that time that has been allotted 
for the du'a mustajab and that beautiful connection with Allah is much greater. So you will go against yourself in, in other ways too. When you, Whenever there's choices to be made between something of the dunya giving into some, you know, uh, nafsi impulse or that something that's better that you will um, you, you'll fight you'll at least resist it you'll think about it and with practice and time eventually inshallah we can overcome these things right um, if you for example uh, you know have have time in the middle of your day and you uh, are driving let's just say this is just a very simple example for the average person to think about you're driving and you have extra time um, and you have not done any reading of the Quran, you have not done any dhikr that day because you got up early, you did your prayers maybe, but then you were off to work or off to school. And now you have like a half an hour break or an hour break. We sometimes, you know, get in our vehicles or get in a private space and instantly the phone comes out and we either start scrolling social media or maybe we pick up the phone to call someone and just start chatting, idle talk, gossiping, whatever. Or maybe we like to watch uh, or listen to certain music or watch certain, I mean, people have, you know, they have, they're very committed to certain programs and, and series that they watch. And they'll, I know some people who watch on repeat, you know, they have collections of, of past episodes of certain shows or whatever, and they'll watch it. Um, Law and Order, you know, I remember, um, what's that medical show? Grey's Anatomy. Oh my God. And I think they're still, they have like so many fans who will continuously watch these things. Like they'll just repeat. I've watched it five times and I'm just like, how, how, subhanAllah. But there are people who are very, very obsessed. You could call them fans of certain um, you know, genres or types of cult classic shows or films. So if you have time, Allah's giving you extra time and you have those things are on your periphery and your periphery, you're kind of thinking about them, but then you realize it hits you, right? That I haven't done any Quran today. Haven't, and I'd likely I'm gonna get busy, I'm gonna go home. I've got this to do, that to do. Maybe right now I should, you know, listen to some Quran, do some dhikr, do some salawat. And you actually start thinking on that level. Eventually, if you keep listening to that voice inside of your heart that's reminding you, right? And sometimes this could be also the angelic realm, because we do have protective angels who will nudge us along um, to do better, right? So when you get those types of thoughts, don't ignore them. You know, if you ever wake up in the middle of the night and it's like two, three in the morning and it's just random, it happens to all of us, but you realize like this was, you didn't set your alarm. Maybe, maybe there's wisdom. What happened? Why did you just suddenly wake up from your deep sleep? And a thought comes to you that says, maybe you should get up. You know, maybe you should get up and pray the hajjid. But then there's another thought that says, nah, go back to sleep. You're too tired. You got to wake up in the morning. That's the internal struggle between the forces of good and, and evil within us. And so eventually, though, if you keep entertaining that thought of maybe I should, you will, uh, inshallah, it'll, you'll, you'll gain mastery over your nafs. But you have to be willing to entertain that, right? And so that's an important thing to do. But just generally speaking, uh, for for the back to the document for for a teacher a real teacher these types of things are obvious right that they are always guiding us to the best course the best course the course of the prophet so I said of course because he's the best of examples so they're always reminding us of these things inshallah and then he mentioned so I'm just going over uh, the foundations of the spiritual path where Sidi Ahmed Zaruk is talking to us about the qualifications of real teachers and what to look out for when you're seeking a guide or a teacher. So he mentions uh, five qualities. So the fourth quality here is a pleasing state. And this is really uh, beautiful because it's so true. Like, I, you know, I know I can uh, speak on behalf of other people that I know very close as well, who've had this experience where when you meet people who are true, uh, truly people who are rooted in the tradition and they it's evident. It's evident because you can't help but be drawn to them. It's like this magnetic force. And you're just like, subhanAllah, I don't know what, how to define this feeling, but I feel this, this, um, this spiritual magnetic draw to this individual. And it's because they have beauty, they have nur, they have light. 
because of the knowledge that they're possessing. And that is transmitting. It's transmitting in their words. It's transmitting in their gaze. It's transmitting in their state. They look beautiful. They speak beautifully. Um, they're everything. They just, and we're not talking about, you know, physical beauty in this, in the worldly sense. We're talking about spiritual beauty that's manifesting through them right through their physical form uh, and so these and i remember i mean i've had this experience several times with different teachers uh male and female uh one of the first times i ever no the first time excuse me the first time i ever met with uh, a very well-known uh sheikha uh teacher um i remember myself and my friend we went to go listen to her for the first time and she wears niqab. She's very shy, mashallah. May Allah protect and preserve her. But her state is, it's like honey. <laughs> it's just so, it's so sweet that you can't like help but fall in love with her. So imagine meeting someone, learning from them for the first time and just loving them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like you can't even help it. But I, um, like I said, first time I ever met her, first time I ever saw her many years ago, she, uh, she she removed her niqab because it was all women. And we saw her beautiful face, her smiling face, just like the sunnah of the Prophet. Said. And that was instantly what I was reminded of, that this woman is, is displaying prophetic qualities because she cannot speak without smiling. And her smile is just so beautiful that you're just drawn to her. You know, she just has this magnetic ability. And then, of course, her words. I mean, they're like pearls, just... Uh, dangling, you know, and you want to hold on to each one of them. And I just thought, found myself getting so emotional because she had such a effect on me. And I thought I was the only one, you know, sometimes you, you're already maybe going through something in life, in life that's difficult. And then you hear a speaker or hear a teacher or hear someone. And, and because you're already vulnerable in that state, maybe they're tapping into something, right? That this is a very real thing that happens to people. But when I, you know, left with my friend, we both were like in a car ride, like, oh my God, oh my God, that was so amazing. So I knew it wasn't just me. And that's the experience that I, because other friends were there as well, that we all started to talk. And it was like this, we all had the same experience. Like there's something about her. And to this day, you know, there's people that you can listen to a hundred times, but they always uh, manage to have that effect on you. I'll say like Sheikh Aisha Prime, I love her, may Allah protect and preserve her. I think we all um, who've heard her and who've met her feel that way about her. She absolutely has a beautiful way of just um, connecting to the heart directly, especially if you're with her in like in, in physical proximity. Mashallah, it's just a gift. May Allah protect and preserve her. Um, but those are the types of of realities that Allah will show upon his uh, his servants who are really pure hearted and and they're uh, you know they're 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 rooted in the tradition and they're not the ones that we're talking about before, right? So they have that pleasing state. And as I said, this is agreed upon by those who are in their company. So that's the fourth quality. And then the fifth quality is the penetrating inner perception or simply basira, right? That a real teacher has a knowledge, a sixth sense, um, something that is beyond the, you know, what, that they have this percep perceptivity that, that, um, that makes them very, obviously different like it distinguishes them apart from others right the, the, the way that they speak sometimes they may even speak about things that have yet to materialize you know because they have a foresight that the average person doesn't have they'll be able to um you know just because of their knowledge and their experience you know, when you're speaking to them or listening to them they're able to again offer insights into uh into things that that just are are obviously different, right? Um, and and I, you know, again, if you've if you've ever had the honor of being in the company of these type of teachers, you'll know what I'm talking about. But sometimes, you know, you you could be speaking to them, or they're just speaking, and all of a sudden they'll have some type of ilham, like this, you know, this knowledge that just will come to them in the moment, and then they'll say something, and you're just like. Subhanallah, wow, how did you come up with that? You know, like how did you come up with that? And I recently had this experience with uh, with our teacher Sheikh Hamza where he said something and I just was like my jaw dropped because it was such an incredible insight. But this, you know, these are you know signs that mashallah Allah gives to, to whoever he wills. And so it's happened before with him, but in this particular case, I just remember kind of being stunned, like, 
Allahu Akbar, that's just incredible, like that you came up with that idea. And he said, Oh, yeah, just it just it just came right now. <laughs> I'm just like, Ya Allah. So this type of perception, this basira, this ilham, these are things that are gifts that Allah gives to sincere people. But um, you know, these are ways that you can recognize the the people from that are truly again rooted in the tradition. And I would also say, I mean, it's not explicitly stated here, but I think it's so important in this day and age to look at credentials. Credentials do matter. And real teachers should be very forthright about their uh, teachers and about whatever knowledge they have, or if they have uh, completed certain um, paths of study, that they make it very clear, uh, if they've received ijazas, that you would not need to dig or ask multiple people because it's known knowledge. Um, but if someone is, again, purporting to be uh, a spiritual guide or a teacher, and you have no clue where they studied, with who did they study, and you don't really have um, a lot of insight into who they are personally, red flag, red flag. Um, actually, uh, just recently, I, I was with some family, and I made mention of something just jokingly, and someone responded that, oh, you remind me of this, um, you know, this he, he called her, I think, a scholar. Yeah, he said, you remind me of this scholar, this, this scholar of this video I saw. And have you seen her? And he starts talking about her. And as he's describing her, I instantly knew who he was talking about because she uh, stirred some controversy recently. And he, he, he was saying that what I said reminded him of something that she had said. So as soon as he identified her as a scholar, and then went on to describe who she was, I was like, whoa, 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 wait a second. Because I was like, no, 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 she's not a scholar, a self law. I mean, she's someone who, um, like I said, stirred a lot of controversy on TikTok and like maybe a month or so ago. And I don't want to get into the details, but she is definitely not a scholar, but she started to make these viral videos, very controversial topics, making a lot of you know statements that she knew people were going to react to and that's exactly what happened people started sharing her reacting to her i can't believe this have you seen this video it caused actually a lot of fitna um but unfortunately this person that i was talking to he was not aware that she was actually you know perpetuating a lot of harmful things and you know positing herself as I mean, I don't think she ever said that she was a scholar, but the way that she was speaking, you know, get, telling people how to conduct their lives was in a way, um, you know, the same. And so anyway, I had to kind of warn him. So this is the danger of not knowing people's backgrounds is that there's some people who can come on and sound very convincing, but you need to, it's on you. You have to do the due diligence to find out more about them and seek out, well, wait a second, what institutions do they learn from? Which teachers do they learn? Do they complete any of their studies? Um, is there anything of concern that we should know about them? And usually uh, people do uh, know, you know, there are, there will be, um, if there's any words of uh, concern or anything of concern, you will get wind of it if you ask, but if you're just gonna take it for face value, that's very dangerous. So. These are the um, qualities. Now, I said earlier that what he did, what Sidi Ahmed Zidur did was interesting is because he jumps from, right, the claims and actions made by false deluded teachers to the qualifications of real teachers. And then he goes back to the qualities of false teachers. So I thought that was interesting because you know, he starts by, I think, kind of, uh, you know, um, warning us about these delusional people, right, that that again, they could be liars, they could be um, deluded, we don't know, but at least like look out for these red flags. Then he helps us to discern between those people and uh, the real teachers, right? So now we have a clearer picture and now he jumps full into the qualities of a false teacher. Like this is it, this is what you absolutely need to stay away from. So someone might have certain red flags that were mentioned before, but if they have any of these things, forget it. This is the, 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 these are the qualities that you absolutely have to warn against. And so again, on the Zoom call, I've, I've paired them together because I think it makes, um, for me anyway, logically, just to be able to be able to connect the false teachers with the deluded teachers in a way so that you can kind of see the similarities and qualities. Ignorance of the religion, right? 
And again, this is the opposite of what we just covered. To have sound outward knowledge is not to be is not the same as to be ignorant of the religion. So if they just don't know, you ask them certain questions and they don't know. Um, and it's okay, by the way, you know, uh, to, to say La Adri or I don't know, Imam Malik, uh, that was his position, you know, that, that that's a sign of actually someone's intelligence, that they don't know certain things. So we're not talking about not having all of the knowledge on hand at the moment. But, you know, because there's sometimes, you know, people have a difficult time retaining, um, but they, they've they studied it, they know it, maybe they don't have the exact source, or they can't give you verbatim a particular answer. Um, and so in that case, that's very different than being completely ignorant, you know, that they are giving you false guidance, they're giving you the wrong message, they're they're misguiding you, right? So ignorance is different than not knowing something. I want to just make that clear distinction. And then the disregard for the reverence of other Muslims. So very similar to, right, the lacking of the proper respect, this last category of deluded teachers. If you don't believe that Muslims deserve your respect, right, like if you walk in and, um, you know, you're, you're apparently this amazing teacher and there are people you know, wanting to say salams to you or greet you or or somehow, you know, they want to be in your in your orbit, but you see yourself as too important and you're just walking past people, you're kind of, you know, dismissing them. You don't want to talk to others. I mean, there is, there's definitely um, a danger, right? That when you become, when you rise to fame and popularity, that you start to look at down at people. And this is absolutely something that happens to uh, many people, whether they're celebrities or people of authority or, or or in this case, religious authority, it can happen to them. So that's why we have to constantly guard our heart from you know, looking down at people, but just not even having any respect or appreciation for, for Muslims. And again, falling into the same behavior we talked about earlier would definitely be a huge sign of a false teacher engaging in matters of no concern to him. This is also very important because again, this is a foundational principle in Islam, right? That part of the beauty of one's Islam, right? Min husni islami tarki ma la Yeah, um, the, the part of the beauty of one's Islam is to leave that which does not concern you or to mind your own business. So if you are a busy body, you want to know people's, um, you know, you're, you're, you like gossip, you want to know what's going on with other people, you're always asking and, you know, trying to um, pry and get information from other people, or just in general, you're, you're not focused on your own, um, you know, whatever you can, you know, your own projects, your own life, but you're more concerned with other people, that's definitely a red flag, because just again, as a principle, as a foundational principle for the believer, we're supposed to really stay away from, uh, you know, injecting ourselves into the business and lives of other people. And so that should be a clear red flag. And again, if you're around people of real serious uh, scholarship, they don't want to know private matters of other people. They're not in it for, they're, if you're in a gathering with them, even if it's a social like uh, you know, experience, they're not asking these trivial questions to try to um, you know, figure out what's going on in other people's lives. They're actually very deliberate about what they talk about. And you'll hear, inshallah, I mean, you'll hear constant reference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You'll hear talking about important things and reminders, and they'll try to draw stories and, uh, you know, whatever it is. But they're always in that mode of, of teaching and being very, very deliberate and intentional about the time that they have with other people. So they're not going to waste it and squander it on talking about nonsense, right? So that's a very important quality. And then following his caprice in his affairs. So again, um, a real teacher is not someone that's directed uh, by their their uh, shahwa or their desires or their caprice. Um, they are directed by right and wrong. They have taqwa. So they're looking at, you know, what is the right course of action? What is the best course of action? Not that fulfills my needs or my wants and my desires, but that is um, the best in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the best in following the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the best in the mutual benefit to other people. So they really take their decisions seriously and what they do seriously. And then the, la the last quality, he says, unashamed displays of bad manners, followed by lack of remorse. This is key because to have bad manners 
is so antithetical to being a Muslim, right? We adab is is so important in Islam, and if you don't have the right comportment, the right way to conduct yourself, you don't even know what that looks like, then you cannot be in a position of teaching, right? If you're, if you're, and, and, and we could say that all of these qualities that we've talked about would fall under, under the general description of just lack of adab, because adab is, is, is the, you know, you, when you have adab, you are constantly in a state of, again, what is the proper protocol because your taqwa is what is guiding you, right? Adab is knowing the protocols of situations. So if you don't even know the basic protocols of how to talk to people, how to be in the company of other people, and you're displaying bad adab, right? You speak again lowly, you're not polite, you don't thank people, you don't show grace, you don't show those prophetic, beautiful virtues. And when you slight people or you do something that would be a clear breach of adab, you don't even display remorse. Certainly these are huge, huge neon sign red flags, but those are not people that we should take as true teachers, but rather maybe again, they've fallen into popularity and fame and people just like what they say, but that doesn't make them qualified as a real teacher. So I've, again, on the Zoom, for those of you who are on Instagram, I'm also on Zoom with the Rahma Foundation, and we have um, these visuals that I think help. Sorry, I think I jumped ahead. What did I do? I don't know what I did. I apologize. Um, so, but, but yeah, so he mentions those, um, Bismillah, here it is. So this is the text that goes with, with what I just shared. So he mentions these qualities as they cannot be a true spiritual guide. If you see people like this, flee. Don't even go near them because they're very dangerous. And in this day and age, again, where there's so much confusion and unfortunately a lack of real, we have a crisis of knowledge uh, in our deen, it's very easy to be deluded by these types of people, right? And so we want to um, know these signs so well. So I'm sorry, I think we have a few minutes left on, on Zoom anyway. I'm going to stop to allow for any Q&A um, and we'll try to finish. Alhamdulillah, we got to... Uh, three sections today, which is good. Um, this is going to help us move along. I know Sada Fadwa and others, I'm sure you have your summer plans. I do not want to in any way um, impede or, or affect your plans. So hopefully we'll try to wrap this up maybe in one or two more sessions, inshallah ta'ala. But uh, Sada Fadwa, are there any questions um, for today? I don't see any in the Q&A. Um, if anybody in the audience has a question, Please put it in the Q and A. Inshallah, we can start taking some of the questions. But we do have somebody who has their hand raised. Do you mind oh. putting the question in the Q and A, or uh, depending on your preference? Um, I don't mind, Inshallah, if she if she'd like to come on the mic, um, sister, I I can hear you. And I'm I'm sorry, I'm on the. Let's see here. Sorry, I'm looking at uh, Instagram to see if there's any questions that I missed here. So go ahead, uh, Sister Sophia. Assalamualaikum, uh, Jazakallah khair so much. I really enjoyed the the session and I appreciate all the insight. And, you know, I loved how you were able to put this in perspective for a lot of us who are starting our journeys as well and how we're trying to equate the information, the, the slew of information, the flood of information, the overload of information that is out there. And especially when it comes to, you know, and how you kind of have to put it in perspective. And subhanAllah Islam gives us all those guidelines and the adab of it as well. You know, so for me, I've been struggling with this for quite a bit and I've been blessed enough. I'm going to say this is one of the blessings of Allah in my life that I've been able to found Rahma Institute and found you and found all of the, every, you know, everything that comes with that. And uh, anybody who feels, you know, that this is a journey that's really heavy and then it discourages you, I think you just have to look inward and reassess your intention. You know, it goes back to that hadith where you're supposed to uh, assess your intention at the beginning, middle and end. And this formula works so well. It works amazingly well. So Jazakallah khair. I really wanted to just voice my gratitude towards, you know, the effort and, and the insight. And I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I'm always sending you my <laughs> my love from the from the you know from the east coast all the time. <laughs> so I, I really do appreciate it. Jazakallah khair so much. And it's really lovely to hear you always. Jazakallah so much. 
beautiful and generous and kind to testimony. Thank you so much. It's always lovely to hear from people on the other side. Sometimes when we're talking into these cameras, it feels very uh, isolating, but I appreciate the feedback so much and your support. I know for myself individually, as well as the institution, Rahma Foundation, it means so much. And I'm so glad you mentioned this because I feel like for a lot of people who are on the beginning of their journey, this is why it's so important that we support our organizations because a, a, an organization like Rahma Foundation, I know there are a lot of them out there now, but if you look at their origins, if you look at their teachers, if you look at who their teachers' teachers are, all the things that we talked about in today's session will be immediately resolved because everything is transparent. The the people are known and they have enough, um, you know, mashallah, uh, you know, credentials and also their reputations, as I mentioned, uh, precedes them just by virtue of what people have to say about them, that you feel like you're in a safe space with your with your spiritual you know, heart. I mean, the most important thing that we have is our heart. And so, alhamdulillah, that's why I love this organization. And they didn't ask me to make this pitch, but I just really appreciate that they gave uh, us the opportunity to come together as they always do, especially as women, to learn from one another. And so, alhamdulillah, but thank you for your continued support and your kind words. Really, really appreciate that, mashallah. Alhamdulillah, such a blessing. We do have a question from online. What is the proper adab as women in approaching the shiuf to ask them questions when we're in their presence? MashaAllah, that's an excellent question. Alhamdulillah, and sister. You know, there's a lot of difference, uh, um, well, not difference of opinion, but there's different things that you hear depending on who you ask. You know, we know that the people of Medina were praised for being people who did not let their shyness, right, prevent them from asking. And so this was something that Sayyidah Aisha definitely mentioned so that we as women know that we should not feel shy to ask. I mean, they would ask her to ask the Prophet some very specific questions with, the, with, the, with regards to demonstration and other very private matters. So you can imagine that that's definitely a position and we, we can certainly take that position. But then there are other people who would say that it really depends on the teacher. You know, there are some... Uh, you know, the relationship between the student and teacher has to also be maintained. So I would say, for example, if it's a, a question that you can, um, that's very private to you, and maybe even, uh, you know, something that's, that's personal that, that you would want to, um, you know, seek advice on, I always advise people to speak about things in the third person, it's actually better. If you let's say you're having a marital issue, let's say there's something that's going on, it's it, when you're dealing with the male teacher, it, especially if it's like you don't have access, you're not sure if you're going to be able to get the answer from anyone else, then don't make it personal to you. OK, and there, there's several reasons why. But I just feel like sometimes in the moment we forget um, that, you know, people are are that if we reveal too much. Right. Let's say you're someone in the community and you need to get a question, clear question. And, you know, it's about your personal life, you know, your your family life, um, that these could th be things that somehow, you know, come back. People from telling too much in those types of impromptu Q&A settings, when it, you can opt to just uh, ask on behalf of someone else, or if there's a written Q&A form to just write your question anonymously, um, because preserving reputation, preserving the honor of your family, your husband, your children, whoever is involved, your in-laws, even if you're really upset with your in-law, right? We get so angry. We want someone to root for us. We want them to advocate for us. So we're just going to go and tell them everything, right? But in the moment, because you're emotional, you might feel that way, but maybe five years down the line, you've forgiven, all is forgiven, everything's fine. And now this teacher is there and they may remember these things. And so I've always feel like we have to be um, really wise when we're in these types of situations to cautiously ask questions and know the the boundaries, right? And so part of that would be to protect one's reputation at all costs. Certainly ask the question, but if there's an opportunity to do it anonymously, do it that way first. If there isn't, then I would say be wise and say you're asking on behalf of someone. You know, that you know someone who's going through this and you wanna be a good help to them. And you can give all the details that you would normally give, but just that simple framing, what it does is it takes out the emotionality that would otherwise compromise you. 
the emotionality is what I uh, I fear because I feel like sometimes um, we let our emotions get the best of us and we we want vindication. We want someone to make us feel good, but we then may feel the repercussions of that later. So you can still get all of that validation uh, anonymously. And I would, I would say that would be the best way. I'm sorry, it's a very long answer, but I hope, inshallah, that that helps you. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, the next question says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I was really rejuvenated by a particular teacher and that an individual offered a retreat in conjunction with an individual teacher that I did not know. I looked that individual up and the credentials were not really sufficient. When I inquired about these issues, I was told the other one was on, was famous on Instagram. I did not go to the retreat, but many in the community did. Is there anything else I should do to caution others about lack of credentials? So checking credentials. Sure. No, Jazakallah khairan. Um, this is a, a great example of someone, mashallah, who used sound judgment. And I want to applaud you because, you know, when you put your time towards seeking spiritual knowledge, you're going to leave your family or your, you know, you take a break from work or whatever it is. You really want to make sure that what you're investing in is going to yield something positive. And if you had gone uh, knowing certain things, then it may have really caused a conflict in your heart, but you made a choice, mashallah, based on your own, um, you know, conscience and inshallah that there will be immense reward for you. Now, as far as the, the people who are organizing, if you brought it to their attention that this is a concern and they are still um, more maybe uh, invested in, in, you know, trying to garner, because um, sometimes if you're, if you are an organizer, you're looking at what's going to attract, right? The headline speaker, the more popular speaker will maybe attract people to the program that sometimes, unfortunately, some people put that before the quality of the teacher or these types of very serious considerations like credentials. So unfortunately, if the organizers fail to act upon your recommendation or at least advice or concerns, and they're just kind of giving you their position, then, you know, at that point, it's on them. You've done your part. Um, you could personally still advise your close friends, but I would caution against being you know the 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 one who's now going to warn everybody because that's also another dangerous element that i think has creeped in where sometimes people want to take on these big issues but then they end up being hurt the most you know when you um raise concerns about organizations especially in a public way uh and people aren't ready to receive that or they have more supporters you're one individual this is a group people quickly turn and it can be horrible to the person who actually was just trying to sound the alarm because out of deep love and concern for their fellow community members, they end up bearing the brunt of um, a, a, an immature community who, does, who doesn't realize maybe that, um, that you know, it was in their best interest. So I would say, don't take that on. Your responsibility is to let the organizers know what your concerns are. They are the ones who are held accountable for putting up uh, these types of people. But you personally can absolutely, in your own circle of again trusted people, warn people, and just keep it you know minimal. Because one of the, um, the models that I uh, really appreciate from our teachers who taught us that, that I think is so effective, and you can apply this to any area of your life, is learning about what we call the sphere of influence and the sphere of concern. Okay. This, so just imagine like concentric circles, right? Concentric circles are like circles within a circle. All of us have to know what our sphere of influence is, which means what can we really impact in our own way? Like in what, what has Allah given us to be able to do, right? And then we can, we have a different sphere, which is the sphere of concern. So the sphere of influence is what you can really impact in your own circles, in your own way. The sphere of concern is where you can redirect your dua because it's something that concerns you. So impact is like direct action and then concern would be dua. So I would say your direct action is to warn your loved ones that you trust who are not going to turn on you and, you know, put draw unnecessary attention to you. And your sphere of concern is, yeah, Allah, please protect 
my community from the harms of these types of people or individuals, or if this person is good, uh, you know, make them veil them or, or make it apparent to people. Um, maybe they are not known for their goodness yet, but always have the good opinion first, you know, ask for the khayr of people instead of, you know, the wanting them to just disappear or, or whatever, you know, we, we always should want good for one another. And, and just make your dua for the protection of the people and the benefit of the people and uh, leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the sphere of concern, and uh, I'm sorry, the sphere of, um, what is it? No, I forgot the sphere of, con- what, what was the two? I'm totally blanking. The sphere of impact? No, I'm, I don't know what I said. I don't know. Asada Father, do you remember? I'm completely blank right now. <laughs> I don't know what happened to me. Anyway, I'm sorry, I was reading influence. questions. I'm sorry. No, no, no it's okay. <laughs> influence. And the, I'm like, wait, what's the word? <laughs> Human moments, you guys, we have them, subhanAllah. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I hope that was a clear answer. Bismillah. Are there other questions? Yes, sorry. I was just waiting for a quiet moment in the room. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about the celebrity culture when it comes to the current scholars? How not to step over boundaries, following them literally, virtually, and how close can we get to them? What's the safe distance? Uh, that's a very another very great question, Jazak Jazakir And I think um, you know one of the things that we want to be very cautious about is falling into this um, unfortunate thing that can happen, where we we become. Um, obsessed or, or obsessive or just too emotionally attached to people um, even if they you know have um, an impact on us they're there we feel a spiritual connection to them we always want to make sure that we see them as a means as a door right that they they're just a suburb if we get too fixated on the personality worship or the individual you know and, and their their celebrity their awe their whatever draw that Allah's given them, it's very dangerous spiritually. And I've seen this over the years happen to people, unfortunately, where um, they become, you know, it becomes a problem. It becomes a problem, especially if, if it's a female to male or male to female sort of dynamic that can be very dangerous. Um, you can start to have unnatural and, uh, you know, inappropriate thoughts. Shaitan likes to play on our vulnerability. So when we um, you know, have a, a, an attachment or a draw to someone. We want to keep a safe dis- distance, right? And I think the most important thing is to have awe, heba. Heba is a really beautiful word. I don't know if there's even an English equivalent, but it's just to see the teacher um, with this reverence and respect, not for them per se themselves, but rather for the, the 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 signs that you that they're manifesting that emanate from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? The gifts that Allah has given them. So it always goes back to Allah. So if you hear a beautiful speaker, even like like reciters, let's say there's a beautiful reciter, right? Someone who just moves your heart. If you can just see them as being uh, you know, that Allah has given them those talents, that Allah has given them those abilities, and look beyond them, and you give the praise and awe that's really due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you won't get fixated on the individuals. You just see them as means, right? And this is where also like the hadith um, that the uh, scholars or the warath uh, al-anbiya, right? That they're the inheritors of the prophets is also another beautiful way to kind of see them as part of a general category of people, right? We have the awliya, we have the prophets who are the elite of the elite, and then we have the saints, right? The, the people who are their inheritors. But if you just start seeing them, that, that these are just a special group and category of people that Allah has gifted with these gifts and these attributes, then um, you don't get, you don't individualize, you don't fixate on the individual. Shaitan wants all us to kind of, you know, hone in on, on the person themselves, right? So that we forget that they're just manifestations of God's power and qudra. They're not to be worshipped and to be awed and to be revered for their own individual traits. Because not nobody, nobody's self-made, nobody's self-produced. None of us, none of us. No matter what we've accomplished, no matter what we've done, no matter what we will do, none of us can make a claim that this was all us, right? So we shouldn't see people in that same light. We should just see them that Allah just gave them those gifts. And I love Allah and Alhamdulillah, we're Muslim. And that creates a natural, healthy boundary so that you catch yourself like you shouldn't be up 
three o'clock in the morning watching videos of someone, you would know that that's just weird. You know, that's a little too much, you know, but if you're, I mean, unless you're like, you know, writing a paper, you're doing something very serious, but I mean to say like, you're just staying up at night and kind of consuming and consuming and consuming. This would be uh, certainly um, an, an indication of something else going on. So inshallah, inshallah that was clear. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Now questions are coming. So I live in a small town and we don't have learned scholars here. For example, um, they disparage Imam Ghazali. How can we not despair when we don't have reliable people to ask when we have questions and we can't and we have to sort of resort to shift Google? Yeah, subhanAllah. So I call it, may Allah make it easy. It's very difficult when you don't have community. And I feel like there's so many answers I would love to give you. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, the, the first thing that comes to mind is make hijrah. Ask Allah subhanahu to give you an opening out of that uh, environment into a place where you feel more supported. And inshallah, of course, he can change our circumstances instantly. So you should always ask for khair in that way. And if you feel like it's really becoming difficult or to practice your faith openly or in a way that you feel really supported, then just rely on Allah and he can make a pathway open for you. And that is absolutely, um, you know, an answer. The other thing would be to, again, and I'll, you know, remind us all, as we mentioned before, to really lean on organizations that you do find trust in, like the Rahma Foundation or any other organization where you feel like this is a place where there is sound knowledge being transmitted. I trust the people because they are displaying trustworthiness. They're showing me clear signs that these are, they have nothing to hide. They're very transparent. Their credentials are all known. So rely on those people. And then as far as your community, I know it's difficult because you see these um, things, but you just have to remember that this is a very confusing time. There are a lot of people who are unfortunately ignorant and that's not um, necessarily their fault. We have people who have been heavily influenced by certain groups. You know, um, they 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 have power, they have money, they have wealth. They know how to, you know, expand their empire. I guess you could say, and perpetuate their misinformation and uh, ignorance upon our ummah. And so we have to just, you know, realize this is just a, a time where, with the internet especially that we have a lot of confusion. But when you see those lighthouses, right, in the in the vast darkness. Um, uh, that that are standing tall, that those are from Allah to help us not to fall into despair and darkness. We should never fall into despair. Just hold on to the lighthouse. Know them, see them where they are, and at all times know, you know, instead of necessarily shift Google, I wouldn't recommend um, free, freely kind of just open, uh, you know, source kind of ways of getting Islam because you don't know where that information is being generated from look to organizations again, especially on very specific questions. Um, there are things that we need to vet and make sure that you're getting the soundest answer for you. Um, and so you can turn to those same organizations and hopefully they have a portal or some means of being able to ask questions. There are uh, other more reliable sources, like for example, um, you know, one of the common platforms that I use um, for uh, general fifth questions, and I always think people should use them, is Seekers Guidance. They have a Q&A and they have um, opinions uh, that are from the Hanafi, the, the Maliki and the Shafi school. I think they may have some occasionally, uh, some Hanbali positions, but they have teachers that are trained. Uh, they have their ijazas in these different respective schools of thought. And so when they're looking at general Q&A, like everyday to, to, to today kind of stuff, right? Muamalat, like the, the fiqh of, of like transactions, the fiqh of just day-to-day -day stuff, they will present um, the opinions of, of the, the houses, I mean, the schools of thought, and you will get sound knowledge. And there's so much there. They have like hordes of, of answers. So you can use their search function, um, seekers guidance. And then I'm sure there are others, but that's what comes to mind now. Uh, and I would just, again, say, trust the organizations that you, um, that you trust to also be able to help you. Uh, and, and make a dua that Allah opens the means for you, inshallah, to be more supported or to either for you to make hijrah to a better community or for Allah subhanahu to bring good people to your community, inshallah. I mean, Ya Rabbin Adameen. Last question. Assalamu alaikum. How can I learn to tame my nets? I've become aware to the fact that I sometimes do things and uh, don't know if my intentions are pure or comments will get to me, and when I was doing well, the comments clouded my mind, and I don't want to do the acts I was doing. How do I stop letting my naps overpower me and stay true to the right path? Mashallah, this is a very good question because it allows us to 
um, first of all, all of us should, you know, find some, um, um, some, um, I guess, consolation or comfort because these are very shared experiences. I think the self doubt that many of us are riddled with when we're kind of second guessing our question is such a commonly shared experience. But alhamdulillah, our scholars have given us guidance on that. If you, at the onset of an action, are pure, have pure intention, and then along the way a thought enters your mind. Um, and you start to now wonder what was my intention. These are all the machinations of Shaitan. This is how he works, right? He he tries to confuse us, but you have to go back to your preliminary intention, right? So there's even, I think, in Purification of the Heart, this example is given. Like if you're going to the masjid and you make a sincere niyyah, you want to go pray, uh, you're in the masjid. You just want to make your, you know, your niya pure, and you start walking. And then along the way, this thought comes to your mind that, ooh, maybe people will see me, right? But you're rejecting that thought, right? It, it bothers you. This is this is a good sign of your iman, and you would not. Um, you shouldn't worry that, oh, now was my prayer really for the sake of Allah or was it for being seen, right, ostentation. Um, those are all thoughts that you have to reject because your original niyyah is what counts and we cannot control the stream of consciousness. Our thoughts, right, this is why it's important to also study the four uh, khawatir, the, the streams of, of uh, thoughts that we have as human beings because it helps you to know, I can't control all the thoughts that I have, right? So I'm not going to sit here and let uh, self-doubt riddle, or, or I mean, you know, um, become an obstacle for me. Because if you if you let that uh, thought process play out, it ends up being so distracting. And then at some point, it can be immobilizing. Like you don't even want to do anything. because You're just like, well, what's the point? My intentions are so bad, you know? And that's exactly what Shaitan wants. So, um, but the four khawat that are, Right, the Khatar Nafsani, Khatar Rabbani, Khatar Shaitani, and Khatar Malakani. Now, the Nafsani and Shaitani are obviously the two sources of evil thoughts, right? Evil inspirations. And then Malakani and Rabbani are from the angels and Allah directly. So those are the four sources of where we get our thoughts from. Now, when it comes to Shaitan and Nafs, they work together. So Shaitan wants us to prevent us from doing better actions, right? So he will want to cast doubt in us so that we don't want to aspire. Um, and nefs will just perpetually, you know, get us to do the same repeated terrible things or bad things that we've been doing because we're habituated to them. So they're, they're a little different in the way that they operate, but anything that, um, you know, prevents you or thwarts you from a path of good and then directs you to something worse would be considered a demonic thought. So if you get, if those types of thoughts demoralize you and now you don't even want to do them, then you would certainly say that that's from shaitan. But the way to control it, and actually Shaykh Hamza gave a beautiful answer recently um, uh, about this, where someone was asking a similar question, like, how can you overcome the nafs? And, and he just kind of said, you know, like he was referencing his experience with his teachers and Mauritania and the people that he learned from. And he said, just ignore it. Like the nafs is, is you know, that the, the people that he, he studied with, they didn't pay that much attention to it. And I thought that was such an amazing perspective because what he's saying is that the more you spotlight the nafs, the more control you give it. So it's better to basically ignore it, just realizing that it's going to constantly try these different tricks to get you, but don't em uh, empower it with attention, right? Because if you uh, suddenly become aware of it and it's like, oh, now did I do this? Did I do that? Did I do this? All of that is kind of giving it too much attention and then it starts to, you know, take over you. But whereas if you just see it like a nagging little fly, right? That's just buzzing around and it's trying to get you to, to basically turn your focus away from Allah by getting you consumed with all this self-doubt. Then you learn to swat it away. And this is where all the B'dayim and comes to mind. And you just constantly rely that Allah's so kareem. I mean, when I, for example, think of, you know, the, the plethora of hadith where he's constantly giving us hope, you know, hope after hope that not to worry so much. I mean, it's it's a very delicate balance, right? Because we have to have taqwa, um, you know, uh, raja, hope, and we also have to have fear, right? Uh, khawf, these are the two wings, right? We have to be balanced in our approach. But when you read those hadith, it's kind of just to give you peace of mind, that don't overthink and overanalyze and let your mind, 
become so consumed to the now you you feel like nothing is purely done because it's something for the rest of our lives every single person no matter what level of knowledge or spiritual height they reach they will always have to purify their ania we all have to do it uh, so inshallah may Allah make it easy just remember your original niya to do something if it's with conviction if it's for the sake of Allah then don't worry about any thoughts that start to cascade along the way just be uh, be convinced that Allah knows what your original niya was and inshallah be pure uh, in that regard may Allah make it easy I mean and yes someone is asking too about the Arabic terms for the four streams of consciousness, what I'll do is, um, they're, they're the khawatir, rabbani, malikani, nafsi, and shaitani, but what we can do is, maybe if you can remind me next class, I can write them out for you and uh, and give you more on that. So, jazakumullah khairan, Sadh Fadwa, I know we went over today, mashallah, I, um, I tried to um, stop uh, before so we could have more time for Q&A, but alhamdulillah, we had a lot of good questions, so thank you for staying on longer, thank you to everyone else for also being here, may Allah increase and reward all of you. Uh, please do support the Rahma Foundation. And those of you who are on Instagram, join us next time on uh, Zoom, but look into this class uh, through the Rahma Foundation. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, wal asr inna la insana la fi khusr, illa ladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasu bil haqi wa tawasu bil sabr. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika shadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Allahumma sari wa sari mubarak ala sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad. صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله جزاكم الله خيرا everyone thank you so much inshallah we will see you next week um, and tomorrow by the way for those who are on Instagram I'll be back for the six points of tabligh uh, inshallah alright والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وياكم بسم الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتحة لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق الهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووافقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا اللهم بالقرآن وذكر الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يقربنا منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا سهل إلى ما جعله سهلا وانت يا حي يا قيوم وتجعل الحزن إذا شد سهلا سهلا اللهم عيدنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. Again, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Everyone, thank you for being here. Uh, again, I apologize for the late start. For those who are on Instagram Live, I am on the Rahma Foundation's Zoom uh, um, session for the Foundations of the Spiritual Path, which is a class we've been doing since the beginning of Ramadan. And inshallah, we're still uh, in it. There are recordings for previous sessions. But alhamdulillah, I'm also able to broadcast on Instagram. So if you want to see the actual class, just join the uh, Foundations of the Spiritual Path. You can go to the Rahma Foundation and uh, find the link there. Um, so for those who are in the class uh, and have been here, let me go ahead and screen share, inshallah, so that we can go ahead and jump into today's session. So um Alhamdulillah, we're almost done with this document. Um, as I've said every every week now, it's an incredible document. It really does help to um, give you some groundwork or some, it lays the foundation for you, literally. It's called the foundations on how to be on the spiritual path and to avoid the common pitfalls that many of us will likely experience if we don't have guidance, right? Because trying to practice the faith, first and foremost, without teachers, without guides um, is quite dangerous. And this is why you see many people today uh, be, you know, misguided because they're, they're, it's very confusing. There's too much information. There's too much, um, you know, a false misinformation and trying to uh, navigate all of that without help is, is very difficult. So then the nuts just doesn't want to put in that work. And a lot of times people just give up. It becomes too hard. And, and that's why it's so important that we um, have the jama'ah and that we stick to 
a grounded, qualified teachers, because they will help us. Just as you would imagine, if you were to embark on anything new for the first time, it's very overwhelming when you do it on your own. But if you had somebody holding your hand, you know, through it, um, through any, you know, new subject or, or, or endeavor, um, you know, if you were to travel somewhere, you were to take on a new practice, you would benefit greatly from someone who's already been there and done that and had the experience. So likewise, with our deen, alhamdulillah, we are highly encouraged to seek out qualified teachers. And so this document, what it does is it helps us to really organize ourselves, to have structure, to know what we're doing, how we're doing it, and who we should gain our knowledge from. And then as well to avoid, uh, you know, the dangers. And so last week um, we talked about the qualifications. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, hold on. I think I apologize. I, I'm trying to recall if we even got to that one yet. I think so. So let me actually go. It's easier for me to switch to this uh, presentation um, of slides that I put together, if you recall, and to see if, yes. So we talked about the qualities of a false teacher last week. Um, and so in the document, if you go to page um, 11, there are, there, he goes in this interesting order. I pointed this out last week too. So page 11 and 12, where he talks about those who make claims about having like, you know, certain spiritual qualifications um, and how to know if they're really lying or delusional. And then he goes into the qualifications of what would, you know, be appropriate for a spiritual guide. And then he goes to how to distinguish from someone who you should absolutely stay away from. And so uh, we got to the end of that list last week. So you can, the recordings are all available, by the way, through the Rahma Foundation, if you want to go back and hear that commentary. But um, here is the, sorry, I thought I had it in slideshow, but maybe not. Uh, let me exit full screen. There we go. So here is the um, visual slides that I prepared uh, that went over the qualities of the false teacher and then the claims that such teachers make, right? Either they're false or they're deluded because some people, they mean well, they have good intentions, maybe their heart is in the right place, but their own ego, their own delusion is um, is causing them you know, to, to misrepresent themselves or maybe aspects of the Dean. And so um, you need to know how to distinguish between the two. You know, there's false teachers who have, they're just, you know, they have uh, ulterior motives. They're not qualified at all. Not, they don't have good intentions. Um, and they are charlatans. That's, the, that's why they're false. And they, you know, would definitely be ones that we should stay clear from. But those who are delusional, you know, they could just be, again, misguided themselves. And then they are contributing to the misguidance. So there, are, there is a difference there, but in both cases, you should know how to distinguish between the two. So Sidi Ahmed Zaruq, he mentions here that, you know, ignorance of the religion, if you're going to take some something from anyone or who claims to be an expert, but they don't even know what they're talking about, then clearly that disqualifies them immediately. So if they're ignorant of the deen, they don't really know things that you ask them questions and they're just not sure, or they don't seem to really have solid understanding, then that's a red flag. If they have disregard uh, or you know irreverence for other Muslims, this is also a problem because a believer and someone who really has studied uh, the the Quranic worldview, the prophetic uh, worldview, will understand um, that adab is at the heart of our tradition. And so, if you start to disparagingly, disparagingly speak about other people, this is obviously a big problem. So, especially other Muslims. And then engaging in matters of no concern. So if this person who claims to be, again, a teacher is not minding their own business um, and meddlesome, you know, some people are quite meddlesome and quarrelsome. They like argumentation. They like to know other people's business. They're, you know, curious about other things that really don't have anything to do with them. It displays definitely a, a weakness in character because, these are very basic foundational principles in Islam that you, as part of trying to maintain boundaries and adab, that you do not delve into matters that are of no concern to you. And that's why it's a hadith, right? The Prophet literally said that part of the beauty of one's Islam is to mind your own business. 
So that is something that a teacher should certainly do, right? And, and also practice. Um, engaging in matters, I'm sorry, following his caprice. So this is also a, a dangerous sign, right? A red flag that if a person claims to be a teacher, but then they seem to be just dict their their desires are dictating to them as opposed to actual rational thoughts or proofs, evidence from the dean, but they kind of um, speak uh, about uh, things as though they're just a lot of opinions, personal opinions being infused into what they're saying. They don't cite, you know, so citation is really important for a teacher um, of really any subject. They should have sources, they should be able to direct you to solid sources. So if a teacher is teaching you things and they don't have sources or they're not speaking um, from the perspective of other teachers, right? Like right now, what we're doing is we are sharing the the the, the um, ideas and the the teachings of our scholar, you know, Sayyid Ahmed Zarruq, translated by Sheikh Hamza um, Yusuf. And so we are relying on senior, more qualified teachers, their uh, perspective, their commentary. And all we're doing is we're talking about it. This is a discussion, if anything. But if I came on here and I just started making a bunch of claims and and uh, giving fatwa left and right, and I don't think people should do this, and I don't think people should do that, and this is wrong, but I'm not ever um, citing sources. I'm not referring to teachers who know better. I'm not maybe paraphrasing or, or somehow at least um, mentioning that what I'm sharing is from the tradition, then it's fair to presume I'm speaking from my myself. I'm speaking from my own opinion. And that's something that we should be very wary of in this day and age, because a lot of people have opinions. Um, I think it's definitely a concern just how um, how often people are willing to share their opinions, even on matters that we don't have the prerequisite qualifications to have an opinion on, right? Which just speaks to the day and age we live in. Um, you know, social media, I think, has definitely complicated this spiritual test because it is a spiritual test if you speak on things that you're not qualified to speak on and you misrepresent your knowledge that's a spiritual test because you you know you, you we have to be very afraid of that uh, our tongues actually the prophet warned warned uh, in a hadith that you know the two things that will land most people in the hellfire are what emanate from their tongue and their private parts and so, and these, this amongst many other hadith that have a similar message warns us about being too loose lipped, you know, talking too freely, um, sharing our opinions just about on everything. We should be very cautious because wisdom should dictate or wisdom should, you know, inform us that sometimes what you're saying could very well be sound and it could be, um, you know, huck, but is the timing the right timing, right? And if you're too, uh, as I said, loose-lipped, um, then you might not have wisdom to know that in a certain setting, maybe it's better not to say something, right? Maybe it's better to refrain from saying something, even if it's huck and there's, there's no dispute about it, because the timing or the environment, or there's maybe people in attendance who could um, who could misconstrue what you're saying. So it's very, very dangerous to not have, again, that element of, of um, restraint, you know, to be able to not feel like you compelled to constantly share everything. Um, it's, it's, it's very important to have that and to be mindful that even if you have more knowledge in a gathering than other people, that you have to assess the situation, read the room, as they say, make sure that, you know, if, if someone is, a, for example, a senior scholar or, or, or more learned than you, they, they know more than you and they're in the same room and a topic comes up, but you find that they are not as talkative or, or they're kind of, you know, maybe not participating on that particular topic if you feel like you want to say something, um, that should be something that you should really think about. Like, why 
if, if someone has more knowledge than me and is more qualified than me is choosing to remain silent in this gathering, um, then maybe I should take my cues from them. And this is why it's so important to have access to, to, to people who are, who are learned because you'll learn a lot of things without direct instruction, just observing, just observing teachers and the way that they are with each other, the way that they behave, what they say, how much they say, what they don't say, will teach you a lot about, you know, how to maintain a certain level of, again, um, restraint in public settings. And later, you know, and I've been in many of these situations. And, you know, as I said, in the moment, you're feeling like compelled, but then in hindsight or later on, you realize, oh, that's why this particular topic wasn't discussed or this teacher didn't say anything, even though it, it, the, everything seemed like, um, you know, like the timing was right, but maybe they, they chose not to. There was, there's always a wisdom. There's always something that, that they know that perhaps um, not everyone is privy to, but this is these are very subtle things. And so, you know, being a person who's aware of themselves to that degree, you're not going to be um, shifty. You know, you, you won't see teachers who are very grounded and really practicing all of these things that help them accountable behave in a way that, as I said, would be shifty. You know, like the and which is what he's describing. Someone who's following his desires seems to, you know, waffle a lot. Seems to um, be be led by something other than wisdom that, that's very a, a stabilizing force right wisdom is something that is stabilizing whereas people who are led by their desires they're inconsistent they're not they don't seem reliable there's something off so that's, that's definitely something to be concerned about and then the last thing that he mentions about teachers who are false and qualities that we should know about is that they're unash they they're un they have unashamed displays of bad manners followed by a lack of remorse, right? So they don't make, um, they don't ha seem to feel bad when they act out uh, of line or they say something or do something that is unbecoming or unfitting for someone who claims to be a teacher. This could be using, um, you know, being like rude, maybe uh, someone loses their cool and temper, you know, and this can certainly happen. Um, people of of all the different faith practices can, can lose comportment. They can lose their, um, you know, their temper quickly and maybe lash out at someone, maybe say something harsh. Everybody and anybody is capable of that, but it's the way that you hold yourself to account when you do something like that. And you kind of wake up from what you've done that says a lot about your character, right? Because we should not expect, uh, people uh, to be perfect all the time, but we can certainly expect that when they come back into a rational state, a state of taqwa, a state of awareness of themselves, that they would have no reluctance at all to hold themselves accountable, to apologize, to try to make amends, to fix the situation, to seek you know, some sort of um, redemption for themselves and for anybody that they may have impacted to try to remove that harm. So if they're just going to behave poorly, be rude, um, slight people, be dismissive, um, use foul language, as I said, lose their temper, but then you don't even see any acknowledgement of it after the fact um, or any redress, you know, then that's clearly a, a, a red flag. Um, so that those are the qualities he mentions of a false teacher. And, a false teacher. and then he goes into previously right because it's the the order is interesting but anyway he he says um he also outlines the claims and actions of people who are false and deluded um and those are similar in a way but he says that uh, allowing any member or student to fall into sinful disobedience so this is definitely a red flag i mean if you're claiming to be a teacher but then the students around you are clearly doing haram they may have um let's just say unethical business practices or they're um tyrannical, you know, in their homes, they're known to be doing things that are really uh, scandalous. And you're just like, oh, that's fine. No, that's inconsistent, because um, it's very important for teachers to maintain order within their, within, you know, with their students and to hold them accountable. That's kind of the purpose, right, of the teacher-student relationship is that the teacher is mindful of 
whatever character defects or problems that their students are displaying, and they would be the first to correct them. It's like a parent-child relationship in a way, right? There's a spiritual parenting that happens with a teacher and a student. So clearly it would be uh, be, be a, an issue if a teacher were to knowingly allow their students to do things that were outright sins and disobedience, acts of disobedience. So that's one red flag. There's something off about anybody who claims to be a teacher and they allow that. Um, affectations in his devotional practice, so over, overly performant, performative, um, just seemingly off. It doesn't seem genuine. It seems like it's all an act. Definitely look out for that. Expectations from the creation. So anybody who claims to um, be strong in their faith, but then relies more on uh, people than they do on Allah and and has seems to have a dependence on on people uh, or or others and not as much so with Allah even in the way that they speak um, or the way that they behave would certainly be a red flag backbiting against the people of Allah that's a pretty obvious one um, someone who's a teacher should never be engaged in things that are you know unequivocally haram backbiting is well amongst those things it's clearly um, there's no you know way of of really uh, justifying that and backbiting, um, you know, there's, there's when, I mean, we have to qualify these things because sometimes people misinterpret it, but like, you know, if you're speaking, warning people of, of others that are harmful, um, um, or if people are asking you direct questions, let's say for the purpose of marriage and you have to disclose certain information, that's actually correct. Right. Because there are certain conditions marriage, business, there's certain things that may come up for people and they need uh, to vet others. And so they may turn to someone, even in a leadership position or a teaching position and ask them, you know, what do you think of so-and-so and so-and-so? And -and In that capacity, we have to be, we have to tell the truth, especially if people are asking us. And that's not the same as backbiting because Backbiting is just a very low thing. It's it's speaking ill of people, you know, behind their back. Um, whether it's true or not, it's, it doesn't matter. You're using, you know, you're speaking about their private life. You're referring to them in a way that would hurt them. Even subhanAllah, I mean, the, the definition of backbiting can extend beyond just the person themselves. Like it even extends to their possessions, right? So if you if you said something, rude about a person's car, about a person's clothing, right? It's not their actual personhood, but it's part of them because it, you know, it's by extension, right? It's something they own. Um, This would be considered backbiting, right? And so we have to be even describing someone in a way that is, that you know may hurt their feelings. We have to be very careful. Um, Like if you know, if you're trying to and describe a person's physical appearance and you're using words that are you know that if they heard you say them it would likely hurt their feelings this would be um this would be a, a form of backbiting we have to be so careful and so delicate when we're describing people um so there's you know there's a lot to say about that but the point is is people who are um, in a in a capacity of guiding others should know these things and they should certainly not ever openly backbite or openly say things harm, harmful about people. And then the last one is uh, lacking the proper respect in accordance with the commands of Allah. So this is, again, just goes down to basic adab. All of these things are signs for us to look out for so that we are not deluded or um, tricked you know, by, um, by these types of teachers. Um, okay. So Alhamdulillah, now back to the document. So that was kind of just a quick summary of what we talked about last week, but now he shifts gears again. And he, uh, says, you know, the, the, the last list that he has here is the spiritual courtesies of a student with his or her spiritual guide as well as the fellow wayfarers on the path, right? So with your fellow students on the, on the path, there is an expectation, right? That we maintain a certain level of adab um, with the way that we deal with our teachers as well as other students. So this is now 
bringing it all kind of full circle, right? Because we started off laying the foundations of what you need to be on a spiritual path in terms of objectives and goals, right? Um, and, you know, we can quickly repeat those for those who, again, who are on Instagram maybe and joining us for the first time. But those very first um, five foundations are very important to know because everything that we've just studied and over the course of all of these weeks actually go back to these five, which are having taqwa um, and that, you know, and, and that is consistent, right? Having taqwa of Allah and then practicing the sunnah, which is, you know, again, there's a, there's a theme that when you uh, when you study the, the five um, you'll see this theme of consistency. So he mentions first turning to Allah subhanahu in prosperity and adversity, which is taqwa. And then, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, mindfulness of Allah privately and publicly, which is taqwa. And then uh, adherence to the sunnah in word and deed, which is, you know, again, consistency in terms of practicing the, knowing the sunnah, you know, knowing it, reading it, studying it, um, but also acting in line with it. Uh, so that's the second objective of someone who should be on, who's on the spiritual path, that they want to always be mindful of Allah privately and publicly. They want to be practicing the sunnah and word indeed. And then they also are free from the bondage of, you know, wanting to be accepted by people or, or free from the fear of being rejected by people, which is, again, if you think about how many decisions people make every single day of their life that has to do with these two things, right? Fear of being rejected or a desire to be accepted. A lot of people are, um, are uh, compelled to action for those two reasons, right? You're either trying to be in the in-group or you're afraid of being kicked out to the out-group. And now with cancel culture, for example, you see this on such a wide scale because there are many people who don't want to share openly their beliefs. They don't want to speak about certain values they have or, you know, principles they, they live by because they're too afraid to, to be canceled, to be um, judged themselves. And so that, you know, puts us in a, in a very uh, compromised position, right? Because when you look at our faith, our faith teaches us that as believers anyway, we have to be doing Amr bil Ma'ruf wa Nahiyan al Munka. So if you are, you know, reading that Quranic message, um, that you're part of your task as a Muslim is to be the one who is establishing the good and and enjoining the good and forbidding the, the bad, then how do you reconcile that with this fear that you have? of not being accepted um, and wanting so much to be, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, the fear of uh, being rejected and wanting to be accepted. How do you reconcile that with Amr bin Ma'ruf wa Nahiyan al-Munkar? Um, it is a very delicate balance. And this is where, again, you know, wisdom comes into place because there is there are ways to do these things delicately. Sometimes you, you can do them overtly and other times you have to be more subtle um, and, but it's a, it's something that it's easier to learn if you're actually with people who, who have that life experience. Um, if you let your own emotions and your own reactivity, like we're very, this is why it's so important to learn about your temperament, because if you don't know your own temperament, then you may, um, get yourself in a lot of trouble, right? Uh, some people are very temperamentally reactive emotionally. They're not really using sound judgment. They're just in a heightened emotional state and then they act. Um, but as you practice your deen more and more and you learn these things, then you learn the importance of really maintaining um, that prophetic ability to just be in a state of equilibrium where you're not easily pushed this way or that way. So this concept of indifference is, is a very broad uh, topic, but it's really about being so firmly rooted in your deen and knowing very well, like the um, that there's that not everything has to be rushed. You know, I feel like in this day and age, that's something that's lost on a lot of us because we're used to um, instant satisfaction or instant gratification. We're used to things being done so quickly and haphazardly 
that we forget that there is an alternate you know path which is take your time with things you don't have to react to every single for example scandal that comes about like how many people I mean, how many times have we seen this in our own community, um, especially online, right? There's some scandal that happens. And within seconds, it's like a firestorm because people are posting about it and sharing. And now it's all these reactions and it just becomes this huge, you know, gossip fest where, you know, things are, uh, people are rush, you know, snap judgments, you rush to judgment, you start to speak ill of, of people without all the facts even coming out yet. Um, and that's why, you know, if you're again around teachers who practice all of these things, you will not find them amongst those who are, you know, right at the onset of of something. They're, they're you know, they're um, it's you know they're, they're broadcasting things right away. They, they'll actually reserve judgment until um, either more facts come about or they feel themselves that they have given you know, the, the situation enough time to assess all sides. So patience, right? These are all hallmark qualities of the believer um, are, is, is something that you just naturally learn when you, when you forego the pressure of having to, again, appeal to anyone because you're more concerned about your state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's a very important quality, the indifference to the, uh, to, or acceptance, uh, sorry, the indifference to the acceptance or rejection of others. And then the fourth quality he mentions is the satisfaction with Allah and hardship and ease. Again, consistency. So whether you're going through hardships or ease, you're still, you have rada with Allah. You don't complain. You're just like, alhamdulillah, um, Allah knows best. If he put me in this situation, even though it's not what I want, he knows best. And I just have to see it through. Um, and you hold your tongue and you try not to say things that you know would um, reveal some conflict that you have internally, right? Uh, and the thing is, we can't control our thoughts, but we can certainly uh, control our words. Uh, and this is why, you know, it's a beautiful uh, practice, but um, it's actually, um, I can't remember it in Arabic, but, you know, when, for example, someone you love passes away, uh, one of the beautiful responses um, is that, you know, your heart is saddened but you um, fear God and you you do not wish to say anything that would displease him. Um, and so that is the state of the believer is that you really are mindful to not have bad adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though internally there is pain um, and sorrow and grief, you would rather remain in a state of complete satisfaction with God's decree um, so, to such an extent that you hold your tongue and you uh, are very choice with with your words and how you grieve, you know. And it's it takes a lot of discipline to do that because, I mean, I think anybody who's ever lost someone, especially if it's an unexpected death, I think they would be lying uh, if they if they said that they didn't feel like it was uh, unfair or that they wished it could be undone. Most people, when you lose a loved one, regardless of the circumstance, it's so difficult to bear that you, um, you know, you, you are really practicing restraint. You, you're trying so hard not to say something wrong, but that comes from taqwa. That comes from all of these beautiful qualities of trying to maintain the best adab of Allah. And then the last quality is the turning to Allah in prosperity and adversity. So that you have the, the right understanding of what to do in these circumstances. In both um, when things are going well and Allah's generosity is shown on you because, you know, maybe opportunities are coming to you, wealth, health, a lot of things that we take for granted that you recognize that these are all gifts from Allah and you you can't help but to maintain a state of constant gratitude to him, right? So that's the turning to Allah. And then in adversity as well, when things are very difficult for you, um, you know the same, that nobody can bring you relief other than Allah. So you turn to him. But knowing that that's the protocol, regardless of my situation, again, consistency, I know what to do. So he lays these five 
foundations, right? These are the actual foundations that the document starts off with. And then, as we said, he goes into, oh, sorry, actually, wrong screen here. He goes into the adab that a student should have. So now it's back to holding ourselves accountable to whether or not if we are on a spiritual path, if we have a teacher, or maybe we're in a jama'ah, we're part of a group, we're learning with other people, whatever the circumstances is, these are the things that we should be mindful of. So he says, first, following the directions of the guide, even if it is contrary to one's own preference. Now, you know, we can obviously, um, depending on the circumstance, right, we can, we can certainly um, take that with a grain of salt, I guess they say, which is, you know, if, you're, if your guide is, is uh, connected to you and they're giving you counsel, especially when it comes to your spiritual practice, um, you know, that's definitely something that you should defer to them because if they're telling you, you know, focus on this area of study first, uh, don't go out of order and then do this and then this, then if you're entrusting your yourself with their, with them, then you should just follow their advice. But if it's matters that they don't really um, have any area of expertise in, or, you know, sometimes people get, you know, it's, it's when you're put in this position of being like an advisor to someone else, um, if you aren't mindful, you can just start to, you know, do that on, on many, on a range of matters. You know, it's like you're giving now dispensing relationship advice, financial advice. So it's not even just, you know, religious like counsel, but it's like, oh, let me just tell you about everything that you should be doing because this is how, what I think. Some people may have that, may have that. Um, issue because they maybe are are leaders. They have natural leadership qualities, and sometimes if you have that, you just feel like you're you're responsible for people. So you feel the need to uh, to tell them what to do on every area of their life. Um, so if you find that the the one that you're entrusting your spiritual guidance to is also giving you now other advice, but you're not quite sure about whether or not their judgment is sound on certain things, and I would certainly Use your own judgment. This is why we have to have some, you know, degree of wisdom and even what we, um, or, or the, uh, the amount of, of um, dependency that we have on certain people in our lives, right? Um, we're all, I mean, when you reach the age of, of adulthood and you're an independent person um, and you've, for the most part, lived your life um, independently, uh, you know, uh, or you, you're, you're in that stage, then you should be able to make um, your own choices. And of course, we have istikhara, we have, we can uh, seek counsel from many people when it comes to different areas of our life. Uh, so we don't have to give, uh, you know, complete auto our autonomy, um, or our um, ability to, you know, to, to make decisions over, we don't have to hand that over to someone else. This is not what having a spiritual guide is about. And unfortunately, there are people who have done that. You know, there are many people who whose relationship with their quote unquote teacher or guide turned into something that was very different. It, it was a codependency, an unhealthy, um, enmeshed sort of situation where now this teacher is completely overbearingly involved in that person's life. And I've heard really sad stories about marriages being affected, uh, divorces being enacted, you know, because, oh, the teacher said so-and-so. I would be very cautious of anybody who is telling you what to do, like, directly. Because I've been around many great teachers who they give nasiha in a very uh, subtle way. If you ask questions, you know, they will give you, present to you answers. Um, but I have rarely met teachers who are willingly uh, telling people how to live their life. They don't dictate, you know, they'll just say, you know, well, this is an opinion. It's, it's very uh, general the way that they uh, approach these things. Whereas someone who's on a bit of a power trip, you know, as they say, may feel that they have the right to tell you what to do about everything in your life. And that's 
beyond giving nasiha. That's, you know, that's, you know, telling someone how to live. Um, and that's, that's definitely concerning, I would say, especially if it's not with religious counsel, but it's just like financially, as I said, or in your relationship, they're meddling in your personal life um, or getting involved with the decisions that you need to make on in a very direct way without being solicited, right? Because it's oftentimes it's unsolicited advice. So nobody even asked, but then, you know, this, these people will want to tell you um, or warn you for whatever reason. And sometimes there's other things going on. So anyway, red flag. Um, but generally speaking, when it comes to religious practice, yes, follow their guidance. And especially if you think like logically, oh, wouldn't it make more sense for me to do this subject first? Or shouldn't I focus on this first? Don't rely on your own logic and assessments when it comes to these things. And I feel like um, a lot of this comes from like the Western tradition, because, you know, in Western academia, there is this notion of students kind of seeing themselves almost on equal footing with their teachers. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that they're the teacher or the professor and they have the credentials, but we can challenge them. It's, you know, it's, it becomes this um, exercise of will and, you know, it's like a, it's very competitive in the way that students are seen, uh, are taught to see their teachers. Whereas Islamically, the deference to the teacher um, is, is demanded, right? That we show our, our teachers deference. And that means that we acknowledge that they may have insights, spiritual insights that we just simply don't know. And that as he says here, even if it's contrary to one's preference, that we think about it from the perspective of, oh, well, I might think this makes sense, but they know maybe from experience, maybe they've had other students go through similar things and they have an insight on the matter that I don't have. So it's just really showing that level of humility to know, to stay in your own lane, I guess you could say. So that's the first adab that a student would have with their guide. And then he says, avoiding what the guide forbids, even if it would appear to be highly adverse to the student. So in the first case, it's following their directions. In the second case, it's you know avoiding what they have forbidden. And it's the same idea, right? Which is there may be considerations that they have that you simply aren't, you know, attuned to. And if you're entrusting them um, and they have experience and they know you and you've you feel that you maybe even know others who are their students and you feel really confident that they know what they're doing, that you uh, you basically allow you know that or show display that humility where you uh, defer to them so that's the second point of adam and then maintaining utmost reverence for them in their presence and absence during their lives and after their deaths so if you have a teacher um as we just mentioned deference respect is so important so when you are in their company and we don't have to go over the top you know some some groups take it to a level where it's uncomfortable, you know, and we have to be very, again, cautious um, and just really look at the best examples in our tradition are the Sahaba and how they were with the Prophet Sallallahu because he is all of our teacher, right? He is the greatest teacher. So if we want to see how the students around the teacher are, then we look to the students and see how did they speak to the Prophet and How did they address him? How did they welcome him? How did they serve him? Um, and they're beautiful hadith, you know. Um, I think it was Sayyidina Abu Bakr, uh, for example. I think it was him. He said that, you know, when they were in in a majlis or a dars with the Prophet that they would be sitting as though birds were perched on their head. Um, which is, you know, a level of stillness, a level of, of mindfulness and respect that I'm sure we can all visualize just by those words, right? To sit still, um, because birds are pretty sensitive, right? I mean, I don't know if you've ever handled a bird before, or played with a bird or had one on your finger, maybe a parakeet. Um, you know, to have birds perched on your head, I think is a pretty um, 
it's obvious what he's saying, that there was a stillness in their presence, the way that they were sitting. So, for example, like when we had lessons many, many years ago with Sheikh Muhammad Ali Aqubi, one of the great Syrian uh, uh, contemporary scholars, mashallah, um, he was very big on this, on the way that students sat in the majlis. You know, he, he, he really expected the students to not move very much, um, to not ever stretch your legs out, uh, because this would be considered bad adab, right? If you're if you're sitting in a in many of these classes, you know, in, in a masjid setting, are usually on the ground, right? So the students are sitting on the ground, um, and so if you're sitting in a traditional classical uh, setting, it would be considered a breach of adab for students to um, extend their feet toward the teacher to keep moving a lot, being distracting. And now, I mean, how many of us see it even during the Jummah Khutbah where you cannot get through a 20, 30 minute talk without cell phones going off. Some people are brazen enough to take a phone call in the middle of a khutbah, uh, subhanAllah, or people are on their phone browsing. So this is, completely unacceptable because it shows such a lack of respect to the teachers or to the scholars or to whoever is in that position when we are so easily distractible. And then we let our bodies and our physical presence become, um, they, they, they're they almost re- revealing their agit- the agitation, right? Because if you're moving around a lot, maybe uh, if you have a health issue, that's totally different. But if it's just like you're yawning, you're um, making noises or stretching or chewing gum or eating or doing things that are like you've, you have no consideration for the setting. I mean, this is a heavy weighty thing, right? To come together in a circle of dhikr or knowledge and to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just study a sacred text or to, you know, read from the Quran or hadith. You want to really think about what is your body doing? What are you communicating? What are you, how are you holding yourself? Um, even in our prayers, I mean, the whole reason why we have to be so mindful of the prayer, even the movements of the prayer, is because it's an it's a very momentous event, right? To come before Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, you have to be well uh, presentable, right? You're dressed well. We first of all make our wudu because we should be in a state of pure purity, but then we also should be dressed well and we should be very mindful of our movements in the prayer because um, actually in the Hanafi I, I, I believe it's three, three or more. If you start to excessively move around um and and do things your prayer is in, uh, invalid because you've you've broken that protocol of just behave you know it's not a very long process and we all do it may Allah forgive us um you know sometimes we're so distracted and thinking about other things we may not be aware of just how much we are moving excessively you know so if you're constantly touching your clothes or pulling on this and that or your nose and you're just moving around a lot, you know, or some people are um, playing with jewelry. Imagine, you know, you're, you're supposed to be uh, focused on Allah and praising him and really in this state of, um, you know, where, where you're humbling yourself before him, um, appealing to him, praising him, asking him, seeking his forgiveness. But then you're, um, you know, cracking knuckles uh, playing with your jewelry, um, touching your you know hands and kind of doing little movements. These are this is not acceptable, and we have to be very careful. So then, in in a setting again with teachers and students, where you're supposed to come together and you know have the good of Allah, it's the same concept, right? That you are what it's a momentous event. It's something very weighty and heavy. So you should show that in your decorum, in your the way that you hold your body, the way that you hold yourself. You shouldn't be getting up every without, um, you know. And I, I'm, a, I'm a teacher, so I see this happen all the time in classroom settings, where students will just get up and they'll go throw something away. I've had this several times. This is totally unacceptable. You have to seek permission if 
there is a reason, you know, that you need to move. Uh, maybe you have to leave. Um, sorry. You know, if, if there was a reason that you had to leave, that you would do it, but you would do it with that respect, right? I apologize. I have to just quickly um, charge the iPad here that I have. One second, everybody. Forgive me, but we have my charger here. Okay, so um, let's see here. Okay, this is going to get tricky because I can't turn on the charger. How am I going to do this? All right, you guys, I'm clearly not ready for all this tech technology here. <laughs> Okay, inshallah, you guys can still see me. I know it's a little slanted, but it's going to have to do. All right, so bismillah. So he was, um, sorry, we were on the point about maintaining utmost reverence for our teachers in their presence and in their absence. So this is also another really important point that if someone says something about your teacher um, in their absence, that you show respect and you defend their honor um, let's say that it was a negative remark or just something that, you know, wasn't maybe said in the best context or mis maybe there was a misrepresentation that you, if, if, if you know, you know, you know, the, the accurate, um, uh, you know, position that they hold, or you, you can somehow defend them. You should, you should defend them. Um, and then the other part of it is in their lifetime and after, if they, if Allah takes them earlier or, or from, you know, uh, while you're alive, then you should always speak well of them and veil them. Because sometimes, you know, as I said earlier, teachers are human, so they may, you know, have have lost, um, you know, comportment at some point or said something or did something that maybe wasn't, you know, very, um, you know, it's something that, that you should veil. You should veil them. You shouldn't speak ill of them you shouldn't unveil them and tell people their business or their private maybe you you saw things about their private life um that others who don't know those details would never know so certainly you should never share those things just because you had access to them that's one of the um the great it's it's, it's unfortunate right that sometimes when um you know people open up their homes or uh, they they start to be a little bit more relaxed around people that one of the risks is that you know that becomes information that's supposed to be private but becomes shared openly with other people oh yeah I saw their home their home situation oh, oh I saw the way he he or she talks to their siblings or I mean their spouses or their children and you just start to unveil people this is not right because um, the teacher is clearly inviting you to their private space to teach you to give you their time um and so veil them if you see something that you even if it's questionable or unpleasant then you should have that taqwa to just none of my business i'm not saying anything but you know that that deference and reverence is really important to have and then giving them their due according to one's ability without stint so if you know, they, um, I mean, this could be, you know, interpreted in different ways, but, you know, to compensate them for uh, their time with you, if if you're able to, you know, some teachers are very humble, and they will not ever ask. But if you, um, if they're giving you their time, they're sharing their knowledge with you, they are making accommodations for you that other people uh, they 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 don't make then you should have it within your own conscience to to know that they deserve to be compensated and to not expect people to do things for you as they say free sabidala you know if someone is going to teach you something um, just because they're a teacher and that's what they do doesn't mean that you think it's a free ride and unfortunately that still exists uh, in our community where some people just expect like the imam or the teacher who's at the masjid, um, because they're there anyway, that they always do things free without any monetary, um, you know, compensation, or that they expect these discounts and these exceptions and, oh, can you please, you know, do this favor for me and this, and we just start to get really um, entitled and, and have too many expectations of our teachers and our, and our religious, you know, and our scholars. So, if you're able to afford something, you give them their due. You're not stingy. You don't expect them to do things freely for you. And the least you can gift them because there are some teachers who will not take money. 
and they make it very clear that they don't want to have a salary of any type or um, like an expected salary, but you could always gift. And that's something that you should consider. You know, if, if you meet someone who's like, no, 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 it's okay. I want to do this for the sake of Allah. Some people, mashallah, are very generous and they really genuinely mean it because they may also be in a position where they just want to do good and give back to the community. So they feel like, okay, I have time. I can teach this person. But if they don't want to accept a monetary um, consistent sort of payment or fee from you, then you could at least, um, out of the goodness of your heart, gift them. Uh, especially if you like conclude a class or you conclude an area of study with them, just give them a nice gift. And it could be for all of the time that they spent with you, but you're at least acknowledging and showing your gratitude. And of course, dua and all of those things are um, certainly uh, included, but to give them a nice gift would be beautiful. And then relinquishing one's own understanding, knowledge, and leadership to that of the teacher, unless uh, these are already in accordance with one's teacher. So really just not having this smug attitude that, you know, that one is at the same level as a teacher, right? Um, Because sometimes this is, you know, again, it comes from, I think, um, the Western tradition, but we can get ahead of ourselves and just start to see ourselves on equal footing with teachers. And, uh, you know, you see a lot of Muslims who haven't even put in one one hundredth of the amount of time and energy and study um, as a teacher, but then they will have these hot takes on a teacher's position. And it's like, oh, I don't agree with them because, you know, they didn't think about this or that. And they just start to act as though that they're on the same footing. But it's like, wait a second, where did you study? How long have you studied? Oh, you're just a student of knowledge. Why do you have an opinion on this matter in the first place? Um, and, and the student of Adab always is very cognizant of their limitations. So they never even go there. And if they hear an interpretation um, that they don't agree with, they'll always presume that they have a weak understanding, that they don't have the full picture they won't rush to judgment and um, and doubt the teacher and, and assume that they just are wrong. Um, but they'll say, oh, maybe I am not clear on this or I have the wrong understanding of this. Or there's, you know, I'm limited because of I don't have the language or the uh, knowledge in this particular area. So all of these qualities are really important when you are a student of knowledge. And it's really about maintaining humility, right? I mean, if you can see all five of them, what it really comes down to is once you are on a spiritual path and you see yourself in that capacity, that you hold your tongue and you check your nafs and you are very clear about who you are um, and that you uh, need guidance, right, from your teacher and you're you're in a way beholden to them, um, not as you know, not not necessarily because of who they are, but the place that Allah Subhanahu has put them above you, right? That you feel this indebtedness to them, like Allah, you have placed me with this teacher, which is such a gift because to even have access to a teacher is such a gift, and um, I feel a great indebtedness to. Uh, to, to them for their service to me. So out of that comes this desire to serve, to um, obey, to uh, take their warnings and advice seriously, to not question every single thing. But as I said in the beginning, the caveat is that the teacher is displaying all of those beautiful qualities that we talked about. If they're not displaying those qualities, those prophetic qualities, then these things would not apply. This would apply if the teacher is a qualified, sound teacher who knows what they're talking about and also doesn't delve into areas that they're not qualified to, to, to talk about. So that's the caveat, right? That if they are really true teachers and they understand and they're on the path of tradition and, um, and you trust that because, alhamdulillah, their you know, reputation precedes them, they have prophetic-like qualities, uh, you haven't seen anything that would cause you concern, then yes, you should maintain this level of 
respect for the teacher. So then he ends this uh, section and says, should the seeker not find a guiding teacher or find one who is lacking in any of these five conditions, he should depend on him only in those conditions the teacher fulfills. As for areas he is wanting in, he should treat him like a brother regarding them. And so that's kind of in a gist what I was saying. So you take from what the teacher excels in and in other cases, you just see them as another human being who's got opinions maybe, but not necessarily ones that you have to follow. Uh, worldly matters, if they, you know, they have, they can have their opinions, but you're not uh, obliged to obey them in those matters. Whereas when it comes to spiritual uh, matters, inshallah, it's best to defer to them because that's why they're in that capacity, right? Um, so then, alhamdulillah, he says, thus ends the five foundations with the praise, help, and the perfect success of Allah. So alhamdulillah, this is the, the conclusion of this incredible document. And then he goes, it is necessary to read this every day, once or twice. I mean, just imagine reading this document every single day, right? But subhanAllah, why is he saying it? And if it's not possible, then at least once a week until what? Its meanings are imprinted. So it's not that you have to do it for life, but that you get it, that you grasp what he is telling you, right? That it's imprinted on one's soul and manifest in one's behavior. Indeed, it contains that which enables one to dispense with many books and much advice. And it is said, surely they have been denied a rival by their neglect of the foundations. Whoever reflects deeply on what we have said will acknowledge its truth and he will continue to have recourse to it, using it as a reminder for him. Success is ultimately by Allah. So alhamdulillah, um, this is the end of this particular section of the foundations of the spiritual path. For those of you who've been a part of the class, it's not that it's necessarily over because he also includes the counsel of Imam al-Nawawi, as well as more counsel from Sidi Ahmed Zuruk, which we will get to next week, which will likely be our last official class, inshallah. Um, and then maybe we might extend it to include a Q&A uh, in case there are any um, outstanding questions or things that haven't been covered. But alhamdulillah, I know this is a very content heavy document um, and there's a lot of uh, commentary that you know we, we, we add onto it. But I think as he says, if you just read, if an individual takes this PDF and reads it over and over a couple of times, and if you you know want to, you're more than welcome to go back and listen to the recordings for added commentary. I think it will provide so much clarity um, to anybody who is embarking on the path about all the necessary things that they should be focused on and all the you know, things that they should be wary of, you know, those pitfalls uh, and dangers, and then heeding the advice, right? And I think for me, when I think of this document, if you go back to um, page 10, the very bottom of it, where he says, I say that being what content with the self, persisting in disobedient acts, and abandoning awareness of Allah are the foundations of all illnesses, tribulations, and pitfalls. That to me is what I think of when I think of this document, because that's it. Um, you know, he lays the foundations of the path, but then he also lays the foundations of what is the reason why we suffer as human beings. We suffer because of illness, right? Spiritual and physical tribulations, um, which could be in the world and in the other life, right? And I think it was Ibn Abbas who said, you know, um, with tribulations that we always have to be grateful because A, it could always be worse, right? Um, B, it could be in your uh, dunya and not in your akhira. And the C, it could be in your, in this life and not the, uh, it could be in this life and not the next. And so he's giving us perspective on how to be grateful even when we have tribulations, when we think of these things, right? It could always be worse. And that's true. Our tribulations could always be worse. Um, uh, so, you know, the fact that we have tribulations, which again, could be in dunya and in our deen, um, is something to be very um, mindful of and, and, and fear uh, that 
we're, we're susceptible to those things when we don't have these things clear, right? For us, we're susceptible to tribulations in our deen. And so, uh, and then the pitfalls, which he outlines beautifully. So he says all of these things that we are as human beings wanting to run away from, nobody wants to suffer through these things. Nobody wants illnesses, spiritual or otherwise. Nobody wants tribulations. Nobody wants pitfalls, right? How do we avoid them? Well, he gives us the formula. Don't be content with yourself, right? Don't continue to persist in disobedient acts and don't forget your Lord, because if you do those three things, you're in trouble. Uh, so the document obviously has much more to offer, but that's just a, a summary. And inshallah, um, you know, I, I'm looking forward to next week where we'll, we'll uh, go into uh, the remaining parts of this document. But if there are any questions, we can go ahead and take those questions. I don't know if Sada Fadwa ever joined because she said she would join as soon as she got home, but it's likely just me today. So Alhamdulillah, that's fine. We're still uh, live and I can take questions. So let me see here. I do see a written question. If there's any more, please feel free to type them up. But this one says, would wearing a hijab and being modest apply to adhering to the sunnah? Does that mean our foundation is lacking if we do not wear the hijab? That's a very good question. Well, you know, we have to be clear here. The hijab is, um, is fard. You know, there's no difference of opinion on that. It is a fard action that is required of uh, a Muslim girl and woman once she becomes of age. However, um, if a sister is struggling in that capacity, um, but she has good intentions and she's working towards it, then um, then she's okay. But if you are not wearing hijab and you have a position about the hijab that is against the normative you know, position, which is that it's far, then that is definitely um, an issue. Yes, that would indicate that there's a, a lack of understanding a fault, you know, some something's going on. And so, uh, in terms of the practice, I would say anyone who doesn't wear hijab, just constantly be mindful that you need to be in a state of toba, right? That you have to be in a state of toba. So you you seek Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's forgiveness, um, and recognize that you don't wear hijab um, for whatever reasons, and you might have many reasons why you're not there yet, but you should be open with Allah enough to acknowledge that you're not fulfilling a requirement that he has made for an obligatory upon you. And so that should put you in a state of humility and in a state of, you know, asking Allah for forgiveness, a state of tawbah. Um, and inshallah, and then just keep asking him to guide you to, to it. You know, I met someone actually over the weekend, um, we had a sister's retreat here in the Bay Area. And so a sister came up to me, mashallah, and she said that, you know, this was something um, that months ago, I think during one of our classes, we talked about a couple of things uh, with regards to wearing the hijab as well as prayer. And we were giving counsel and advice. And so she said that she, um, you know, she started to wear the hijab uh, here and there, you know, uh, which I, I really recommend. I really want any sister who does not identify as a hijabi to not fall into the all or none mindset because I feel like that makes it more difficult. Rather, I think anybody who doesn't wear the hijab, you should have the open attitude that I can wear the hijab whenever I want. Just like I can pray whenever I want. And if you feel inclined to wear the hijab, to the masjid, to certain events, um, to go to the store, you just feel like doing it, do it. But this idea that you have to be a hijabi in order to wear the hijab is just ridiculous. And I don't think that's something we should encourage, you know, that, um, that we put sisters in that very difficult position because. The transition has to happen. And sometimes the transition happens with practice. You know, you, you're practicing wearing the hijab every day. You're wearing it here and there. 
And once you start to do it more and more, what happens is it becomes infused as part of your personality. I know many people who did that. Uh, one of my very close friends actually did that for years. She did not wear the hijab and everybody presumed, like she did not wear the hijab full time. Um, she wore it, let's say like 80% of the time. Uh, but then there were some situations where she just didn't feel comfortable wearing it around certain family. Um, so she was, many people who met her just presumed that she was a hijabi because she wore it so much more than, uh, and they didn't see her when she didn't wear it. And I think that's a perfectly balanced perspective. Why not? Why do we have to put sisters in this awkward position of they have to commit or no, don't, don't even touch it? Uh, you're, you're a hypocrite. Astaghfirullah, that's horrible. Uh, let her get her practice. If she needs a few years of wearing it to certain venues and settings before she's fully comfortable, let her do it. Let her do it without any shaming, without any blaming or putting her on the spot. And then you'll see, because uh, the sister who came up to me, she said, that's what she did. She just started, she took that advice. She started wearing it and she never you know, thought of it before. And then now, alhamdulillah, it's been two months and she's been wearing it full time and her spouse is supportive. Um, I hear these things all the time, alhamdulillah. So I think that's the way we should approach these things. Um, so that's the only question that I see here. Uh, I don't know if there are any more. I'm looking again in the chat. No, I think that was it. And then let me see here on Instagram. And I apologize for those of you on Instagram for the curt, like the slanted thing. Let me actually see if I can take off the charge now. Okay, how about that? So I don't know if there are any questions, but let me read through here. So, okay, so the sister is asking to the three things. Okay, sorry, sister. Um, Sidi Ahmed Zuruk in the document says that he believes that the reasons why we have illnesses, tribulations, and pitfalls is due to three things, which he said is number one, being too content with the self, right? So that we are, um, we're just, uh, we're comfortable. We're, we don't really see ourselves as being, um, that we need development or, or betterment, or we're just resigned to wherever we are and we're satisfied. So self-satisfaction is very dangerous, spiritually speaking. Number one, that's, and then number two is that you're persistently doing haram. Like, you know, that something is forbidden, but you keep doing it. And that is going to be, you know, it's going to lead you to your peril. People who expect um, to be, to receive any type of lasting um, satisfaction or comfort or, um, sorry, I just think it's really, okay. So anybody who, who expects that their life is just going to go well and that they'll have afia, well-being, or, you know, that things will, good things will come to them, but they're directly in disobedience to Allah knowingly, you can see how that's, there's a disconnect there. Why would you expect your life to go well? Which is, for example, one of the things that I always ask sisters who, you know, I, I've met with sisters who come to me and they'll want to take off their hijab. Um, you know, they're wearing hijab and they're starting to struggle with it. And, when, and I'm very direct. Uh, so I'll just start asking a bunch of questions like what's going on. And sometimes, you know, in the past anyway, people have revealed that they're afraid that they, they're not going to get a job or that they're not going to get married if they continue to wear the hijab. And so I try to point out to them how that is such false logic, right? That it's there, it sounds logical, but it's actually deception because Iblis comes up with all these ideas that sound like convincing, but if you actually, you know, dissect them a little bit, you realize like how preposterous, preposterous it is, right? To think that disobeying Allah, to, to stop doing an act that is a fard is going to somehow open up the doors of khair upon you. Who do you think is going to bless you with a halal good income? Who do you think is going to bring to you a righteous good spouse who will take care of you and love you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-munim. He is the source of all good. So if you've logically convinced yourself that acting in direct disobedience to him would somehow open up khair for you, 
you can, I hope, see that that's illogical. There's no logic to that. Um, and it's just a deception of Iblis. So, um, you know, that's the second thing. And then the third thing is that you are not thinking of Allah. You know, if you're, if you can go um, a full day, half a day, a quarter of a day, and Allah is not on your mind or on your tongue, you know, his praise, his remembrance, his dhikr, um, you don't read the Quran, you're not, your prayers are barely there. This is um, a, a huge danger for you in many ways, spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, because we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, away from the evils and the dangers of this world. So what are you going to, who are you, where's your safe haven if it's not Allah? Who is your safe haven? Like, think about it. We need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have to be consistently or as often as possible uh, trying to be in his remembrance. And if you're not, it's really, really dangerous. Um, alhamdulillah. So uh, I have another question here. I'm just looking at both Zoom and Instagram. Uh, so someone is saying, SubhanAllah, I really love the hijab advice because some sisters take it off because of a divorce, but they make their daughters wear it or there are lots of arguments about the clothes those teens choose. How can one help? Because the ex-husband's input pushes pressure on uh, the on on children the most, I think. Even if their deeds seem to be the reasons all of them are really struggling with Islam, but even more with the hijab. Um, you know, first of all, we should never make our daughters, our wives, our women, whoever, wear the hijab. It should never come to that. And as soon as you think that that's to strong arm a sister into wearing hijab, that you've somehow pat yourself on the back and think you've done good, you're just, it's delusion. Laikal Hafidin is very serious. We do not force people to do things because it will, you know, blow back or it will, uh, it won't go well. The, the, anybody who's forced into something may do it for a period of time just because they are pressured and they just don't want to hear it anymore. You know, especially if someone's nagging you or it's held over your head. It's a, it's a power card. Sometimes ultimatums are given and threats are issued. So a person may just give in because it's like enough is enough. I can't deal with it anymore. Fine, I'll do it. Um, but if you're delusional, delusional enough to think that that's somehow a win for you, um, you're prioritizing your own conscience or whatever false idea you have about your responsibility over them, over their spiritual well-being. Because if you're more concerned about their spiritual well-being, then you would take the time to actually explain to them the incredible wisdom of the hijab. And, you know, you can do that if you're just analyzing the world, you're looking out into the world, and you can start to connect all the dots with why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put, um, you know, the, give, give up, both men and women the responsibility of being modest in their dress. And for women, a little bit more. Let's like let's unpack it. Unpack it in a in a way that is informed. That's not emotional. It's not you know fueled by uh, personal jealousy, rida, as we say. But it's actually information, which is look at the exploitation of not just women, young girls. You know, I was reading earlier uh, this article about. Um, this girl who was a pa she was in pageants and she um, it was I don't know where I read it but anyway she was in those toddlers and tiara I don't know if you guys remember that show stuff well anyway and she's now a, a high school graduate and she was the valedictorian of her class and so in the article she said that someone asked her or the reporter I think asked the question like what do you say about people who make a claim that you know um, pageantry for young girls is sexually exploitative and you know she of course because she's in the world of pageantry she starts to defend it and she's like it's it was it really helped my confidence and anybody who thinks that it's they're sick or perverse or she's made some statement like that and unfortunately that's just really being blind to the reality if you don't think that um little girls are exploited in this culture in this time uh, through these means, right? Um, 
then you're just not awake. You're, you're, it's just, you're in your own world because the reality is we have a crisis. Everybody knows this is real. There are rumors, there are pedophiles, there are sick and twisted demonic forces that target children. Nowadays, we see this topic. It's very prevalent, unfortunately, with uh, people, you know, consumed with uh, indoctrinating children, sexualizing children, teaching them really disgusting things way too early. Uh, so just look around, see it for what it is. The world has always exploited the vulnerable and amongst those are women and children. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to protect us. And he literally, the you know, some of the translations anyway, say that the reason why we wear the hijab is so that there were known, right? So that we were, are, we're very clearly manifest that we are Muslim women and to protect us from the molestation of people. And the molestation of people isn't just a physical molestation. It's a visual molestation. So there is incredible wisdom to why our Lord has protected us um, by giving us the obligation of hijab. Um, and if you just start to logically explain these things to young girls, while at the same time being very patient and understanding and empathic and loving and compassionate to know that it takes time for some people to commit, then a sister will eventually see it, inshallah. Especially if you're making dua, you're teaching with wisdom, just be patient. Allah will open their heart. But if you think, no, I'm just going to force them and guilt them and shame them until they do it, you will create a horrible situation of hypocrisy likely uh, where a person loses their faith because they, they just don't believe in something. And then they may never, because they were forced ever want to live that life again. It's too triggering. It's too traumatic. So that's why we just follow the book of Allah. La um, ikra So may Allah guide them inshallah. But I think, you know, we have to stop being so emotional. And this is part of, you know, when I teach, parents where I do parenting sessions, I really try to emphasize trying to be as logical in our discourse as possible and intellectually inviting our children to conversations instead of using our position as authorities and then becoming emotional and personalizing things. Because if we really want to save their souls, then we have to reach them. We have to reach them. And, and, and that can only come through um, effective communication, inshallah. So, alhamdulillah. All right. I think those were the final questions. I started um, about almost 10 minutes late and we went on for an extra 20 minutes for Q&A. Oh, so the father was going to be like, what are you doing? <laughs> alhamdulillah, forgive me. I know. And thank you for everybody who's on the Zoom call because you all are so patient um, waiting uh, through for the session to end. But alhamdulillah, I think we've finished today's session. We're going to hopefully finish up this document next week, um, inshallah, when we come together for our final session. So I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that. I hope you've all enjoyed um, this class so far, uh, but feel free to um, maybe go back to the beginning uh, of the document and, and review again. It's as he says, keep reviewing it until it sticks and it's imprinted on your soul, inshallah. So with that said, um subhanakallahumma Jazakumullah khairan again, everyone, on Zoom. Inshallah, we'll see you next week. Um, and those of you on Instagram Live, I know there's a couple more questions. I'll, I'll be back with you in just a second. Um, oh, I think, was there another question? Right at the end, mashallah, in our community, the new thing is to protect the team. Hmm, that's a difficult one. All right, the, to the sister who came in and slid in at the very end with the final question, I will answer it quickly. She said, in our community, the new thing is to protect their teenage girls, 14 and up, and marry them to older cousins back home. The imams don't say anything and keep talking about modesty, the main focus of spiritual development. What should we do to try to stop this trend? You know, it's um, it's unfortunate, but I think 
you know, I, I don't know it's, if, it, if it's something that um, you can necessarily stop uh, um, because especially if it's impacting an, an entire community, uh, something, sometimes these trends take a life of their own and it would be uh, a very tall order to try to stop it. But you can at least, if you hear of people close to you um, who are considering these options, that you advise them and say, you know, um, is there a better, is there another alternative plan? You know, I know that there's fear. There's just a lot of fear right now. Fear of, you know, daughters being taken advantage of and abused, fear of faith being lost. So people are in panic mode and they sometimes uh, jump on these ideas because other people are doing them. So we have to be very careful. But if it's someone that's close to you and you think that they may not be um, considering an alternative option that you think they should consider, you can always suggest other things. But for the most part, I think um, we should really try to be careful from in meddling too much in other people's lives because you know what if you dissuade someone from doing something they want to do and you convince them and you think oh i know the right uh, you know i have a strong um feeling about this and you give advice to someone and then things don't work out you'll be at fault they'll come back at you and go it's all your fault i was going to send my daughter i was going to do this but you told me not to so the relationship matters approaching people in this way directly matters and I would just say, if you're asked, always give sound advice the way that you would want uh, to be advised, but don't go out of your way to start to dictate to people and warn people. And now you're, there's a whole, um, you know, movement. Uh, just be, be, be wary of that because people are never um, satisfied and they'll always look for a scapegoat. So you might bring unwanted harm to yourself. Anyway. We could talk more about that next week. But Jazakum Allah Khidin, everyone, inshallah, take care. Uh, and we'll see you on Monday of next week. All right. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتحة لما أغلق والخاتمة لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق الهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووافقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا اللهم بالقرآن وذكر الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يقربنا منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا سحل إلا ما جعلته سحلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن إلى شئ سهلا سهلا اللهم عيدنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome everyone to the final class of Foundations of the Spiritual Path. I want to once again thank Asada Fadwa and everybody uh, who's part of the Rahma Foundation for facilitating this session. It was only supposed to be four weeks and we are way past that. Alhamdulillah, because this text is just so incredible. There's so much uh, to cover. So Alhamdulillah, they gave us ample time to do that. And here we are at the very final class, alhamdulillah, it's been an honor. So with that said, I'm gonna go ahead, and for those who are on Instagram, because I'm also broadcasting there, you're welcome to join the Foundation's uh, Zoom session um, through Rahma Foundation, so please contact Rahma Foundation. I'm not able to uh, multitask right now and give you links, but if you just go to the Rahma Foundation page, you should be able to get all that information, and it's a very simple registration process. But let me go ahead and um, screen share so that we can all Inshallah, read along. So, alhamdulillah, as I mentioned two weeks ago, because last week, of course, we had our um, break uh, for Memorial uh, Weekend, Memorial Day weekend. So we did not have a session last week, but the week before, right when we came to the end of the council from Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, we uh, ended on this note here where he mentions that this document is so essential that we should be actually reading it every single day, right? Everything we covered for the past, uh, how many, eight, nine weeks, 10 weeks that we've been talking about this document, he felt, Sidi Ahmed Zaruk, that it was so relevant 
uh, that we should be actually reading it every day. And I, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of mashallah um, things that we we do. We we pray, inshallah, we all pray our prayers. We read Quran, we do our awrad. So yes, it might seem like oh we're adding more, but if you really think about, I think what he's saying by just even giving that advice that the guidance that you find in a document like Foundations is something that should be renewed, right? Because it's very easy to lose your way. Once you start to practice for some time, um, we become stagnant. And, I, and if you recall, that was one of the uh, diseases of, of the heart. That's one of the things that he actually mentions leads to spiritual disease, is stagnation, spiritual stagnation. So I think what he's really saying is review, renew, make sure that you're constantly revisiting your intentions, you know, make sure that you're aware of maybe uh, patterns of, of behavior, whether you're doing things or not doing things. And also be mindful of the company that you keep, because I can't tell you uh, how many times I have been um, approached by individuals who are, you know, going through the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows, as we say, of what we would say is the experience of the vast majority of uh, of believers, right? If you you know refer to the Quran, Allah Subhanahu wa describes the three different type of nufus, which today Subhanallah was um, my last session with some seventh graders that I teach at, at a local private school here, and we had um, a review. So Alhamdulillah, they they were able to remember the three nufus that are mentioned in the Quran: the nafs al amara bisu, the nafs al lawama, and the nafs al mutmainna. The nafs al lawama is the blaming self; it's the self-reproaching nafs. It's the where most of us would fall because we, inshallah, are believers, right? We have taqwa, inshallah. We pray, we fast, we give our zakat, we try to help, you know, people. We try to maintain good character. But because of the lives that we live, the lifestyles that we have, the so oftentimes it really does come down to the company that we keep. We may find ourselves slipping into sinfulness and forgetfulness and heedlessness. So there's a big emphasis on uh, really watching the company that you keep. So he's mentioning that here. But let's now um, proceed because it's there's not that much left. But what is left is, of course, very also, uh, you know, um, it, it's it's worthy of review and worthy of real deep contemplation. So the first um, little box here is it's uh, uh, it's small in, in the sense of you know the the, the number of characters and words, uh, uh, but in terms of the depth of what uh, is written here, there's just so much to cover. So this is the Council of Imam An Nawawi, and so just for again those who are on Instagram. The Foundations of the Spiritual Path, which is this document that is in the Agenda to Change Our Condition, it was translated by Sheikh Hamza, is primarily the advice of Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, but within the document, there's also a short little segment that provides counsel from Imam al nawawi rahimahullah. So here, uh, this is you know from Sheikh Hamza, he says, in addition to the above work, there is a large portion about the path to Allah that appears in the great Imam al nawawis Al-Maqasid, which Sidi Ahmed Zarruq did not mention in his work. It is a wonderfully succinct summation of the path to Allah. So Imam al nawawi may Allah sanctify his secret, says, this is now Imam Nawawi's advice. And so what, did he, what does he say? He says, one reaches Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala most high by repenting from all things, unlawful or offensive. So if you want to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to, first of all, know that you can't continue or carry on sinning and allowing for what is haram to, uh, you know, to be a part of your life. You have to be willing to get rid of those elements, whether they are things that are, you know, actual haram objects, materials, things that are preventing you uh, from, uh, from being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or there are other things. Maybe, um, as we mentioned, you are, you know, in a, you you're, you're maintaining a certain lifestyle where you're allowing the haram to affect you. So the point here is to, First of all, first of all, remove those things and then to repent from everything you've ever done that has been unlawful or offensive and to really take Toba seriously. You know, so what does that look like? It looks like facing yourself. It looks like what you would 
do if you, you know, wanted to heal or or cleanse yourself, maybe even from a physical perspective, right? If you go to clean yourself or to remove the filth off of your face, let's say, let's say you went um, somewhere and you you got dirty with mud. You know, there's there's a lot of places we can go where we can get physically very dirty, right? So if you went somewhere and you got physically dirty and then you wanted to clean yourself, part of that process would likely be looking at yourself in the mirror, right? Confronting uh, where the dirt may have gotten into and taking those extra steps to really try to cleanse away, right? Whatever the wherever there is uh, impurities. So. In a similar way, when you're doing a spiritual cleanse, you have to think about your life. You have to think about the mistakes you've made, the things you've done. And this can be over the span of your life, you know, collect like just looking at what are what are you what have you done that you would consider to be a grave sin? And this goes back to again another, you know, uh, area of knowledge we have to have. Um again, an, an agenda, by the way, if you don't have the book, it all has it for you. So in the agenda to change our condition is outlined the 17 kabair or enormities, right? What is considered a grave sin in Islam? And if you don't know what those things are, which, you know, again, I think if you have even a rudimentary understanding of Sharia and Islam, maybe your parents, your grandparents, your Islamic Sunday school teachers, hopefully taught you enough to know, you know, what, what is considered haram, but you might need to look into, you know, a list like the one in agenda to get a more comprehensive understanding, because some of the things that uh, we don't really think about, you know, I did a class uh, uh, yesterday, no, Sunday, Saturday, on uh, diseases of the heart. And we, we did an entire two hours just talking about uh, the difference between riba, the difference, uh, and buhtan, and namima, right? So there's riba, which is, uh, you know, saying about someone something that is, that would would hurt them, that you know would hurt them. And, and the our scholars went into such great detail to give us specific examples so that we realize that we are prone to make to excusing our bad behavior by, um, you know, kind of as they say, you know, remaining in in the uh, like when when you are willfully ignorant, right? You you you're not choosing to actually know the specific details or boundaries. Uh, there is a you know com- complicit uh, complicitness there, right? You're you're complicit in your own sinfulness because you know that. Um, that there are very specific parameters, but you're just choosing not to even delve into that. So Riba is actually very broad. And our uh, scholars, mashallah, took the time to tell us, for example, um, let me see if I can bring up the document that I worked with. Uh, Hold on, give me a moment here. Alhamdulillah, I think I might have it already up. But this document is so rich. It's so comprehensive because... It goes into things like I mentioned, uh, for example, saying something about someone's height, saying something about someone's even possessions, right? And you know, mashallah, again, the may Allah bless our teachers. But it, it, they were very. It was very eye-opening when we we're learning this, you know, years ago. Even with Sheikh Hamza, when we he, we we did purification of the heart, and he talked about how it is considered riba to talk about the possessions of a person in a negative light. Right. So if you were to describe someone's car and you were like, yeah, you know, the 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 one with the paint that's chipped and it's it's pretty old and it's it's just not, you know, it's like a lemon. And and that's the description you gave to someone's vehicle. It would be considered riba by Sharia, because if the person heard you say that they would take great offense. Right. Because it's like there is, you know, some some insult there. You're trying to say something about the possession that they have, which is often an extension of what you think of them. So if you think a person is has an ugly car or an, uh, or doesn't dress nice, or maybe their shoes aren't very, uh, they wear, you know, shabby clothes or, or, or shoes that are dirty. If you're pointing these things out in that way, you are uh, hurting the individual indirectly because you're insulting them, right? And just think about it for a moment. It makes perfect sense. 
Uh, because otherwise you could use more neutral language. You could just say, uh, you know, they're, you know, the sister or the brother who, if you're trying to describe someone to someone that maybe they don't know them, they don't know their name, you could use descriptors that are favorable, that are pleasant, that are nice, that are kind. But when you choose to hone in on the qualities or possessions of an individual that you don't deem are uh, are worthy, um, and you use very, you know, specific language to let that, kn- uh, to let a person know, right, uh, what you think of them, that is essentially riba. So here, this is the text, it's, um, they mention here, the mention of riba is to mention your brother who is, uh, who is absent in a way which you would not like if informed. This is whether it is in regards to a bodily deficiency, such as having blurry eyes, being one-eyed, being cross-eyed, not having hair, uh, excessively tall or excessively short, uh, and the likes. So the words we use to describe people are actually, um, they do imply certain things, right? We're we're, we're making implications uh, when we say certain words in a way. So anyhow, this is one topic, right? Barely scratching the surface of one of the acts of the enormities that we would consider sinful and we should stay away from. Now, if you know, there's 17 enormities in total, but you know, the, uh, according to, again, our, our scholars, they've counted 17. And then you know the order of what is the gravest of sins, right? Shirk, associating partners with Allah, obviously murder, uh, you know, anything that's deserving of capital punishment, these types of things are sinful, but then there's other sins as well. So, <clears throat> When we say to make toba, right, which is, um, sorry, let me go back to the other document I was at. When it says here to repent from all things unlawful or offensive, right, <clears throat> and it says very clearly, um, uh, you know, uh, sorry, that that first section, what it's telling us is that we have to be willing to look at the blemishes of our own character and be willing to face it, not make excuses, call a spade a spade, as they say. Be like, yeah, all the billah, I have committed a lot of offensive and uh, sinful things. I, I've, I've done a lot, and may Allah forgive me. I have lied, I have uh, cheated, I have, uh, you know, um, done things that are unethical, whatever it is. You just keep going through the list. And this is a very internal, inward spiritual process. But the point of it is that you are facing your reality. You're humbling yourself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're beseeching him, asking him to forgive you. And you are hyper aware of his grace. Because ultimately, when we are in the doing the exercise of tawbah, that's really what it's about. It's that you come to that realization of how much grace Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to give you despite how sinful you are. Right. So then and then that turns into what this overwhelming desire to please him, you know, gratitude, this feeling of indebtedness, this feeling of I want to be better. I want to better myself because I am undeserving. Right. But I think that's why it's so it's very um, telling that, you know, he starts off the list of things that will take us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala proximity, have marifa, have, have that knowledge of him with Toba, like do the cleanse first, purge, do it all, get yourself in the right state of mind, which is humility. And now it's being proactive in a different direction, which is seeking sacred knowledge, right? So after you do the Toba and it's sincere and you know the steps of Toba, right? You admit uh, that, you know, you acknowledge what you're doing is, is sinful. You seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then inshallah, you vow to never repeat those things again. And you don't, you know, those are the conditions of a sincere Toba. So when you do that, then you move on to the next uh, topic here, which he says is seeking sacred knowledge in accordance with one's needs. So wherever you are on the path, you need to know what is the next step, right? Because we are all students of knowledge. And just because you attain a certain level of mastery in one area or understanding doesn't mean that your job is done and that you're suddenly graduated from learning. You know, we are lifelong learners. So from the cradle to the grave, we're supposed to be learning. So you then 
uh, start to, you know, figure out, do you need to work on aqidah? Do you, you have fiqh areas of fiqh where you are negligent or just not aware? Have you learned the, how to read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? This is, these are all fardain. These are the obligatory, among uh, what the obligatory knowledge is that every Muslim will be held accountable for. Um, <clears throat> So you have to know these things. And then Imam al-Ghazali also believed that purification of the heart was part of also the Fadl'ayn. You had to be doing this work constantly because, you know, again, the whole objective is that we reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having worked on ourselves. So um, all of this is to say that each person is going to have to figure out what area of knowledge they need to uh, to gain for themselves, right? So then, <clears throat> sorry, one second. So then um, the next thing he mentions here is maintaining ritual purity. This is incredibly <laughs> important. Um, if it's not obvious to all of us yet, I don't know when it will be. Uh, you know, we know what month it is. This is the month of uh, one of the uh, diseases of the heart, something that we should never be celebrating. But subhanAllah, ironically, it is being, it is a month of celebration and they, are celebrating something that we believe to be a disease and not something, not a virtue whatsoever, but a vice, pride. But what comes with pride in today's world is also um, a degree of uh, depravity that is really hard to even imagine that these things are done in public spaces. I mean, just today I was um, accosted, my eyeballs were accosted on Twitter looking at my newsfeed because people are outraged by some of these quote unquote family friendly uh, pride parades that are happening all over the country in major cities in Los Angeles this weekend, for example. There was a horrific, truly horrific display, despicable on every level, of sex acts being performed in front of you know children. Why am I mentioning this? Because there is a demonic realm. And if you're not aware that these demons, uh, Shaltina al ins are very real, they exist. They're in plain sight now. You know, there was a time where these are shadowy figures that lurked in, you know, in, in the darkness because socially it was not acceptable to be engaged in this type of depravity. But we've come, you know, unfortunately, so far uh, in, in the worst way possible from that, that now people are very open, very proud of their debauchery and their depravity, and they don't care if it offends you, if it's disgusting to you, because they are very proud of what they do. And so the demonic realm is, we believe in the unseen, the ghayb is very, it's part of our aqidah to believe that these things are real, the angelic and the demonic. And in order to protect ourselves, in order to shield ourselves from the effects and the proximity of the demonic realm, we have been given the gift, the absolute gift of wudu. Wudu uh, prepares you for spiritual ritual worship, alhamdulillah, but it also is like a barrier. It's a shield. It's a protective bubble, you could say, a spiritual protective bubble that when you maintain it, it invites the light. It invites the angelic realm. The angels are actually drawn to us when we are in a state of wudu. So to maintain your wudu, there is great hikmah in that. And you know, just to prove how these things are all connected, right? Um, the mind, the body, the soul. When we are maintaining our wudu actively, one of the ways that we have to do that is control the stomach, right? So your food intake and your drink intake actually is impacting, is impacted by the niya to maintain ritual purity. You can't go on, you know, drinking abundantly or eating all the time if you want to maintain your, your wudu. You have to actually start to structure your day according to, uh, you know, where, first of all, where you are, how much, you know, what type of access you have to a restroom. So it, it involves much more than just being in a state of wudu. And that's why it's so amazing because you think like, oh, okay, it's just a matter of splashing water on your on different limbs, and that's all it is. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us these gifts uh, of in our worship, will do his worship, in order for us to benefit in all of the ways. It's it, there's many ways that we benefit. So will do helps us in that way as well. When we maintain ritual purity, we so let's let's go over some of these. First, 
We are protected from the evil, right? The, the demonic realm, both the shayateen and ins and inshallah, the, the, the jinn. So that just the negative energy, we, we inshallah will create, uh, foster a more uh, positive uh, shielded force field, you could say around us uh, for that. B, it'll help us to control our appetites, right? So you get the benefit of being more control of yourself so that you're not drinking everything and eating everything in sight. Three, you are prepared for any act of worship. If the time comes and you wanted to immediately fall into prostration and make a sajda shukran, for example, mashallah, you can do that. If you needed to read Quran, read dua, open the Quran to, to read something, you can do that. If you wanted to do many things in a state of wudu because you're already facilitated, do extra nafila, whatever it is, do dhikr, do salawat. The fact that you're already in a state of wudu, this pre, uh, you know, uh, prerequisite to our much of our worship, but you're already in it, becomes a means of facilitating it, right? Because if you think about a lot of people who have, because you know, I have worked with individuals who have a difficulty maintaining prayer, a lot of the times it's not the prayer itself; it's the wudu that becomes the source. Uh, that that causes you know some difficulty or challenge because they're at work, they're at school, um, they they have issues you know with with the whole wudu process or there's there's not enough time in their 15 minute lunch break or whatever it is. So the constraints that affect a person's prayer are usually tied to wudu. So again, if the, you take this as a niya that I'm going to try my best to maintain ritual purity as often as I possibly can. Inshallah, you will reap the benefits in all of these ways and much more. As we know, the Prophet ﷺ will recognize the believers on the Day of Judgment on the basis of how much wudu we do. Our limbs will be illuminated according to the amount of wudu that we do and the effort that we put in in that. So the more wudu, the better. And I always, I've taught my kids and I'm very intentional about it myself. Uh, alhamdulillah, especially for those of us who have the luxury and the privilege to work from home. That if you use the restroom, uh, you make wudu immediately after. Don't fall into this habit of just leaving the restroom without wudu. Uh, just do it. And you'll become so habituated to it that you don't even think twice. There's no thought that comes to your mind about it because you've you know, habituated to it. And if you teach your children from a young age to do these things, inshallah, they won't be so resistant to prayer. But when they're not habituated to wudu and then you want them to suddenly be praying five times a day, it becomes a, this, you know, tug of war every time. Get up and pray. Ah, why? Why are we doing that? We're working against, you know, uh, our own, you know, I mean, we're working uh, uh, counter um, to 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 our nature. We're lazy by nature. The nafs is very lazy. So we are uh, lazy. Excuse me. So we have to. We have to know how to go around the nafs. And that's why uh, this is important. So he says, maintaining ritual purity. And then, so these are all intentions, right? You want to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make tawbah, start to seek knowledge, maintain your wudu. Then the next thing he says is perform the obligatory prayers in the first of their time. And if it's possible in congregation, right? If you're able to do it um, in jama'ah, if, you, if your family is with you, do it in Jama because it's always best, right? The pray, the family that prays together stays together. These are the 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 you know words that we hear to incentivize family prayer. Very important that we do that, um, and then to try to get it in at the very onset when it comes in. So, you know, I was gifted. May Allah bless uh, Dr. Sada, one of our wonderful community members locally. She gifted um, me with this awesome clock. Um, what is it called? Oh gosh, I forgot the name of it, but it's an Adhan clock and I love it. And I told her, I love you for this gift because the Adhan goes on every day, all five days and it's beautiful. And then there's the, the Dua right afterwards. So we're, you know, my children have learned the Dua. Everything is just so, um, we're, we're able to do our prayers right away because of it. Uh, so Adhan clocks that are 
easy and affordable to get. You put them in the house. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of when does prayer come in? That's why they make them. Uh, obviously, you can use your apps too for the same function. Whatever is easy for you, just figure it out. But be that person who's like, oh, prayer came in. I want to do it now. I'm not going to constantly procrastinate the prayer because how many of us have missed prayers? right? You have the need to do it, but then you get engrossed into your project. You know, you got to work assignment. You got to do, you got to, if you're a teacher, you're grading papers, you're reading, you're doing something, you're cooking, you go to make uh, lunch thinking I'm going to be able to, you know, finish this quickly, but then guess what? Lunch uh, gets, takes two hours and then there's cleanup and then the kids have an accident and now you're cleaning up a mess and then, oh, oops, there's some package at the door. And now I got to check this and We are the most distractible creatures. We're so distractible. It's part of our nature, part of the dunya. So what have you done? Because you had an opportunity at a window to pray, but your nafs, shaitan sometimes maybe, likely it's your nafs, convinced you to to wait, you know, to do it later. Now you're in that horrible predicament where you realize it's six o'clock, the adhan for asr goes off and you're like, oh my God. I didn't pray the Hari Allah, forgive me, astaghfirullah. And that guilt just eats you away. It ruins your day. That's how it should be anyway, which is a good, just to mention this because, you know, we talked about this today in, in my class with the seventh graders. When you miss a prayer, if the guilt isn't eating you, there's a problem. When you miss a prayer, there should be the immediate remorse self-loathing that comes with it if especially if it's negligence right Uh, we're forgetful we're negligent whatever the case is it doesn't matter actually it shouldn't matter why you missed the prayer the fact that you missed it should still put you in a in a state of almost like a panicked state where you want to rush to do your qada you seek forgiveness from allah and you truly show remorse but there are because i know i've worked with people where shaitan can get us to the point of apathy. So you missed your prayer, you fudge your alarm clock goes off. And I've, you know, with people who are close to me, they know, you know, my positions on these things. Um, But if there's like even four minutes, three minutes left for fudger and you've just woken up, you better jump out of that bed. You better run to the bathroom and make the fastest will do that you possibly can and get on that prayer mat in total uh, sense of desperation before Allah. But for some people, the idea that you look at the clock and you're like, oh man, I got three minutes left to fudger. I can't make will do in that time. It's okay. I'll just, oh well. And then you carry on and you start going to your social media and checking emails. This is fully like, this is not acceptable. And that is dangerous spiritually because what you're showing is, you, you know, this is a fault. This is why we're created. We're created to worship Allah. But you're showing, you're demonstrating a lack of remorse, a lack of guilt. Um, and there's just no accountability. There's no, and just think of it on a human level. Like if, if someone crossed you, if someone betrayed you, if someone hurt you, if someone didn't fulfill something that they were supposed to fulfill for you, it's very interesting how we are unforgiving when people do wrong, do us wrong. You know, we get mad and we are expecting some, at least some, you know, uh, mea culpa, you know, some guilt, Come to me and show me that you feel bad. Show me an an iota of remorse, of regret, of sorrow, of guilt. And maybe I'll feel better because you know what? At least you feel bad about it and I'll deal with forgiving you. But if you are, if someone hurts you and wrongs you and does all that, but then they just are carrying on, they don't have any show of remorse Trust me, none of us will accept it. We'll be, we'll flip our lid. We'll just, we'll be even more angrier. So the idea that we miss a prayer and then don't show remorse is really reprehensible. We should absolutely uh, feel the guilt right away and then seek the path of penitence, whatever we can do immediately. Offset a wrong, right? This is what the Prophet said. If you do a wrong action, offset it with the right action. Get up and do it. Even if you're late, even if it's 
qada, just do it and beg Allah and inshallah you'll be fine. It's much better to do that. But in order to avoid that whole you know, scene from unfolding, when we're being in, encouraged you know, by our teachers, of course, and our great scholars, because they know, and of course, it's a sunnah of the Prophet to do the prayer at its earliest time. It's because we are circumventing the nafs. We're going around the nafs. The nafs is, is lazy. It's forgetful. So just do it. Make it your, you know, rule for yourself. Inshallah, you'll, you'll uh, seek, you know, you'll, you'll prevent um, these other scenarios from happening. Then he says, Adhering to the eight rakah of the mid-morning prayer, duha, and the six rakah after the sunset prayer and before the night prayer, between Asr and Maghrib, performing the night prayers, right? So these are all the extra nawafila that we can do during the day, also from the sunnah. And each madhab might have different formulas of when to do when. But the point is, is to be people that once you establish your five daily prayers, that you now want to elevate to the next level. You know, it's interesting, right? Because... Uh, life is obviously not a game, but, um, you know, if you play video games, for example, it's all about getting to the next level. You don't just stay at the same level once you do really well, right? You go to the next level. So we understand it when we are in these, you know, every day-to-day -day scenarios, but in our spiritual life, we have to be reminded that, yeah, good for you. You're doing your baseline, you know, worship, alhamdulillah, but you need to seek to do more. So now that you've gotten your five daily prayers done and you're reading your Quran, you have your daily dhikr of time, you're doing all those good, check all of them on your you know checklist. Now let's level up. How do you level up? You do the extra prayers. You do these extra sunnah prayers, naf nafila prayers. And then, you know, he mentions, um, yes, the, so I kind of bl blended them all together, but he separates these extra uh, nafila prayers as one section. And then he mentions performing the night prayers after awaking from one sleep. So you, again, these, this is the way that you level up. You do your, your, your faraid, you do your sunnah, you do your nafila. And then inshallah, once you get really um, into a routine with these extra acts of worship, now it's about sacrifice, right? The hajjud. It comes from the same root as what? Mujahada, right? Or jihad, struggle. You are struggling. Why? Because you're leaving the bed. It's very comfortable to sleep, uh, to be resting, warm, cold, whatever, uh, you know, climate you're in, to feel the comfort of your bed, um, and to just lay there dreaming all sorts of wonderful dreams, hopefully. It's very nice. And most people love sleep. A lot of people love sleep. But when you get to the level of spiritual, um, you know, the path of, as we say, there's the path of salvation, right? Our teachers remind us the path of salvation, which is basically baseline. I just want to do whatever it takes to get me to the door of Jannah to get into the Jannah. Like, let me get in. That's one path. But inshallah, we should graduate from that, that path to the path of sanctification, which is I want to be close to Allah. I don't want to just get into the door of Jannah. I want to get to the highest level of Jannah. And in order to get to the highest level of Jannah, you have to know the this, this specific acts that the Prophet ﷺ taught us to do that will bring us closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And tahajjud is absolutely amongst the greatest acts of worship. This, the Prophet ﷺ, of course, did it every night. Um, it was obligatory for him. And, you know, it was his sunnah to do it every night, but he did not make it obligatory for us. Uh, however, um, if we do it, the benefits that even just praying to rakah, there's, it's untold, there's really no way to quantify or qualify or express the the rewards because they're they're only known to Allah. But one thing that we know uh, is that it is a, the time for du'a mustajab. So if you think about all the needs that you have, all the pain that you're carrying, all the grief that you're carrying, all the sorrow that you feel, all of these, this weight on your heart and soul that you are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, uncertainty, right? A lot of people are 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 feeling so heavy. Uh, spiritually because of anxiety or depression or sadness, whatever the case is, when you think and understand the power of the hajjud, the hajjud is 
taking all of your problems, taking all that, that burden that's on your soul and just bearing your, your soul before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking him to bring you light and to remove your burdens. That's the power of tahajjud. Um, and there's, again, so many benefits. I remember reading one scholar who said that one of the gifts of tahajjud is actually protection from illness, like, you know, uh, disease, you know, like, uh, you know, real, real serious diseases. So it actually can also help you in the physical, you know, material body, even though it's a great spiritual um, effort and act. Uh, and just, you know, to be up in that hour, that very special time of the morning where everyone else is asleep and you have that intimate time with Allah. Um, again, we can't really express, but we know from, from the hadith and the descriptions that the hajjid is a very special time. And if you are a person who's dealing with a lot in your life, or you have worries about your children, you know, I spoke to a mother today who's just riddled with constant anxiety over her children. I got another message earlier, which I haven't yet responded to the same thing about a mother panicking that her daughter has a horrible, um, she's now, you know, with the wrong friends group, she's smoking weed, she's doing a lot of haram that she couldn't, she can't believe that her daughter is doing these things because this was not, you know, our babies grow up and all of a sudden you're just shocked, right? How many of you, who have children have had that experience, these little pure beings of light that brighten up your day that you think could never disappoint you because they're so sweet and so loving. But then they enter the adolescence uh, age, which is a very complicated age, very difficult age. And then in this day and age, especially trying to forge an identity is so difficult for our poor youth that they, they're going to go through some, some rough patches. But, you know, parents are are dealing with this fear and this crippling sense of uh, doom and gloom that just like, Oh my God, something's going to happen. So some, some, I'm going to get news, something that I don't want to hear. Um, and that can really affect you. Well, if that's your reality and you're not sacrificing your sleep to, to ask Allah subhanahu wa to change your circumstances, to bring you ease, to guide your children, to protect your children, to protect your family from harm, then you, there's a disconnect there because who else is going to change your condition? Who else? You can go to all, you can knock on every therapist's door on the planet. You can go to every sheikh, sheikh, ustad, ustad, whoever. You can go to every single person on the planet for help. But if you don't knock on the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regularly, fervently, passionately, uh, with conviction that only He will change your circumstances, there is a disconnect there. And likely, what will happen, unfortunately, is you will not see the change because you're not going to the right source. So we have to really train or retrain our brain to know the protocol of when you're in a state of desperation and panic, go to your Lord and wake up, leave the bed, set the alarm. Who cares if even if you have to go to work uh, with one eye open and cranky you know, on coffee, it's okay if you do that periodically, because guess what? Your body will adjust. And th this is also, sorry, I just have to mention this because I feel like the science, right, that has um, convinced so many people that things are fixed um, has also conditioned us to think that, oh my God, if I don't, uh, you know, drink eight glasses of water, for example, a day, or if I don't get eight to 10 hours of sleep a day, I'm going to collapse and die. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. And I think, you know, a lot of these things, there's, there, these are campaigns. These are, you know, there's, there's reasons why these things have been, you know, perpetuated or, or spread, uh, you know, through our, through, through me, the different mediums that we've, we're exposed to. But I think we just have to look at the precedent, you know, and many of our great scholars were known to be people who were up at night the one third of the night was for worship. And what they did is they uh, they certainly compensated. So if they needed rest, what would they do? They would sleep during the day. The qilula, as we know, which is the nap that the Prophet ﷺ took during the midday is something that you can certainly do. And it's a re, it's a reset. It's a power uh, you know, nap um, that can reset you. That can really refresh you. Um, but your body can also adapt. And I, I mentioned this before, but it really is 
important to mention. Look into sleep training. You know, we, we talk about sleep training children. You can also sleep train adults. If you understand the REM cycles of sleep, like, you know, I, I went into this deep research because I really wanted to understand. And alhamdulillah, I have benefited from it. One and a half hours. If you can get one and a half hours cycles of sleep, which are how we uh, we enter the REM, that really deep, important state of sleep, you can train yourself to not rely on uh, a lot of sleep because you're getting quality sleep. So it's really more about the quality, not necessarily the quantity. But anyway, do your own independent research. Don't take my word for it. Uh, talk to your doctors, but don't be convinced that you have to, because you become a slave to sleep, then it becomes very difficult to implement this. But if you can readjust your understanding and say, you know what? Allah, first of all, is the one who gives rest and repose. So if I'm waking up to worship him and I also work full time and I have children to take care of, but I ask him to fortify me, to give me rest, to give me strength, to be able to continue to worship him uh, as best as I can and continue to manage my responsibilities, of course he'll do it. He'll give you full rest. Um, and, you know, again, I've, I've had experiences where, alhamdulillah, wa shukrillah, I've gone days, uh, you know, sometimes on very little sleep because of different, you know, objectives and things that you're trying to do. You pull those all-nighters. And then, subhanAllah, Allah will give you this incredible sleep that is so refreshing. It's like you enter a different realm. And you do, you know, the sleep is it's the little brother of death for a reason because it's a very soul experience. It's a soulful experience. And so Allah can restore you um, in ways that you just don't know. But my point is, is the hajjid is a very important part of getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you want that, if you want to feel more spiritually strong, like you just, you're, you feel like there's something missing, don't neglect the hajjid, you know, do it. So then he says, uh, after the hajjid and, and, and encouraging, and he says specifically after waking from one's sleep. So he's trying to, you know, nudge that point a little bit uh, that you're going to have to abandon your sleep. Then he says, fulfill the witr prayer, right? Which is obviously also a sunnah um, in the Hanafi madhab. It's, it's wajib to do the witr prayer. Uh, and I'm sure it is in, in some of the others as well, but it is something that you should never abandon. Um, and then fasting on Mondays and Thursdays and on the three days of the full moon. Uh, so this is an important uh, spiritual practice for those who are able to do it. You know, if you're able to fast regularly um, to do it. And I know, I, you know, I, I do a lot of intermittent fasting. I I'm trying to get myself to this level of being able to fast monthly. I know people who are close to me, who mashallah, they do it every week and they, you know, it's, it's just, it's a practice. So once you get good at it, it becomes second nature. It's not difficult to do. Uh, and so alhamdulillah, but even with intermittent fasting, the benefits are so incredible. Like you feel it, you feel much more clear of mind, much more lighter, everything just kind of falls into place. So a lot to say about fasting. We just finished Ramadan. So you all know it is real. It's true. And then also the days of the year in which fasting is recommended, right? So uh, we'll be inshallah for the day of Arafah, for example, um, and other days that are coming in the year that we know uh, those are always announced, you know, to, to, to fast during those times. Then he mentions reciting the Quran with the heart's presence coupled with reflection upon its meanings. So he's giving us all the ways that we can get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we're doing all of these things, right? Where, um, and I'm just gonna run down the list for those who are joining. Uh, so we repent first. You start off with Tawbah. Make Tawbah, be sincere. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you for all of your sinfulness. Then start to seek knowledge because you can't you move forward if you don't even know which direction to go to, right? So knowledge is really about you know, laying out the, the, the plan ahead and following it and then maintaining ritual purity. So ma maintaining your wudu for all the reasons we mentioned, protection from the demonic realm and uh, the ability to, uh, to just be able to jump into acts of worship with ease. You attract the, the light of the angelic realm. Inshallah, the marks of our wudu will be the reason why the Prophet is able to recognize us we can go on and on and on. We'll do uh, literally cleanses your sins. So much to say about we'll do, but maintaining ritual purity is really important. Performing the obligatory prayers in the first time. So as soon as the prayer comes in, you do it. You don't procrastinate. And if you're able to do it in congregation, also doing your sunnah prayers, any whatever madhab you follow, that that will the formulas will slightly vary. 
Then also doing tahajjud, which we spent some time talking about. You can go back if you just joined us, but the importance and weight of tahajjud. And then the witr prayer, fasting, all of the days that are recommended that were the sunnah of the Prophet And now he gets to um, the, the point of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is what we all really need to understand if we want to make sense of the insanity of the world, our place in the world, how to navigate all the rapid changes that are happening and all the things that we talked about, the anxieties, the depression, the sadness, the dysfunctions, the feelings of betrayal, whatever it is you're going through, your answer is in the Quran because it's all there. You know, and this is, you know, again, our, our teachers, I mean, mashallah, if you if you followed any of the series that many of our teachers have done on the Quran, where they go into deep dive into tafsir, and they really do highlight that the stories of the prophets, right? The Quran, of course, has the best stories, but the stories of the prophets, many of them align and they reflect real human problems. So even though they were, you know, alive thousands of years ago, in many cases more, Allah knows, um, it doesn't mean that human problems have evolved to such a different degree that they're unrelatable. That's actually not true. You will see all sorts of things in the Quran, in the Quranic stories, things that we're experiencing right now today. Um, and so when you read the Quran and as he mentions here, right? So you, first of all, reciting the Quran, you need to learn how to recite. So this is now also one of the farlain which we mentioned. Um, you know, learning tajweed is very important. You have to know how to recite the book of Allah. You can't just pick it up and apply your own um, articulation to it without studying the maharaj of the huruf, the, the way that the letters are recited or the actual rules of tajweed. It doesn't work. You have to learn, and you can't learn that on your own. Tajweed requires a teacher because many of the rules need to be modeled for you. You need to, it's an oral science. You have to hear it. And then you have to repeat and replicate and 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 um and and then you know learn learn according to uh to, to how your teacher is teaching you. So learning the the how to recite the Quran. And then he says the qualifiers matter because you know the, our teachers didn't leave you know they 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 weren't ambiguous with their words. They're very specific in choice. So he's telling us to recite the Quran with the heart's presence. So you have to be paying attention with your heart. You have to really feel it. So when you read the book of Allah with your heart's presence, you know you're inshallah you find first of all um and I I this is what I would recommend, I think it's really important that you uh, recite, you know, learn how to recite, but also find a reciter whose heart, whose recitation appeals to you. Um, and mashallah, there's plenty of amazing reciters, both male and female. If you're not familiar with the Qariya app, I highly recommend that you get it. This is from uh, Sheikh Maryam Amir, who mashallah created the Qariya app. She's on there herself, but she has mashallah tabarakallah gathered reciters, female reciters from all over the world to provide, you know, their voice in order to connect us with the Book of Allah. And then, of course, many male popular reciters, which we know of uh, from the past as well as the present. So the point is, is find someone who, when you hear them recite, the hairs on your the back of your neck or your arms are raised. That's the kind of reciter you want. You want someone who is like a punch to the heart. And Allah has given uh, his abid, his his servants, this ability because we've all been there. I mean, it's even been recorded non-Muslims who don't even know the words that are being said. They don't have any connection to the language. You will see plenty of YouTube pages of people hearing Quran for the first time, bawling in tears. They're moved because it is undeniably, it's the words of Allah. What do we expect? But then because. Uh, the words of Allah beautify the voices, right? Uh, and there's a different interpretation of how the, that particular verse in the Quran is understood. You know, do we, are we supposed to beautify our voices with the Quran or are our voices beautified by the Quran? Both cases are true. We should give our best performance when we recite the book of Allah. And of course, we can't do that without a proper teacher. So he's telling us to recite with proper recitation with heart's presence. And you can do that if you connect yourself to someone who you just enjoy the recitation, when you hear them, you feel something, right? So now you're on the right track. You're, the Quran is transformed from what could be a very dry, 
uh, subject, right? Uh, that doesn't have, that isn't really affecting your heart to something that's bringing your heart to life, right? In this way. And then you reflect upon its meanings. So now you have to have tafsir, you have to have a source, whether it's online or a book that you can look up meanings. So it's beyond the translation even, because sometimes translations are limited, you know, there and there's plenty of them, but a tafsir is more, it gives you the back end um, of it. There's stories like uh, for, for this class on Saturday that I was doing on Riba, you know, I was reading the tafsir of Surah Al-Hujurat and it's incredible. Uh, just the first, if you read, you know, the, 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 I think it's sort of, yeah, verse number 12 that talks about, you know, the prohibition against, uh, you know, eating the dead flesh of your brother of Riba, but just reading the tafsir and the meanings of the very first 11 verses and why they were revealed and the context, because this was a Medina and Surah, it was revealed to the uh, to the Muslims who had, you know, the Ansar and the Muhajirin who are now cohabiting. And they, and a lot of the Ansar needed guidance on rules because they had embraced Islam, but they didn't, they were rough around the edges. So they needed guidance on things, for example, like not raising their voice above the Prophet Sallallahu speaking to the Prophet Sallallahu with decorum, right? Um, and then even, you know, I believe there was an exchange between Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar, who they became very ruckus, you know, uh, having this uh, disputa disputation and, and, it, and it upset the Prophet ﷺ. And so there was a lot of correction that was being made. But just all of that you get reading the tafsir of Surah Al-Hujurat. So it gives you a much deeper appreciation for the context of the verse that now it, it's like you're almost seeing a movie come to life, right? Because when you see these conversations that are happening, um, and I'll give you an example. Let me let me read to you because I want you to really understand the power of tafsir. So let me see if I can pull the very verses that I was reading from because uh, I was just amazed. I said, subhanAllah, you know, the thing is, is I my problem is I have a memory problem. So I... I've read some of this before, but you know, it's not always to retain it. I have a hard time retaining. So when I re read something, um, it almost is like I'm reading it for the first time. Although I know I've read these things before, but here, here, this is verse number two of Surah Al-Hajarat is, oh, you who believe, do not raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, nor address him in the manner that you address one another lest your deeds come to naught while you are unaware. Okay, so that's the verse, the translation of the verse. Now let's look at the tafsir. What is this? Why was this verse revealed? Right, what's the significance of this verse? This verse was reportedly revealed in response to an argument be between Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Allah, radiallahu anhum. Each favored a different individual for the honor of receiving a delegation from an outlying tribe. Their quarreling in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ was so loud that his voice was drowned out, at which God revealed this verse, nor address him in the, in the manner that you address one another. So imagine, and I just, I, to me when I was reading this, I was imagining the scene. These are the two best friends of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi And sometimes we get heated, right? So they're, they're human. And I think we forget that they're human. So they're dis disputing over which man should receive this delegation that's coming from another tribe. And they're starting to argue, argue, and the voices are raised to the point that what? The Prophet Sallallahu voice is drowned out. That means he's talking. So I was imagining, I'm like, oh my God, they became so involved in this you know, heated discussion that they were actually speaking over the Prophet said, who was trying to speak. So he was probably giving his advice or somehow trying to calm them down, but Audubilla, they didn't hear him. And so then I was like, just imagining, you know, how they must have felt when this verse was revealed and the tafsir was told to them. Can you imagine? Like you see that, so now it's like, you start to humanize these Sahaba who are of course human beings, but we tend to not have, we, we have so much formality uh, with them, which we should, but I mean to say like, we forget that they have these moments of humanity as well. And so then 
It says here, so nor address them in the manner that you address one another speaks primarily to new members of the Muslim polity who had taken an attitude of excessive familiarity with the Prophet. They should not call him by name Muhammad, but by his title, Messenger of God or Prophet of God. So imagine some of the new Muslims who had come into the Ummah, right? This is in the Medinan period, were so relaxed with the Prophet that they were just calling him Muhammad. Like out of that again, you know, this is um it's something that you you know you want to just kind of imagine uh you know at, at that time and place, it's understandable. You know, they're 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 not they don't have all this adab, they haven't been taught how to maintain adab. So the protocols they're learning through these verses, right? And then um there's another story here as well. Oh, so look, I have number four. SubhanAllah. So ayah number four of Surah Al-Hujurat is truly those who call thee from behind the apartments, most of them understand not. So it's like, what does that mean, right? There's a story to it. Here it is. A group of Bedouin reportedly came to the Prophet while he was sleeping and shouted for him to come out from his apartment. They, they didn't know. So they're disrupting his sleep. He's asleep, subhanAllah. It's just shocking, right? They did not know in which of his wife's apartments he was sleeping. So they went behind each apartment. So not only do they disrupt his sleep, they're disrupting all of the, their wife, the wife's sleep. Ya Allah. So they went behind each apartment and called to the Prophet in a crude manner, right? One, one of them, Aqra ibn Habis, reported that he called he had called out so it's his report he said just imagine this okay oh muhammad verily my praise is sweet and my curse is bitter to which the prophet responded only god is like that and then this verse was revealed so this is the power of tafsir it gives you the context and you're just like wow so this man had the audacity to speak to the Prophet so I said him that way. It's a threat. It's a veiled threat, isn't it? If I tell you that my praise is sweet, but my curse is bitter, that is a veiled threat. But this is the degree that these, and may Allah forgive them. We have to keep in mind, these are new Muslims. So we're not a astaghfirullah, you know, casting any judgment on them. It's just the idea of this happening should be like, wow, you know, it's kind of shocking, right? That, so the Prophet was, was spoken um, like this or to, uh, to, uh, to him like this. But also look at how beautifully he responded. You know, he didn't get mad. He didn't, uh, how dare you speak to me in this way? He is exhibiting constantly beautiful character, even when he's being treated this way, when he's being mis mistreated and misspoken to in this way. He's teaching. So what did he teach them? Only God is like that. You don't have the right to speak about yourself in this way. That is God's domain, right? But this is what, when we say, when, when you know, Imam Noe is reminding us to recite the Quran with the heart's presence, coupled with reflection upon its meanings, it's this depth. And you have to want to do it. You can't, you have to seek it. You have to see the benefit of it because, uh, you know, if you have to be, this is not, this is a matter of your own, um, you know, betterment, like, you, you, you know, your own understanding will be improved if you do this. Nobody else is benefiting from reading the Quran with depth other than you. So you have to see the, the worth of that and then seek it, inshallah. Um, and then he goes on to say, uh, frequently asking uh, Allah subhanahu for forgiveness, istighfar, or istighfar. So you read the Quran with presence, and then you also make sure that when you're doing all this, because it's normal, as we said, if you start to do all of these things on this list, and it's a very lofty list, you know, it seems like it's a tall order, but over time, it's not as difficult as it sounds. If you do it all at once, obviously, it's going to seem difficult, but you kind of have to look at this incrementally and gradually. But if you do this, you don't want to fall into a state of stagnation or which he already addressed in the foundations itself where you start to be riddled with spiritual disease like arrogance or just self-righteousness that can come from, uh, you know, being so, um, you know, on top of everything. Like if you're really on top of your worship, you can fall into a state of self-righteousness. So how do you prevent that or protect yourself from that? You seek forgiveness. You constantly see yourself as a sinner. 
as a person who's making mistakes all the time, whether they're it's act, outwardly actively doing haram or being negligent in areas that you should be better at making, you know, we all make mistakes. So istighfar is uh, just a process that everybody should, should be doing regardless of their uh, their age or their experience. Maintaining prayers and blessings upon the Prophet he mentions, uh, peace be upon him. And finally, adhering to the meritorious invocations of the morning and the evening that have come to us from the sunnah, adhkar al-sabah wa al-masa. So this is uh, you know, a nutsh- in uh, you know, in, a, in in the most simplest terms, you know, in a nutshell, what uh, Imam Anawi advises for those who seek to be close to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and for those again who are on uh, the Zoom call, I do have on Instagram. If you go to my second post, you will see. Um, how to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala counsel from Imam al nawawi It's the second post on my feed. You'll see it. This is it that I took from this specific list and I put it together so that we can see it um, as, you know, I like visual lists. I feel like sometimes it makes it easier to follow. So feel free to use these, but this is all from this particular segment of the foundations of the spiritual path. Alhamdulillah. So um, let's see here. I just want to check the time. I'm sorry. Sometimes I forget where I am. Wow, I have completely lost my page. Oh, there I am. Okay. So alhamdulillah. Now, I was ambitious, I think. Ustada Fadwa, are you going to be upset with me? Because this next section is long. And I just realized today's our last class. It's supposed to be our last class. The next section is the Council of Sidi Ahmed Zarruq. Um, I don't know if I can do this in 30 minutes, but I think we were supposed to do a, a one and a half hour class. I can read through it and try to limit my commentary. Uh, what do you think? Do, if you're here, do you think we should just jump into it and try to get through through this? And those of you who are on Instagram, do you want to go? It's, up, it's up to you. If you feel like you want to take another session, of course, you're more than welcome to. Um, if you feel like you want to stop here, or you want to rush through it. Whatever, you're in charge. <laughs> you're so sweet. I just feel bad. I keep telling all of you that we're going to have a last class. And then I realized like, wow, that one little section took so long. Um, let me just see what I can do in like, like maybe 10 minutes. If I can get through a good chunk of this, then maybe we can get to the finish line. If not, then I'm sorry. We're going to have to do one more class. I hope you guys are okay with that, inshallah. But let's look at this next section. So what I just read, for those of you who are on Instagram, is a small excerpt from uh, Imam Anawi's of Maqasid where he advises on how to get close to Allah. And it's done. That section is finished. Now, in the foundations document is another council. So we already, the entire document was the council from Sidi Ahmed Zirup, but now it's more. And so it's just additional information that will help us. So let's, let's jump into this. And this is from Sheikh Hamza. He says, Finally, we add an extraordinary counsel from Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, may Allah sanctify his secret, taken from his two books, The Poor Man's Book of Assistance, Kitab al Ayana, and The Principles of Tasawwuf, Qawa'ad al Tasawwuf. So it is as follows. Follows, excuse me. <clears throat> now, this is also Sidi Ahmed Zarruq speaking. No, may Allah subhanahu give you and us success. Um, no, may Allah give you and us success, rectify our worldly and otherworldly lives, and grant us adherence to the way of truth in our journeys and our sojourns, that repentance, toba, is a key. Piety, taqwa, is vast, and uprightness is the source of rectification. So know these things, right? He's telling us we know we have to know toba, taqwa, and being upright, right? Uh, having uprightness and righteousness. All of these things are um, ways to, re- uh, to rectify our souls. Furthermore, a servant is never free of blunders, shortcomings, or lassitude. Lassitude is like taking things way too easy, right? So we're always going to struggle with these things because we have nafus. We talked about this, right? The nafs al is inherently within all of us, this, this you know, ability to fall, right? We fall short. We do good, and then we fall short. So we struggle against ourselves for that reason. Therefore, now is the advice. Because of that, because of all these things, 
what we have to be watch out for. Therefore, never be neglectful of repentance. Never turn away from the act of returning to Allah. And never neglect acts that bring you closer to Allah. So we already talked about the hajjud. We talked about fasting. We talked about dhikr, salawat on the Prophet and the Quran. All those things bring us proximity to Allah. So he's saying, do not avoid those things, right? I have someone asking, what document are we reading from? We're reading from Foundations of the Spiritual Path. If you go to sandala.org, go to media, you will see the document there. It's a long link. Unfortunately, I can't cut and paste it, but it is available through uh, sandala.org, sandal with an A.org. So we are at the end of this document, but basically, again, he's mentioning don't be neglectful of repentance and don't turn away from whatever brings you closer to Allah. So all the things we mentioned, do them. Indeed, anytime you fail to do one of these three things, repent and return. If you are falling short all the time, keep coming back. Keep returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not for a moment think that the door of Kaaba is closed to you because that thought emanates from Iblis. Iblis is the one who puts us in despair. Iblis is the one who comes and tells us you're a lost cause. You're broken. You're damaged. You are horrible. You're inherently evil. There's no hope for you. No matter what, you've made so many mistakes, nobody will forgive you. This is all Iblis. And because he wants us to, to destroy, he's, you know, he wants us to destroy ourselves. And so uh, the way he does that is to basically make us, fill us with hopelessness and despair. This is why Allah uh, tells us very directly, do not despair ever in the mercy of Allah. So anytime you make a mistake, listen and obey, right? If, if you're being corrected uh, by someone who, you care, who cares about you and the nafs is intercepting, it's going to rub you the wrong way. But if what they're saying is true and truthful and you are in the wrong, just listen and obey. Just do what they're, especially if they are spiritually, you know, on the path ahead of you, take their counsel, take, and this could be your spouse. It could be your sibling. It could be your friend. It could be your parent. It could be your teacher, your coworker. But if someone Allah has placed in your life that dispenses good counsel to you and helps you to see your own shortcomings, just listen and obey because inshallah, they're teaching you the right course, right? Anytime you display shortcomings or show lack of enthusiasm, don't desist in your efforts. So don't let your nafs uh, make you feel like it always has, you always have to be on some high. This is not about that at all. We talked about that, right? Lofty uh, spiritual, you know, um, aspirations where you're looking for experiences and emotions before you've even done the work. And I've talked to people, unfortunately, they almost believe, which is again, one of those, you know, the, um, the trappings of shaitan, because he dilute, he, he distorts our understanding. So they believe that in order to pray consistently, I have to feel something to be inspired to the prayer. Right. Um, and you know, some of our uh, brothers in faith of other traditions kind of created that, I think, understanding, right? Like the, I have to feel the spirit within me <laughs> and then I can act, but the spirit, I have to feel it. Well, that is not our faith. And we talked about that extensively. You do what you're obligated to do because you're obedient and you're dutiful and you understand that it's a command of God and he deserves to be worshiped and obeyed. And that's it. Whether or not he fills your soul with light and you start to see the heavens open up and the angels are, are speaking to you is a gift that he may choose to give some of his creation and, or not. But that's not the motivation or the incentive to worship. You do it because you have to do it. So if, if you start to fall short or you just start not feeling as inspired as you did maybe a year ago, because like, you know, many times, for example, new converts or people who've come from Jahiliya, you know, from the darkness into the light, they always reminisce about like, oh, when I first started praying, when I first started doing this, oh my gosh, I was, I was on such a high. I love that feeling. I wish I could recapture that feeling. And it's like, it's not, if it's not that level, it's not even worth doing. 100% an Iblisi thought. That's just Iblis. Discouraging you from doing what you should be doing because he's set up the expectation that there has to be this high of some sort 
in order for it to be worthwhile. And that is just a lie. You do it because you're you're created to do that. That's it. Halas. And as I said, if Allah chooses to give you that, alhamdulillah, if he doesn't, you still do it. Let your main concern be to remove your outward state from your outward state, anything displeasing, and then continue to work on your outward state through, through continuous counsel. So just think of your life as a process of, you know, of basically like we are, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to think of an analogy that kind of makes sense. If you see a sculptor, right, the sculptor who's really meticulous takes their time working through every little inch of the sculpture because they don't want to rush it because once it solidifies and hardens, it's over. You got to start over. So they will take their time and work while with this malleable, you know, substance, right? And we are made of clay. So there is some, some, something there that hopefully it connects, but basically that's how you have to look at it. Like you are your own sculptor and your job or your objective should be in this earthly realm to produce the best version of you. So that's going to require you to be what? Malleable. You cannot harden. If your heart hardens, right? If you're, if you become hard hearted, then you, it's like the, the, the clay that has, you know, gone into the oven or baked or been out in the sun and dried up. You have to start over. It's too difficult. But if you be, remain malleable, which how do you be, stay malleable in a spiritual sense? You always see yourself as a work in progress. You always welcome constructive criticism. You always are open to these things. And this is very relevant today because if you look at our culture, you know, and read the, the coddling of the American mind, read what has happened to our culture where people have become so fragile that you cannot even give them counsel anymore without people falling apart because everything is a personal attack. Everything is perceived uh, as personalized. And this is a cognitive distortion. If, if someone is giving you objective criticism on how to become a better individual, how to be better at something you do or, or enhance your performance in a certain area, they're objectively trying to guide you because maybe they have experience you don't, maybe they've been down the same path. But if you perceive that as some attack on your personhood, you have a cognitive distortion. Your brain is receiving information the wrong way. And if we, because we're in a culture where these things are uh, reinforced so much, right? That everybody's triggered, everybody's offended by everybody. You can't say anything without people literally thinking you're out to kill them now. It's insane. We've, we've become very, very fragile that people no longer are, are becoming better versions of themselves. They're actually regressing. Because if you don't have Adina Nasiha, if you don't have good counsel and good people who are looking out for you, then you become self-deluded, right? The delusions of the nafs, where you start to think you're much better than you are, that you're smarter, that you're more successful, that you're whatever it is that people, you know, put value in because you don't have the counter, uh, you know, narrative or, or, or something to counter whatever your mind is telling you. This is why, you know, it's so important to have social uh, healthy social interactions and relationships where you can get that type of feedback, right? Feedback is important. But the point here is that's how you stay what? Malleable, spiritually speaking, is you're open to advice, you're open to criticism. And if you go back, right? I mean, for those of you who are on the Zoom call, go back to the first foundation. I'm going to review this because it's all connected. We're doing a full circle here, right? Taqwa, mindfulness of Allah. That's the first foundation Sidi Ahmed Zudu calls out in private and in public. You can't be a performer. You know, this isn't about performance. This is about sincerity. So if you're if you're a mutaqi, it's going to show wherever you are, whether you're alone or with your whether you're with people. Adherence to the sunnah in word and deed. You're consistent. You say what's true and you follow it with action, right? You're not just, again, a lip service. It's not lip service. The third point is indifference to whether others accept or reject you. 
That's a foundation of your of the spiritual path. You have to get to the point of not being affected if people like you or not, because your moral compass, your compass, your standard is completely aligned with pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is the only one that you're concerned with. If people don't like you, oh, well, as long as you're on the hook, of course, uh, and you need to, uh, you know, I mean, all of it has to fall in place, which is you have to have proper guidance. You have to have good teachers. You have to have good people around you who are what? Revealing the reflection that you need to see, the true accurate reflection. And you can't be around people who delude you to, but you get to this point where you're indifferent if they not like you or not, because you're more concerned with what? Pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So being open to all of these things, will get you to that place of what? Going back to the sculpture, the sculptor analysis of seeing yourself as a constant work in progress. And there's always areas to refine and there's always areas to improve constantly. Like you're never done. Until you take your last breath, you should believe with 100% certainty that you will have areas and flaws that you need to correct. It doesn't matter how much you learn, how much you've memorized, how many circles of dhikr you've sat in, how many hajj you've done, how many umrah you've done, how many fasts you've done. None of that matters because we are flawed and that's it. We'll be that way until we die. So anyway, sorry, the, the two remaining foundations, again, for those who are just joining, is contentment with Allah in times of hardship and ease and then turning to Allah in prosperity and adversity. So those are the, the, the what you start off with in order to build your spiritual path. And then the rest of the document goes backwards. But, you know, you can go and uh, contact the Rahma Foundation if you want to follow these recordings to get more. But going back to this advice of Sidi Ahmed Zuruk, as far as, you know, being really uh, uh, focused on um, removing these blemishes from your, you know, the anything that's displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then continuing to work on yourself, that's how you do it. Be open to advice and be willing to see yourself as flawed, no matter what you think of yourself. Continue doing this until you find that fleeing from anything outwardly displeasing is second nature to you and that your avoidance of the boundaries of prohibited, prohibited things is as if it has resulted from a protective net that was placed before you so that you are so cautious, right? Taqwa is really vigilance, right? It's vigilance of, of the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's, that, that's how, you, if you do this enough, it's almost as if you're seeing this, you know, this, uh, this, uh, net uh, that that's cast uh, in order to protect you from the boundaries, right? At this point, it is time to turn inward. So once you've removed all of these outward flaws and bad habits and things that are just displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now we move to the inward, right? So he says, at this point, it is time to turn inward toward your heart's presence and to its reality with both reflection and remembrance. So the khushua that all of us seek, it can't come if you're outwardly still engaged in haram, your, you know, your income is haram, you're not eating from the halal, you're um, engaging in things like gossip and mingling and free mixing and you're flirting and you're playing all these games that people play. If you're not vigilant about the boundaries that Allah subhanahu wa has put in terms of social interaction and just your 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 presence, you know, with with His creation, then inwardly, how are you going to possibly reach that level of proximity and intimacy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It doesn't make sense because the inward, you know, that is sacred and it's a it's it's the the reward of all the hard work that we do to get to that level of intimacy. So sometimes, as I said, people jump the gun and they think, well, that's what I should feel first. And then I'll start to follow uh, everything. Well, that's ideal, but that's not how, how faith works. Faith has to be established and then you act on it. So he says, don't hasten the end result before you have completed the beginning. Exactly. But likewise, don't begin without looking toward the end result. You know, Stephen Covey's uh, highly uh, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, right? Begin with the end in mind. These are all things our tradition has, but, you know, we have to follow all these new people who come with their ideas and suddenly we're impressed. No, this is it. This was, he said this how many centuries ago? Look with, you know, know the your objective. Be clear about where you want to go. Um, but also don't uh, get, jump the gun, basically.
This is so because the one who seeks the outset at the end loses providential security. And the one who seeks the end at the outset loses providential guidance, right? So let's look at that. This is so because the one who seeks the outset, if you want all of those rewards before, right? Um, at the end, uh, seeks the outset at the end, loses providential security. So if you want these things at the outset, you're losing that you know, security that comes from uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the one who seeks the end, if you just want to get to uh, the end result at the outset, you lose providential guidance. So act in accordance with principles and the appropriate legal rulings and not in accordance with stories and fantasies. So mashallah, a lot of these things are really summarized points from the foundations because we talked about this too, right? Being in reality, not falling into fictional ideas, fictional concepts. Like we're in an age right now where people, because they do not believe in God, they don't believe in an akhirah, they don't believe in anything outside of this earthly realm. They are literally driven by their passions, by their, uh, no matter how depraved and how despicable their desires are, they're driven by them because they believe this is it. And so they get caught up in fulfilling their fantasies, their fetishes. And that's really what we're seeing unfold in front of us is a, is a world where people are catering constantly to their appetites, their emotions, because they are in the realm of this false fictional idea that we can create our own utopian realities, our own subjective truths in this world, and we can all be happy. No, you can't. It doesn't work that way because this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the, this is his mold. He owns this domain and he created it to actually be a place of difficulty and strife and pain. And that's why they're miserable people. Most of these people are miserable. You know, when you see them out there prideful and celebratory, don't fall for it. It is a lie. It's a lie. And they're, they're projecting what they want people to believe. But if you really read the, the research and follow what actually happens to many of these people, they have the highest rates of suicide. That Many of them are on antidepressants. They're in therapy. They are not because you're going against fitrah. Your fitrah is real. Allah created you. So you're violating the laws of, uh, you know, the established by your creator and you're trying to be harmonized. You're never going to be harmonized. I don't care how many surgeries you get, how many partners you, you amass, how many people you sleep with, you will never find this utopian blissful state that you think you're going to get by giving into your desires. It is all a lie perpetuated by Shaitan, Adu and Mubin. He knows we're weak to the flesh. He knows we have uh, weak weaknesses and he exploits those weaknesses. But we have been given guidance. We have aqal and the mind is very powerful if you are using it. So don't be what? pushed and, uh, and uh, don't believe in, in these false stories and fantasies. Don't even consider stories of how things went with others, except as a tonic to strengthen your resolve, certainly not as a reference based upon their outward forms or what they seem to be revealing. So I gave a very general commentary on just stories, but he's specifically talking about even other people's spiritual experiences. Sometimes we seek you know, because someone had this amazing experience. And so we now also want to seek what others have, spiritually speaking. But we have to be very mindful that we're all on our own journeys to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our experiences are going to be individuated. We will not have the same experiences with prayer, with fasting, with hajj that others have. So if you hear stories, you're like, oh my God, that sounds amazing. And then you act on something because you're hoping to replicate that, you might be disappointed. But if it's your drive is just the pleasure of Allah. Like I just need to go close to my Lord and I'm not going to get caught up in these details and let those be the uh, catalyst for why I do what I do, right? That's why stories can be sometimes beneficial in that they can inspire, but they can also derail a person from their own path because they're too preoccupied on trying to get something, uh, simulating something that someone else had. In all of this, depend upon a clear path to which you can refer and a foundation upon which you can rely no matter what your state that is it. I have to strengthen my, um, my, my, my heart because 
I could find myself in a situation that where I will have no helpers. There will be nobody else to call upon. So if I'm not doing this to fortify my own self, like think of, for example, what was it in the 50s and 60s, or I don't remember which era in particular, but there was an era where in the United States, there was a real threat of like, maybe maybe it was the Cold War or or either alien invasion or something, but there was this idea of like, imminent danger and people started creating bunkers you know like they actually built the shelters right from like nuclear war or whatever it was because they took it so seriously like i need to be in survival mode i can't rely on the government i can't rely on mom dad so you found a lot of people they put the time in creating you know these types of safe uh, shelters or whatever um, spaces for them and their family so that in the event something happens, they can go down, they have food, they have water, they have a place to use the restroom. They built a lot of this stuff because they were thinking of all those possibilities. Spiritually speaking, we have to kind of be in that mindset of the same survival mode. I got to be, you know, looking out for myself, spiritually speaking, because I came into this world alone and I will be, uh, you know, I will be, um, I will, I will leave this world alone. So I have to really think of, of these things on a deep level. So then he says, the best of these is the path of Ibn Atta'ala because it gives clear direction to Allah. Do not take from others words unless it is in accordance with your own path, but submit to their implications if you desire realization. Avoid all forms of vain and foul speech to your absolute utmost. So now we're getting into other things that are also practical things that we have to be mindful of. If you speak idly, you speak like, you know, um, always, you know, self uh, praise, you're speaking in terms that are just not becoming, that you're not in line with the prophetic character. The Prophet never did these things. He was not boastful. He was not a braggart. He was not pompous. And he also never used foul speech. You know, I um, spoke to someone recently who said, you know, they knew of this uh, individual who used to be very mindful of their words. And then they moved away and they met with them again. And all of a sudden, Aulabala using a lot of curse words. Why? If you, you know, what happened? Someone came around and all of a sudden now you're following the the trends of, of you know, the, the modern uh, era where it's just like, I want to be what? Popular. I want to fall into, you know, the same uh, culture as everyone else. We have lines as Muslims, so we don't use foul speech. Put aside anything if unable to discern its benefit immediately. It's good advice. Don't waste your time. If you're not sure about something, it's a great area. Why do it? Don't waste your time. Beware of being extremely hard on your nafs, your selfish soul, before you have obtained a mastery over it. So this is really good advice because sometimes we go way too, you know, we dive head first. We're not even thinking about like long-term effects. So when you go, you know, go big, right? Or, or you, it's like a pendulum. If you go too hard, too fast at something and you become, you overwhelm yourself, you can really go the opposite direction. And I've seen people do this, unfortunately, even spiritually, they try to be super Muslim overnight. It doesn't work. So be gentle with yourself and don't also punish yourself when you slip. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful of the merciful. And then uh, but also beware of being too lax with it regarding any of the sacred rulings. So you got to find that happy medium of I'm not going to push myself too hard. And I'm also not going to give myself a pat on the back or, a, you know, a carte blanche to do whatever I want to do and then make excuses when I slip. Right. I have to be willing to be count accountable to uh, Allah. And uh, muhasaba is part of that process. Right. Taking account of what you've done, what you need to do, where you felt fallen short and then fixing things. This is so because it is constantly fleeing from moderation in everything, and it inclines towards extremism in both matters of deviance and guidance. Very important point. The nafs does not like balance. The nafs loves extremes. So don't, whenever you're going extreme in either direction, know that it's taken the wheel, as they say. You got to bring it back to the aql. The mind has to be, this is a rational process, right? We are rational human beings. But if your nafs, your appetites, your emotions are dictating, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Seek out a companion to help you out in your affair and take his counsel concerning matters that occur from both your inward states and your outward affairs. So try to find people who match where you are, you know, and that, um, you know, who are, who are, um, who have a similar, you know, uh, you're, they're on the path with you because sometimes people are on very different, you know, wavelengths. 
they're on different levels and it can become difficult to uh, feel like you really have a companion that's on the path with you. But if you're somewhat at least aligned, it'll be much easier and you can benefit each other with good counsel, support and all of that, right? Um, and then if you do indeed take his companionship, then treat him in a manner commensurate with his state and give him of yourself based upon his inabilities and abilities because the perfected companion can no longer be found. So yeah, don't be too um, hard on, on, you know, or don't uh, have too many high expectations from even your companions, just kind of, and I think this is a wise advice too in general about like, for example, you know, some people become very codependent in their relationships. They start to rely too much on one another. They get disappointed easily. Then they personalize things as we talked about. This is not good. We need to have a very safe, healthy distance in all relationships, even between husband and wife, even to, between parent and child. There should be a healthy distance. And that's going to look different based on the relationship. But we really do have to see ourselves as being truly spiritually speaking on a path alone to God. And there are others that Allah has gifted us with on the journey, but our path is really our own, right? And so having some safe distance will help with that. Then he says, furthermore, um, sorry, indeed, in these times, even a suitable companion who is agreeable rarely lasts. So that's just, you know, uh, real talk about the nature of dunya, right? Furthermore, beware of the majority of people concerning both your religious and worldly affairs, unless you have ascertained they have a sound relationship with their Lord, rooted in knowledge, which is free of caprice and love of leadership, and they are in position, possession of sound intellect, free of the pitfalls of hidden agendas. So basically, don't get too close with people unless you vetted them, unless you can see true prophetic character or desire of, of wanting the same things, spiritually speaking, that you do, don't uh, let them in your heart. Your heart is, you have to protect it like a fortress, you know? Imagine it's you're in a fort and you're a fortress and you have a moat and there's a drawbridge. Anybody who wants to get close to you has to go through a lot before you suddenly trust them with your secrets. You see people telling people their business. What are you doing? We live in the age where people can weaponize information. So be smart, be wise. Do not tell people your business um, and be cautious because not everybody has good intentions. And if they if they're worthy uh, of your love and trust and loyalty and fidelity, Allah will show them to you. You will have that and time will tell. And I truly believe in that. Um, and then he says, do not be heedless of the machinations of others or their hidden states. There you go. Consider these two from both their origins and their actions. People of high character and family distinction are almost always beneficial. On the other hand, excruciating circumstances compel a person of low character and origin to forsake others in need. So he's making excuses that, yes, it's always better to have people who come from good family backgrounds where they had this moral right upbringing, um, and, and that would be ideal. But we also have to excuse that those who have not had those circumstances, they're compelled by uh, other things, right? It's not necessarily, uh, th there's a sense of, you know, survival and maybe because they have had to fend for themselves, they haven't felt support, that they may forsake people easily, but it's not necessarily always malintent or other reasons. So it's, you know, just a nice balanced way of looking at different groups of people that you may encounter in life. Be extremely vigilant of the dominant qualities of a given people in any given land, and don't be heedless of the divine wisdom in the creation. Notice gathering and separation. So this is actually really wise too, in terms of just becoming emotionally intelligent. Part of emotional intelligence is being able to read the room, understand the nuances of different groups and individuals, you know, that come together based on culture, based on background, upbringing, all the things we talked about. If you're a person with strong social skills, you will take the time to learn about people, to learn about what are the predominant qualities of their culture or their background, what things that really distinguish them from others. And this is why the Quran Allah Subh'ana tells us in Surah Al-Hajrat, right, that I've created you to nations and tribes that you may come to know one another. We have to be doing the knowing part. And so this is where really taking the time to pay attention and, and, and seeing those different changes and then treating people according to their specific uh, way and culture. Some cultures, for example, are very particular about 
um, let's just say like gender mixing. Okay. There's some cultures where you have a little bit more flexibility and they're not as rigid. Other cultures, they're very particular about, you know, men and women, for example, speaking, even if it's on a halal, um, you know, environment, if you go to a person's home who has a particular, who's raised in a certain culture where there was more separation, um, even if everybody's nice and there's families and it's a very beautiful, safe, mahram or everywhere, everybody's observing hijab, some people will have much more strict rules around commingling than others. Other people are more relaxed, you know, so you might meet someone whose spouse is very, um, you know, uh, talkative and and just very sanguine, you know, in their nature, and they're they just like to keep conversation going. If if that person meets someone whose uh, husband, for example, does not like that. Um, then they should have, you know, not personalize it. Like, what's up with that guy? Why is he so uptight? I didn't mean anything by asking his wife how he is. No, maybe that's his culture. And you should just be respectful that he comes from a different background than you do. And he's not used to random men coming and making small talk with his wife, you know? So these are the kinds of sensitivities that we learn when we are paying attention. Some of this, now I'm going back to the reading, some of this we've already covered in the book Al-Qawaid, so study the subject further there. Organize your hours in a manner appropriate to each time specific needs, using a gentle and tolerant approach, all the while being very wary of the extremes of rigidity and laxity. So now he's giving us counsel on how to organize our time. We need it. Every one of us needs time management. With laxity, this is especially necessary given that too much latitude in permitted matters sets the heart back on its journey to such a degree that even a man of resolve ends up looking like a foolish child. So if you start to allow yourself too much, there's a lot of you know, permission to listen to music, to watch TV, to start eating, you know, randomly and not really caring for yourself in the right way, then you may end up regressing. And that's really what he's trying to say. So find the balance of remembering your nafs, you have to master it. And it is like this strong-willed, disobedient, rebellious child that knows how to manipulate you. So don't be manipulated, right? Know that you have to govern the nafs. And then he says, work for this world as if you will live forever, but work for your next life as if tomorrow you die. In other words, do not neglect the externals of your worldly needs, all the while keeping in mind your end and final resting place. Be extremely vigilant with about avoiding positions of leadership. This is so important. If you want to be a leader in anything, check yourself. That desire for leadership, the desire for power is being overshadowed or is overshadowing the responsibility that comes with it because you're seeking something, right? You're seeking power or reputation, suma and uh, riya or diseases of the heart, wanting people to hear of your accomplishments, wanting people to know that, oh, you got this position, you won this uh, whatever role or whatever it was, you went and finished your degree and now you have been offered this blah, 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 whatever it is. If you like people to know these things about you and then you seek out those opportunities and you really believe that you are the best qualified person for the job, I would say take a moment and rectify yourself a little bit because you're forgetting that any role of responsibility comes with immense, immense pressure. I was actually speaking to uh, someone uh, just yesterday and actually, yeah, well, she was she's a, a principal of a local Islamic school. I was speaking to her yesterday and I just told her I could never do what she does because I know the weight uh, that they carry. They're responsible for children. They're responsible for parents and teachers and community. It is a lot uh, of work to be in community service, especially those who are in the field of education and have the top role of any uh, school, right? It's very, very difficult. So the point is, is not to seek those things out. If people appoint you, if they beg you and plead and oh, you know try to twist your arm, inshallah khair, because now this is a sign from Allah, inshallah, maybe that you are being called to that point of duty, but not something that should come from you. Um, and then he says, so I'm sorry, be extremely vigilant about avoiding positions of leadership, but you sh should you be tried with such matters, know your own limitations. So look how he phrases it. If you're tried and tested with the role of leadership, like Allah puts you in that, it's a test. So know your limitations, know that he will hold you to account. Be absolutely sincere to Allah with the sincerity of one who knows full well the one 
who is placing demands upon him. So when you are in that leadership role, role, know that the one who has put you in that role also has demands of you, right? Surrender completely to his decree with the submission of one who knows he can never overcome him. We will never overcome what Allah has planned for us. Never. We will never, if Allah w- wishes something for us, we can try to thwart it every which way possible, bring all of humanity together to try to concoct some plan. He has his plan. We have our plans. He's the best of planners. We'll never be able to overcome anything he wills for us. Know that and then stay in your lane. Humble yourself. Stay, be disobedient. Inshallah, Allah will give you tawfiq. Have a firm foundation in all of your affairs and you will be safe from their pitfalls. Organize your devotional practices and you will find your time is extended due to the grace that pervades it. Allahu Akbar. If you spend time organizing your uh, worship with what Allah or pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will put barakah in your time. He will. Time dilation is real. It is a very real phenomenon that happens. Ramadan is a perfect proof of that. And there are other people who've experienced this in very real ways. They have gone to either the sacred cities of Mecca and Medina or other places on these spiritual, uh, you know, expeditions or, or trips. And they have seen and witnessed the time being stretched for them. They've been able to accomplish things that they could never accomplish in regular normal circumstances. Time dilation is real and it is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the one who prioritizes him. Right. When we prioritize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he will give us ease and 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 that uh, dilation of time so that we can get other things done, inshallah. And that's what I was saying about Hajjit. If you give up your bed for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you think he's going to leave you to suffer? Not when you do it with full trust that he will take care of me. If I need rest, he'll give me rest. If I miss something, he'll help me. I have to have that trust that I'm in the best hands when I do anything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and never let my mind convince me otherwise because those are always ways to deter us from good, right? Never be fanatical about anything, whether it is true or the truth or not, and your heart will remain in a state of soundness towards others. So if you're not a fanatic, if you're a person of balance, right, you don't go to extremes, we talked about that, then other people will also gravitate towards you. Never claim anything to which you are entitled, not to mention that to which you are not entitled, and you will be safe from connivance and treachery. Uh, just, uh, I just want to mention this because I watched this video of Sheikh Hamza. He was telling the story of Sayyidina Abu Bakr when a man came to him. It was in a video I saw yesterday, but he, I, I was reminded of the story. It's a famous story of when a man came and he was cursing at Sayyidina Abu Bakr and accusing him of the most heinous things, horrible things. And the Prophet stood there smiling and Abu Bakr was silent. And then Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu Then he spoke up and he started to defend himself. And so the Prophet left. And then later he asked the Prophet what happened? You were there smiling and then you left. And now the Prophet is teaching him and he said, what? When, I, when the man was saying all those terrible things about you, I saw the angels defending you. But the moment you went into defense of yourself, Iblis came into the picture and I don't stay in the room with Iblis. Or I don't, you know, I'm, I don't share the same space with Iblis. So this power of the story, you know, and I don't have the, the rest, like the full context of what happened next, or that was just the story that Sheikh Hamza said. But I think more importantly is what the Prophet lesson was trying to convey for us, right? Which is people will violate your rights in this way. This man was accusing Sayyidina Abu Bakr, who, come on, everybody who knows him, who knows who he is, you know, he is the most beloved companion to the Prophet It's without a doubt his character. There's no dispute about who he is. So whatever this man was saying, it's obviously false. There was no need for him to defend himself. But it's an example for all of us that we will experience these things where people will take our rights from us. They will, um, you know, do these things, violate our trust. And yes, we have the right, we have recourse by Sharia to go through different ways in order to protect ourselves. But sometimes, in this case, like you have to weigh every situation uh, the Prophet was teaching him, you didn't need to defend yourself. The angels were doing it for you. So in this same vein, never claim anything to which you're entitled, right? If, if someone is taking something that you have, you want your rights, just 
let it go if you're able to. And everybody's different. And I'm just giving you general advice. So don't take this as a letter, uh, you know, like something that is in concrete uh, that you have to follow. But it's more like assess the situation. As I say, pick your battles. And if you can forego uh, something for the greater good, or even if you're entitled to something and you want it, just you know, khair, inshallah. Allah is a witness and he will compensate for whatever it was. I don't need to make a big deal out of every single situation, right? Um, and then indeed, anyone claiming a rank above his own will fall, scandalized and humiliated. Audhu billah, may Allah protect us from ever thinking we're better than we are and always keep us humble to know, to see our flaws before any good and to recognize that our good is always from Allah anyway, and he can take it away at any time. Moreover, those who claim a rank they warrant will have it stripped from them. So we don't make claims. Don't make claims. Just let things be and speak always humbly. Conversely, those who claim a lesser rank than their own will be elevated to an even higher one than they deserve. So when you see the people of Adab, the people of Akhlaq, the people of true prophetic comportment, they always deem themselves less than what they are. They're not ones that are showboats and braggarts and try to, uh, oh, I'm, in, I'm entitled to this. Or I deserve this. I worked hard for this. I'm more knowledgeable. I know, astaghfirullah. They just leave it to Allah and they never feel the need to ever uh, self-promote or advocate. It's just not the way of people of Allah. Allah will take care of them. And they truly believe that. Never reveal to your companion anything of your state other than what his own state warrants. The reason is that if you go down to his level, he'll have contempt for you. Whereas if you attempt to raise him up to your level, he'll forsake you. So this is really just about keeping a very balanced, healthy um, and distance, even, you know, just with what we share with, with our companions, because human nature, it's true. You know, there, there are relationships that are tested in this way. There's relationships that outwardly look like they're strong, but there is internally hasad and other things that are happening. So you just want to be very careful not to uh, get ahead and, and to give too much trust to anybody, really, especially in this day and age. And then never demand a right from anyone, whether an intimate or a stranger. The reason is simple. A stranger owes you nothing. And one close to you is too important to direct or blame toward. Never assume that anyone in this world can really understand your circumstances other than from the perspective of his own circumstances. Because in reality, people see things only in accordance with their frames or of reference and their personal path. I mean, I just love how genius. Sidi Ahmed Zarouf is a true, you want to talk about psychology. You want to talk about interpersonal, like real, like the dimensions of, of human the mind and, and all these things. Our scholars had all of it. What you're seeing now, I really believe a lot of them copy and they just go back and, and try to repackage what they're reading. But this is such incredible insight, right? It's true. If you're constantly seeking human validation, thinking that you're going to meet someone who really understands you, you're going to be disappointed every time because nobody understands you. Nobody. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who sees you in your totality, in your entirety. And so people will try because we're empathic. We, we want to reach out. We want to connect. We want to be able to see, you know, to show you that validation. But we'll always fall short because we're not able to see things holistically. And so, and as he said, our vantage point is based on what we, you know, we see, oh, I'm on this side of the situation, you're on that side of the situation. I can, we're likely not looking at things from the exact perspective. I might see some things that you see, but I don't see it exactly the way you see it. So lower your expectation. And I would say this, especially for married couples, because I think a lot of people, um, and I'll speak to my sisters here. I think a lot of sisters, we forget that as much as we want our husbands to sympathize with us, to understand us, to really have our backs, to be able to, you know, listen to us with a sympathetic ear and give us, you know, the right understanding and perspective. It hurts a lot when we put them, when we set them up to fail, because at the end of the day, gender differences are real. Men and women are, um, you know, we create, I mean, we, we see things differently, right? We, we do, we, we do. And our perspectives are, and one necessarily isn't better than the other. It's just a matter of what is, you know, um, what is what is being asked of the individual. So if you need empathy and you want validation, I always advise wives to look more towards female companionship for that. 
um, because you will likely put your husband in a difficult spot if you're thinking that he's going to be able to emotionally uh, heal you in the same way that maybe another woman who totally relates to your challenges, whether it's with children or with your in-laws or with other things, external things that are affecting you. Another woman is probably is most likely going to better you know, understand you than your spouse, even though the expectation is my spouse should, because they live with me, they love me, they claim to love me. Why can't they get it? Why don't they ever see things the way I want them to see it? Well, there's a lot of reasons why, but lower the expectation a little bit, you know, bring it down to a human level. And just to heed this warning that, um, again, never assume that anyone, I mean, his words are very clear, never assume that anyone in this world can really understand your circumstances other than from the perspective of his or her own circumstances. Because in reality, people see things only in accordance with their frames of reference and their personal path. We do a lot of uh, projection. We do a lot of, you know, um, insertion of our own opinions and personalities and temperaments and all the things that make us individual. So it's hard, right, to assess things the same way as another person, unless you're very empathic, but it's rare to meet people like that. However, when aims, purposes, and aspirations are similar, people tend to work together toward a common goal. So that's Yes, we can find commonality when things align, but again, it's not always easy. Never belittle any talk that concerns absent people, even if there is no harm in it due to the likelihood of harm entering into it. This is important. We talked about this on Saturday in the class that I was referencing earlier on Riba, Bahda, and Namima, that bringing up the people when they're not there is dangerous, and you should avoid it because it opens the door for harm. Because, you know, Sheikh Hamza used to say, one of the most dangerous questions you can ask people today and nowadays is, how so-and-so? Because you're just asking a general question, like, how is this person? But it usually opens the floodgates for riba. Like, oh, let me tell you, you know, did you hear they got divorced and then this happened and this happened? So the be better advice is to avoid bringing up people in their absence. Guard your secrets, even if you feel safe with someone, because the one to whom you divulge your secret to is not a safer vessel than your own heart before you revealed it. B mind blowing wisdom, mind blowing. And I'm very big on this. Please, 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 please don't tell people your sins. Don't tell people your sinfulness. Don't share it ever. Don't think, oh, I can confide in this person. They can, you know, um, they're my vault. I'm just going to tell them all my secrets. And no, because as he points out, which is very wise, subhanAllah, that the person that you divulged it to or are going to divulge it to is not safer than your own heart which came which it came out of right you're 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 supposed to guard your secrets and you can't even guard your secrets because that's why you're telling someone else so how do you expect them to keep your secrets and i have seen lives destroyed by this by the way all the belah from people who are evil enough to weaponize things shared with them in confidence but there are people who do it they will take things you've shared with them and they will turn around, blackmail you, hold it over your head, ruin your existence because you, you gave them information. And so we just have to be very careful not to do that. And then we're almost towards the end here, you guys. Uh, forgive me, I'm trying to get through this, but I want to be true to my statement of last class. Never leave an Adam's weight of your regular devotional practice. Never be lenient with yourself in either relaxed times or those of high resolve. Indeed, should you miss some of your practice at a given time, redress it later. If you are not able to do your usual practice, at least occupy yourself with some other similar practice. So if you can't pray, ladies, when you're on your menstrual cycle, do something, right? Do something to compensate for what you're not doing. Read more Quran, read more Hadith, memorize a text, watch talks. Um, learn, you know, pursue knowledge, but don't be like, oh, vacation. That's a really horrible framing if you think about it. What are you vacationing from? You usually vacation from something that you don't want to do regularly, work, right? School, things that you see as chores. Worship should never be framed that way. Worship should be, it is what gives your soul life. 
It's it's a blessing to be guided and it's a blessing to be able to worship all this kind of data. So to frame it that way is dangerous. But the way that you kind of, again, bring that balance is to say, OK, I'm not praying because I'm menstruating. I'm going to do this instead or whatever it is. If you're traveling, you're doing something where you're off your routine, you find other ways to compensate. If you aren't, um, never obey your selfish soul, even for a moment, nor believe any of its claims, no matter what it says. Nafs is the greatest enemy of the human being. There's four of them. Dunya, Hawa, Shaitan, Nafs. Nothing is worse than Nafs. Do not obey your Nafs. Go against your Nafs. And I'll, I've given this example before, but one of the things that you'll, if, if it's happened to you, I have been in this predicament many times where I have to go somewhere and then I, I'm praying. So I pray the hood but I'm on my way to go somewhere. Cause you know, you make your wudu, you get ready. And then I usually say, I'm going to pray my doha right before I go. So sometimes, and this is how the, just to show you an example of the power of nafs. I'm praying and you know, there's sunnahs to prayer. The Dhuhr has four before if you want, or, or for the Hanafis and then two after. So sometimes, you know, I, I jump into the prayer and then there's this dialogue that happens almost all, every time I'm in this situation where it's like, you know what, you're going to be late. You just get up and go, right? Just, you know, it's okay. You can do your duas, your sibratas, be in the car. So there's always this kind of negotiation, right? And I, it's funny. It's not comical to me because I recognize it as nafs, right? That the nafs will still do this to me. And alhamdulillah, I got to, I've gotten to a point where I don't care. It can, I can have these ideas whatever they are, but I will absolutely immediately after I turn my salams and I say my prayer, I shoot myself right up and I enter my prayer for my sunnah. Why? Because there's no discussion. Um, I know the thoughts are coming. I can't control my mind. It's a beast because I really like to be punctual. I don't like to be late to things. So that's where it comes from, right? This desire to be punctual. He's exploiting that. He's, um, I mean, not he, I guess she, my nephew, she is, um, She's telling me all these ideas, trying to freak me out about being late, but you have to get so in tune with yourself to know like, oh my God, here's the same lame strategy you use every time. I don't fall for it. And the way that I shut you down is I immediately disobey everything you're saying and I shoot right up. I do my prayer and guess what? Alhamdulillah, I'm not late. I have peace of mind. And I actually feel quite satisfied when I come out of my sunnah prayer, feeling like Alhamdulillah, I dominated. Again, alhamdulillah, thank you, Allah, for tawfiq. Thank you for giving me the presence of mind to know my nafs is trying to derail me, thwart me from receiving the, the blessing, added blessing of doing my sunnah by convincing me with all these ridiculous arguments where it's irrational thoughts. Alhamdulillah, this is how you do it. So when we say never obey your selfish soul for even a moment, that's what we're talking about. That level of awareness of the nafs will always try to take away opportunities of khair for you, right? Don't obey it, go against it. And that's the way you do it. Do, disobey it. Do exactly what it's telling you not to do. To the utmost, guard your resolve in all affairs. And should you resolve to do something, do it immediately before it abates or dissipates. We talked about that. Don't procrastinate. Procrastination is one of the spiritual diseases that can really afflict people, but be a person of action and uh, and resolve. Examine your soul constantly in matters you're obliged to do or those that you should do. Always do this muhasaba, this examination. It's very important. Leave off anything you don't need to do, even the recommended. In short, do not involve yourself in anything other than the absolute necessary or that in which a real discernible need exists. So this is where, you know, learning what is far, what is wajib, what is, uh, you know, um, what is mandub? What is makru? What is haram? You have to know the, the different levels of actions and then do, you know, extra things as they uh, appear, but be more uh, vigilant on what is, you know, uh, demanded of you. What are your fardahain? Treat others just as you would want to be treated and fulfill what is due. All of this is epitomized in the words of the poet when he said, if you desire to live such that your religion is safe and your portion is full and your honor is sound, guard your tongue. Never mention another's faults for you too have faults and others too have tongues. Take care of the eye when it reveals another's faults saying, oh, my eyes, remember the eyes of others. Live treating well all others and avoid aggression. And should they oppress, repel it, but with kindness. The source of these words is, in fact, the traditions of the Prophet ﷺ when he said, be vigilant of Allah wherever you are and follow a misdeed with a good deed and it will remove it and treat others with the most excellence of character. In another, he, he ﷺ said, every child of Adam makes mistakes and the best of you, excuse me, the best of those who make mistakes are those who seek to redress them. He also said, the Holy Spirit inspired my heart's core 
that no soul will die until it fulfills its decreed portion of this world and its appointed time here. So be conscious of Allah and make your request with dignity. So that's just important. We all have a you know, number of days here in this earthly realm and just uh, you know, to make the most of it. In summation, and we're almost at the end here, in summation, repentance, awareness of Allah, and uprightness are the foundations of all benefits. The truth is manifest and its details are weighty and significant. The affair belongs to Allah. Success is in his hands. Peace. And then from Al-Qawaid briefly. Oh, wow. SubhanAllah. There's even more. I thought I was done. <laughs> are you ready to go? Are you just done with me right now? Ya Rabbi. I'm here. I'm here for as long as you need me to be here. I love you. You're so sweet. I just want to finish this. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, please bear with me. I'm going to be a super speed reader right now. We're going to just get through the text. I'm not even going to comment. <laughs> I'm just going to read it. I've done so much commentary. Unless I really have to, okay? I'll just give myself that ability. If I have to, I'll comment. This is from Al-Qawaid. Our Sheikh Abu, Al Abu Abbas Al-Hadrami said, Spiritual training was elevated to a science due to the development of a, of a technical vocabulary, but benefit from it is derived only as a result of aspiration and spiritual states. So adhere to the book and the prophetic practice without omitting or adding anything. This applies to all of your transactions with your creator, the creation, and yourself. As for what is between you and God, three matters are concerned. Fulfilling obligations, avoiding prohibitions, and submitting completely to his decree. As for dealing with the self, so I'm sorry, let me review that. Fulfill your fara'id, your fard. Stay away from the haram and then be in submission. That's it. These are what we are, uh, what we, we should give to Allah subhanahu wa As for dealing with the self, this also involves three necessities. An unbiased approach to the truth. As we said, I want the truth no matter where it comes from, who it comes from, right? Abandoning defense mechanisms such as self-justification. And guarding against the dangers of the self in respect to its attractions and aversions, its acceptances and rejections, and its comings and goings. We have to do more study on the nature of the nafs, what it pulls us to, the distractions and all the distractibility, all of those things in order to know how to avoid it. But self-justification is a huge part of also gaining mastery over the nafs. As for dealing with people, this concern three this concerns three requirements also: ensuring their rights are fulfilled. Give rights to people, a virtuous lack of desire for their possessions. Don't be a hasud, a person who is, you know, wants uh, the, what other people have. An absolute avoidance of anything that adversely affects their hearts unless it concerns an obligation to the truth that cannot be ignored. So one of our dear friends, uh, Dr. Ozma, she uh, always used to tell me that her grandmother taught her never break anyone's heart. No matter what you do in this life, be a person who that is your mantra, your rule. You will never break anybody's heart. And I think it's beautiful, simple advice. You can teach children, you can teach anybody. Just don't do it. Don't hurt people. That's it. Any aspirant of this path who inclines toward the feeling, toward the following preoccupations will perish, okay? Um, horseback riding, uh, general self-interest, occupation with changing social wrongs or with fighting in military jihads while neglecting the acquisition of personal merit and virtue, believing that he is in no need of rectifying his soul or that he can obtain all the virtues. So yes, this is basically hobbies, right? Getting into really fun stuff that you like, self-interest. Um, and, and engaging in things that are socially unacceptable because you're, uh, and because basically you're not really rectifying your own self. You're just too preoccupied. You're too distracted by all these other ventures, other interests that to work on yourself. So that's why he, they're mentioning these things, right? That if you do this, you'll perish. And then he says, seeking out the faults of his brothers and others. So if you're a fault seeker, you're looking for flaws in other people, you'll perish. Excusing himself by claiming abandonment of the world. So if you're like this, oh, I'm this ascetic and I'm just gonna, you know, I, I'm giving up the dunya and you go to this extreme where you are foregoing the rights that others have over you in order to, uh, you know, fulfill your own whatever spiritual desires, but you're not fulfilling him according to uh, the prophetic path, which is balance, right? The Prophet system, um, he, he was a father, he was a husband, he fulfilled his obligations. He didn't just go off into the mountains. So you can't be like, oh, I'm just going to give up the world and then, you know, forget uh, that you have 
uh, obligations and responsibilities. Spending all of his time in religious devotion. Again, this is a lack of balance. If you're, and I know people who've done this, they would let their families completely fall apart while they're off because they have to be in the masjid at a certain time or the sheikh is coming, so-and-so is coming and they have to attend these things while their children are falling apart. Home is falling apart. So that's just total delusion of the nafs, right? We have, uh, we have, people have rights over us. And if we're not fulfilling those rights, then for us to seek um, Allah, it's just, a, again, a total disconnect that way. You have to be doing things in the right order. Um, spending a good deal of time in public gatherings or seeking company, not for teaching or learning, but simply for human companionship. So we have to be clear. Allah knows our intentions. If you're going to the kids, you're going to classes because you want to socialize, you're not there to learn. It'll be very clear to you um, because you won't have tawfiq and Allah will call you into account for misrepresenting yourself, you know, as a student of knowledge when you're not even really there for the right intentions. In Planning toward the people of wealth, claiming he is doing so for religious reasons, preoccupying himself with spiritual matters of the heart before learning the basis of sound transactions or the rectification for his, of his faults. All of these are things, again, showing imbalance, lack of prioritization, lack of truly understanding the correct order of what you should be doing as a believer. Thrusting himself forth as a spiritual teacher without being appointed by a true spiritual master, scholar, or imam. So if you're out there positing as a leader, a teacher, an influencer, and nobody has endorsed you. Nobody of sound, sound reputation has endorsed you. You are a liar. You're misleading people. You're a charlatan. You're likely misguiding people because if you had a proper teacher, then they would either endorse you openly or at least give you the credentials to do so. But in the absence of those things for you to be positing as one is very dangerous. Um, mindlessly following anyone who says follow me whether his words to be true or false so basically being a sheep without ascertaining the details of his state belittling someone who is among the people of Allah even if he should deem that person insincere based upon some proof he has so basically you know judging people dismissing people showing you know that you think you know better or you know someone just because maybe the one little thing that they did or didn't do that rubbed you the wrong way now you're just going to throw them out and speak ill of them these are all reprehensible sensible, poor, uh, you know, character flaws that a person of God does not possess. And if they possess them, they certainly don't show them outwardly. They try to work on removing them. Um, yeah, well, inclining toward dispensations and interpretations. So if you're always looking for shortcuts, you want rukhsas for every little thing, it's likely because you're looking to make things too easy on yourself and you're not really working on disciplining the soul, putting the inward before the outward. Uh, yeah. Like if you're, you know, because there are people who are all about spirituality, right? New age spirituality. I'm spiritual and spiritual. I do a lot of things spiritually, but then outwardly they're engaged in every fiscal facade. What? There has to be, you know, a, that can't be so disconnected, disjointed. Um, being satisfied with the outward to the detriment of the inward, extracting from what from one that what contradicts the other, being content with knowledge devoid of action or with action devoid of an inward state or knowledge believing that an inward state suffices without the other two. So all of that kind of is similar to what I just said, or having no principle to which he has recourse in his actions, knowledge, states, or religious practices from the accepted principles in the books of the imams, such as the books of Ibn Atta'illah concerning inward matters, especially at tanwir So this is his recommendation. And concerning outward manners, the book of Ibn al-Hajj, Madkhal, and those of his sheikh, Ibn al-Jamra, as well as of others who follow the same path from among the realized masters. So these are all the uh, the uh, recommendations of how to, again, have the proper understanding. May Allah have mercy on all of them. Any aspirant, any person who's really a seeker, who is of the above mentioned types is in fact ruined and has no salvation on this path. But whoever holds to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prophetic practice will be safe and Godspeed arrive. Protection is from him alone and success is by him. The messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was once asked about Allah's words, tend to your own souls. And he replied, if you see covetousness obeyed, passions and whims followed, and every opinionated person marveling at his opinion, own opinions, then tend to your own soul. This is the day and age we live in. Look at social media. We're seeing all of this. People are completely driven by passions, whims. They're, uh, it's all envy and coveting. And then a lot of self-promotion. And, you know, I'm so, I have so many wonderful things to say. Let me advise you on everything in life. 
then what should we do? Tend to our own soul. He, may Allah grant him peace and blessings, also said something to this effect. In the tablets of Ibrahim, Suhaf al-Ibrahim, uh, salam, it is written, an intelligent person should know the age in which he lives. He should hold his tongue and mind his own business. An intelligent person should have four portions of his day for the following. A portion to take his soul to account. A portion to converse with his Lord. A portion to spend time with his brothers, meaning those who help him to see clearly his faults and direct him to his Lord. And a portion to indulge in his own personal recreation from the permissible appetites of man. Incredible wisdom. Just imagine if we lived by that, every person. We had this simple formula, four portions of your day, 24 hour period, you do the math, six hours, right? <laughs> Mathematician, mashallah. So that's it, you know, divide your, your time. May Allah provide us with that and help us to fulfill it. May he always maintain us in a state of grace for we cannot survive without his bestowal of grace and prosperity. Allah is enough for us, alhamdulillah. And God is the best of protectors. May prayers and peace be upon our master Muhammad and his family and his companions. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah, we have gotten to the end of the text. Allahu Akbar. Thank you, Asada Fadwa, for your patience with me. Thank you to all of you on Instagram and those on Zoom who are tuned in. We did it. I'm very happy. I know it took much longer than I intended, but inshallah, we did it. If there are any questions, I think I can stay. If Asada Fadwa, you have to go. I totally understand. I actually, we still have time, alhamdulillah. It's only 7.15, so we have time for Asad. But um I'm happy to take questions because this is the final session and I did want to leave some time for Q&A. So let me see if there is anything. Father, do you have anything? I, I know I got tech, I got questions here on Instagram, so I got to go all the way back. Yes, yeah, go, uh, go ahead and take the questions from Instagram. We don't have any questions here. Okay, alhamdulillah. Let me see here. May all the kind of Seek refuge in the law. I mean, so sisters are making dua here. Okay, so people are asking about the text. Okay, let me see. I'm so sorry, you guys, because this is very difficult for me to do, which um, with on, on my iPad. My iPad is turned sideways. My keyboard is like parallel or perpendicular to the iPad. I cannot, I can't type the link in here. That's why I can't do it. But if someone can please... I will share the link. I will share the link on Instagram. Okay. Thank you. So Ustada Fadwa is going to share the link for this document. It's called The Foundations of the Spiritual Path by Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, translated by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. It is an incredible text. Please take time. I, I get you came in if you're listening to for the first time, you're coming in to the tail the end of it. We we literally finished it today, right now, in this moment. But it is such an incredible, rich text that everybody can benefit from it. So please take your time to read through it. There's a lot of great advice. So this is one of the questions that I have here on Instagram. How can I counsel my sister who got diagnosed with an autoimmune condition that is a degenerative condition, lifelong? She's not able to accept it. I don't know how to help her. Yeah, Allah, first and foremost, Allah, may Allah grant her shifa. Um, it's very difficult when your loved ones are tested with their health because they, they're hurting, they're in discomfort, they're in pain, and you feel helpless. Um, but we believe that Allah tests everybody differently and health, uh, you know, tests are certainly real. And if a person bears those tests with patience and with surrender, they are being purified with every wince of pain, every moment of pain, their sins are being purified. They're being elevated spiritually. And I think the most important thing to remind, um, you know, anyone who's going through something like this, in this case, your sister is that it's from Allah. You know, we, we're going to be tested. We all have tests. And there is a beautiful story of uh, Ibn, um, is it Ibn Al-Tayla? I'm so sorry, my mind, everything is frozen right now. I think it is Ibn Al-Tayla. Um, but there's a wonderful story about, and it's in my, if I can, I'll, maybe if you don't mind messaging me, but there is, um, anyway, it's, it's a story about, you know, the, the four different ways that Allah tests us. And um, part of it is through tribulation. And, you know, but that doesn't mean that others aren't being tested too. So if you're going through something with your health, other people might have, you know, to attest in their relationships, in their wealth, in their 
um, mental health. There could be a plethora of different ways that we're tested, but we're all being tested. Sometimes what happens when you're going through a health problem is because the symptoms are so strong and you feel very immobilized or suddenly you're not able to do a lot that you did before. You feel like you're the only one being tested. So a good perspective is to just share you know these things these realities that everybody's being tested it's just your test is with your health but it's from Allah for a reason and there is um I can point you to this it's called the 17 benefits of tribulation uh look it up on YouTube Sheikh Hamza did a beautiful talk it's been around for a really long time but that talk has brought much healing to many people who've suffered uh, who are suffering through uh, medical or physical ailments, because it really brings things into perspective that there are actually benefits to being tested in this way. But may Allah give her shifa. You can, of course, continue to uh, find means to help her. I would definitely look into functional med- medicine. There are healers, there are hakims. Um, Dr. Mazen Atasi is great. Uh, he has, um, what's his page called? Let me see if I can find it real quickly. Um, oh gosh, I should know it. Sorry. Uh, Mazen. Yeah, here he is. What is his page called? Well, you can look him up. Oh, a forward to health. Forward dot to health is his. Um, he's a homeopath, a holistic uh, medical practitioner. I would definitely look to these types of means in order to, um, you know, find healing because medical, like just allopathic medicine, is very black and white sometimes, and they kind of give people these harsh horrible sentences of like doom and death and it's just terrible but you'll find subhanAllah people of other practices who are much more optimistic and actually try to really work to find underlying reasons for especially with autoimmune how to heal so find those types of resources continue to make dua for her shifa and then have that talk um have her listen to that talk i think it'll really shape help her with her understanding of her tribulation some of us work full time and have to cook or exercise and do other obligations after work hours. So most of the day is gone. How do we stop feeling guilty not doing the hajj and reading more Quran? So it's a good, good question. And I think, you know, as we mentioned, you want to take it easy. Don't try to do everything all at once. So I would say for the time being, if the hajj become is difficult for you because of time constraints and you have other obligations, then then uh, read Quran. Because Quran you can do any other every time of the day, any time of the day, right? It's not relegated to a specific hour or or time frame. Um, but just to mention it, the, the Quran that is best uh, or, or that is often said is, is uh, witnessed, it's in the Quran, that it's witnesses in the Quran at Fajr. So there is immense reward in reciting Quran at Fajr. And if you can add that as part of your Fajr routine, where you wake up for Fajr and immediately, you know, have a page, half a page, even some of these apps have these really great reminders where they come up, pop up, but it's your point of reflecting. You can be a verse every day where you just take a moment to reflect, start with that. And the goal is always to habituate to things for 40 days. This is what our scholars have traditionally said. Try that for 40 days and then move on to the next thing. And inshallah, that should assuage your your guilt, you know, because if you're doing something and you start to see progress, then inshallah, shaitan and your nafs can't try to play those guilt games with you, right? So alhamdulillah, let's see. Any other questions? I think, was that? That was one. Thank you so much um, for all of your kind words and duas and your hearts, your love. I really appreciate it. And I have, we have to share some of that with Asada Fadwa because she's she's the one who's putting, help us put all this together. Um, is adjust a better word than lower? Sure, I don't know what I said in that context, but I like adjust, go for it. Thank you for helping me if I, oh, I think it might've been because I kept saying lower standards. Maybe that, what's your talking about? Yeah, adjust your standards does sound a lot nicer. Thank you. I appreciate those types of gentle, subtle ways to be more tactful. Yeah, Allah. Um, let's see. Anything else here? So, yeah, documents. So a lot of the questions that I'm seeing or comments are about the document. Um, I think, which is my favorite party? Uh, that's a very nice question. I have a few. Um, like Mishadi, of course, is amazing. I love Husari for Tajweed. He's really good. Um, mashallah. But I'm sure there are others. 
Okay, so I'm just quickly scanning to make sure I don't forget anything. We don't want to hold ourselves accountable. We always complain that we do not feel connected to our prayer. That's a very good question. I mean, very good point, right? I'm sure even our laziness is tied to what we put in our body. Absolutely. There is a total connection between the foods that we eat. Um, food is supposed to be nourishing. That's why we eat from the best. Allah SWT literally tells us to eat from the best, right? We are supposed to actually take a effort to try to find the best ingredients, the best food. But most of the time we... We just fall into what um, shortcuts because we're moving about life so quickly. So then we, we're going to suffer the consequences, right? So it's really important to just take accountability and say, you know what? It's not that I'm tired and I'm exhausted and, or, or sorry, it's not that prayer is so difficult to do because that is a, a total, again, uh, cop out. It's not prayer is difficult to do. Prayer actually is very easy to do. But if your body is heavy because you're not eating good food, you're not resting, you're staying up all night watching, you know, YouTube or or Netflix, and you're not getting enough sleep so that your body feels really heavy, then you are the reason why prayer is difficult. Don't blame the prayer. That is a cop out. Uh, accountability is how we reset ourselves. But when we're always um, passing the buck, as they say, or, or, you know, just absolving ourselves from any accountability, we then will continue to slip because you're not, there's nothing motivating you to change. But once you start to face yourself and go, I am the reason why I'm making all these excuses. It's all in my control. Stop making excuses. Just do it. And then it's very beneficial to have good sohba because they hold you accountable. So Alhamdulillah. All right, brothers and sisters, I want to thank all of you. I don't know how many people came in this room, but I saw a lot of people in and out, in and out. It's like a revolving door on Instagram, so it's hard to gauge. I hope you found this beneficial. If you did, I'm going to ask you. She did not ask me to do this, but the Rahma Foundation is one of my favorite organizations on the planet because, mashallah, they're very, very committed to providing platforms like this for women, first of all, to learn from other women. Um, in this case, you know, I'm open with, with my content. I don't mind it being co-ed if, if brothers want to share, but most of their programming is for women, providing women teachers uh, or uh, classes with women teachers. And mashallah, we know, of course, Dr. Rani Awad, may Allah bless her. She is uh, the found, uh, founder, co-founder, along with Ustada Fadwa and others. Uh, half of the Suzanne Dirani, Basada the Shamira Chothia, we have Sister um, Ruhi Ahmed. They're a beautiful, incredible team of women who have been working for more than 10 years to try to provide these types of classes. So if you enjoy this, this is free. Nobody's charging you anything. Um, the content is all available, but support goes a long way. And it really means a lot when female led initiatives are supported. We are the first uh, homes, I mean, the first madrasas of our children. So if you want to see our ummah thrive, please support female teachers. Um, just support female-led initiatives because we are going to hopefully be impactful with future generations. And if you look at all of our great scholars, many of them, if you read their, their biographies, they themselves will say it was their mother, their grandmother, their you know aunt, who, someone, a female who was instrumental in putting them on the path of knowledge. So if we want our societies to flourish and our communities to flourish, we have to support women doing amazing things. And Alhamdulillah Rahman Foundation does that by providing these types of programs, but support them, inshallah. Support them by liking their page, by uh, sharing their content, uh, making dot for them. And if you are financially able to, why not also donate to them? But I want to thank again, uh, Usada Fadwa and everybody else. I know it's been a very long session today, but it's the last one, inshallah, for this class. We might, uh, we'll, we'll probably hopefully do something else soon, but keep us in your dua. I'm going to go ahead and end in uh, dua, unless, uh, Usada Fadwa, did you have any announcements or anything that you want to make before we end the call? Final announcements? Uh, I just want to take some time on behalf of the Rahma Foundation and upon myself to just thank you, Sada Hosai, for your patience, your insistence in completing the text, the blessing. I don't know if everybody realizes the blessing of completing a text. And it's an honor and a, and a pleasure to, ha to have completed this text with you. Um, you know, having you took this knowledge from our sheikh. And so for to have you deliver this to others, is just alhamdulillah, a blessing to witness uh, and an honor to, to be a part of. So, of course, uh, please, for those of you who are listening, uh, Stay connected to the, to Ustada Husai and the Rahma Foundation if you can, because we are planning a next course with Ustada Husai. We do not want to let her go <laughs> without, inshallah, 
continuing the benefit that she provides for everybody. So please stay connected both to her on social media if you're able to, and as well uh, the Rahma Foundation, um, so that we can keep you in tune with what we're doing. I have made some requests. I don't want to name them, but we have put them in the universe for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept so that we can uh, continue working together, inshallah. Uh, she's probably one of the biggest blessings in my life, so I appreciate the time that she gives us. Thank you again, Stada Hussai. And with that, inshallah, a closing du'a and some... Fiki, mashallah. Likewise, you know how much you mean to me. I love you for the sake of Allah. And alhamdulillah for beautiful company. Wallahi, if there's a du'a that you want to make every day is to continue, ask Allah subhanahu to preserve uh, your the, the friendships that you have that really remind you of him. And if you don't have that, then Allah subhanahu wa gives you beautiful company because it's uh, it's invaluable really to have uh, people like Ustada Fadu in your life and others who inspire you, who uplift you. Alhamdulillah wa shukurillah for beautiful company. So alhamdulillah, jazakumullah khairan. I'm seeing, I'm sorry, so, someone, um, are, is, uh, Ustada Fadu, someone's asking, is there a link for those who are watching through the Rahma Foundation? So um, I think if you just contact the Rahma Foundation's Instagram page, they can probably send you that. Um, and I don't know, someone else said that their battery died. They had a question. I don't know, sister, if you've already answered your question or uh, asked your question, but I hope I answered it. And then someone else said, please make God for those of us struggling to improve and stay on track. I mean, you know, I mean, we're all struggling, honestly, sister. It's uh, it's this is life. Life is struggle. But there's beauty in struggling for the sake of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's never a burden when it's for Allah. It's always beautiful. It's always meaningful. And alhamdulillah for having purpose and direction in life, because there are a lot of people who have no idea what they're doing and they were never given the gift of guidance. So alhamdulillah, even if it's difficult, it's still better, much better than uh, floating in the abyss of dunya with no direction and no guidance. Alhamdulillah, may Allah protect us all. Inshallah, I hope the, the live will be saved. If not, the recording will be available on the Rahma Foundation. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and stop so we can pray asr, inshallah, and make our final dua. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wal asr inna linsana la bi khusr illa ladina amanu wa amanu salihati wa tawasu bil haqqi wa tawasu bil sabr. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natsubu ilayk. Allahumma salli wa salli wa barak ala sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزه اما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله جزاكم الله خيرا again everyone thank you so much inshallah i hope you all have a wonderful remainder of your monday evening inshallah please keep us in your dua and until next time wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh